I can see clearly now. Wayne Dyer. He was an American psychologist and writer of books on spiritual growth. I can see clearly now. It's Christmas 1941, a few weeks after the Pearl Harbor bombing. The United States has been drawn into war, two of my mother's brothers are serving in the military, one in Europe and the other in the Pacific. My father is no longer in the photo. His persistent partying with other women, his heavy drinking, and his regular encounters as a lawbreaker, which have landed him in jail on several occasions, have finally made it impossible for my mother to live with him. He has simply walked away from his parental responsibilities and was never heard from again. My mother is alone with three children under the age of five to feed. She takes her three children to her mother's house to watch her while she goes to work. My two older brothers and I are waiting with our mother for the bus to arrive at Jefferson Avenue on the east side of Detroit. We are dressed in our snow suits, gloves, galoshes, and ear muffs, standing at the bus stop next to what looks like a huge mountain of freshly cleared snow. The road is full of salt to melt the continuously falling snow, and it is a great disaster. A truck passes in front of the four of us, spraying us so hard with mud that we are knocked over. We landed safely but drenched in the gigantic pile of snow. My mother collapses, she is dressed for work and covered in a dirty, salty sleeve. She is exasperated. Obviously, her life is out of control with the departure of her ex-husband, and she is trying her best to make ends meet. Persistent depression, coupled with a world war, contributes to your overall situation. It is difficult to find work and my mother must count on the little help she receives from her family. They are also burdened by the long-term economic downturn. It is a difficult period under the best of circumstances, due to a shortage of all kinds of goods and the fog of war itself. My two brothers are also very upset. Five-year-old Jim tries to comfort our mother, three-year-old David is crying uncontrollably. I, I am having the best time of my life. This is like a nice surprise party with a big snow castle that we are all lying on. We can have fun. I don't quite understand why everyone is so angry and frustrated. And then these words came out of my mouth, Okay, mommy. Don't cry we can all stay here and play in the snow. I am the baby who rarely cries, the little boy who tries to make everyone laugh and feel good, no matter what is happening. I am the child who makes faces to change the environment from sad to happy. I'm that kid who'd be sure there must be a pony here somewhere if the litter box was full of manure. I don't know how to fill myself with sadness. My behavior seems to be naturally inclined to look on the bright side and pay little attention to the things that make everyone else sad. According to my mother, I am the most independent and curious child that she and her family have ever known. Apparently I arrived with this happy disposition intact. I am so happy to be here in this world. At nine months I am about the same size as Dave, who is months older. I try to make my brother laugh and feel safe, because he seems scared, sick, and most of the time sad, but he rarely smiles. I find the world so exciting and I love to wander and explore. As I get older, nothing seems to disturb or distress me. I look around and everything I see brings me into a state of wonder and amazement. I want everyone to be happy. I want all the despair in my family to disappear. I'm sure we don't have to be miserable just because our father sucks. I want to see my mother have joy in her soul instead of all this heartache. I want my older brother Jim to stop worrying so much about mom and her two younger brothers. If I can make them happy and have a little fun, Maybe all these other things will just go away. I just can't understand why everyone seems so severe. There are so many things to get excited about. I can play for hours with a spoon or an empty cardboard box. I love going outside and looking at the flowers, the butterflies, or the stray cat that keeps coming into our garden. Most of the time I am in a kind of blissful state of appreciation and bewilderment. I also have a very strong mind. I will not let anyone tell me what I can or cannot do, I insist on discovering my limits on my own. When they tell me no, 
I just smile and then proceed to do what my inner self instructs me to do, regardless of what important people may say about it. I seem to be totally in my own world, one that is joyful, full of exciting and limitless potentials and discoveries that I can make on my own. No matter how hard someone tries to make me feel sad, they can never be successful because I came here from a divine light, and there is nothing anyone can do to put out that light. This is who I am, a piece of God who has not forgotten that God is love. Like me. I can't count the number of times my mother told me that snow pile story. It was her favorite memory of me just before she was forced to place David and me in a series of foster homes and orphanages, while my older brother Jim went to live with our grandmother for most of the next decade. When I look back at the early days of my life in this incarnation, I can clearly see that the old maxim there are no accidents in this universe is a no-brainer that applies from the moment of our creation, and long before that as well. In an infinite universe there really is no beginning and no end. It is only our form that is born and dies, what occupies our form is immutable and, therefore, has neither birth nor death. As the father of eight children, I am quite convinced that each individual comes here with their own unique personality. We are destined here from an invisible field of infinite potentiality. That which has no form, has no borders, it is the self that is in the constantly changing body. All the accomplishments that fill my personal resume began to take shape at the moment of my conception, throughout my nine months of embryonic existence, and when I took my first birth breath upon arrival. I look back at that month-old child lying in a snowbank, and not a single cell that comprised that child is still here on planet Earth. However, the self that was in that body is the same infinite self that remembers everything a few years later. Even before I could read or write, I needed a personality that was congruent with the music I came to play here. That as a child I needed to feel that I could reach out to others and help them feel better about themselves and their circumstances. Somehow I knew that attitude is everything in life, even when I was a baby, so the attitude that my mother described to me and that characterized my childhood was connected in some mysterious way with the dharma that I had to fulfill throughout my life. Of this life. Lying on top of that snowbank with the rest of my family, watching them in a deep state of anguish and instantly deciding to try to make things a little more bearable by making them laugh or inviting them to have fun instead of being sad, is a spiritual level, same as writing books on how to break free from the negative thinking trap and enjoy life to the fullest. The form is adult with a larger and older body, but the same infinite self communicates through a new pair of eyes and ears. I have seen my eight children blossom into their own awakenings. They all appeared here at birth with their own unique personalities, perhaps from a series of previous lives, the mysterious possibilities are endless. But I know for sure that the one divine mind that is responsible for all of creation has a hand in this captivating mystery. The same parents, the same background, the same culture, and yet eight unique individuals, all of whom came with their own distinctive character traits. I think Khalil Gibran put it perfectly in The Prophet, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you, and although they are with you, they do not belong to you. We all have a mission of some kind to accomplish the moment we make the shift from nothing to now here, from spirit to form. I realized a long time ago how important it is to allow my own children to live their inner dictates, realizing that this is precisely what I have done all my life, based on the stories my mother told me about my life when it was baby. And then like a little boy, he was never surprised that my life turned out the way it did, due to what he observed in my childhood. Each of my children also had their God project. My job has been to guide, then step aside and let whatever is within them, which is their own uniqueness, direct the course of their lives. I know that I came here to fulfill a purpose that I decided before embarking on that journey from the invisible to the solid, from spirit to hardening into a physical reality. Starting with the three people unhappy with me in that muddy predicament, I was actually doing the first research and practices to live a life where I could help influence millions of people. While in that snowbank, 
I was intuitively trying to get everyone to see that we had a choice about how we viewed the situation. The self within the child wanted others to know that it is not so bad, we can change all this by laughing instead of getting angry. The greatest service that can be offered to children who display personality traits or inclinations that the adults around them may not understand is allowing them to express their own unique humanity. I was fortunate to be able to live much of the first decade of my life in an environment where the intrusion of parents and other adults into my life was minimized. I know that I came into the world with what I call great dharma, with a plan to teach self-reliance and a positive loving approach to large numbers of people around the world. I am very grateful for the circumstances in my life that allowed me to be practically alone and develop as planned in this incarnation. Just as everything we need for our physical development is handled by a divine, mysterious and invisible force as we develop for nine months in the womb, so is everything we need handled by the same source for all other aspects of our being. We come from a state of perfect well-being, divine love, and our creator does not need help to deal with this development. It is only when we interfere with this heavenly programming that we get off the path of God realization. Today I can clearly see that this entire universe is on purpose. Now I see that our early personality traits and predilections are expressed because they represent our higher selves. In these early ages we are still very connected to our source, because we have not yet had the opportunity to bring God out and assume the mantle of the false self, which is the ego. It's spring of David is nine years old and I'm about to turn eight. I yell at nearby customs officials who are inspecting cars entering Canada in Sombra, Ontario, my brother is drowning, my brother is drowning. You have to do something right now, right now. It's the first time we've swam in the St. Clare River this year. Last August there was a sandbar. 50 meters from the customs dock where we swam during our summer visits. The cabin where we stayed in Sombra is owned by my mother's boyfriend and my future stepfather, Bill Drury. During the winter, the fast currents of the river swept the sandbar, and David is now caught in the fast currents, unable to stand up. As I watch in horror, his head sinks and his hand barely shows above the surface of the water. This is my brother, my best friend, and my only companion on our many foster home excursions since we were both little. He's disappearing beneath the surface, and for a split second I'm immobilized in shock. At this point I run to the customs booth, where Bill Lang, a friendly-faced customs inspector who knows us, hears me, and instantly runs to a moored boat, starts the engine, and heads to the last spot where he was seen. My brother. As the boat approaches the spot I'm pointing to, Dave's little hand appears for the last time just above the surface. Bill and his assistant can take my brother into the boat, turn it over, and get the water out of his lungs and mouth. I see the color of his skin return from its not grayish color, Dave will be fine. I am very grateful that the people in the customs hut heard my panicked cries for help. I'm amazed at how quickly they started the boat and rescued my brother. That night, when we tell our mother about the situation nearby, Dave is still in shock. The next day, he refuses to go back into the water, and this continues for the foreseeable future. My brother's reaction to the near-death experience is one of the most mysterious things I have come across. Not only does Dave avoid swimming, but he develops severe hives if someone tries to persuade him to return to the water. I watch my brother closely, as we are always together, and I realize that even when I catch him outside in a sudden rain shower, every drop of water that touches his skin leaves a hive mark. Dave is so traumatized by this incident that this condition will last for most of the rest of his life. As an adult, raindrops continue to leave unpleasant reminders on his skin of his flirtation with the Grim Reaper on the St. Clare River as a nine-year-old boy. Fast forward almost three decades. David is in the military, stationed at F.T. Riley, Kansas. I'm traveling with my nine-year-old daughter Tracy to publicize my book Your Erroneous Zones. We're in St. Louis and then Kansas City, so I decide to take a trip to Junction City, Kansas, to visit my brother, whom I haven't seen in many years. 
Dave has been stationed overseas and has served two tours of duty during the Vietnam War, he has received the Bronze Star for his extraordinary service and bravery under fire. This is how Dave describes what happened during our visit, in his book From Darkness to Light. It reminds me of the meaning of his brush with death in 1948. In 1976, he was stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, and lived in Junction City. Wayne was in town promoting his best-selling book, Your Erroneous Zones. He and his daughter Tracy were staying at the Travelodge down the road and they invited me to swim in the pool. Wayne told me to focus my thoughts on something other than hives when we entered the pool. He kept talking to me and I didn't get a chance to think about anything other than what he was saying. In fact, he was speaking so softly that I couldn't understand what he was saying, so I had to keep getting closer and closer to him. Wayne had caught my attention on purpose. Before I knew it, I had been in the water for half an hour. When I got out of the pool and dried off, I couldn't find a single hive on my body. For the first time in years, I did not experience an outbreak of hives when I went swimming. I immediately went back to the water for another half hour with the same results. Since then I have enjoyed swimming and have never experienced an outbreak of hives again. While I was on that pier watching my brother being swept away by those fast currents, I felt the presence of something that I cannot adequately express here, or anywhere else in my life. That presence is here right now as I write about one of the most important events of my life. It is a feeling of not being alone and a force that propels one to action instantly. That late spring day was not the time for Dave to step out of this life, and I was the one designated to ensure that his dharma continued. That scene is so real to me even now, every detail of it has been imprinted on my inner screen. In those few moments when I was propelled to action, I learned that I could get people to listen to me and that I actually had the power of life over death within me. To delay would be to invite disaster. Standing there and crying was not an option. Letting fear overwhelm me was not for me to consider. I felt a life force pushing me away from the scene I was watching unfold before me, dragging me toward that customs hut, insisting that I yell at the top of my lungs at Bill Lang. I cannot say what this mysterious force is, but I know that it is something that has been there for me many times in my life. It is something invisible that I can feel and talk about in my lectures and in many of the books that I have written. It is powerful knowledge, like an invisible angelic guide that I trust. The experience of my brother's brush with death was the first time I absolutely knew that I was so much more than an eight-year-old going into action on that river dock in Sombra, Ontario. It is a comforting presence that I feel more and more frequently in my life and that I never ignore at all. From a clearer perspective now, when I look back at that event in, and then what happened in 1976 at FT. Riley, I can see the connection, as well as how it relates to the course that my life has taken. Life. Little did I know at the time that the fact that my brother was about to drown and the extreme reaction of his body would be an opportunity for me to put into practice what I intuitively knew as the mind-body connection and its incredible healing abilities. At the time of my visit to Dave, I was just beginning my exploration of the power of the mind and its ability to perform healing miracles. The quarter century in which hives appeared on Dave's skin whenever he found himself in a situation of having to enter, or even near, water, he was overcome in an episode of putting his mind on healing instead of the fearsome thought of a catastrophe. From a clearer perspective, I can now see how my presence on that pier that resulted in my brother's rescue was instrumental in giving me the information and confidence to become a teacher and practitioner of mind-body healing. That childhood experience helped guide us both, leading us to explore and realize the power we possess to accomplish whatever we put our attention on with love rather than fear as our anchor. In some incomprehensible way, everything is connected. My brother's near drowning gave me the opportunity many years after helping him heal him from the traumatic reaction that caused him to have serious skin breakouts, as well as launching myself into a self-empowering teaching career. The year is 1950 and I am in the fourth grade at Arthur Elementary School in Detroit. This is the first time I have attended school while living with my family together. Every day at 2.45 p.m., 
if the whole class has been reasonably well behaved, that is to say, there is no need to talk out of turn, our teacher, Mrs. Engels, reads to us the secret garden. I love listening to her, especially because of the way she brings all the characters to life. In the classroom, I'm in my assigned seat, doing the motions of memorizing my multiplication tables, reviewing the words of the week, looking at maps for our geography lesson, practicing cursive writing, and all the other tedious details in my room. Primary school day. But secretly, I'm anxiously waiting to hear the secret garden at 2.45, so I sit at my desk and look at the clock on the wall. As I sit here at my desk some years later, I can see the word Seth Thomas in my imagination on the face of that clock in the classroom. It seems that I am the only kid in the class who is obsessed with the development of the story. Every afternoon, and I find that many of my classmates seem oblivious to the fact that if they misbehave, the story will not come. I am 10 years old and I have already realized that I do not see the world as the other children around me see it. I have found that people will listen to me if I speak with conviction. I've also learned that I enjoy spending most of my time in my own inner world, exploring ideas that my contemporaries don't even seem to consider. Here in Ms. Engel's fourth grade classroom, I realize how much power I have to make things happen that are important to me. Every day I voluntarily take on the role of enforcer of the silence that Mrs. Engels cherishes so much. If the class becomes a little rebellious, I will leave my seat and remind offenders that they are jeopardizing our time in the secret garden and that I will not tolerate this disruptive behavior. They listen and calm down, not because they want to hear the story but because I take a position of authority. This is an enlightening experience for my 10-year-old self. I realize that it happened before in the foster homes where I had lived, and now here again in a new school. When I speak with confidence and kindness, they listen to me. Anyone who misbehaves in a way that prevents Ms. Engels from reading to us is brought to order by me without threats or rudeness. Oh, how I love to close my eyes and listen to the magic that is, for me, my own secret garden. The story, written by Frances Hodgson Burnett in 1991, is about Mary Lennox, a 10-year-old orphan girl, sent from India to live in England after her parents died in a cholera epidemic. She arrives in England as a severe, hurt and negative young woman who feels her parents did not love her. The story describes his discovery of a completely new world that changes his perspective on life. Here I am, a 10-year-old boy, who has just spent most of my life with similar feelings of not being loved, and now I hear a story that speaks of another way of looking at life. I am fascinated by the idea that there is a secret place in the world or in the mind. I listen mesmerized by the conversations Mary and her sickly friend, Colin, have with flowers and a bird called a robin. Robins also fly around me, building their nests and singing as I walk home from school at the end of each day. I engage in conversations with these new avian friends all the way home, living in my own imaginary secret garden where sickness and weakness disappear and where a positive attitude is the antidote to all suffering. I feel the exquisite power of the words read by Ms. Engels and create my own secret garden to escape to a world where anything is possible. Here I talk to animals and flowers and I feel the presence of real magic in my life. Coming to this new home to live with my family is not as comfortable as living in someone else's home. Bill, my new stepfather, drinks a lot and when he does he is argumentative and petty. But I manage to remain somewhat oblivious to his ranting, largely because I am aware that in my imagination I can create a secret space much like Mary Lennox's garden in England. No one is allowed into this space without my permission. I am fascinated by this idea that life is not limited to what I see and hear with my senses. I discover that I can be here in this world in my body, and I can also step out of the limitations of my physical self and live within my own private world. In the secret garden I hear Mrs. Engels talk about healing people with serious illnesses and I think, if Mary can do that, so can I. If Mary, Dickon, and Colin and all their companions in the secret garden can talk to the animals and listen to the trees, then me too. My imagination flies. 
I envision myself as a magician who can do anything he sets his mind to. I see a guide for me in all of nature. I learn to go within and cleanse my inner world of everything that interferes with the bliss of my inner peace. I make the decision that Bill will never be able to get to me with his madness, or his obsessive diatribes on topics that exist only in his own weakened mind. I have a secret garden of my own, to which I realize that I have often retired in the past years from living in foster care. Here in this new environment, living in a small house with three essentially strangers, one of whom spends his days and nights drinking beer, I receive a gift that is immensely beneficial. The gift is the awareness of my secret garden, the place within me that has no restrictions or obstacles, and where I can create a way of life that is immune to any and all influences that can bring me down. Over the years to come, living in an environment of verbal and alcoholic abuse that is the norm, I have a safe haven in my imagination that I treasure, and I am eager to tell others about it. Mrs. Engels reading the secret garden for minutes at the end of each school day is probably not memorable for the other kids in that fourth grade classroom. For me it was a benefit that lit a fire within me for which I am always grateful. It was the beginning of the awareness that I have something inside of me that triumphs over what happens outside of me, my own secret garden where all things are possible. Even after six decades have passed, I often look back at that classroom with Ms. Engels and think about how Divine Providence was working on my behalf. Somehow I was led into his classroom by a force that was conspiring to ignite a fire within me that would prompt me to write and speak about the ideas presented in that novel written more than a century ago. Before I began writing, I decided to peruse the secret garden again, to remind myself of what had ignited such a provocative interest in my young self. The following passage, which the author writes about ten-year-old Mary Lennox, really caught my attention, she was a great believer in magic. Secretly, she quite believed that Dickon worked magic, of course, good magic, in everything that was close to him and that's why people liked him so much and the wild creatures knew he was their friend. The excitement that this idea germinated in me again became the impetus for a body of work that would span my entire adult life. I didn't know at the time that I would spend a lifetime examining and exploring this idea that there was a lonely chamber within all of us that, when nurtured and tested, empowers us to live our lives to extraordinary levels. In a universe that has no accidents, a universe that is divinely orchestrated, it seems clear to me that Mrs. Engels, my prophetic fourth grade teacher, was in my life to awaken a passion within me to go beyond the ordinary. This experience opened my life to a passion for greatness, for achieving miracles, and for believing that there are no limits to what one can achieve by tuning into the powers of the invisible world that is our birthright. When I was a ten-year-old boy, I came across two ideas that served as a guide for the journey that would become my destination. The first is that people will respond to the benefit of all concerned if you speak to them with confidence and without judgment. The second guide is that there is a secret garden where miracles and magic abound, and it is available to anyone who chooses to visit it. Of course, I didn't realize at the time that those hours of sitting and listening to the secret garden were actually my preparation for a lifetime's work. They were purely emotional moments for me. When the bell rang and classes ended, all the way home I walked through my own secret garden. It was a passion that was ignited then, and I still feel almost giddy when I contemplate what we are all capable of experiencing when we allow ourselves to reach our full potential. Years later, when I read Candido, Voltaire's best-known work, I was reminded of Mrs. Engels's class. After traveling the world and seeing the worst of humanity, the main character Riley explains at the end of this satirical tale that the violence and plunder of kings cannot be compared to the productive and peaceful lives of those who cared for their own affairs and cultivated theirs. Yard. Every time I read this passage from Voltaire, I see the ten-year-old that I was, gazing at his own secret garden and, unbeknownst to him, setting the stage for a lifetime encouraging others to avoid ordinary life and actually attend. To your needs. Own garden. I am at a new school, Marquette Elementary, my fifth school in as many years, and I hear Mrs. Cooper tell us, her fifth graders, that she is quite hurt and upset about the way we are behaving. 
he goes so far as to say that we are the worst class he has ever taught. Sitting in the back of the classroom, I am amused by his irate response. These thoughts swirl in my head as I watch a grown woman lose control of herself, how could she allow the misbehavior of a group of children to be the source of her discomfort? She is the teacher, she is the boss, she is supposedly in charge of this room and she is allowing the behavior of others to get the best of her. How could she hand her power over to a group of little kids who are just getting rebellious because this class is so boring? I acknowledge that our teacher is trying to get us all to behave through the tactic of trying to make us feel guilty. And I realize that I am not at all like other children in the way that I think. In my mind I go back to Mrs. Scarf's house at 231 Town Hall Road in Montana. Clemens, Michigan, a foster home in which she lived less than two years earlier. Many children came and went during the time my brother David and I lived there, and I remember a young woman named Martha crying hysterically after two adults left her. I heard MRS. Scarf told her husband, go find Wayne, he can make her calm down. I walked into the room and took Martha by the hand, telling her what a great place this was and how much I was going to enjoy living here. I found Dave and we took her for a walk in the chicken coop, the cherry and peach trees, and the garden. Then I took her to my favorite bush, where lilacs bloomed and lilies of the valley grew close to the ground. I gave her the two flowers and asked her to smell them and think happy thoughts, and right before my eyes, Martha transformed into a happy and excited playmate. Now, in the classroom with Miss Cooper, I think about how it felt to miss my mother so much in those years and how I had to take care of my older brother, who was often bullied by some cruel children because he was little. For your children. Age as a result of a severe anemic disorder. I remember throughout all those years I simply used my thoughts to turn sad events into blessings, and here is a grown woman who is deformed by some disturbing noise, not knowing how to be happy by imagining herself smelling the tempting delicious fragrance of a lilac or lily of the valley. And you want me to feel guilty about your own inability to find joy in every moment. I have a knowledge within me that none of the other children seem to have. It's so perfectly obvious to me that no one has the ability to make me feel bad or cajole me into feeling guilty for their helplessness. I am so aware that I am different. I know that I can choose how I will feel at any time. I rest my head on my desk, aware that I can choose peace over what Mrs. Cooper chooses for herself. Class ends and we all head to the playground after lunch. Sue is very upset about the things the teacher said to the class and is crying with her friends Janice and Luann. It seems that she feels singled out as one of the instigators of the incident that unleashed Ms. Cooper. I begin to speak to Sue, with an understanding in my heart that I have the ability within me to make her see the situation for what it is, rather than what she imagines it to be. Why are you so upset? I ask him. Can't you see that she's just trying to make you feel guilty? Because she looked at me directly and said how bad I was and that it made her feel bad. Why do you think he was doing this? For us to behave. Do you need him to feel bad so you can behave? I ask. No, I just don't like that she is mad at me and thinks I'm bad. What does it matter what she thinks of you? It makes me feel bad if someone is mad at me. Isn't your anger your problem? I want to know. Not if it's my fault she feels bad. What if I told you that you are a tree? Would you be a tree and feel bad for her to think that? Of course not, Sue replies. I spend the recess period making Sue realize that Mrs. Cooper is trying to control and manipulate her by playing on her weakness. I want to help my fellow student realize that no one can make her feel bad without her giving them permission to do so. As we return to the classroom, Sue has a small smile on her face, but in my heart I know that she has a long way to go to learn to be independent of the need for approval. I also know that I have something inside of me that gives me a freedom that other children don't have. I know that how I feel is something that I can choose in any circumstance, and that no one can take it away from me, unless I allow it. I also know that I can help others feel better just by speaking common sense to them. Looking back on that experience in fifth grade, 
I now realize that I seem to be connected in a way that was different from my peers. That day on the playground with Janice, Luan, and Sue has always been etched on my mind. It was just one of many similar occurrences where I was able to almost step back from what was happening and see myself behave in a way that I had never seen demonstrated by any adult, let alone 11-year-old contemporaries. At the time, it seemed like the best thing to do. It made perfect sense to me not to let external things bother me or impede my own sense of well-being. From this point of view, it is so obvious to me that I was actually in some kind of training ground to become an active teacher of higher spiritual principles and common sense. I know that this universe has a creative source of energy that sustains it, which is literally the matrix of all matter. Nothing happens by chance anywhere, because this universal mind is permanently on guard, going on its miraculous ways in a myriad of infinite possibilities. Those inner thoughts of mine that prompted me to trust my own mind and help my classmates overcome their ordinary ways of seeing things were an integral part of this universal source's plan for me. Those early experiences are still so vivid in my mind today. This was my training ground, and those were my little steps toward a life of teaching self-reliance. Looking back on my early days here on Earth, I can see that spending most of my first decade in foster care was part of God's infallible plan for me. If I was going to spend my adult life teaching, lecturing, and writing about self-reliance, then obviously I needed to learn to trust myself and thus be in a position to never be deterred from this awareness. What better training ground for teaching self-reliance than an early childhood that required a sense of independence and a need for self-reliance? At the time, of course, I was not aware of all the future implications that these early experiences were going to offer me. Now, from a position of being able to see much more clearly, I know that each encounter, each challenge, and each situation are spectacular threads in the tapestry that represents and defines my life, and I am deeply grateful for all of it. It is a new school year at Marquette Elementary, where I am starting 7th grade. On the first day of school, Classmate after classmate comes up to me and says that we have two new transfer students in our class and that we should avoid them. I am puzzled when I am informed that these new children are somehow different and therefore not deserving of my company. Rather than judge these new classmates, I am intrigued by what threatens them. One of the new children is a boy named Guy, a transfer student from a local Catholic school, Our Lady Queen of Peace. Apparently the fact that he's from a Catholic school, and had some kind of trouble at that school and got expelled, is reason enough to boycott Guy of any chance of joining our 7th grade camaraderie. I hear most of my friends speak ill of this boy. They have no knowledge of him at all, other than some rumors that are spreading, origin unknown. I am well aware that I have an enormous influence on my classmates. My willingness to speak without fear makes me love them. So I know that if I avoid these new students, they will indeed be left out, but if I hug them, the others will line up and welcome them instead of ostracizing them. This is a power that I have had in every school situation that I have been in for the last seven years. The other new student that year is a girl who lives just down the street. Her name is Rhoda and I have yet to speak to her. My classmates keep coming up to me and whispering, as if they are giving me corrupted and forbidden information about this new girl at our school, don't talk to Rhoda, she is Jewish. This is a word I had not heard before, so I ask, what is a Jew? What does it mean? What is it about her that makes her so undesirable? None of my classmates have an answer. They only know that someone has told them something about Jews somewhere, and that means they cannot be friends with them. Everyone is willing to avoid this new girl because of a label that somehow made her an outcast. Rhoda lives half a block from me on Moross Road on the east side of Detroit. That same night I decide to find out what all the fuss is about. I knock on the door and Rhoda's mother greets me, in fact, she's one of my clients on my newspaper route, where I deliver the Detroit news every afternoon on my bike. I discover that Rhoda is like the rest of us, but that she practices a different set of religious beliefs. Being exposed to a variety of religious experiences in the foster homes I lived in, being a Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, or whatever means absolutely nothing to me. 
I've already formed an opinion that the so-called religious teachings I've been exposed to just don't make sense. So, I just ignored the Sunday school message of fear and judgment and paid no attention to any of it. I don't see the need for all this craziness in my life, and I decided a long time ago not to participate because every time I was asked to go to church I ended up feeling worse from the experience, and I want, more than anything, to feel bad. Feel good. Rhoda's family couldn't have been nicer, and at that very moment, I decide that Rhoda is going to be my friend and welcome to our 7th grade class. With my acceptance of both Rhoda and Guy, their transition to a new school environment went smoothly and both children are accepted as part of our classroom. The use of the word Jew as a pejorative label stops almost immediately. I am puzzled by the willingness of many of my friends to judge someone based on what their parents had told them about a word they did not even understand. Instead of thinking for themselves, they use their mind to reflect what others tell them to think. I am very lucky, I don't have older people around me telling me who to hate, reject, or judge. These two experiences with Guy and Rhoda stand out remarkably when I look back on my early life and now realize that they were preparing me for an adult life of teaching compassion and tolerance, even though I was unaware of that. Destination at that time. I did not feel special or more enlightened than anyone, in fact, I was just one of the students in the class, it just seemed for the best at the time. Now I can see quite clearly that I was being guided to behave this way as a child. The divine guidance was obviously directing the play that was only in Act 1 at the time. I can't say why I took on this kind of role in the early stages of my life, other than speculating that a higher power was at work during these formative years. While many of my friends and acquaintances were quite willing to use hateful epithets, that language innately offended me and made me bristle inside when I heard it. I did not choose to make a great scene when such behavior arose. I knew inside, just like when dealing with the bully who threatened my brother, that fighting was a waste of time and would accomplish nothing. I heard different voices in my head, internal proclamations that encouraged me to be an example of what I knew to be correct. This theme of compassion and kindness towards others has been with me since I was a child. Perhaps it was a leftover from a previous life. Perhaps it arose from feelings of early abandonment, in which I wanted to give love because the love I felt did not reach me. But from this point of view I see it as the hand of divine providence on my shoulder guiding me to behave in a compassionate way from the beginning, so that I can write and speak about the importance of extending love to all as part of the mission of an entire life. However, that spark of motivation was placed in me back then, I want to express my deep and sincere thanks for it. Not only has it illuminated my life immeasurably, it has been a source of comfort and healing for millions of people around the world. When I'm on The Tonight Show talking to Steve Allen, I'll be way more interesting than the people who were there last night. I am having a conversation with my mother and two brothers early in the morning before she takes her bus to work and we go to school. I am 1954 years old and I see Steve Allen almost every night. I'm lost in fascination while watching the show, and I find myself right there in the studio talking to Steve and chatting with his cast of wacky characters. I don't think I'm a guest, I know. We have a small black and white admiral television, the first television in the neighborhood. On the roof of our little duplex on Moross Road there is an antenna that brings reception, depending on how the winds are blowing. For me, this is the absolute height of luxury, and I get addicted to my nightly entertainment long after the rest of the house is asleep. I sit near this strange new gadget and keep the sound as low as possible, because my mom has the alarm set for the morning and I don't want to disturb her, or find out I'm wide awake while thinking. I am fast asleep. These nights watching Steve Allen on The Tonight Show are more than just entertainment to me. In my imagination I merge with the whole show. Somehow I can see myself not only in the present, as a child sitting in my living room watching electronic transmissions, but I also see myself in the future. I have such an incredible feeling of being connected to what I'm going to do in the future that sometimes I look at the small screen and see myself sitting on set and talking to Steve like an adult. I can't get rid of this image, ever. I speak it to very few people, 
but somehow I can merge the present with the future, and these internal images become my own private world. This probably sounds crazy to most others, but to me it's very real. I see myself using this small television screen as a means to reach out and teach people, not only in my city or my country, but also around the world. When I share these images with my family and friends, they largely make fun of my naivete, so I start to practice how to keep these internal images just that, internal only. And the knowledge never leaves me, night after night, as I watch Steve Allen on The Tonight Show. Fast forward to 1976. I had published my first book for the public, entitled Your Erroneous Zones. I was embarking on a national tour, largely on my own, visiting city after city doing as many media interviews as I could arrange. Being that I was an unknown personality, all the requests that were made to me to do a national television commercial were firmly rejected. So I decided that the other way to reach everyone in America was to go directly to them. I packed my books and with my nine-year-old daughter, Tracy, spent many months traveling. I did all the interviews that my personal friend and publicist, Donna Gould, could arrange. Finally, in August I got a call from a man who worked as a talent coordinator for The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. His name was Howard Papush, and he had just read Your Erroneous Zones and wanted to know if he would be willing to attend a pre-interview for a possible appearance on The Tonight Show. Of course, I immediately accepted and arrived in Burbank, California, at the NBC studios. Here Howard and I talked for several hours and finally became close friends. A couple of days later I got a call from Howard informing me that he was scheduled to appear the following Monday night on The Tonight Show with guest host Shecky Green, a comedian who performed frequently on the Las Vegas Strip. This would be my first opportunity to speak to the people of the United States about the message I wanted to share with the world in your erroneous zones. I was ecstatic excited beyond anything I could write here today. He was scheduled to be the last guest, in what was called the author's place in those days, in the final minutes of the minute show, and would be broadcasting on, AM. The night the show was being taped, as I was being led to my dressing room, I passed a group of public phones and there, completing a call, was none other than Mr. Steve Allen, who was scheduled to be the first guest. I introduced myself to Steve and walked to my dressing room in a cloud of amazement. I am going to appear on national television with the man I have admired so much since I was a one-year-old boy. The show finished filming around the afternoon, and my segment with Shecky Green went extremely well. Shecky was engaging, funny, and made me relax and sound cohesive and interesting. I went out to lax in a state of pure delirium. As I was about to board the plane, I heard my name broadcast over the public address system, telling me that I had an urgent call. I found a phone and it was Howard calling with bad news. For the first time in the Tonight Show's history, it had been avoided because at the Republican National Convention in Kansas City, Vice Presidential nominee Bob Dole exceeded the allotted time and NBC didn't cut, so my why had just been erased. Appearance on National Television I went from happy to pissed off in an instant. The next day, Tuesday, Howard called me in Detroit to tell me that Johnny Carson would like to have me on the show the following night, Wednesday. It turns out that at the meeting on Tuesday morning they told Johnny about this new guest who was fabulous the night before, even though the show did not air. I got a plane ticket back to Los Angeles, to show up with Johnny on Wednesday night. However, because the show was so long with Johnny talking to Orson Welles and Robert Blake, I had very little time left. So Johnny told me on the air, I'm so sorry I ran tonight. Would you be willing to stay and redo the show on Friday and will we give you more time than you had tonight? I said yes and showed up with Johnny again on Friday night, then the following Monday night, they aired the show that had been previewed the week before with Shecky Green. I suddenly went from zero national television appearances to three Tonight Show commercials in five days. This marked the beginning of a series of appearances on The Tonight Show over the next two years, as well as regular announcements on The Merv Griffin Show, The Mike Douglas Show, The Phil Donahue Show, Dinah Shore Syndicated Talk Show, Dinah. 
The John Davidson Show, The Today Show, Good Morning America, and so. As I passed that bank of phones and saw that I was about to make an appearance with Steve Allen on The Tonight Show, I had an immediate and almost overwhelming feeling within me that I had actually created my own future by having such strong knowledge. When I was years old. In fact, I'm pretty sure that time itself is much more of an illusion than we are capable of understanding with our body-mind. Perhaps my knowledge in 1954 was a possibility that a future event was present in what I now consider the past. But if time is an illusion and unity is what really defines our experience, then the idea of the past and the future must also be an illusion. And if this seems crazy and indecipherable to you, it often seems so to me, then consider your dream state. Here you can fly, your long dead grandparents are alive, and it can be a small child, an older person, or any age you want if you put your attention to it. Consider that for a third of your life, you are in a non-temporal dimension and anything is possible, and the only way to know for sure that you were dreaming is to wake up and look back. From a more awakened perspective in my life today, I look back at my one-year-old self that had an inner knowing, which became an intention that connected with the all-knowing, all-creating divine mind and me. Allowed me to become what I am. I was putting my conscience, just like I do in my dream state. That's how powerful I think our thoughts and intentions are throughout our lives. I see now, from a clearer perspective, that each moment of our existence contains an infinite number of possibilities. The strongest knowledge within us about what we are going to do or become is actually lived in that very moment, although we have not yet experienced it in our everyday reality. A persistent thought is a thought that is aligned with the divine mind and becomes a reality in what we call the future, but it is actually part of the unity that is just that, one. No division, just an experience, which is now. Remember, everything that happened to you in the past actually happened in the now, and the same is true in the future. Everything you will ever experience will also happen now. Yes, now is all there is, and when I saw myself and felt myself on The Tonight Show with Steve Allen in 1954, it was a now-waiting experience. I had to do it. There was no chance it wouldn't show up, since I knew it. What I know from this point of view is that whenever I have that absolute knowledge within me that something is going to happen, I feel that I have the guidance available from Ascended Masters, who are working with me and steering the ship of my life in the direction. That has been my own personal dharma from the moment I incarnated in this life. With this awareness, I am convinced that I have been in some kind of Ascended Teacher training course from the beginning, and that these insights that were so persuasive to me as a child were actually part of that training regimen. The past, present, and future in a timeless dimension are simply occurring at the same time, even if our time-based dimension sees it differently. Today I know that I have a spiritual guide with me, who guides me on the path of living and teaching God realization. I have no reason to doubt that this same angelic assistance was with me in 1954 when I saw myself in the future. There seems to have been a fundamental truth at work back in 1976 that has guided me throughout my life. When I look back on what was happening while I was promoting your erroneous zones myself, I never felt any frustration that I couldn't get any appearances on national television. I simply decided to go to as many cities as possible and take on whatever local offerings I could generate, leaving the rest to the higher powers to direct my efforts. And as I followed my own inner callings, while enjoying the best time of my life, out of that awareness emerged three appearances on the most prestigious national television show in five days, and a launch to national prominence for the rest of my professional life. I wasn't chasing success, I was chasing my own inner vision. All of this is wrapped up in a quote that I have quoted many times, which was written in the 20th century by one of the most influential spiritual teachers who has ever graced my path. His name is Henry David Thoreau, and his words have always resonated sharply in my conscience, if you confidently walk in the direction of your dreams and strive to live the life you have envisioned, you will find unexpected success in common hours. That this wisdom was operating over time in my life. It sure was unexpected and beyond anything I had dared to contemplate. 
I was confidently moving in the direction of my own personal dream and living the life I had envisioned, and I loved every minute of it. I let success haunt me, which it has been doing ever since. The only thing I am sure of is that I can control what goes into my imagination, and I have simply allowed whatever success I have enjoyed to come to me. By the time there were three appearances on The Tonight Show in five days, I had already given up a full-time teaching position at a major university so I could go out into the world on my own and talk to whoever would listen. Truly, Thoreau's words resonated with me as I followed my dream and allowed the universe to handle the details. I'm riding my bike around and around the block, trying to avoid entering the chaos of my house. Life at home in me. Fifteen years are full of confusion and getting worse by the day. My mother works as a secretary for the Chrysler Corporation and is struggling to earn enough money to support her three children, as her husband has no interest in doing anything other than drinking and causing violent outbursts. Finally she decided enough was enough and filed for Bill Drury's divorce papers, he will bring the peace and quiet that he so desired to our home, and he will also change his last name to mine. My stepdad's drinking is spiraling out of control, erupting into the common verbal attack most drunkards use. Rant aggressive, loud, fast, angry. He bothers me for anything he might be upset with me about, anything. So now I'm riding my bike waiting for him to get in his black 1954 Chevrolet and go to the bar. The words of my high school guidance counselor are fresh in my mind as I pedal around the block, I want your mother to come to the school and talk to the principal. Until then, you are suspended. Mr. Cutter is punishing me because I refuse to fill out the student personnel forms properly. When I got to the line asking for my parents' names, I was confused about what to insert in that space. Should I write on behalf of my stepfather or my own father, whom I have never seen? And how do I explain the impending change of my mother's name? I felt violated, I didn't want to put anything on these forms that would make my mother look bad and I didn't like being asked for personal information about my family. So I wrote in large letters across the form, that's my business. As a result, Mr. Cutter suspended me and demanded that my mother miss a day of work and take three buses to have a conference with the principal, Mr. Irwin Wolf. For three days I cannot participate in any school activity, instead, I can sit on a bench in the principal's office. There is at least one interesting book in the probation bench, placed there presumably in the hope of changing the wayward disgruntled who are sentenced to sit in this place. I was readmitted to school after my mother explains to the principal and Mr. Cutter that I am trying to protect her, and promises that I will contain my dislike for filling out forms and treating the enrollment process each semester with respect. Nothing is said to me about what drives my anger at school regulations. Buried deep is the pain of living with a scandalous fortune in the form of alcoholism, along with the prospect of another impending family breakdown and the fear I have of being sent back to foster care and losing daily contact with my mother. One more time. A few months have passed and my 10th grade biology teacher has informed me that I must make a scrapbook of the various neighborhood sheets and turn it in before the end of the semester. I will not earn a passing grade and will have to retake biology if I do not comply. I am years old and I don't take school very seriously. The most important thing for me at this point in my life is my job, which is more or less a full-time thing. I work as an assistant manager slash cashier slash produce manager slash butcher slash whatever else is needed at Stall Market, a small independent shop serving the local population. I give a portion of my earnings to my mother, as do my two brothers, who are also working very hard at their jobs and failing when it comes to being stellar students. One of the girls in my biology class, Mary Jo Mercurio, has offered to do the leaf collection for me, just so I don't have to go through the ignominy of failing biology for no sensible reason. I refuse, it has become a moral problem for me. I am not a troublemaker in any sense of the word. But there is something within me that reacts strongly, almost violently, to the idea of doing frivolous, busy tasks, and doing them because everyone else just follows and never questions authority figures. 
I am very frustrated with the intransigence of my biology teacher in this business of putting together and pasting sheets in a scrapbook simply because everyone has always done it. I beg you, but to no avail. Maintains your posture of. Do leave picking or fail the course, even if you have high marks on all your schoolwork and have shown that you know the difference between the leaves produced by oaks, elms, and evergreens. My frustration takes hold of me, and I speak out loudly, this is so stupid. I have a full-time job and I don't have time to do such a silly task. I'm not going to do it. I go back to the principal's office, to sit in the row of criminals. Once again, I must get my mother to leave work and come on a second date with Mr. Wolf, so that she can hear why my insolence cannot and will not be tolerated. As I sit there, I see the same book that caught my eye a few months earlier. The book is a paperback edition of Walden, by Henry David Thoreau. The last time I was here, I just flipped through the pages, now, while I'm sitting on the long bench waiting for my appointment with the justice for not being like everyone else, I decide to read everything. I love this man's writing. I am totally absorbed in Thoreau's stream of consciousness style when he describes what it feels like to live in nature and to learn about life by listening and being content in nature. My refusal to engage in what seems silly conformity for the sake of conformity is reinforced by reading Walden while I await disciplinary action. It is true that I am a bit skeptical about the position I am taking, because following it means going to summer school and taking up biology again. I come to school every day and head to the varnished bench in the principal's office, where I continue to read Thoreau's account of his time living in the Massachusetts desert. I also dream of living in peace in nature and without stupid rules imposed on me. I am lost in his words and in everything he learns from the mysterious forces of nature. I decide that this man, who wrote about a hundred years ago, is my hero. I learned that he went to jail instead of paying taxes to a government that allowed slavery and participated in the horrors of the war between Mexico and the United States. He is a rebel who opposes foolish laws and immoral behavior towards others. I am very grateful for who left this treasure and for all the wisdom that flows from this man, who thinks like me, something that I had never found before in my life. When I finish reading Walden, I find an essay at the end of the book titled Civil Disobedience. I have one more day left to sit on the bench in the principal's office, so I promise to read this essay. I'm beyond excited, I'm flabbergasted. This man is writing directly to my heart. The entire essay is written around the central idea that everyone has both the right and the obligation to follow their conscience, especially when cumbersome and silly rules are imposed on them by government authority. I feel like I've found a literary soulmate, a man I can respect. Thoreau lived up to his ideas and was even willing to be jailed instead of paying a poll tax in his hometown of Concord, Massachusetts. I make the decision that one day I will visit Concord and immerse myself in the same world that produces people who have such a revolutionary way of thinking. I suppose the school officials, who provided me with this book to read while I was in limbo, wanted me to apply the principles I was reading. I am excited to share Thoreau's ideas with Mr. Wolf at the conference scheduled for tomorrow with my mother. I feel like I'm not that strange sitting here a second time waiting for my punishment for the crime of believing in myself and being willing to stand up for what I believe. I feel good about this advice on the importance of obeying my own conscience and practicing civil disobedience. My mother comes in, obviously upset about having to miss work for another meeting at school. I've lived with her for five years right now, so she has a pretty good idea that her son Wayne isn't like most other kids when it comes to obeying silly rules and being told how to live his life. She is confident in my ability to make my own decisions, in large part because that is what I have done since I was very little. On this second visit to Mr. Wolf I show him what I have been reading the past week while awaiting my fate, should the citizen ever, for a moment, or in the least, surrender his conscience to the legislator? Why, then, does every man have a conscience? I think we should be men first and subject later. The only obligation I have the right to assume is to do what I think is right at any time. My mother, bless her, supports the position I have taken, 
just as she did a few months earlier when she explained why I had taken the extreme position of refusing to fill out a large number of forms that could make her look bad. I will attend summer school, but I am not bowing down, I am deeply grateful for the days I was suspended from school, reading the words of a man who will become one of the most influential people in my life. I hope to go back to studying biology in a few weeks. The events described above are the two biggest things that happened to me during all of my four years of high school. I look back at the inner rage I felt at having to fill out forms and reveal the family discord that I preferred to keep private, and now I can see the vast amount of benefits I received. That experience uniquely helped me become a better parent to my eight children whenever they came into conflict with school regulations. I could remember my encounters with rules and regulations that didn't seem to make much sense to me, and empathize with my children's frustrations. I understood when I was very young that blindly following the rules just because they are rules is losing control of your whole life. Now I can see that my first encounters as a teenager in high school with those who tried to make me conform were placed before me so that I could write and speak about a higher form of consciousness. Much later in life, I began to live as a man who respects the wisdom of the Tao Te Ching, written by Lao Tzu in the 5th century BC. I discovered the higher form of consciousness revealed in the Tao. This philosophy declares that when the greatness of the Tao, God, is present, action arises from the heart, and when the greatness of the Tao is not present, action arises from the rules, a sure sign that virtue is absent. My first entanglements with having to live by a set of rules, which often seemed so unnecessary, were the fodder that allowed me to write and talk about the importance of self-reliance. If I had been a young person who simply lined up and did what they told him to without questioning the authority or rationale for the rules in the first place, I would have a very different resume today. Within me there is something that I call my presence I am, which is my connection with my source of being, the Tao, the Divine Mind, God, Allah, Krishna, the Christ Consciousness, no matter the name. This presence of I am is something that speaks to me very strongly, and always has. He never lets me down, although there are times when listening to his inner pleas forces me to face once again what appear to be the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, but are actually the great lessons I embodied to learn. The presence of the I am within me is extremely persuasive, and was already like that when I was a child. He just couldn't be one of the pack, and when I saw pack behavior, I criticized it in a much more selfish way than today. I was a bit loud back then, drawing some unwanted attention to myself to be sure. Today I can clearly see that the inner provocations I experienced in high school were my earlier calls to teach others not to willfully be victims of the groupthink mentality. The summer that I took biology for the second time turned out to be another memorable experience from my high school years. My new teacher, a woman named Olive Fletcher, was one of the best teachers I have ever had, anywhere. He took the time to get to know me as a young man who had all this potential but was filled to the brim with confusion and pain. She took me bowling, I dropped them. Here was a teacher who cared and wanted to spend time talking to me, instead of to me. Mrs. Fletcher made me look inward and treasure what I found there. If I had agreed with my original biology teacher and put together a collection of sheets, I may never have had the opportunity to meet a caring and compassionate teacher who modeled for me the kind of practices I would adopt when I became a teacher. The biggest irony in this story is that years later, I had just finished my PhD studies and was given a position as a visiting professor. I was teaching a course at the College of Education that was a requirement for graduate students who were practicing teachers and would like to become school administrators. There, on my list sheet, was a familiar name. The same man who gave me a failing grade in biology was enrolled in the course he was teaching. There are no accidents. I enjoyed imagining that he would send him to Australia to complete his collection of sheets, a requirement of the course. I never actually brought up the high school incident and I don't think he even remembered it. I am so grateful for any divine intervention that was so moving that I placed a copy of Thoreau's Walden in the principal's office when I was just a few years old. I can't explain why this man's words rang so true to me in my early years in high school, 
but it was the beginning of a lifelong love affair with this 20th century American philosopher who only published two books in his life. Life. Over the years, I have visited many homes of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau in Concord, Massachusetts. In fact, on one visit I was so moved by the Thoreau Lyceum that I convinced the curator of the museum, which was once Thoreau's study and home, to allow me to lie on his bed and sit at the desk where he wrote the essay. About the civil disobedience that moved me so much as a teenager. From my perspective here today, I can see quite clearly that Emerson and Thoreau have watched over me with angels for most of my adult life, his words are like beacons of light in a cloudy world. I first realized his messages of transformation and heightened awareness as a child sitting in the principal's office, but I knew then that something magical was being introduced into my life. I felt chills inside me when I walked into that conference with my mother and Mr. Wolf, because I had an ally, an ally that the school officials supported. Why else would they leave that book there so conspicuously for me to read at a time when it clearly cried out for some kind of civil disobedience? I felt Thoreau's presence with me then, and he is here with me now as I tell you how powerful the first transcendentalists were in my teenage life, and still are today. Today it seems clear to me that this independent thinking giant was with me as I formed self-reliance memes during my teens. He was there with me when I went to his house, lay down on his bed, sat at his desk, and meditated in his personal lair, and he was with me while I was filming a PBS special in his hometown. He is with me now as I write, reminding me that we are never alone and that we can invoke the spiritual essence of any teacher who has ever breathed on this planet and fulfill our own destiny with their help. I clearly see that my adolescent stamina became the basis of the unstoppable energy that I feel within me and that it was my way of saying yes to a call to become an international teacher on self-reliance and increased awareness. The great Tao, God, works in mysterious ways, and who can say that Thoreau himself did not intervene in my life as a teenager and put me on a path that I continue to travel. I'm talking to Mrs. Olive Fletcher, my former biology teacher, who gave me an A in the same course that I had previously failed due to an irresistible force meeting an immovable object and I had to give in. I tell him, this year I am going to write my own novel. I know I can write and I have an idea for a book that I want to try. I am fascinated by the idea of an extraordinary conscience. In my mind, it is a level of consciousness that allows instant manifestation, telepathic communication, self-healing, and extraordinary powers to communicate with angelic beings. I imagine a fictional character who possesses these otherworldly qualities. He has achieved divine God realization and has a job as a paleontologist at an archaeological dig. I call my book The Anomalous Countryman, and every night I escape to a quiet place and let my fantasies flow. My handwritten tome grows and I keep it secret in big brown paper bags in the little attic of our house. I love these low-key, hidden moments where I escape the fictional characterizations I create. I love to read and am always in the middle of a new book. Most of my friends hate reading and never consider writing an occupation. Clearly, in his way of thinking, writing is for nerds and fags. In English class, each student has a manila folder for book reports on their reading during the semester. The more reports, the more a student is regarded as a budding scholar. When I don't have cash, I write and sell book reports on 25 cents each to supplement my income. If the grade received is less than B, I do not request payment. Now I work as a writer and therefore I feel confident that I have the ability to write, I have tested it in the real world of profit and loss. I write on any subject and often think of my writing as automatic writing. My hand moves across the page, but it's not really me who writes. It's a kind of connection to an invisible part of me that occurs when I sit down with a purple pen in hand and let the words form on the paper under my moving fingers. I feel more at home when I have a writing assignment. I love writing tests, knowing that my writing skills will help me overcome any flaws I may have in the material I am writing about. My writing is like having a friend with me at all times. I love my space where I escape every day to give life to my characters, although the story is becoming less important, 
it's just the chance to sit in a sacred space with a blank sheet of paper staring at me that I really enjoy. When I take the time to write about my novel, I think to myself, writing is not something that I do. It is what I am. I like to feel it and say and remember, I am writing. What gives me the greatest sense of accomplishment is feeling aligned with who I am on the planet in the first place. That's what writing is like for me. I still frequently withdraw to my writing space, as I have for many years, and feel safe and closer to my source of being when surrounded by personal photos and memories in what I call my sacred writing space. Even in my teens I was aware that writing would play an important role in my life. I came alive on the inside while reading Thoreau and Emerson in high school, and had a sense of fulfillment and doing what they sent me to do while writing my novel, as well as a collection of personal essays on topics like avoiding group thinking. All things are possible and how to really know God and live forever. This was a hobby when I was young that I happily added to a full-time scheduled job and one-time high school curriculum. Full. As I wrote book report summaries for my friends, I knew I had something special. When I wrote essays on topics that refused to quiet my thoughts, the feedback I received was a variation of, you really should consider writing. I often heard that he had a way of putting things on paper that made sense. When I went to the Navy and then to college, what I enjoyed the most was that my writing gave me a kind of confirmation that I didn't need anything outside of myself to earn a living. I loved knowing that I had all the tools I needed to become completely self-sufficient. I didn't want to have to go to a workplace and be told what to do and how to think, I wanted to listen to my inner voice and write what I thought in my own way, and know that I could make a living without everything. Of the onerous requirements that seemed to come with being an employee. I was already an employee, many weeks working more than 40 hours, and I did not feel free. But when I wrote and people paid me, or when I finished a chapter in my book and realized that I could sell my novel and whatever else I wrote, I felt like I had been invited to sit on God's lap and just say what I wanted. I wanted to say and get paid for it as my bonus. Now I can see that I was destined to have no bosses, judges, employers, rules, just my own internal vocations. I look back at my early writing days and the inner consciousness that spoke aloud to me of the freedom I would one day know. Following my instincts and my good feelings that always arose when I took my pen in hand and declared myself a writer although no one else shared the same opinion yet I followed the vocation of my soul. It was enough for me to claim it and declare myself an expert in what I was so passionate about. I hate you so much. How could he just walk away from his kids and never make a phone call to see if we're okay? I want to smash your face, I'm so mad at you. At night my anger and pain erupt into dreams where I yell at my father. Almost every morning I wake up in a cold sweat after these late night encounters. I dream that I get angry when I see it and demand answers. This man I have never seen in waking life remains distant and disinterested, indifferent to whatever I am saying to him in my dream state. Although I have no recollection of this man, and I know the stories about the mistreatment of my mother and my grandparents, I am perplexed by his continued indifference towards the three children left by some. Fifteen years ago. I have heard stories of how he stole jewelry from my grandmother, spent time in prison for robbery, and refused to work to support his family, along with his constant womanizing, drinking, and sexual violence. Most egregiously, he simply walked out of our lives, never making a phone call to see how his three children were doing or how they were doing with the paltry sum of money he was supposed to provide for child support. No, Melvin Lyle Dyer just disappeared and not once did he look back. Now I live with my brothers and our mother, since Bill Drury has finally left the chicken coop. Jim and Dave are not interested in finding and confronting our father, but I am. My night dreams reveal a young man deeply in conflict over his father's abandonment. I try to get my mother to describe him, but she refuses except to say that he was an absolute jerk, a fast-talking con artist, who steals money wherever he goes and refuses to take on the responsibilities of parenthood. She remembers a job she had, selling door-to-door -door brooms and brushes for an agency for the blind. When he forgot to hand over the money he raised, 
he was fired. Although my mother has nothing positive to say about this man who is my father, I want to meet him. My outrage and anger insist that I confront him and ask to hear his version of events. I think about him every day, imagining that I will accidentally run into him and have a long conversation about what motivated him to leave behind a beautiful woman and three children under the age of five. I want to know if you knew me or if you had any feelings of love for this boy who is fast becoming a man. I'm trying to locate him so we can talk. I make phone calls to his relatives and get some clues as to his whereabouts, somewhere in the deep south, but I never make contact. I have a fantasy that I am finally going to meet this man who so mysteriously left my life, and that we are going to solve these internal problems that I have related to abandonment. I ask questions incessantly and I can see that my mother is greatly threatened by my curiosity about my father. My brothers don't ask and they just don't want to know more. Perhaps my older brother Jim remembers some of our father's abusive actions towards our mother and us and that explains his disinterest. Maybe you just want to leave it all behind. My mother hates him so much that I usually answer my questions, he was not good and you better not know him. I stop chasing my curiosity about him with her, but my soul yearns to know more, talking to him, hearing his views and explanations, to maybe even discover that he really loved me even though he chose to stay away. I often think that perhaps he made the noble decision to stay away, knowing in his heart that his presence in my life would not be the best for me, and that his departure was a selfless decision rather than a selfish one. Regardless, the absence of a father in my life is huge for me as a teenager. I'm curious, I desperately want to find it. And the bitterness I feel turns into a fury that manifests itself in the frenzied dreams of violence that I express to him in my lethargy. I promise myself that even though everyone in my immediate family feels that I should drop the matter and be grateful that this loser of a man is out of my life, I will go after him and talk to him one day him man to man to get the answers I want. I am not satisfied with simply letting go as those around me urge me. I want to meet him. I want to hear it directly from him. I want him to know that I exist and, yes, I very much want him to love me. On Valentine's Day 1956, our phone rings on our shared line at Tuxedo 15942. I'm called by an aunt I never knew or haven't even heard of. Her name is Audrey and I learned that she is my father's half-sister. She tells me that my grandmother Nora Mabel Wilhelm died that morning, and that my two brothers and I were asked to be pallbearers at this woman's funeral. I didn't know my father's mother had been alive, I hadn't even heard her name mentioned, but instantly I say yes. My decision is not based on my desire to pay tribute to a grandmother I never knew, my heart races at the prospect of finally being able to meet my father. He will surely be there at his own mother's funeral and he will no longer be able to hide from me. I have a few weeks to go before the turn and I have my learner's permit, which allows me to drive if accompanied by an older licensed driver. Jim, also designated pallbearer, agrees to let me drive his car up the west side of Detroit to a house full of strangers. I'm here for one reason and one reason only. I want to see this man who is my father. But he is not there. There is a funeral in a church, but not Melvin Lyle Dyer. Then we make a short trip to a cemetery, where I help carry the coffin of a woman who is my grandmother, my father's mother, although a stranger to me. Not Melvin Lyle Dyer in the cemetery. We all return to the house on the west side, the residence of my deceased grandmother. I am full of emotion sure that my father, absent for a long time, will surface. When we re-enter this house for a buffet dinner, a truck pulls up to the house and delivers some puny flowers with a note. We are all informed that Lyle is in South Alabama or Mississippi and cannot be in this final commemoration of his mother's life. I am crestfallen. Once again my father appears missing. A variety of cousins and aunts that I didn't know were related to make excuses for Lyle. They told me he's scared to show up, probably because he's scared my mother will put him back in jail for more than a decade of court-ordered child support payments. I wonder what I am doing here at this memorial service and I urge my brothers to leave. 
However, before we can get away, a cousin named Dorothy says my father had multiple wives after leaving my mother, including a girl he picked up hitchhiking at a place called Blooming Rose, West Virginia, and before that a woman named Juanita, a nurse who now lives in Sandusky, Ohio. I take note, I say goodbye to these unknown relatives and realize for the umpteenth time that this man has no interest in meeting me or my brothers. Even the funeral of his own mother is not attractive enough for him to appear in my life. Now I am more determined than ever to have that face-to-face -face encounter with my father, and I have a pretty good idea of where he might be living. I'm not sure why I'm so obsessed with finding this man who obviously wants nothing to do with me or my brothers, but I'm full of determination. After I comply, I buy a Plymouth with dollar I have saved. I plan to drive to Boone County, West Virginia, and pay a surprise visit to my father and the young hitchhiker I found out he had married. When summer break rolls around, my boss at Stall Market, where I've worked for three years, asks me to work full-time all summer as an assistant manager, which includes closing the store and handling receipts for the day. This opportunity, added to the expense of owning and insuring a car, and my desire to be with my new girlfriend, led me to postpone my trip. Instead, I decide to search for the ex-wife named Juanita in Sandusky, Ohio. I drive three hours to Sandusky and meet my father's ex-wife, who works at a local hospital and speaks firmly and without hesitation. Your father was a bad man, he says bluntly. Everything your mom told you about him is true, and more. He refused to work and maintain our marriage, he was always in trouble with the law, he had no sense of right and wrong, he drank heavily and was mean and vicious when drunk, which was frequent. I recommend that you abandon your desire to meet him. He's a phony and you're much better off without him in your life. Juanita Dyer spends all day with me, and the most disappointing part is her direct response to my question, did she ever tell you something about her three children who had dropped out? Did you ever mention your youngest son? Wayne. She looks at me with the loving eyes of a woman who works as a nurse in a hospital, seeing tragedies day after day. No, she replies. I didn't even know he had children, even though we were married for several years. Such anguish. Do I have a father who doesn't even mention his own children to his wife? What kind of man is this? Don't you love anyone? How could I be so different in every way from the man who is my biological father? My heart is full of love for so many people in my life. My mother, my brothers, my friends and, above all, the oppressed, and even my father. I leave Sandusky determined to crush my interest in finding or understanding Melvin Lyle Dyer. I return to Detroit and dedicate myself to my life as an assistant manager of a local grocery store, earning a living and helping my mother financially. I have encountered a myriad of obstacles in trying to locate this man who is on the run, who leaves the anguish wherever he temporarily settles, but the yearning to meet him never goes away. Bad dreams continue for years. It will be 20 years before I can recognize him as my best teacher. As much as I wanted my father to show up and love me when I was a child, I now value his absence as one of the best gifts I've ever been given. His rebellion and abandonment of me was really part of my coming here to teach self-reliance, which is the great theme of my life. I have been doing just this since I was a child and it has mastered my entire life's work. It is so clear that there are no mistakes in this universe. The stars are all aligned. The sun is the exact distance from Earth, to the millimeter, to create and sustain life. There is a precision in this universe, whether looking through a telescope or a microscope, that defies intellectual understanding. Everything is perfect down to the smallest subatomic particle and towards the most distant celestial body. Included within this clarification is everything that is presented to us as well, although the understanding of why is often not obvious. I needed to be in a position to trust myself if I wanted to fulfill my own purpose and live my dharma to be a self-reliant spiritual master. The years I spent in foster care gave me the opportunity to learn this firsthand. I had to trust myself, there was no one there to do it for me. 
my relationship with my father was going to be the most important relationship of my life. My wish for him to show up for me on my schedule, when I thought I needed him so desperately, was my own ego at work. Everything manifests in divine time. We get what we need on the program from a force much greater than ourselves. This invisible force moves the pieces in its own way, in its own time, to harmonize with the perfect precision that defines every cubic centimeter of space and time. It may seem far-fetched to some, but I think my life without the benefit of a father was perfect in every way. From this point of view, I see that my books, lectures, films, and recordings came about because my father was absent from my life. My ego wanted it, but my spirit knew it had a much greater purpose to fulfill. Those years spent in agony over why and how a man could be so callous, so cruel, so distant, always ended up leaving me with no choice but to go inside and solve the problems myself, or turn to a new perspective. A kind of divine love practiced only by great spiritual teachers and by God himself, a love awash with forgiveness. It was providing me with everything I needed to stay on track in my life, even though the child I was couldn't know at the time. Today, from the perspective of looking back at my life, I can see that everything was absolutely perfect. Unbeknownst to me, I was in some kind of training from the beginning. Perhaps my father agreed to come to this world from the spirit world and live his own life in such a way that it would require his youngest son to learn to live a life of self-reliance as a young child, a teenager, and later a young adult. Having the opportunity to send love and forgiveness to my father for all his wicked and fickle behavior was perhaps a training stage to help millions of people transform their own lives with a vision aligned with a God-realized perspective. I feel my father's presence frequently, and whenever I feel him close, it is like a soft mist of infinite love rather than the fierce storms of anger and anguish that previously typified my thoughts about this man. Yes, he was my best teacher. I know for sure that God works in mysterious ways, but not accidentally. In fact, it is and always has been perfect in every way. I am very grateful. The prospect of being drafted into the military and serving as an infantryman is one of the scariest scenarios I can imagine. Being a worker at one of Detroit's auto companies, which my neighborhood has done many years after finishing high school, is also very unattractive to me. So I have chosen to enroll in the Navy, as my older brother Jim did two years ago. Here I am two weeks later in Great Lakes, Illinois, feeling sick to my stomach as I wonder, what have I done to myself? In my bunk early in the morning, I take stock of my new life. Last night I counted hundreds of cockroaches crawling on clothing, bedding, and sleeping bodies, if he wanted to, he could have counted to infinity. The place is invaded by these vermin that live in the crevices until the lights go out, and then they come out in swarms, feasting on crumbs and living their nightly destinations. I choke at the thought of them sliding over my face, but roaches are less of a problem. I have lived in many places and learned early in life not to judge my circumstances. I have no allergies, I have no foods that I will not eat, and I have no aversion to bodily functions. Not that I have a hard time adjusting to living in close quarters with hundreds of men in the confined spaces of the company's headquarters here at the Great Lakes Naval Station. Roaches and stinky bathroom smells are nothing compared to what is expected of me as a full-time active duty member of the military, where the rules govern. The rules are that I never think for myself. I must obey any order that any superior gives me and never question that order. Disobedience has serious consequences, including confinement. There is a chain of command operating at all times, and I must accept my role as the lowest of the lowest, to do what I am told to do and what everyone else is told to do as well. There is no individuality here. I just have to say, yes, sir. And obey. They tell me what time to go to sleep, when to wake up, what and when to eat, and what to wear which is the same as everyone else is wearing. My hair is cut short, my shoes must be polished with saliva, and my face must be clean-shaven and inspected several times a day by a superior who barks in my face that I am an insignificant dwarf, to which I must answer, yes. Mr. 
or incur their feigned anger and receive some kind of foolish punishment. Although I am not thinking in these terms at this time, I believe that on some level this cannot be the place for someone who has incarnated in this earthly domain to teach self-reliance. There is no way to escape this military mentality. They are teaching me that there is no self and that I will trust my superiors and their rules for any identification that I may require. I will wear the same uniform for the next four years, and I will settle or be absent without permission, the penalty of which is a long period in jail and an undesirable discharge. I choose to accept this destiny, knowing that I am something much more than a body, and whatever you decide to do to my body, I have the option of being in a state of inner peace. I can live by the rules. I make the decision to be obedient and can even recognize the need for this arrangement in an organization designed to participate in war. Doing what you are told without thinking or asking questions is necessary when the overall goal is to destroy an enemy. I decide that I will abide by the rules on the outside, but I will never agree on the inside. I will do these four years with honor, but within myself I will have no enemies. I will be constant, convinced that I am a man of peace, treasuring and respecting the individuality of all. I am at peace with this new regulated way of life, confident in my ability to be self-sufficient and continue to function within the military system. I abhor silly regulations and inspections, and I know myself well enough to be sure that I will finally find a way around them without anyone knowing what I'm doing. My inner world is safe and I will make a fun game to get around the insanity of this way of life. In general, I am perplexed by what I see in my fellow young sailors. Whenever I am given a few moments of leisure, I realize that these grown men are happily reading comics, Superman, Captain Marvel, Batman and Robin, Archie. Most of them have reading levels and interests quite different from mine, yet these are the people I live with day and night. On our first freedom, we have the opportunity to spend a weekend in Chicago, with a deadline to be back on base at 10 p.m. on Sunday night. In my uniform, I go to the city by train and spend my time walking. I speak to many of the merchants who are eager to profit from these newly released young men trying freedom for the first time in two months. The city is full of cheap tattoo parlors, bars, prostitutes, and souvenirs, of which I see my colleagues enthusiastically partaking in their newfound freedom. I return early to the Great Lake space and the barracks begin to fill with several hundred severely drunk sailors. Three out of four of my fellow sailors have had their bodies inked with large permanent tattoos, and they are all swearing and hurling racial slurs in their states of drunkenness and uncontrolled vomiting. Does anyone read books? I wonder. Will these really be my friends and comrades for the next four years of my life? I know that it is impossible for me to permanently disfigure my body with symbols of the US Navy or anything else. For a long time I have despised drunken behavior and now I am surrounded by it. I have been writing my own novel and now I am locked in a world where comics, profanity and prejudice abound. I despise violence of any kind, and now I am being groomed to be an instrument of slaughter, to carry a guard weapon, to take pride in exterminating assigned enemies. I become much more introspective and lonely. What the hell am I doing here? I ask myself over and over again. This is not what I'm here in the world for. I see the reason for the existence of an army, but that is not my role. I am a fish out of water. I want to be a person who strives to create a world where weapons, battleships, hates, and enemies are extinct. I am puzzled because I made this decision willingly. It seemed precisely the right thing to do when I graduated from high school. I had no idea that this military lifestyle was designed to stifle all forms of independent thought. I think of all the times that I had conflicts with authority figures who constantly pushed me towards a groupthink mentality. I think of a quote from E.E. E. Cummings that I memorized in high school English class, to be no one but yourself, in a world that is doing its best, day and night, to become everyone else, means fight with all your might battle that any human being can fight and never stop fighting. And here I am, trapped in an organization that I freely joined and that is organized around the principle of making everyone be like everyone else. 
During my adjustment period to get used to the strict requirements of military life, I felt as if I had made the biggest mistake of my life by signing up for a four-year stint on active duty. From this vantage point of viewing it from a distance, everything is clear and crystal clear to me. As I made the decision to join the military at the age of, I can remember feeling that in some mysterious way I was being guided by an invisible hand. I knew beforehand that this kind of regulated lifestyle was going to be anathema to me, in large part because I had always defended the right to freely make my own decisions without anyone telling me how to live and what to do. Yet there I was, talking to a Navy recruiter in downtown Detroit and signing an agreement to enlist in a few weeks. It was as if I had to go through with this crazy urge, although I also knew it was going to be a monumental conflict for me. What I know for sure is that to understand something intellectually, one must study it, analyze it, reflect on it, examine what others have said about it, review formulas about it, and finally come to a conclusion and do an examination of it, get a passing grade after all these brain maneuvers. But to get to know and understand something spiritually, one must experience it, there is no other way. You could write in endless detail about the flavor of an avocado, compare its taste to other foods, and ultimately give them a written speech on this topic. However, the only way to know the feeling of eating an avocado is to experience it. As you eat it, you become one with it, and you know it, beyond any possibility of transmitting the experience to anyone else. I knew I didn't like being told how to live my life. I knew I was rebelling against authority dictating to me, but for this to really bring me home spiritually, where it would have a huge impact on me and send me in the direction of teaching self-reliance and self-actualization as a lifetime assignment, I had then to experience it firsthand. I've often cited the idea that the storms in our lives, the tough times, the tough times, are things to be thankful for. My brother David lived through more than 50 years of alcoholism, a compulsive nicotine addiction, ruthless shyness and distrust, and an atheistic outlook on life. And then when he was, a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease that he was told was incurable and would lead him to life as an invalid changed everything. My brother decided to quit drinking and smoking, started writing every day, lost his shy personality traits, and started speaking in public to large audiences. He found God and volunteered to serve others who were less fortunate, and he published his book. He attributes all of these changes in his life to his Parkinson's diagnosis, his best teacher. That in order to stand on the path that I signed up for in this incarnation, I had to really experiment and know what it was that I didn't like. Those years in the military where I was expected to fit in and become like everyone else offered me the opportunity to experience firsthand what I didn't like so strongly, and then to seek and live from a perspective of knowing what I had to do, when that regulated time was over for me. I am very grateful for those first experiences. My intense dislike for all things authoritarian prompted me to be equally fervent in living and teaching what I love and what I believe in. From this perspective, I know that gratitude should be expressed for all that, even for the things that seemed so unbearable at the time. There was a reason for me to be pushed in that direction, and every day I am grateful. Today, with my diagnosis of leukemia, I can welcome it and know that it will take me to a higher place, just as my military experiences did more than 50 years ago. Behind me, I am in Bainbridge, Maryland, attending school for six months to become a radio operator and cryptographer. The school is arduous, with daily classes from early in the morning to late at night, and requires evening study. We spend our mornings learning Morse code, converting dot and dash sounds into letters, and we have tests every other day. My classes also include study in the areas of communications, electronics, physics, learning to operate the latest equipment, encoding and decoding, and mastering typing. My subconscious mind is learning to automatically respond when I hear sounds in my headphones. I am fully committed to pursuing this six-month academic adventure with excellence, and I remember that when I choose to apply, I can literally master any discipline. In high school, when I loved a subject, I invariably received in a grade. When I wasn't interested, I just dropped out, 
regardless of whether I got a passing or failing grade. Here at the School for Radio Operators I am a determined young sailor, I strive not only to pass the course, but to do so with distinction. Upon graduation, I am among the best in my class. My best friend in Bainbridge is a one-year-old named Ray Dudley from Chicago. We study together, we bond as brothers and basically we become inseparable. When we leave base to go to Baltimore or Washington DC, for a weekend, we often do it together. Ray and I return to base after a weekend in DC. It is the afternoon of a Sunday night and we must return to the Bainbridge base before midnight. We decided to stop in the small town of Haver de Grace, Maryland, and have a plate of fried rice, since we haven't eaten all day. It's a cheap meal for two starving sailors in United States Navy uniforms before the 10-mile cab ride to base. I'm surprised when I hear, sorry guys, we can't serve you at this restaurant. I ask the waitress why it is like this, the restaurant is open until midnight and there are many soldiers who return eating. She looks at me shyly and just shrugs and points to my best friend, an American. Military member of the Navy who serves his country as a member of the armed forces, and then hits me square in the face, as if someone had just brutally punched me. Ray is African American and in this small town in Maryland they do not serve people who do not have white skin. I ask to speak to a manager, but no one of higher authority appears. The waitress doesn't want to have a nasty scene, but I'm outraged and embarrassed for my friend. Ray has lived with these kinds of prejudices his entire life and he gestures for me to quietly leave to avoid any possibility of serious conflict. He had never experienced the horror of racial prejudice like this. I am puzzled, deeply saddened, and very hurt for my friend. But more than this, I am outraged by the folly of refusing to serve another human being who wears the uniform of the armed forces of his country, and who is willing to go to war and die so that the opportunity to live and breathe is preserved. Freely. For everyone, even restaurant owners and waitresses who work there. I apologize to Ray as we return to our barracks at Bainbridge Naval Base. I promise myself that I will never, ever judge anyone on the basis of their appearance. I am moved to the core. I am forever changed. I will dedicate my life to rid the world of that stupid thought. Every day for the rest of my time at Bainbridge, I am obsessed with what I, as a single man, can do to eradicate this kind of simplistic behavior. It is the mission of my life. I am committed to being a man who does not judge anyone. That Sunday night at Haver de Grace still stands out as one of the most influential nights of my life, even though it was more than years ago. That moment of looking my friend Ray in the eye and seeing the pain that prejudice can cause inspired me to commit myself to abolishing prejudice from my own way of being, and to incorporate this love for all humanity as a cornerstone of my work. Life. From that night on, I became aware of my own propensity to label people based on any external factor, and I began to walk a path where I could see the development of the spirit in every person I encountered. In many respects, that year's experience as a sailor was divinely orchestrated. I had to be there as a witness and as an unwitting participant for the horror of this type of behavior to drive me home. That unfortunate waitress was only reacting due to the innate conditioning that cultural circumstances had imposed on her as a child. He saw the mistreatment of dark-skinned people and accepted it as the right thing to do. She was also an employee who was simply doing what they told me to do, it's my job. This mindset has been the driving force behind countless heinous acts throughout the centuries. To replace these habits with compassionate rather than judgmental behavior, people must examine how their subconscious minds have been programmed and then begin to change these habitual ways of being. In 1959 I began to do just that. I had heard a lot of nigger slash spick slash kike slash dago slash polish talks growing up over the years and while I don't recall using that language in my life, I know I witnessed it regularly and it didn't stir up any feelings of outrage within me. My experience with Ray Dudley changed me. I began a slow transformation of expressing my disdain for that language without making a scene. I started reading books on the topic of prejudice and hatred, and I lashed out at Navy policies where segregation was an established norm. 
When I look back at two of the most important themes in my writing and in my adult development, they both go back to that painful night in Maryland. The first of these topics is teaching people how to have a mind of their own, regardless of what they have been taught to believe. If I know that it is wrong and that it is not in harmony with the divine love espoused by our most revered spiritual teachers, then regardless of what they have taught me, I must think for myself and always come from a place of love. If we are told that God is love, then we should not say so in our place of worship during a weekly ceremonial church service. We must live it. The second topic involves the subconscious mind in which adult habits are rooted. I wrote about my time in radio school learning Morse code. I practiced and practiced until I went from an activity of the conscious mind to a permanent place in my habitual subconscious mind. I have not used Morse code in more than half a century, and every part of the programming is still present in my being. I can still spell any word or sentence instantly in my mind using the dots and dashes that were placed there several decades ago. Likewise, we all have other ideas that we call memes, which drive our behavior today. Although they may not serve us well, they are still there operating, just like my unconscious tapping for Morse code today. That waitress at the Haver de Grace restaurant in 1959 represented both themes. She was doing what she was told to do, despite her body language saying, I don't really feel that way, I'm just doing my job, and he was also acting off a series of memes that he had never had a chance to correct and then completely eradicate from his subconscious mind. I can still see that waitress and my young African-American friend Ray Dudley in my mind as I write these words. I believe they were both sent into my life that Sunday night to help me not only see the light but teach from a more enlightened perspective. We are in the middle of winter of 1959, I have been temporarily assigned to a brief tour of duty at the Patuxent River Naval Air Station in Lexington Park, Maryland. I decide to put on my uniform and hitchhike home to Detroit to visit my mother, and especially my girlfriend, Linda, who is enrolling at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. It is a distance of about 590 miles, and it usually takes 12 to 14 hours. Being in uniform usually means that someone will stop and take me no matter where I am stranded. I made this trip several times and am confident that I will be able to get home on Saturday morning, have a full day and a half at home, and then return to base for a Sunday midnight curfew. It's a long, time-consuming road hitchhiking trip, but well worth it for a nostalgic, in love sailor who is starting to get used to being away from home for long periods of time. I set off on my weekend excursion and took a ride to Washington DC several connections later I arrive at the Breezewood entrance to the Pennsylvania Turnpike. It is now close to midnight and the temperature has dropped dramatically. In the freezing cold I managed to take a westbound ride, but the driver informs me that it will only go as far as Butler, Pennsylvania. He does not want to leave me at the exit in the middle of the night because I would be in serious danger of freezing to death, it is far below zero and the winds are blowing fiercely. I'm wearing a navy blue pea coat and standing in the dark without being seen by drivers heading west on the turnpike could be disastrous. This amiable driver insists on dropping me off at one of the service plaza restaurant stops on the turnpike just before his exit, a few miles down the road. I agree. I walk into the restaurant around 3 in the morning, have a cup of hot cocoa, and then head out to try my luck taking a westbound vehicle, in the middle of the night, in the middle of what feels like nowhere, in half. The coldest weather I've ever experienced. On my way up the ramp in the icy darkness, I pass another sailor returning to the restaurant. He has had no luck getting a ride and he says, it's very cold, buddy. I wouldn't stay there too long it could easily freeze if you're not careful. I admit, I wish him well and am heading to the turnpike. I stay there for a few minutes, with no luck. Almost frozen, I decide to go back to warm up. When I enter the restaurant there is only one person in the place, the sailor who spoke to me a few moments before, warning me not to stay too long. Imagine my surprise when I realize that the sailor is my brother. Jim is stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. He had also decided to hitchhike home to see our mother and her fiancé, Marilyn, 
for the weekend, he too had been left in the exact same place. I had no idea Jim Sub was even in port. I hadn't had any contact with my brother in months, as his whereabouts on the submarine were considered classified information. My own brother had spoken to me and warned me to be careful without even knowing it was me. Together we stood in disbelief at the mysterious forces that were at play to make the scene come true. We meet the driver of a gassing wheeler and tell him about the incredible coincidence that just happened. This synchronous event that brought Jim and me together in the middle of nowhere under these impossible conditions so shocks the truck driver that it takes us out of his way, straight to our front door in. 20,217 Moross Road in Detroit early Saturday morning. I can't begin to tell you how many times Jim and I have shared the above story in the last 50 years and the bottom line is always the same, it's just one of those strange coincidences that pops up and defies rational explanation. This event was deeply meaningful to the one-year-old sailor that he was. It introduced me to the world of synchronicity, quantum physics, and the idea that there are no accidents in a world governed by divine intelligence. Today I look back at all the events that had to come together perfectly for my brother and I to have that meeting in the middle of the night all those years ago, and it doesn't surprise me anymore. My life has been full of these kinds of events, but this was the first big event that really caught my attention and changed my way of looking at things forever. I can clearly see that I had to get rid of all doubts about the possibility of all things coming together in divine order and divine time. My writing and my speech have been dominated by this great idea of synchronicity, which is a term coined by Carl Jung to explain what he called meaningful coincidences. The synchronous incident that brought this to Jung's attention occurred during a session with a client who was relating a dream. As your client pondered the meaning of a beetle in the dream, they both heard a noise, which turned out to be a beetle at the window, that caught their attention. Now I see that this synchronous event with my brother, which goes beyond logical thinking and defies the incredible odds of something like this happening by chance, was necessary in order to open myself to the possibility that all things are connected and on purpose. Personally, I needed to free myself from my own excessive rationalism at this point in my life. To eventually write and talk about the world of spirit, I needed to know at an early age that there are no accidents or coincidences in a universe that is truly created and guided by invisible forces that elude rational explanation. Now I see that we have no idea how something is created in this physical universe and that everything originates from something called spirit, which no one can define or come close to explaining, including our greatest scientific minds. There are many reasons to believe that there is intelligence behind life. As Max Planck, a great scientific mind who received the Nobel Prize in Physics, pointed out, all matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force that makes the particle of an atom vibrate and holds together this tiny solar system of the atom. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. This being so, then all that intelligence is innate in each creation of that intelligence, which means that it is in everything and everyone and is directing the entire work. This intelligence is so tremendously mysterious that it is capable of creating worlds and galaxies so vast that they stun even the most open imaginations. An intelligence that can keep the entire universe in perfect balance and create a rose from scratch, an intelligence that is in all things, the spirit that gives life, as Jesus said. This invisible intelligence can and does create miracles every second of every day. Bringing two brothers together in the middle of the Pennsylvania Turnpike is a minor achievement compared to creating life out of nothing and bringing together an infinite number of celestial bodies to form an entire universe. I cannot conceive of a watch without a watchmaker, so it is impossible for me to believe that this universe exists without an intelligence that is the matrix of all matter, a creator. When I look back on this experience of synchronicity that occurred in 1959, it clearly seems to me that it has opened my eyes to the possibility of a divine design that provides clues to our destiny. Then I felt that both Jim and I were involved in a collaboration with destiny, and I began to consciously consider my contribution. I wanted to align my life with this miraculous invisible energy. I began to choose a mindset that was aware that I was much more than a mere human form, 
that I was spirit himself, that the life within me was truly divine. When I stepped back and watched from this place of total faith in my own magnificence and my connection to this great invisible spirit, I began to be a co-creator of more and more synchronous events. This experience was the first I remember that surprised me to see that life was not exclusively factual and physical. I was and still am convinced that an event of this nature is not a coincidence. From that day on I began to think in new ways. I did not share this newly awakened consciousness with anyone at the time. But I knew that I was involved in something much bigger than simply following the movements of life as it was delivered to me. I began to listen to the silence that seemed to whisper softly about my inner life and about seemingly miraculous events. It seemed clear to me that there was a synchronous link with everyone and everything, all life was interconnected. I thought of the drivers who dropped me and Jim at the freeway rest stop and began to see them as part of the drama of my life, and me as part of theirs. This was my opening to the awareness of the divine force moving through our lives. From my perspective of looking back at this event so many years later, I clearly see that I was beginning to free myself from the chronological form of cause and effect that I had been taught to think about. I was beginning to cultivate a mind that is truly open to everything and is not attached to anything. It seems like the one-year-old self welcomed the discovery of this theme that would eventually permeate her life's work, giving up and knowing that everything is exactly how it's supposed to be. Albert Einstein was right, there are only two ways to live life. One is as if nothing is a miracle. The other is as if everything is a miracle. Or as Buddha said if we could see the miracle of a single flower clearly, our whole life would change. This miraculous event allowed me to see clearly and begin to co-create my own life. And teaching others how to co-create their lives too. As I look back, I give thanks for all the participants who collaborated to bring about this wonderful awakening in me. It is the summer of 1960 and I'm a communications specialist aboard the world's largest ship, the USS Ranger. We are at home port in Alameda, California, following a six-month tour of naval bases and hotspots in the Western Pacific, including Japan, Hong Kong, the Philippines, and Hawaii, and we are now back in the continental United States. Suddenly, this announcement reverberates through the ship's speakers, you will report to the flight deck and stand in a formation that says hello Ike as President Eisenhower flies over our ship in a helicopter. I am outraged by this order to meet with several thousand of my colleagues and participate in this absurd spectacle so that one man can look down and see this message, written by a group of sailors in white hats. In no way can I be part of a group that acts like a flock of geese doing what they have been told to do, for no sensible reason that I can understand. I detest this mentality and find such stupid activities deeply insulting and an affront to my dignity. I am a third-class petty officer, a trained professional with monumental responsibilities. I am not at all willing to be gathered in a group to stand in the hot sun dotting the I in Hello Ike in order to make a political statement for the Republican Party during this election year. It is a constant struggle for me to maintain my own uniqueness and continue to function within an organization that does everything possible to suppress any thoughts of individuality. The name of the game is Groupthink. The rules are, do what you are told and don't ask questions, forget about your pride, your ego, your desire to have a mind of your own, obey all orders and suppress any thoughts of contesting offensive orders. I know I have less than two years to serve and then I will break free from this mindset. I want an honorable discharge. I want to go to college and become a teacher. I want to spend the rest of my enlistment avoiding any confrontation about my inner pride. But, and this is a big but, I just can't afford to participate in this charade. For the past two years, I have successfully avoided most of the military exercises that cause resentment in my soul. I learned to be in other places legally when those mortifying inspections are called, and I have not told anyone about it. I know not to make waves and draw attention to myself, I call it being quietly effective. I know what an outrage to my soul is and I don't need to file a federal case on it. I hate inspections so I find out when they are scheduled and assign myself to do something else while they are done. When they tell me to carry a gun and stand guard, I get a permit to be elsewhere. 
I hate weapons and instruments of death. I don't want to give a speech about it, I just don't want to have these vile killer devices on my person at any time. I am pleased with myself for figuring out how to stay within the system and still avoid the parts of the system that violate my own personal internal standards. As the enlisted sailors head to the flight deck to tell me how to stand in the formation that says hello, Ike, I head in the opposite direction, down, down, to the lower decks, where I can sit. In solitude until the madness over me subsides. There are too many people for anyone to miss me, no one will ever know that I am lost nor will they ever know how much I despise this. I just can't understand why people who feel so strongly about this as I do, just go ahead and get used in this way. On the other hand, I reason, if everyone handles these kinds of situations like I do, then it would be impossible for me to do what I do, so in many ways I'm grateful for those who just go ahead and settle. It allows me to lose sight of myself without being noticed and still maintain a shred of dignity without explaining myself to people who choose to conform. I meditate in silence and read a novel that is currently on the bestseller list. I am immersed in the story of Atticus Finch fighting the system and fighting prejudice. This is my third reading of Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, although it was released only a few months ago. This is not a book that you read once and then put away. Atticus Finch is an individual of great integrity, a heroic southern Alabama attorney who stands up for what is right. I am captivated when he tells his daughter, Scout, that he could never raise his head in front of his sons again if he did not accept this case. Explain that you must accept it even if everyone thinks you are wrong. As I reread To Kill a Nightingale Below Deck, I am pleased to disagree with the pack of sailors above. I am encouraged by my decision to listen to that calm voice within me that says, you don't have to be like everyone else, there is another way. I can still see myself sitting in an isolated boiler room nine stories below the flight deck reading Harper Lee's book. There's the one-year-old me, in awe of a fictional character who defies pressure to act like everyone else, and instead hears that relentless voice within him beckoning him to follow his heart to be the person he was destined for. To be. The theme of that Hello Ike story has threaded itself through every item on my resume for the past several years. I feel like the persistent and insistent inner call to resist conformity was divinely designed to show me my life purpose. I have never met a person who, after talking to them for an hour or so, did not feel that they had a divinely inspired mission. I felt it deeply throughout my life. And now I know that the experience I had with Harper Lee's Pulitzer Prize winning novel and my cry to escape the scene unfolding on the flight deck of my ship was an important moment in my life. It's as clear to me today, more years later, as it was when I returned to my dorm after everyone was fired from their ridiculous assignment at the top. I often think of these words of St. Paul, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, Romans, smiley face and the great Sufi teaching that instructs us to be in the world, but not to be of it. I have written often about the idea that we are not our body, but infinite beings that continue to occupy a new body at each moment of each day that we live. While escaping from the stupid requirements that the military imposed on my body, a part of me knew that I was also in this world as a body, but did not belong to this corporeal world of form. I was going beyond form, being transformed right there aboard my ship. I can see that those strong urges to be quietly effective and avoid activities that seemed absurd to me were early training exercises to teach me to be self-reliant. At this point, I am deeply grateful that Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird appeared when he did, and for the decision of the powers that be to hold that Hello Ike ceremony. My conscience needed those incidents to inspire me to begin writing essays that eventually became books that encourage millions of people around the world to have the courage to listen to their own inner callings. About a decade ago, when my son had his birthday, I wrote him a letter about what it means to reach this age and become a man, as taught in many spiritual traditions. I ended up giving him the sage wisdom, if you follow the pack, you'll end up getting into shit. The shit I mean is living with yourself when you ignore what you know to be right and true and instead follow the instructions of others who are afraid to leave the herd and want you to be like everyone else. 
I have been assigned a post on the island of Guam in the South Pacific during the final months of my enlistment. I was promoted to Petty Officer Second Class and I am a supervisor at the Naval Communications Center near the town of Agonia. I've been reading editorials and daily stories in the Guam Daily News about discriminatory policy at the naval base. Civilians working in retail stores have the privilege of shopping at these outlets and can therefore take advantage of the significant discounts offered to all active duty military personnel, unless they are a civilian origin employee. Guamino. Then this privilege is not for you. If your skin is dark and you are Guamanian, you are excluded. Once again, this type of discrimination surfaces in my life. This time he is sanctioned by the United States Navy, the military service for which I also work. One Saturday morning, I noticed this ad on the last page of the newspaper. This is an invitation to speak your mind. A dollar. First prize for winning letter on U.S. Navy policy to prohibit purchases at the Navy exchange for civilian employees of Guamanian descent. I know that if I participate in this contest I will win the prize, it will be my first payment for something that I have been doing on a daily basis for the last few years. I have an extensive collection of essays that I have been writing on a wide variety of topics. Writing essays is more than a hobby, it has become a passion. I discover themes everywhere. I am struck by a behavior that could never in a billion years participate in myself, for example, a news clip of people wearing silly hats and chanting a candidate's name at a political convention, standing up to a line of applause, calls for an essay on the inclination of average people to behave foolishly when around others. That they do. I feel that it is very important to trust your own individuality and live from a perspective of being extraordinary rather than ordinary. I have written several hundred essays, having no idea what to do with them, not even why I write them. It is simply my passion, and that inner calling is working overtime on me as I finish my enlistment here on this island in the South Pacific. I submitted my application for the letter writing contest that very night. Two weeks later I receive a phone call from the newspaper informing me that I submitted the winning proposal. Obviously, he had taken the position of supporting local Guamanian civilians and criticizing the Navy's policy of excluding people with special privileges on the basis of their national origin and skin color. I received dollar dot, and my picture appears on the cover of the Guam Daily News in my Navy uniform holding my award. And then all hell breaks loose. I get dozens of angry phone calls, including a death threat. It appears that civilians, most of whom are family members and dependents of active duty personnel in the armed forces, are very upset with the idea that Guatemalan civilians have the same rights that they enjoy. Racial prejudice is evident in the epithets directed at me for supporting these savages and non-Americans. I am in shock. My letter simply defended the equal rights guaranteed by the Constitution, as well as simple impartiality. Why should someone have special benefits that are denied to others simply because of their place of birth? If these advantages are to be granted to civilians, they should be granted to all civilians. It seems so clear and simple to me. They summon me to the commander of the naval forces of the Mariana Islands and inform me that I violated the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which informs me that it requires me to present my opinions to my superiors for their approval before making them public. Because I went ahead on my own and expressed an opinion that was in contrast to existing Navy policy, and because I was photographed in uniform accepting money for writing that opinion, I could be considered for a possible court-martial. I could be demoted and possibly a less than honorable discharge from the military. All this for a simple letter expressing an opinion that seemed so obvious to me. I have a couple of weeks to think about this before the naval forces commander makes a decision, so I immediately jump into action. I write letters to the editors of the Detroit News and Detroit Free Press, two newspapers that I delivered door to door on my 10th birthday, detailing what is happening here in Guam. I also write an extensive letter to the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, explaining the discriminatory policy that exists here in Guam. I tell you how I am threatened for expressing opinions that you spoke so eloquently in your inaugural address a year ago. I make copies of these letters, 
but do not send any of them. I am called by a young ensign who is an assistant to the admiral who is the commander of the naval forces here in the Mariana Islands. He starts lecturing me on what could happen to me and tells me that I have committed a serious violation and that I am being considered for a serious reprimand and possible additional retribution. I am polite, but firm, and determined. I totally believe that the Navy is out of place and is practicing discrimination, something that the Commander-in-Chief has promised to eliminate in our country, and I suppose that this also refers to the armed forces. I tell this officer that I am not afraid of his threats, and while I do not want to jeopardize my next discharge date, and I definitely do not wish to be court-martialed for winning a letter-writing contest on why this guy of bias is improper and even illegal, I will not back down. I show him the copies of the letters I have written and tell him quietly but firmly that this could become a huge monstrosity, not only for the commander of the naval forces but for the entire United States Navy, which until it was only a year or so that they continue to practice segregation policies on their ships at sea and their bases abroad, and I witnessed this outrage throughout my enlistment. I tell you that if I am court-martialed, I will definitely send these letters when the proceedings begin. All of this is said in a very civilized and friendly environment. I am convinced that my superiors have no intention of taking this matter to a court-martial. I think they are intimidating me because of the large number of complaints they have received about an enlisted sailor who had the recklessness to speak publicly about long-established Navy policy. I leave the ensign's office and never hear another word on the matter, although threatening phone calls and letters continue to appear in my room. Even though I was in my early years, they were directing me to be a person who could make a difference, who could stand up to authority for what I believe in and do it without fear. I remember my outrage at the way a minority group of people was being treated unfairly and, as a result of my own intervention in the matter, I would learn that yes, a person with a conscience that was not willing to be intimidated could bring about change, and yes, when I returned to Detroit as a freshman from college, I received a letter from a friend telling me that the discriminatory policy towards Guamanian civilians had been repealed and that they had been granted the same privileges as everyone else civil employees. This was a monumental experience for my own development. It stands out even today, years later, as one of the fundamental lessons he was to learn. After all, it shaped my entire career as a writer and speaker. Somehow, the universe conspired to place me on Guam during the last months of my naval career. It was on that island that I was overwhelmed knowing that not only could I be a writer, but that I could make a living doing it. When I mailed my entry to the Guam Daily News, I had no doubt that the prize money was mine. I felt an invisible source of energy with me as I composed my response to the Navy's misinformed policy of mistreatment of a minority group. When I was notified of my award, I said to myself, I can do anything with the power of the pen. Not only can I change policies, I can impact people's lives with my writing. That little contest on the distant island served as an axis for me to dedicate myself to writing in a big way. Throughout my career as a writer and speaker, I have been telling audiences to trust yourself above all else and never allow any outside force to pull you away from what you feel is your truth. Being there in that admiral's outer office and presenting my case to that young naval officer was a key role I had to play. It was as if my source of being was saying to me, here is a fork in the road. In what direction do you want your life to go? This wasn't something I was doing to prove something, this was going to be a turning point for me, and there was no way I could withdraw and give in to fear. This experience helped launch my career as a writer. I feel like that young ensign was placed there as a guide to everything he was destined to take on in the future. I watched his face as he smiled at my lack of fear for his plans to deal with me in a harsh military manner. He knew he was an ally and he was sure he would do what he asked and make this nonsense go away. At the end of my military enlistment, I was given the opportunity to write for a newspaper and paid to do so, as well as to test my resolve. I was given the opportunity to experience the power of fearlessness and unwillingness to compromise values and be an instrument to overturn immoral politics. I often give thanks to all the people who lined up to accomplish all of this and launched me into the work that I have been doing for so many years. 
the person from the Guam Daily News who decided to run this contest, the forces that determined that I was assigned to this isolated place, the people who called threatening me, thus intensifying my resolve, the young ensign, and so they go on and on. From this perspective, I can clearly see that I was destined to open that newspaper that Saturday morning in Guam and accept the challenge of the letter writing contest. I am so grateful for every moment of that experience, which taught me, never give up, trust yourself, I know you can change the world, be brave, reach out and serve those in need. And never let anyone restrict what you feel inside of you, especially when they try to intimidate you. Oversitting while working on the communications equipment, combined with the tropical humidity, has caused severe pain and some swelling at the base of my spine. It is diagnosed as a pilonidal cyst, which is common in young men, in fact, this diagnosis is more common in underage men. According to the Naval Medic IC in Guam, they have a whole ward of young men suffering from this affliction. I report to the Aganya Hospital, where they assign me the three days prior to the minor surgical procedure to be performed. My duties are to help with the treatment of the other young people who have had their surgeries, I will help clean wounds, change bandages and help disabled sailors with sits baths. The first morning, I am assigned to work with a young sailor who had his surgery the day before. She stands in front of me and takes off her robe, and I see something I'll never forget. Both sides of his buttocks have been cut off and raw meat is exposed at the base of his spine. They tell me to dry and clean the wound after helping him with his sits bath, and then apply an ointment to this naked, oozing flesh followed by a bandage. There are at least a dozen or more men there, all of whom have undergone this surgery in recent days, and those who are healing are helping those who are immobilized and in quite a bit of pain. I shudder to see all these wounds and the amount of flesh that has been cut, leaving permanent damage to their bodies. All I have is pain and some swelling, and I'm looking at what looks to me like an assembly line of radical surgical procedures that will leave permanent damage if I do it within two days. I make the decision right there that this is not for me. I'm not letting these happy young doctors with knives get to work on my ass. I leave the pilonidal cyst room and make an appointment with the head nurse. I inform you that my swelling has disappeared and that I am not in pain, so I will not need your surgical intervention now or ever. I see the doctor and tell him the same story. He insists that I stay one more night to see if my sudden miracle cure holds up the next day after an exam. I stay the night, and all that night I visualize myself as cured. The idea of being cut so drastically motivates me to work on my first self-healing adventure. The next morning I tell the nurse and the medical team that I am cured, that I do not have any symptoms. I refuse to allow them to examine me further and I also decline their efforts to have me sign a surgical permission form. They release me, put me on a bus, and send me back to the naval communications station for duty. All the way back on the bus, my butt still hurts, but I'm noticing a considerable decrease in the symptoms that led me to that madhouse in the first place. For the next several weeks I take my own sits baths at the barracks and practice a kind of visualization technique that I read about in a recently published book that I borrowed from the library. The title is Cybernetic Psycho, by a physician named Maxwell Maltz, and its premise is that the mind-body connection is at the core of successful self-healing. He urges his plastic surgery patients to seek a positive outcome through intense visualization and emphasizes that an attitude adjustment can create miracle cures. I diligently practice the principles that Dr. Maltz elaborates in Psycho-Cybernetics. In four days, my pilonidal cyst disappears and I have no symptoms, without the need for any additional medical treatment. I can't begin to tell you how many times I have expressed my gratitude for the pilonidal cyst that appeared on my coccyx in 1961, and for the three guys whose bottoms I had to treat during my only day at Guam Naval Hospital. This was my introduction to the power the mind can play in healing all kinds of medical diagnoses. Dr. Max Maltz's book became a bible for me during that crisis. I think about how I literally healed myself through intense visualization, and I can see that all the people involved in my life during that experience on Guam were indeed some of my most important teachers. 
After that crisis, I resolved to use my mind to visualize myself as healthy and disease free, and to stay away from the medical mindset, except in the most dire circumstances. I can clearly see that I needed to have that terrifying experience in the hospital to discover the wonderful and mysterious powers that are inherent in our consciousness. As I watched many of my young friends leave for their surgical fix, I spoke to them about what I had learned from Dr. Maltz. Change your image of yourself, he would tell them. You can heal yourself. Honestly, I did it by seeing myself as already healed. Try. But mostly they refused to listen because of the image they had of themselves as unskilled and inept when it came to their own healing abilities. I can clearly see that the experience I described in the naval hospital as a one-year-old sailor was absolutely necessary for me to finally become a master of the power of mind-body medicine. Once it was fully integrated into me, I spent most of the years using these self-healing techniques through visualization. I encouraged many people to change their concepts of themselves and begin to see themselves as the miraculous divine beings that they really are. Clearly, he was meant to believe and teach that with God all things are possible. I have shared scenarios around the world with trained medical teachers who join me in teaching the mind-body connection. Little by little, the field of mind-body medicine has taken hold, and more people are receptive to relying on their healing abilities before seeking drugs, surgeries, and other invasive procedures. For me, this fascinating field of research began back in Guam, where I had a divinely inspired epiphany as I looked at the bloody butt of a young post-operative sailor, and made the decision that there had to be another way. I am thankful for that epiphany, as well as for Max Maltz's publication of his classic cybernetic psycho at precisely the right time in my life. Years later, after a diagnosis of leukemia, I continue to use the techniques that I learned back in Guam in 1961, and I believe and teach the power of the mind to heal anything we put in our imagination with an alignment performed by God. This is a lesson that I have also emphasized in raising my eight children. Looking back, I can clearly see why I had to have that terrifying experience at the time, and today it reaffirms what I know to be true, everything that appears in our lives does for a reason, although sometimes it takes slash hindsight to see it this way. It is the spring of 1961, and I am about to board a military propeller plane to cross the Pacific Ocean. My uncle Bill Volick, a school teacher in Hayward, California, is going to fire me after a two-week leave of absence, which I spent with him and his family. For the past two weeks with my uncle, who was a radio operator aboard a destroyer in the Pacific during the hellish years of World War II, I enjoyed walking with him and observing his teaching style. He is the most popular teacher in his school because he brings the subject to life. I love watching him teach and seeing the affection his students show him. I'm impressed. He's fun, smart, and deeply committed to his work, as well as all of his young students. We spent the afternoons together asking each other questions on all kinds of topics. We joke back and forth, and I try to confuse him and his wife, Barbara, with questionnaires that I have made up. I love the intellectual and philosophical exchange that takes place every night. I love the atmosphere of being in the company of cultured and stimulating people. And I love my uncle, who is by far the most influential man in my life. For me, he is a role model, an intellectual, yes, even a quasi-father. Before boarding, I make myself a promise. I say out loud, I am going to spend the next few months in Guam preparing to attend college and become a teacher. I am alive inside with anticipation and excitement. I want to teach. I'll teach. I will go to college and obtain the necessary credentials to make this dream come true. No doubt. I have found my calling and my Uncle Bill is my inspiration. I have a year and a half in Guam to prepare for what I will do when my discharge date arrives on September 4, 1962. 18 months to find a way to get admitted to a university, which could be quite a challenge since my high school transcript does not predict that I will be ready for college enrollment. I am committed to finding a way that I can pay for tuition and textbook expenses, 
as well as convincing the university that they should bypass my high school records and take a chance and admit me as a full-time student. I decide on my first day on the island that I will save a percentage of my salary for the rest of my time in the Navy and live on the other percentage. All my meals are paid for, I don't have to pay rent or clothes to buy, and I don't drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes. I am determined that I have saved enough money to cover all my tuition expenses during four years of college, as well as being able to buy a used car when I am discharged. I'm sure I can get a part-time job when I go to college. I receive my first paycheck and take the transportation service to the city of Agonia, open a savings account and deposit everything except the percentage of my salary. I'm excited, I'm on my way. I see myself as a college student and I know that I will not be discouraged at all from this commitment. Every month for the next several months, I resolutely follow this ritual, watch my bank account grow, and have a great time proving to myself that I am capable of accumulating wealth even at the paltry salary of a man in the Navy. I watch with interest how many of my fellow sailors waste their money, get drunk, live beyond their means, and barely earn paycheck to paycheck. This is not my way, I am in my own separate reality. I live in a very different world than everyone I work with at the Guam Naval Communications Center. I live in the vision that I have for myself. The small library at the base provides me with a source of books to borrow and read during my free time. I read greedily, jotting down words I can't define. At night, before I go to sleep, I look up the definitions of the words and write them down in my vocabulary improvement file. I am tenacious in this activity and the file is getting heavy. I often spend my afternoons perusing this growing list of word definitions and I notice that new words are beginning to appear in my essays and in the letters I write home. I look more and more like a person educated beyond high school. I spend a lot of time in the library and decide that I will read a minimum of books during my stay in Guam and maintain a bibliography, which is growing rapidly. I eagerly read everything in the library, my sleeping space in the barracks is soon overloaded with all the books I'm reading. I don't tell any of my friends about my intentions. They see me as a bookworm and some kind of private intellectual. I am simply acting on my inner vision to prepare for college. I see myself as a teacher, a university professor, and I act on that inner image every day. I read books on every topic imaginable, preparing for the college entrance exam that happens to be named after me, Wayne State University, at my home in Detroit. In particular, I enjoy reading about people who have gone far beyond being ordinary. Great writers, poets, philosophers, scientists, inventors, musicians, athletes, nothing is off limits. The idea of living at extraordinary levels and transcending normal is extremely attractive to me. I spend much of my free time writing and have amassed a large collection of essays on a variety of topics. These essays seem to write themselves through me, and I feel the pen rush through the pages as the excitement inside me surges at the thought of becoming a writer. I don't share my essays and my growing vocabulary list with anyone, this is my own personal adventure. I seem to have figured out a way out of the present moment, and in fact I feel like I'm living the life I'm so lucidly imagining in my mind. I am a writer. I am an educated man. I'm a teacher. Finally, several of my close friends became interested in what my daily reading and writing means. I describe some of the ideas that seep into me, mentioning William Blake, Emily Dickinson, Plato, Friedrich Nietzsche, Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Thomas Wolfe, among many others. I am talking about the lives of these great thinkers and what they convey in their writings. I speak of existentialism, transcendentalism, and other isms that sound strange to my small group of friends. As they begin to see me as an expert in these subject areas, I do nothing to disabuse them of their faith in me. I am an expert because I am willing to speak as an expert about my interest in these famous experts. At the request of my friends, I organize a conference in a small group. Half a dozen guys show up and we have a discussion that I lead about Albert Camus, a French author and philosopher who had recently passed away. 
We talked about the myth of Sisyphus and Camus's idea that all great deeds and all great thoughts have a ridiculous beginning. Great works are often born on a street corner or revolving door in a restaurant. We discuss the latent greatness in all of us. To my surprise, my friends want more. The following week people show up, including an officer who is not supposed to fraternize with the enlisted men. I am the resident philosopher at the naval base, simply, it seems, by my willingness to live without fear and lose myself in works that are available to everyone in the base library. I love these evening sessions where we can talk about ideas that inspire me to my own greatness. As the time for my discharge approaches, I become acquainted with the education officer at the Naval Communications Center. Write a letter to Wayne State's admissions department requesting that I be allowed to take the entrance exam here on Guam and that he administer and supervise it in the education office. After several months of disputes and, before cell phones or computers, international phone calls, arrangements are made and I have a full day exam scheduled. At the end of the testing day, I'm pretty sure I got it right. Virtually all vocabulary questions are words that have appeared in my massive vocabulary enhancement portfolio. A month later, I received a response from the Wayne State Admissions Officer with whom I have spoken and with whom I have corresponded for the past six months. I have done very well in the entrance exam, however, my high school transcripts are not indicative of success at the college level. The bottom line is that you should attend a community college and then apply for a transfer upon completing a two-year curriculum. This is not the answer I imagined. I speak with the education officer, who sends enthusiastic testimony to the admissions office detailing the work I have been doing. Describe the study groups I have been leading and teaching, and my commitment to higher education. I make another international call and plead with the same admissions officer who has been handling my case. After much discussion and negotiations, I receive a telegram informing me that they are going to make an exception because I am a veteran who has become a huge pain in the ass. I will be admitted on a provisional basis and my status will be re-evaluated after the first three quarters of the academic year. I'm admitted, I'm ecstatic. Looking back, I can clearly see that the months I spent in Guam just prior to enrolling as a full-time undergraduate were incredibly instrumental in the life's work that awaited me. There was something about the controls in my life that led me to Northern California, where I spent many weekends and spent time at Bill and Barbara Volick's house. The time I spent with my mother's younger brother was divinely arranged, of that now I'm sure. These were my introductory lessons to the power of the idea of intention. I didn't want to become a teacher until I saw Bill in action, and from that day on I was able to declare it a present fact and live from this inner mindset. It was this intention of myself as a teacher, inspired by Bill, that allowed me to go ahead and declare myself a teacher when I arrived in Guam. For me, it was a reality, pushing me to apply for university enrollment and demanding that I actually teach at the base. The intention provided the impetus to organize my whole life around an idea that I implanted in my consciousness when I was a one-year-old sailor with only a high school diploma. After thousands of public lectures on all kinds of topics covered in the books I have written, I still see those four words of intention that I did in 1961 printed on my inner screen, I am a teacher. The universal mind seems to have known that it had to be so impressed, and I am in awe of its magical power in me now and forever. Teaching people to act as if what they want to manifest is already a present fact has been a major theme of my life's work. When I had the idea of being a teacher in my imagination, the only thing I could do was act on that intention. I am deeply grateful for the powers that brought Bill and me together at this crucial moment in my life. We were meant to be friends for life. I also appreciate the fact that I was able to pay this beautiful man for what he unknowingly offered me when I was a young sailor going to an island in the Pacific where he would undergo a colossal transformation and change the direction in which my life had passed. Been taking. While in Guam, I acted persistently and decisively from the inner affirmation that I am a teacher. My bi-monthly trip to the bank to save 90% of my salary stemmed from that intention. By the time I left the Navy, I had amassed all the funds I would need to attend college. 
I was able to purchase a previously owned Studebaker Lark, which lasted until I completed my master's degree. But more than that, I embraced a philosophy about money and saving that set me on the path of becoming financially independent for life. Somehow the universe was teaching me how to live and fulfill my own dharma without allowing myself to be burdened with debt, a lesson that has served to keep me on purpose rather than figuring out how to resolve the debts that would have distracted me from my mission here. In this age, there on Guam, I was being pushed by the universal mind, which warns that wisdom is not related to one's potential personal greatness. Becoming an expert means not being afraid to declare yourself and then act on that inner declaration. These early lectures and study groups on existentialism and philosophy were the prelude to a career of being willing to stand in front of people and speak with common sense because it was what I knew to be true deep down inside of me. I was being directed by an invisible force back in 1961 as I steadfastly pursued my intention to live up to my inner affirmation that I am a teacher. I refused to accept any answer other than congratulations. You are admitted to our university. I cannot define that inner spark that would not allow me to give up, but I know for sure that it is a part of the divine, a spiritual drill sergeant who refuses to give in even when everything around me said, give up. On it, Wayne. That inner motivator kept pushing and has pushed me throughout my life, not because I'm special, but because it takes its orders from the intention that is in my imagination. That foreman acts on what we believe is already a present fact. Consequently, it is not necessary to give up a destiny that is and must be fulfilled. When I arrived at the university in September 1962 to register as a freshman, I went to the admissions office and looked for the official who had been so kind to bend the rules so that I could be admitted as a student. Full-time student. I often thought of the courage of that gentleman to make an exception and allow me to attend college. He told me he was just acting on a hunch. An invisible sign, so to speak, in fact, the same invisible energy that was pressing my buttons there in Guam not to give up, was pressing its buttons to bypass the rules. After my first academic quarter, my provisional status was removed and there were no longer asterisks next to my name. Then, on May 4, 1970, the same day of the horror show at Kent State University in Ohio, where four students were killed, and nine wounded, by National Guard troops who had fired live bullets at the crowd of young people. Students protesting the fiasco in Vietnam. I passed my final exams and became Dr. Wayne Dyer, adjunct faculty member of my alma mater. In eight years he had gone from freshman to teacher. With gratitude for all that had happened, four decades later I was able to commit a million dollars to a scholarship fund for unqualified students to enter college in memory of the admissions officer who had done the same for me. What do I know for sure? There are no accidents in an infinite universe in which the spirit is in control of all decisions. When I received my orders to leave my ship, the USS Ranger, I had only been on board for a little over a year. It was unheard of for me to be transferred after such a short tour of duty, especially since I was a short-term worker, meaning I only had months left of my military obligation. Clearly, it appears that the invisible hand of fate was at work, I was destined to spend that last year and a half in Guam, where I came face to face with my future, which in some mysterious way had already been fulfilled. All I had to do was listen, step aside, and allow myself to catch up. In a universe where everything happens at once, there is no past or future, and everything exists simultaneously. I didn't know it at the time, but I was living what Lao Tzu expressed so succinctly, you are not doing anything, you are only doing. Figuratively, a large hand reached down and pulled me off the ship and onto Guam, where I was aligned with everything I needed to fulfill a dharma I had signed up to, long before I appeared on this planet. If I had stayed aboard the USS Ranger, I would have lived another Dharma and you would not be reading this book. I can see very clearly that everything is, was, and will be perfect. As Rumi said, sell your intelligence and buy bewilderment. I am puzzled and in awe of the perfection of having spent four of my developmental years in a military organization that represented the exact opposite of everything I have taught and strived to become. 
divine perfection also threw me to an island in the South Pacific where it could foster my readiness for a new way of being. I have come to know, from a much clearer perspective, that there are no wrong paths to anywhere. I keep looking back in awe and wonder at the perfection of it all. I am a one-year veteran attending college classes for the first time and it feels like the happiest time of my life. I love walking between classes on campus, looking at all the buildings in the heart of the city where I grew up. It is a great honor for me after spending the previous four years aboard a ship or in the barracks of the military installation. I am beyond ecstatic. I love attending conferences and can't imagine wanting to cut any classes. I arrive early every morning and spend a lot of time in the huge library, as well as looking for a place to park every day. But I have no complaints. What I feel most is pride. I never had the idea of attending higher education imprinted on my conscience by my family, that was not an expectation. It was my personal choice to take this route at this point in my life. I have a nearly full-time job working as a cashier for the Kroger Company retail supermarket chain. I am grateful for the opportunity to work nights, study late, and attend school during the day. My tuition is fully paid and I have accumulated enough in my savings to cover my school expenses until I graduate. It is my second academic term at Wayne State University. Although these school premises only last weeks, there are many things in them. The previous quarter I scored above average in the four courses I completed, which included English, American Literature, where I was delighted to discover Theodore Dreiser, William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, Mark Twain, and F. Scott Fitzgerald. Now I am studying English, which is a composition class. I feel like I won't have any problems, after all I'm a writer. I've been writing since I was a preteen, I've finished a novel, and I have a file full of essays I've written. This glow of eagerly anticipating my writing being legitimized by a college professor teaching at a major university is dramatically dimmed, however, when the young graduate assigned to teach this freshman English course announces, should be shipped in accordance with APA style. You will lose points for each and every inconsistency, and if you ever use the word interesting, you will receive a failing grade on your work. The weekly essays required for this course must have a footnote and must be supported by something someone else has already written. Not interested in what the students in this class think or write? Should students be guided by a manual designed for everyone to write and sound like everyone else? No creativity, no opinions. I find it almost impossible to believe, but it seems to me that Joaquin Rise, who is teaching this class, is obsessed with the publication's manual of the American Psychological Association. Each paper must meet the exact standards set out in the manual. Grammar, punctuation, bibliographic citations, everything must adhere to a certain format, and students must not express opinions. My first article, which is an interpretation of a poem, receives a failing grade. The red marks that appear throughout the document point to my mistakes as seen by Mr. Rise, incorrect annotations, punctuation, and footnotes, and I have had the audacity to interpret the meaning of this poem in a way that Rise considers incorrect. I am indignant. I hate the idea that everything I write is criticized and rejected for what seems irrelevant to me. I am writing to the author of the poem, who is a professor at a small Wisconsin university, and I include a copy of my article, which details my personal interpretation of what he wanted to convey in his poem. I am also a poet. I wrote many poems during my years in Guam and am deeply interested in the works of Rumi and Hafiz, two Sufi poets from Persia whose words bring a comforting elixir to my soul. I receive a warm letter from the poetry teacher congratulating me on my performance. He loves the role and is touched by what I got from his poem. This man was delighted to write to me, poets obviously don't get much mail. I take my response from the poet to Mr. Rise, who is obviously very upset with me, this inexperienced college student who dared to question him and his grading system. I have not ingratiated myself with my instructor, who views me as cheeky and refuses to even consider changing my grade. Weeks pass, and for our final exam, we are assigned a term research paper that is due the last week of the term. 
I write an article about the Hungarian Revolution 1956 and the role that Janos Kater, a communist sympathizer, played in that conflict. This is of particular interest to me because when it happened, I was a one-year high school student trying to follow this event to the best of my ability. I am proud of this article and I think it is very well written and I follow the APA style to the letter. Mr. Rise is still upset about my attempts to improve my grade at my first job. You are a graduate assistant who is offended by the idea that one of your freshmen would object to any of your pronouncements or grading procedures. Now he tells me that my one-page research article on the role of Janos Kater in the recent Hungarian Revolution is not my original writing. I must have plagiarized, in your opinion, even though you have no evidence of such a transgression. He gives me a D on the paper, and when my final grade arrives in the mail a week later, I find that I have a D for the course as well. A passing grade, but a less than satisfactory grade. I am beyond angry. I have not plagiarized anything. I have been writing articles and a novel for over six years. I am being punished for what I consider to be high-quality writing. I make several attempts to meet with Mr. Rise in the next quarter. He refuses. I ask the head of the department to listen to my case. Listen carefully. I show him my investigative work and the allegation of possible plagiarism, and he informs me that there is nothing I can do. He is not in a position to override the grades given by a staff member and tells me that I can retake the course and have the D replaced by my subsequent grade. I think back to my leaf collecting fiasco and I remember having to retake biology and how I let my pride bother me, just to prove I was right. I decide to quit. The D is my only unsatisfactory grade over an eight-year period from freshman to completion of my Ph.D. My days as a college student, especially those early days, taught me a powerful lesson that has permeated my writing and my speech throughout my life. I have often spoken of the metaphor of a ship's wake, that the wake is nothing more than the trail that is left behind and that it has no power in the present. He does not and cannot drive the boat. It is a path that does not influence the boat at all. Attending and excelling in those college classes taught me more than the subjects I studied. Walking around campus, I realized that my past didn't have to dictate my future. The excitement I was feeling and the success I was having in the university environment were certainly unforeseen due to my past. Using the boat as a symbol of my life, the wake of that boat was not the driving force of my life. He no longer needed a personal story, my past was just that, past, it was no longer a factor for me. I was doing well regardless of what my high school record indicated, regardless of the facts of my background and education. I needed to know this firsthand from experience, and somehow I was led to this realization. From my first day on campus I never looked back and understood that it could be anything I put my attention on, that anything I could put my imagination could achieve. But I had to experience this truth before I could teach it, and you can trust me on this, every day as I walked around that campus in a state of euphoric awe, I was seeing that the awakening of my life was nothing more than a trace that had left behind. Now I was in charge of the direction my life would take. My experience with Mr. Rise in English is now viewed by me as another one of those great learning experiences that came disguised as an embarrassing and anger-producing event. A part of me seemed to think that I was back in the army, that they told me not to think for myself, to do what they told me and to write according to a manual. The APA style is basically the uniform code of military justice for college students that says, write according to a code devised by the American Psychological Association. Don't be creative, don't think outside the box, write an article that resembles any other article that has been presented to a university professor. Writing according to these dictates results in books or articles that remain unread. Citing sources and jotting everything down creates boring, researched, and data-driven writing that doesn't come to life for the reader. Books written in this style are primarily read by other scholars and contribute primarily to expanding the large number of unread manuscripts gathering dust on library shelves. I wanted my writing to excite readers, to inspire them. I wanted readers to want more, not to feel like they can't wait to finish. 
Being forced to write in such an uncreative style, fitting into a preset format, gave me a valuable experience. It taught me what I didn't want for myself, it allowed me to experience what I definitely didn't want to be. Right there I discovered in English with Mr. Joaquim Rise that I wanted to write for a large audience, not for a pedantic and erudite collection of scholars. I felt the pain of having to stifle my own creativity to please and fit into a predetermined writing style. Yes, I succumbed and carried on, but in doing so it motivated me to write this the way my heart described it to me. I followed the movements, but my imagination was fueled every day by my desire to write in exactly the opposite way as I was forced to write for a college requirement by a rigid graduate student. It seemed this man had chosen to drink all the institutional Kool-Aid, and that hectic work had captured his soul. From a distance I can clearly see that my episode with the Wisconsin professor and poet was the product of my life almost exclusively from my ego at the time. I desperately wanted to prove he was right, even though all my efforts were obviously self-sabotaging. Rather than coming from a place of understanding and love, I chose to put all my efforts into making my university teacher wrong. This is the action of an ego-dominated fool. It is similar to speaking rudely to a uniformed police officer when pulled over for a traffic violation, regardless of whether you feel you are correct or not. I was so outraged that this man found my interpretation of a poem incorrect that I reacted by hitting him and even tried to embarrass him by giving him proof of my superiority. That I needed to have a series of these kinds of misfortunes throughout my life. I finally got the message that has been a central theme in my life's work. When you have a choice to be right or nice, always choose nice. Living from your highest spiritual sense is the essence of what it means to be a self-realized person. He saw Mr. Joaquim rise as an enemy he had to defeat, even if the only result was a Pyrrhic victory. In the Navy I learned to be discreetly effective and it had always worked for me. At Wayne State he was busy fighting a losing battle against the system. What I know today is to treat everyone with love and kindness, even when they behave in a way that I don't like. I had to learn to allow my higher inner self to become the dominant influence in my life. The only way I could get this lesson was to tame my ego. I must admit that it made me feel very good to prove myself and Mr. Rise right in this matter. But being right should have taken a backseat to being nice and mindful of my true goals for that English class. Those goals involved completing the class on a good grade, removing one more hurdle from my larger goal of actualizing my I am presence, which had already declared that I am a teacher. With these kinds of setbacks, they were setting me up to teach about the absurdity of relying on the ego and how truly unfortunate it is to do so. And now I can give my honest assessment regarding that degrade that seemed to be a pinch of poison on my illustrious looking college transcript. I can clearly see that I fully deserved that unsatisfactory rating. I created it and I take full responsibility for it. I encouraged this man. I saw him as a competitor and a threat to my own image as a competent writer. I put him in a position where he was going to do whatever he could to retaliate against my dismissive attitude. Yes, I earned that D, and although half a century has passed, the presence of that scarlet letter on my college transcript is an enduring reminder that I must always choose between kindness and love. If the Wayne Dyer of yours spoke to the Wayne Dyer of yours, it would remind him of the great truth that he had been teaching throughout his professional career, live to be separated from results. Do it all because it resonates with your higher self and responds to your pleading inner voice, not because of the rewards that may come your way. That degrade on a transcript is totally irrelevant to a highly functional person. I would advise that 22-year-old version of myself to be content to know that he had written a great article and to enjoy the feeling that comes with the joy of writing and expressing himself. This is a lesson that I had to learn the hard way. We live in a world that exerts excessive pressure to define success in external terms. I have spent many years in a profession where many pursue success in these ego-defined terms, how much money do I make? How high is my book on the bestseller list and how many weeks has it been there? Did I get a promotion? Did I get the job I was looking for? What did the critics think of my book and how many copies did I sell? 
These and hundreds of more ego-driven thoughts are typical of authors looking at external success rates. Through the years that I have been immersed in this business, I have learned to let them go. My concern about that unsatisfactory black mark on my academic record was a great learning experience when I look back. Taming the ego, which defines itself on the basis of its reputation and what it achieves and possesses, has been one of the main lessons of my life. The fact that I highlight my experience as a first-year college student in a composition class in English indicates the importance of trying to curb the demands of the ego in my life. That the degree of D decreases in importance from the distance of a 50-year observation tower. The fact that I could interpret a poem and understand it as the poet pointed it out, and that I had the energy and the will to invest in writing a detailed academic research article that was thought to have been plagiarized because it was so well written, largely superseded the trivial mark in a transcript that has absolutely nothing to do with who I am or what I have accomplished in this life. He needed to learn this lesson well. Detachment from the outcome was my ultimate goal, and this early experience was one of the necessary episodes I needed to bring this message home clearly so that I could finally become a master of self-realization. I drive my Studebaker Lark home from college after a full day of school. I am nearing the end of my sophomore year after attending summer school. I want to graduate as soon as possible to pursue my teaching ambitions, so I am taking additional courses every trimester and I plan to attend school full-time throughout the year to make this idea come true. It is Friday afternoon in November, 1961. I am approaching the Edsel Ford Expressway, I-94, on Crane Street and am right at the entrance ramp when I hear this shocking news on the car radio, we discontinued this program to announce that the President of the United States it was shot in Dallas a few moments ago. It is expected to be fatal. I stop at the entrance ramp and sit in stunned silence. Tears roll down my cheeks. I feel like a bullet has gone through me and left me too smashed to drive. I can't catch my breath. I take the news blaring on the radio very, very personally. He loved this president very much. He spoke so eloquently of the many injustices that he wanted corrected. He advocated for the elimination of the horrific demonstrations of segregation that so impacted me while I was serving my four years of active duty. He exuded hope for a better world and was willing to face forces that wanted to keep the same old prejudices and hatreds in place. I marveled at the courage he displayed in his campaign when he promised executive, moral and legislative leadership to combat racial discrimination and school segregation. Just a few months earlier, I proudly watched the Alabama National Guard, on the orders of President Kennedy, provide security for two black students to enter a building at the University of Alabama and register. I watched as the governor of Alabama, George Wallace, stepped aside and a new era of equality began. In June of 1961, I heard President Kennedy give this speech on television. The heart of the matter is whether all Americans should have the same rights and opportunities, if we are to treat our fellow citizens the way we want to be treated. If an American, because of his dark skin, cannot have lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for the public officials who will represent him, yes, in short, he cannot enjoy the full and free life that we all desire, so who among us would be content to change the color of his skin and take his place? That speech marked a turning point for our country, the beginning of the campaign for the approval of what became the Civil Rights Act of 1961. I sit in my car on the freeway entrance ramp remembering what those two young African-American students looked like when they were going to sign up for classes. I remember my friend Ray Dudley being denied a seat at a restaurant in Haver de Grace while wearing the uniform of the United States Navy just a few years ago, and I am saddened by the loss of those hopes that the president offered. I read about JFK's heroism during World War II in Robert Donovan's book P.T., and how his actions saved the crew after a Japanese torpedo split their ship in half. I devoured Kennedy's own book, Profiles in Courage, in which he focused on the careers of eight U.S. Senators. Congress that had shown great courage in the face of constituent pressure. I was so hopeful that this kind of courage would apply to so many social problems in our deeply divided country. 
I remembered the fear that gripped the nation during the Cuban Missile Crisis and how this brave young president stood up to Soviet Prime Minister Nikita Khrushchev and averted a nuclear disaster. I believed in this man. I felt close to him. I wrote to him during my participation in the Guam incident, where the indignity of prejudice was raising its ugly face in my life. JFK was the man I thought would fix this mess if he was told. Little by little I start to pick up speed and hit the highway, heading east to my house where I live with my mother, until my next marriage next year. Later I'm working at the Kroger grocery store on the afternoon shift from 4 to 9. Everyone who looks at my cash register is in shock, very few are able to speak. I look a woman in the eye as I hand her her change and when our gazes meet, we both break down in tears. Silence permeates everything. No one can speak without crying. I am shocked by this tragedy in a way totally foreign to me. I feel like my life is going to make a big change as a result of the events of this day. I included this historical incident because it influenced the direction of my personal and professional life. That November day of 1961 started a great change for me in many ways. Until then, practically everything in my life that was impacting my future was personal in nature. My experiences in foster care or in an orphanage, in high school and in the Navy were my Wayne Dyer moments of awakening to a new direction and a new awareness in my personal life. The assassination of President Kennedy not only killed a man he admired tremendously, it also killed something in me. So I began to think of a plan for a life that would have a global and historical effect. It was no longer just about my impending teaching career. I began to think in terms of how it could impact the consciousness of the entire planet. From that day forward I saw myself as a man with a voice of compassion for a higher good. I didn't know how or even what my role could be, but I knew that a person with a conscience could make a difference and I was that person. Why not? I thought like JFK long before I ever heard of this man. I felt a tingle thinking about giving voice to these ideas and making that voice heard all over the world. I began to see myself as a world leader, not a political leader, but a person who was full of compassion for everyone and a person whom others were willing to listen to. When I look back at the assassination of President Kennedy, now 50 years later, I can see that he was destined to give his life for his own dharma to be fulfilled. The Civil Rights Act was not going to be passed in 1961. The likelihood of JFK being re-elected was shrinking because the South was rebelling against his uncompromising views on racial intolerance and voter rights. The filibusters of the Southern Senators were almost insured. But when JFK died and the nation mourned this great man, the whole mood of the country changed. With the new president, who was re-elected in a landslide in 1961, the winds of change began to blow much stronger. The politicians who promised segregation forever began to change under pressure from a more enlightened and awakened population, and in fact voted for equal rights and moved toward a great society. I believe that there are no accidents in this spiritually ordered universe. The death of President Kennedy that day opened the door to civil rights, voter rights, health care for the elderly, improving schools, and the awareness that equal rights are not just words to say, but actions everyone should take. Of us. This was the only way he could change the conscience of our country. He was also caught up in this new awareness. A rising tide lifts all ships, and I felt metaphorically lifted by this tragic event. I, like so many others, marched for civil rights and protested a coming war in Vietnam. As a teacher in downtown Detroit, and later as a spokesperson for ending world hunger through the Hunger Project, I sought changes in our unfair and unnecessary attitudes. My life as a writer and speaker focused on elevating people from thinking of themselves as ordinary and limited, to trusting in a new awareness that within everyone resides a person without limits who can accomplish whatever they put their attention on. President Kennedy's vision of a country populated by citizens who want to give and serve rather than receive and receive, is a vision that I share too. That he had to die to move the entire country in a new, more compassionate direction is part of the perfection of our universe. It can be argued endlessly, but it is nevertheless so. He died, and as a result, we all became better people. 
and I, too, began my journey toward being a better person and a career centered on service, compassion, and love for all. My life could have had a different emphasis and direction if the events in Dallas that day had not happened. I am in my last year of university. I have attended almost every conference in these four academic years, not once missing a class. I am committed to this regime of full-time students, and I am so happy, proud, and fortunate to be here in the first place that voluntarily missing even one class is never even a consideration. While I love the atmosphere of this university built in the middle of a large crowded inner city, I am in awe of what appears to me to be apathy on the part of the teaching faculty. It is rare to find professors truly enthusiastic about their topic or interested in inspiring students. I notice how much disinterest is pervasive in many of the classes I take. Thoughts like these flow through my consciousness repeatedly, it seems to me that all these teachers are simply doing their job. So much boredom, so little emotion for what they are teaching. I remember my uncle Bill Volick, who was my inspiration to want to be a teacher. Her classroom was a joy because of the laughter and excitement it inspired. Bill loved his students and he loved his subject. He was living his own dharma and everyone was having a good time. The key word here is love. I think that is what seems to be lacking in these classes. Everyone is going through the motions, no love here students diligently take notes on items that may appear on the midterm or final exam. Otherwise, they are obviously indifferent to this whole thing called euphemistically higher education. The teachers are not teaching, they are presenting material and just doing the moves themselves. They are doing work, showing up most of the time, though they often cut classes themselves and seemingly oblivious to the boredom that permeates the entire classroom. I notice this lack of enthusiasm on the part of almost everyone involved in what seems like a game in progress. I look and wonder, can't they see that no one is excited by what they're saying? They have a captive audience, students have to be here and they can't leave until class is over. Why don't teachers bring this topic and class to life? I imagine myself having the privilege of being in front of the class as a teacher with this same captive audience. I play this fantasy in my mind almost daily when I am in a classroom full of students being bathed in a warm learning environment. I imagine myself bringing the room to life and presenting the material in a compelling way. I see myself teaching students to be motivated and inspired and to learn the curriculum even if they think the material is not important. This is a fantasy that I experience every day. I look at teachers with some disdain, the same way I did a few years in high school. In fact, I feel sorry for them because they seem so caught up in living their routine day after day, year after year. In high school, there were several teachers at the end of their careers who simply spent their time until retirement. I see some of the same in college and I wonder, where is your pride? How can they be in front of a class and not want to entertain their students and get them excited about learning this subject? I promise myself that it will never be me. I love making people laugh, and every memorable teacher I've ever had had this wonderful ability to infuse humor into their teachings. I promise myself that when I speak in front of a group, any group, the audience will love being there. I will not only follow the motions and do my job to receive a paycheck every two weeks. I will keep the love alive, the love for what I teach, the love for my students, but most importantly, the love I have for myself. I am determined to honor who I am and never become a teacher by doing my work a listless sham of indifference. That is a blasphemous image that I would abhor if subjected to such ignominy. Every day, in classroom after classroom, I am captivated by my own imaginative musings about how I would bring this material to life. I am motivated by an intense desire to bring excitement, fun, and humor to the learning experience. Ultimately, I am assigned to Pershing High School, in the Detroit public school system, to teach my students. I am teaching economics with honors to a group of graduating seniors, and my supervising teacher is Mr. Zygmunt Boyder. I have been truly blessed, Zig Boyder is a great teacher, a man who embodies all that I aspire to become. His students adore him and his principal considers him the best teacher in the school. After the first two weeks, Zig gives me free reign, 
I am the only teacher for the rest of the semester. Economics can be an incredibly boring subject, or at least it was for me in the two courses I was enrolled in as a student. But now I have the opportunity to put into practice what I have been imagining for the past four years sitting in so many drab classrooms. I'm in heaven. I love this semester more than any other so far. I love this class, I love the students, and I even came to love economics. I am excited when the class presents me with a leather briefcase and a beautiful card that expresses their enthusiasm for the course and for me, the teacher. I am deeply moved. I'm excited. I am a teacher and I am also on my way to being a speaker. As I sat through an endless series of classes where apathy seemed to rule, on the part of the teacher and the students alike, I didn't realize that this was my initial training ground for being a public speaker. When I look back, I can clearly see myself sitting in the classroom in disbelief at the monotony that seemed so unnecessary. Why, I wonder, doesn't the instructor make this exciting? Isn't it obvious how tedious this is for everyone in the room? Now I know, from a distance, that I had to have these feelings of frustration. They were awakening something in me that couldn't be silenced and ignored. I was destined to play a speaking role in my life. I needed to prepare back then, and the surest way to prepare was to provide me with a forum where I had to participate in something that I disliked. Again, it's that old theme of having to experience what you didn't want to be, to really know what it was you wanted to do. This, like all experiences in my life, was an abundant blessing in disguise. Those internal musings that I was hearing and feeling were my wake-up calls. When I spoke to my classmates about these feelings, they looked at me with puzzled expressions. For them, this was the system, boring lectures are part of what college is. I didn't know that my inner outrage was a voice from the universe telling me, watch this carefully, feel the pain, and make a commitment based on what you feel to learn from this and become a brilliant, entertaining, and compelling speaker. Having spoken in public forums for nearly four decades, to the hard-earned public paying their hard-earned money to attend, I feel blessed to have had the opportunity to be in classes in high school and college that sparked those inner voices saying, pay attention and make a commitment to bring your messages to life. Be enthusiastic and watch your audience for clues to see if they are paying attention and having fun, if not, change what you are doing on the spot. Over the years, I have written and spoken often about the importance of passion in business. To be apathetic to me means to have lost connection with my source. A person standing in front of an audience without enthusiasm for his subject and his actions is disconnected from his spirit, that is, the God within. In fact, the fundamental meaning of the word enthusiasm is the God within. Through decades of speaking to large groups of people, I have learned that when I surrender and let myself be guided by a divine source, everything seems to fall into place. As I am introduced as a speaker about to take the microphone, I repeat this line from A Course in Miracles, if you knew who walks by your side at all times on this path you have chosen, you could never experience fear or doubt again this has been my reminder to keep the image of my alignment with the creative source of the universe and to speak from my passion. What was happening to me in those passionless classrooms was that my spirit was pushing me to stay in harmony with my inner sense of awe and appreciation for all that I am, and by doing so, I could become a speaker that people would want to hear. I remember when I was an undergraduate student I thought that I would like to excel in whatever I undertake, especially in writing and speaking. He had heard that writers were generally not great speakers, and that those who excelled in public speaking were generally not good at expressing themselves on paper. Over the years, I have learned that greatness is really a function of what I choose to believe about myself and my abilities. I know that I have the ability to excel at whatever I choose. There is nothing set in stone that says whether I am a professional research expert who therefore must lack the competence to speak before an audience. I started playing tennis at the age of 31 and the first day I played I decided that I loved this game and that I could become a very skilled player if I took the time. And I did, for over 35 years. Similarly, in undergraduate school I knew that my ability to achieve any level of prominence was not restricted. I would live my passion, 
loving what I did, and there was nothing stopping me except my own beliefs in my limitations. I can see one thing quite clearly when I look back at those classrooms and observe the monotony that surrounds me. From this perspective, I understand that every experience in my life, regardless of how I chose to process it at the time, had something extremely valuable to teach me. There are lessons in every moment, and now I know for sure that there is no uninteresting topic or ordinary moment. There are only disinterested people. I learned by example many years ago not to be one of those selfless people. I feel that being bored is an insult to the higher self, which is, by definition, the God within. The year is 1961, I am married with a one-year-old daughter named Tracy, who was born in the midst of the riots that decimated a large part of the city of Detroit. I am also in the doctoral program at Wayne State University after completing my master's degree two years ago. Since I have bachelor's and master's degrees from Wayne State, one of my PhD requirements. The program consists of completing several semesters at the University of Michigan to give me some diversity in my general educational background. I am currently enrolled in a summer school course here called the Psychology of Perception, in which there is great emphasis on the advantage of using hypnosis in treating perceptual deficiencies. I used a form of self-hypnosis to quit smoking that I acquired in undergraduate school, and I am eager for instruction in hypnosis and practical experience. The teacher for this course, a very energetic and very competent scholar, gave us group hypnosis yesterday. I was in a happy state, my mind was in an improved state, and I felt peaceful. I was fully aware of everything that was happening and didn't feel like I had given up control, yet I found myself willingly following his suggestions, doing whatever was suggested to me without questioning anything. I felt like I didn't have to do what they told me to do, but I did it anyway. Today we are going to witness an experiment in mind and body control. A woman in her early years has agreed to be the student who will undergo a hypnosis experiment with our teacher as the experimenter. He places her in a chair at the front of the classroom and puts her in a hypnotic trance. He then explains that the human body cannot make a clear distinction between extremely hot and extremely cold temperatures. He tells us, along with the hypnotized woman, who seems totally normal and unaffected by any hypnotic suggestion, that a blindfolded person played by a super cold instrument or a red hot instrument generally cannot tell what kind of touch has received. Explain that extreme heat and cold can feel the same. We are all attentive as the teacher continues to explain the psychology of perception and that the nervous system simply reacts. Cold and heat are purely perceptual variations that depend on the composition of the person being touched. Blindfold the woman and proceed to play her with an icy metal instrument and an unlit match still warm to the touch. Cold first. Then hot. Then a variety of confusing essays. The woman has a percentage of accuracy in her guesses as the experiment proceeds. Then he removes the blindfold and discusses the results with the class. The woman is still in a hypnotic state. He tells you that he will show you which extreme temperature utensil to use and instructs you to just say hot or cold quickly when you touch it. He shows her a frozen utensil and then a red hot pin that he says will touch the inside of her arm, and she must say out loud how each touch impacts her. Put the blindfold back on and pull out the icy metal picket. Very gently he says, this is the cold, tell me how she feels. She says it's cold and she's a little scared. Then he takes the red hot pin and places it close to her face so she can feel the heat, and says, I'm going to touch your inner arm just a little bit, and I want you to tell me your immediate reaction. After the pin is placed near her face, she is convinced that he is about to touch her with the red hot object. The professor places it in a glass ashtray on his desk and instead touches the inside of his arm with the eraser on the tip of a pencil that he has taken from his shirt pocket. The woman is startled and a slight blister forms on her arm, even though she was only touched by a pencil eraser at room temperature. A surprised classmate says, did you see that? Is incredible. I can't believe she did that with her mind. I'm stunned. My eyes are wide open, as is my mouth, 
as I witness firsthand the amazing power of the mind over the body. By her belief and nothing else, this woman was able to produce a blister on her arm. The teacher explains that much of our perceptual activity is controlled by the beliefs we have. Describes the placebo effect, in which experiments are performed on sugar pills that people with arthritis think are arthritis medications, and sugar pills relieve arthritis. Just as I had experienced with my pilonidal cyst when I was in the Navy, I am seeing again how our beliefs can be key to healing. Even more than this, I wonder if outside influences or culturally ingrained ideas might be irrelevant in the face of this infinitely powerful mind of ours. Perhaps, I reflect, we can convince ourselves of our own abilities to manifest anything. That summer day in 1961 was a turning point in my life. It took me to the brink of a reality that I had believed in for years and brought me to a place of unimaginable potentiality. Although it was a relatively new field of research, I had read quite a bit about the mind-body connection, particularly in the field of medicine. However, my intellectual research had not prepared me for what I witnessed in the classroom at the University of Michigan that day. That I needed to be there to have this new awareness firmly implanted in my conscious and subconscious mind. It's one thing to read about something, it is quite another to experience it directly. If this is possible, I asked myself that day in class, what else is the mind capable of accomplishing that most people believe is impossible? This incident at the University of Michigan that summer day in 1960 was the birthplace of my teaching on what I came to call life without limits a few years later. But far beyond becoming a teacher who wrote and spoke passionately on this subject of being limitless, due to the limitless power of our minds to imagine anything and then make it come true, was the impact this ample and eraser experience had. Have me personally. I decided that I was capable of creating anything that I put in my imagination and I enthusiastically kept there. I decided I didn't have to have colds, fatigue, or financial hardship, and for the most part I was able to manifest almost everything I imagined. It was as if a light bulb had gone out inside me when I saw the look of astonishment on the woman's face as she observed what her firm belief had accomplished. I reasoned that if she could so firmly believe in something that could create a blister with that belief, then there was no reason why I couldn't begin to train my mind to believe in all kinds of amazing achievements. As a result of that episode of hypnosis, I later incorporated this concept in my public lectures. I encouraged people to cultivate a way of believing that could overcome conditioned belief in their limitations. I have always felt that an important hand of fate placed me in that classroom in 1961. As I sit here writing today, more than years since that demonstration in the early years of my PhD studies, I have such a clear picture of everything that happened that day, as if it happened only this morning. This changed my life because I knew that I might as well have been the one who created the blister with my own mind. Little did I know when I walked into that classroom that day that the class was going to provide me with an image that would affect my life personally and professionally from that moment on. This image was so strong that it struck me, all my children, who were raised to have an open mind to all possibilities, and my many students and millions of readers, in 47 languages around the world. A seemingly innocuous classroom demonstration stretched to infinity, influencing countless people to trust themselves and the power of the mind to make anything happen. At the time I reasoned that if enough people were to tap into the potential of limitless thinking, the entire course of human behavior could change for the better. Why not? This invisible mind of ours seems to affect everything in the physical universe, so why not dream big and work towards a world where a great many of us actually think and act in this new way? I know this sounds a bit great, but that's what was going through my mind that day when I left class as a changed and idealistic young PhD student. Yes, I see clearly from this point of view that the body is the servant of the mind. I had heard, read, and paid very little attention to this phenomenal idea until I experienced it right in front of me. Even events in our lives that seem mundane can, if we are willing to pay attention and wonder, impact our lives and the lives of others. The blister and eraser event was going to be a monumental experience, influencing everything he was going to create for years to come. 
from that day on I began to be much more aware of how I was using my thoughts. Because I had witnessed firsthand the power of a thought to create a physical manifestation, I couldn't get the idea out of my mind that every thought I had contained some kind of enormous potential for change. I remember walking to my car after that class, thinking that one day I would write an entire book on this topic, not knowing then that the demonstration I had just been a part of would launch me into writing a little library on the amazing power of our mind. The image of the woman in the classroom never left me. Almost half a century later, it still glows brightly on my inner screen. While earning my PhD, I work as a counselor at Mercy High School in Farmington, Michigan. I love this school where some 1,000 girls are enrolled in a college preparatory curriculum run by the Religious Sisters of Mercy. I love my job, which is providing guidance and counseling services to approximately 300 students in grades 9 through 12. It is the Wednesday following Labor Day, 1961. In the auditorium last night I spoke with parents and presented the school's plans for the academic year. The opportunity to give a speech and entertain the audience was an engaging evening, and I am still very happy. Nancy Armstrong, one of my students, tells me, My mom heard you speak last night and she wants me to give you this book as a thank you gift. She told me to tell her she loved her speech to the parents. Nancy explains that her mother is a member of the Book of the Month Club and received this large volume as a bonus for buying a certain number of books. Ms. Armstrong thinks she never you will read it, and because of the content of my talk the night before, you are sure I will enjoy having it for my personal library. The book is titled The World of Psychology, Volume 2, Identity and Motivation, edited by G.B. Levitas, it was published in 1961 by George Brasler. It is a compendium of essays written by a diverse collection of authors, including Plato, William Butler Yeats, Friedrich Nietzsche, Aldous Huxley, Margaret Mead, Carl Jung, and many other prominent contributors. The mix is exciting, poets, psychologists, literary luminaries, and philosophers. I really like it, as I really enjoy reading poetry, essays, commentaries, and the like. In my hobbyist way, I have dabbled in these forms of writing since I was a child. I call Ms. Armstrong and thank her for her generous gift. Then I realize that I have four hours off before I have to be on the Wayne State campus. There I will meet with my doctoral advisor, Dr. Mildred Millie Peters, to discuss my work plan for the remaining two and a half years of my doctoral studies. I have already decided the direction I want to take. I simply need Dr. Peters to approve my plan, which describes all my next course assignments, my internship and internship requirements, and the subject of my PhD thesis. I am interested in Carl Rogers and BF's client-centered therapy. Skinner works on behaviorism and has decided to pursue areas of research that focus on its modalities. I pick up the compendium Nancy gave me this morning. I turn to Part 7, The Whole Man, and I see that there are offers from John Stuart Mill, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Robert Browning, and C. E. Montague. But one particularly strikes me, Self-Actualized People by Abraham Maslow. I am inexplicably drawn to the article, which is 28 pages long and will need a couple of hours to read in depth. I turn off the phone after deciding that I should read this before my 7 p.m. meeting with Dr. Peters. As I read, I have the strangest feeling that my life is about to take a radical turn. The essay describes people Dr. Maslow calls self-actualizing. He defines these rare and unique people this way. What a man can be, he must be. We can call this need self-realization. It refers to the desire for self-realization, that is, to his tendency to actualize himself in what is potentially. Maslow describes the innate internal call of these types of people to become all that they are capable of becoming, and how difficult or impossible it is for them to suppress this urge. As I read, describe in detail the specific characteristics of self-actualizers, who are dramatically different from average people. Maslow suggests that they are often labeled as selfish or unconventional and, it seems to me to say, that their actions and attitudes should be exalted and praised rather than repressed and squashed. 
Maslow points out that the self-actualized person has a strong desire for privacy, vehemently resists enculturation, but always has a freshness of appreciation, and he has a genuine desire to help the human race. However, when it comes down to it, in some basic ways it's like an alien in a strange land. Very few really understand it, as much as they like it. I am captivated, highlighting almost the entire article. I feel like I am reading about qualities that I have always felt deep within, but have often been criticized. I am so fascinated by what I read that I feel as if I am in the middle of an oceanic mystical experience. That is all. This is the direction I want my advanced studies to take. As I read the conclusion, I know that I too must be what I can be, and I marvel at the coincidence of receiving this gift just before finalizing my plans with my PhD advisor. However, on some other level, I know that Nancy bringing this book from her mother is somehow connected to the need for her to read this essay today. I reread Dr. Maslow's conclusion over and over again. And I know that I no longer want to focus on what I was so sure of before reading this essay. I am absolutely sure of what I want to study now. I make a copy of the last paragraph to take to my meeting with Dr. Peters. In this, as in other ways, healthy people are so different from the average, not only in degree but also in kind, that they generate two very different kinds of psychology. It is becoming increasingly clear that the study of crippled, stunted, immature, and sickly specimens can only produce a crippled psychology and a crippled philosophy. The study of self-actualized persons must be the foundation of a more universal science of psychology. My heart is beating fast, I feel like I am about to enter a new phase of my life. I show Dr. Peters my work plan, typed and ready for her signature, and then tell her what I just read. I'm bursting with enthusiasm for this idea of focusing on the highest functioning people and drawing conclusions about who we can become, not based on average people but on extraordinary, self-actualizing people. I want to write about what I just digested. I see many of my own atypical personality traits and inclinations in Maslow's description of self-actualized people. I have always been independent of the good opinions of others, have followed my own predilections, and have been out of the box in my thinking for as long as I can remember. I love the idea of having high standards that are not based on what the culture dictates, but on what I feel within myself that it is possible. I ask Dr. Peters, one of the most self-actualizing people I've ever been fortunate enough to meet, a woman who earned a Ph.D. When very few women were even considered for such high academic status, a woman who always encouraged me to follow my own instincts regardless of what the system seems to dictate, if I can change this work plan sitting at her desk and dedicate myself to this area of work. Self-realization in my doctoral studies. Without hesitation, she says yes. We break the old plan and start a whole new chapter in my life. The workers of destiny were working overtime that September day of 1961. I had given that talk to the parents because the school principal was feeling ill and asked me to replace her at the last minute. If that hadn't happened, my entire life could have been very different from what it looks like from this point of view almost five decades later. When Nancy handed me this compendium of teachings from great spiritual teachers, I was inexplicably drawn to it. When school finished around two o'clock, I sat at my desk debating whether to go to the university library or go over my PhD work plan one more time in my office. That black book on my desk seemed to have an energy of its own urging me, pick me up and read to me, I have something very important to tell you. When I came across Dr. Maslow's article on people's self-actualization, he also spoke to me, read me and do it right now. That these kinds of almost desperate appeals are the work of something greater than myself, but with which I am passionately connected. I have come to trust these messages and synchronous collaborations with destiny. At the time when everything was happening, I just followed the way they were leading me without thinking too much about it. Today I'm sure that, on some level, Nancy Armstrong, her mother, my school principal, the person who made the club book of the month bonus decision, and many others were in some way mystical that eludes my intellectual understanding.
participants. To show me my way. I believe in that. I trust it, and now, from this point of view, I am much better able to take advantage of it while it takes place. It no longer takes me years to have this perception, everything and everyone is connected to each other and to the Tao or the one universal mind from which all things originate and return. After that fateful meeting with my beautiful advisor, Dr. Peters actually created a whole new curriculum in the PhD program so that I could fulfill what I felt was burning so hot inside of me. She designed a new program for many incoming PhD students, and at least 12 people signed up. I was able to be part of a PhD internship program that focused on using small group counseling therapy sessions to train people who were inclined to embrace the principles of Maslow's groundbreaking work on self-actualization. I would no longer limit myself to marking the requirements for a doctorate, he had an approach that filled me with passion. Abraham Maslow became a prominent figure in my life. He was the inspiration for me to look at psychology from a 180 degree position. Instead of studying what was weak, weak, or limited in clients and making an assessment based on overcoming the ailments, I began to look for the highest qualities of self-actualization and to encourage clients, and ultimately readers and listeners, seek your own innate greatness and aspire to these pinnacles. I reasoned that if some of us could be self-actualizing, then me and anyone else who understood that it was possible could do it too. This became an important focus of my professional life and the compass that I set out to live the principles that Maslow outlined in his writings. Dr. Maslow spent his life researching what constitutes positive mental health. Most of the psychology that I studied before my introduction to his writings concerned anomaly and disease, in my doctoral studies and practically in all my writing, the idea of self-actualization and humanistic psychology became the central focus. It was meant to spread this idea that each person has the ability to cultivate their own magnificence. Throughout my life I felt that I had something unique within me, when I read Maslow's essay I knew that I had to make it the focal point of my PhD studies and beyond. I can remember being familiar with what you described as the characteristics of self-actualizing people. Later, when I was writing The Sky's the Limit, I devoted entire chapters to developing the ideas that were inspired by this mentor of mine who spoke to me through his lectures and particularly through his writings. And I wrote What Do You Really Want For Your Children? As a guide for parents who want to raise their self-actualizing children to be humanistically oriented adults. All based on what this man taught me. Dr. Maslow died of a heart attack on June 8, 1970. I received my final degree the same day, and from then on I would be known as Dr. Wayne Dyer. It is as if the witness had passed me and said to me, I explained this idea of self-realization to the academic world, now you take the baton and show it to the masses. Many books and thousands of lectures later, I can still see myself receiving the world of psychology, volume 2 from Nancy Armstrong's mother and then letting myself be guided by those forces that are always at work in all of our lives at all times. That book is still a treasure, it's near my desk as I sit and write a few years later. This collection of insightful observations by some of my most beloved and revered scholars was the inspiration for a similar type of book that I produced in Wisdom of the Ages magazine. I wrote essays based on the offerings of distinguished scholars during centuries past and how their teachings could impact today's reader. Many of these learned people contributed to the book that contained that essay on Abraham Maslow's self-realization. Wisdom of the Ages also became a PBS television special that aired nationwide in prime time for many years and was watched by millions of people. All because of the events that occurred in my office back in the year 1961. It is so clear to me today that everything, every event and every person, is connected in some inexplicable way. There is no time, 1961 and they are all one, although our body mind sees them separated by 50 years. We are all connected to everyone and everything in the universe. What I do affects everyone, and all my thoughts and actions are not only heard by the Great Tao, but have an impact independent of time constraints. I cannot begin to give a literal or linear explanation of how and why the events described in this section occurred, but from this point of view I can clearly see that not only the journey of my life, 
but also the lives of millions of people were shocked by me reading that essay by Dr. Maslow that September afternoon. Today, whenever I feel compelled to do something, something that I experience with passion, I pay attention. When I recognize that it is a calling from my soul, I know with certainty that this is something I must do. It is God calling me in a unique and amazingly mysterious way. It is that call to which I pay attention that pushes me every day to write these vignettes. I am connected to you dear reader, although we may not have any physical ties, there is an energy flowing between the two of us. Neither of us knows how mind-altering it can be, or how far-reaching it is. I know for sure because I see more and more clearly. It is the last year of my doctoral studies. For my internship practice, I lead beginning PhD students in group counseling and at the same time do research for the publication of my PhD thesis. Dr. John Vrind, a relatively new member of the Wayne State faculty, is a member of my doctoral committee. He received his own PhD from NYU, where he participated in a counseling and therapy approach called Rational Emotional Therapy, RET, taught by Albert Ellis, who has written many books and conducts workshops and training at the Albert Ellis Institute on East 65th Street. In New York, John hands me a book and says, I want you to read this very slowly and very carefully. It will alter your views on how to help people in a new and instructive way. What John gives me is a guide to a rational living, one of the more than books that Dr. Ellis has written for the public. As I read the little book, it speaks to me like nothing else in my training, coursework, and personal reading, in terms of helping clients reach their higher selves. This is the very me that Dr. Maslow wrote so movingly and convincingly about. What appeals to me is that Dr. Ellis is providing the details to teach people how to reach the pinnacle of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-actualization. The essence of RET is a basic understanding that irrational and unrealistic beliefs cause most emotional problems. The therapist's job is to help the client strive to change irrational beliefs, challenge self-destructive thinking, and actively promote rational self-talk. Unrealistic core beliefs that most people hold from childhood to adulthood that cause emotional disturbances include, I must perform well to be approved by any other important person in my life, I must be treated fairly, and if not, then it is a catastrophe and I just couldn't bear it, and, conditions must go my way, and if they don't, then it's horrible and I'll be distraught and unable to bear it. I devour this book and its central theme, we are responsible for the way we feel and we have within us the ability to change the way we view the events of our lives. In plain, common sense language, Dr. Ellis offers therapeutic tools that demonstrate to clients and therapists that it is not necessary to be emotionally disturbed or upset. He repeatedly emphasizes that I must do well, you must treat me well and the world must be what I want it to be are neurotic ideas that he groups into the category of masturbation. I am completely captivated by the simplicity and logic that Dr. Ellis teaches. I replay the recorded recordings of him conducting therapy sessions with people who suffer from all kinds of serious emotional disturbances and begin using these techniques with many of my own clients in college and high school. The results are amazing. I had been trying to do counseling that involved client-centered therapy, a psychoanalytic method in which I am essentially a reflective listener. So far I have been frustrated by my clients, and myself. But as I begin to be interactive and present an alternative to my clients, the positive changes happen almost immediately. I feel happier and am able to convince myself of some lifelong thought patterns that are not serving me. I take this book with me wherever I go and read it over and over again, studying logic and seeing that most emotional upheavals are caused by a set of crazy beliefs, which when changed result in the disappearance of the restlessness. I am fascinated by how Dr. Ellis weaves together Dr. Maslow's teachings on self-realization, Buddha and Lao Tzu and all Eastern philosophers, and Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius from ancient Roman times. This little book is the most influential book I have ever looked at. Dr. Vrind, who introduced him to me, is not only on my doctoral committee and a member of my professional studies staff, but he is also becoming a close friend. He gives me guidance, but even more, 
he gives me permission to enter into friendly disputes with my clients about the nature of what is disturbing them and to fearlessly show them how their thinking is really the cause of their emotional turmoil. So I say to them, change the way you think, attack the logic behind your continuing anger and basically change your philosophy, and you will improve everything in your life. By changing the way you process each and every event as they arise in your life, you can live a happy and fulfilling life without emotional clutter. I take notes on this new way of helping people and especially myself. I bring this approach to my teaching, my counseling, and my training sessions at the university during my internship. I drink it, I live it. I write myself notes on a book that I would love to write one day that combines self-actualization, rational emotional therapy, and the ancient Eastern and Western philosophies that I have been studying for over a decade. I thank Dr. John Vrind every day, who brought me this amazing book and insisted that I read it slowly and carefully. I am now very clear about the path my future counseling, teaching, and writing will take. But more than that, I am delighted to have a new tool for my own life. I will never again blame anyone for any emotional upheaval I experience. The guilt is gone from my life. I know that if I change the way I process any event, and I always have this power, even as a child, I can straighten out almost immediately. A man who went from being my mentor and colleague to being my closest friend gave me a guide to a rational life, a man who was sent to me at the precise moment in my life. Many years later, John told me that he felt inexplicably compelled to introduce me to the idea of rational emotional therapy while I was one of his doctoral students. I had had the vision that it would influence my future writing when I left the familiar territory of Wayne State and embarked on my own professional calling. I carried Albert Ellis's favorite quote from Marcus Aurelius in my wallet for many years and have used this idea in my speeches and writing for years, if you are distressed by something external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but to your own estimate of it, and this has the power to revoke it at any time. This is a great departure from what the psychoanalytic and behavioral schools taught, which was that our disturbances can be attributed to cultural and family factors, that we are often powerless in the face of these external influences and therefore, we must learn to adapt and overcome these early traumas. I was so drawn to this kind of thinking, that we are responsible for how we process any external events, is what I knew intuitively in elementary school when I urged my friends not to be fooled by the efforts of adults to manipulate them emotionally. Now I had been presented with an interactive process and methodology to help others choose their own greatness. I currently had three amazing sets of ideas seeping into me, the great ancient philosophical teachings of the East and the West, the concept of self-realization and living at extraordinary levels and the reality of creating miracles, and a methodology to interpret all this in a practical way, so that anyone can achieve the desired changes and overcome all entrenched obstacles. I started thinking about writing a book in the future that would incorporate all these modalities and continue to attract the masses. I could see that this was more than Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking, which I had already read. I felt like I had a way of presenting common sense ideas that anyone who wanted could use to change counterproductive attitudes and live from their own greatness. They just needed to be willing to change their thinking and conceptualize themselves as capable of actualizing their greatness. When I look back at the people and events that were instrumental in shaping my thinking, two people stand out. One is Abraham Maslow and his radical idea that there are people among us who reach exalted states of consciousness and live exciting lives that impact the world they live in and the people around them. When I read Maslow, I wanted to be one of those venerable souls he called self-actualized. However, Maslow believed, as a result of his research, that this lofty position at the top of the pyramid of the hierarchy of needs was limited to the few. Albert Ellis's rational emotional therapy closed the gap that existed in my consciousness about who could be self-actualizing. After reading and studying a guide to a rational life, he was convinced that this noble calling was available to all. It became increasingly clear to me that we simply need to get out of our own way and overcome the conditioning that we have become used to believing is what our lives are supposed to be. Then we can reprogram our self-concepts and live from a new perspective. Once we remove the wrong thoughts, 
it is a pleasure to begin to choose our own greatness, our inherent birthright, so to speak. I look back with deep gratitude and respect for all that I learned from Dr. Ellis's work just as I was launching into the world of publishing and conference. Although I never emulated his harsh and often crude therapeutic style, I was proudly influenced by Dr. Ellis's logic and all that he had to teach about overcoming emotional obstacles to a self-fulfilling life. I feel like a guardian angel whispered in John Vern's ear to put in my hands that book that changed my life a few years ago. Since then, I have never taken lightly any book that seems to appear in my life, especially if I feel some kind of special energy associated with the book at the time. God works in mysterious ways, and what seems like an insignificant coincidence may be the impetus for a monumental change as a result of what appears to be an inconsequential act of giving. From this point of view, I can see that John's gift to me was one of those magical moments that changed my life. I am in my last academic term of my doctoral studies. The year is 1970, and I am scheduled to complete all the numerous requirements for my degree. My dissertation is almost finished and I will defend in May, a few days from now. I am in an advanced seminar on diagnosis and review of case studies, which is a required course to complete my degree. There are six students in the seminar, which meets every Thursday night from 7 to 10 o'clock. Our professor is the most famous man on campus and it is a real honor to be seated with him. I have already taken two courses with him and found that he is the most memorable teacher of my eight years of higher education studies. I consider myself lucky to be in this seminar, since it is the most requested in the university. Admission is by lottery because there are several hundred applicants and it is only offered once a year. I'm pretty sure my advisor, Dr. Mildred Peters, a close friend of this professor, had something to do with the fact that I was a lucky lottery winner. Each week we present case studies to the people in the seminar room seated around a large table. Students offer their thoughts and diagnostic assessments, and the teacher then gives his or her assessment. We all furiously take notes as he talks, we are in awe of this man with an international reputation for his erudition and diagnostic brilliance. The man of letters teaching this seminar is Dr. Fritz Radl, known as the father of modern psychoeducation. He has published many books, the best known of which are Children Who Hate and Controls from Within. Dr. Radl was born in Klaus, Austria, and obtained his doctorate at the University of Vienna, studying with Anna Freud and August Eichhorn. He left Austria in the late 1800s because of the Nazi occupation and the treatment of scholars when they occupied a country. He is also known for his work with delinquent boys and for teaching that love and caring are absolute requirements in the treatment relationship. To that end, he takes us to visit the Pioneer House, which he founded in Detroit as a residential treatment center for psychosocially lost young children. I have come to love this man in many ways. He exudes compassion, and is always entertaining and humorous in his presentations. I have devoured his writings and I feel that I have a very special relationship with him. He has taken me under his wing, inviting me frequently to meet with him alone and discuss some of the cases I present at the seminar. Here in this weekly seminar, the true genius of man is on display every Thursday night. I love my time with this great teacher so much that he brings incredible insight to every case study we present at the seminar. He speaks reverently of the work of Abraham Maslow and encourages me to think of each person as a divine being capable of self-realization if treated with love and affection, even if they don't deserve it. Throughout the entire semester, Fritz Redl repeatedly emphasizes this, even if they don't deserve it. Dr. Redl is a very unpredictable man, known for his unusual sense of humor. Her classes and seminars are always fun and entertaining but also intertwined with her commitment to love and caring as two essential components of the therapeutic relationship. At the midpoint of the academic term, we find these words written on the board. This is your midterm exam. You have minutes to write. Your answers will determine whether you stay in this advanced seminar. He looks at the six of us, all sitting there with our blue books open, obediently ready to write for a few minutes, and hands us a paragraph that reads. 
a self-actualizing man comes to a dinner party where everyone is dressed in pretty formal attire. They all wear evening dresses, suits, and ties. He is wearing overalls, tennis shoes, a t-shirt, and a baseball cap. What does he do? Dr. Red looks at us, tells us that he will be back in minutes, and suddenly leaves the room. The six of us looked at each other curiously, and with puzzled looks we began to write. Just after a few minutes, our teacher returns to the room and asks everyone to read aloud what they have written. We all say pretty much the same thing, trying to sound scholarly and regurgitate what we learned about this idea of self-actualization, he wouldn't mention it, he wouldn't explain himself, he would just act like nothing. They were bothering him. He would participate in a conversation and be himself even if he did not dress the same as the others. He would not judge the situation or feel uncomfortable because he never judges others or himself by appearances. He wouldn't be bothered by the fact that he stood out, he wouldn't apologize or apologize. All of our blue books convey these kinds of responses to the midterm question. After Dr. Reddle has listened to each of us, he takes his briefcase and slams it against the seminar table in mock outrage and outrage at our responses. You have all failed this course. You haven't learned anything yet. All you had to do was write three words on your paper. He takes the chalk in his hand, turns to the blackboard, and writes in large letters, he wouldn't know. Then he leaves the room for five minutes while we sit there, smiling shyly and looking at each other. Dr. Reddle comes back to the room, sits down, and announces that there really are no midterms in this seminar. We spent the next two hours discussing the great distinction that exists between people who rate themselves as average and those who self-update. It has been over 40 years since I took that seminar, and I have never forgotten the lesson of those three words that Fritz Redl wrote on the board that Thursday night. He wouldn't notice. They have stayed with me and influenced me in many ways. Those words penetrated me in that moment, and after all these years I can clearly see how they have permeated my writing, my teaching and, yes, my soul. Self-actualized people see the development of God in everyone they meet. They go beyond appearances. They are friendly to anyone regardless of class, education, political beliefs, race, or religious affiliation. As Maslow noted, in fact, it often seems that they are not even aware of these differences, which to the average person are so obvious and important. When I got out of college and was driving home that night, I made a commitment to myself that this would be my path for life. He would do everything he could to abolish any judgment he made based on appearances. Dr. Redl always emphasized the quality of love, acceptance, and affection for all, both in the therapeutic relationship and in our own lives. He used to tell us that therapy is for better or for worse, and if we, as so-called helpers, were operating at lower spiritual levels than our clients, not only would we be unable to help them, but they would leave their counseling sessions worse off than they were before. After that experience of what I called my mock midterm exam, I realized that I learned more from that little exercise than I ever could have learned from my reading or research. This was a defining moment for me, or what Fritz would have called a peak experience. At the high school where I worked, I took pride in being the only faculty member who had no judgment towards any of the students. Nerds, troublemakers, and the unruly were as welcome in my office as the bright stars who always looked, smelled, and acted in an aura of rosy excellence. I stopped noticing differences between them. The same thing happened in all my interactions. I had always prided myself on being non-judgmental and non-judgmental, but now I realized that I had noticed appearances in a big way. Throughout my academic years I encountered so much motion behavior on the part of teachers and my fellow students that it motivated me to be different, in some way that I myself could define as better. Meeting Fritz Radl, this international spiritual superstar from Austria, was something of a peak experience in reverse. He was in love with the true charisma of this man. I loved his lectures so much that I actually attended them when I was not registered for classes. I was learning from him just by being in his presence. His high energy was contagious. 
it made me want to be a better therapist, a better teacher, and most importantly, a better human being. This was a man who cared, especially for the homeless. He spent much of his time helping the underprivileged and those who had been labeled criminals. The lessons Dr. Fritz Redl gave me are evident throughout my writing, beginning a year later in 1970, with the publication of my first textbook. He was masterful in front of a group, whether they were students in his large lecture hall classes or with a group of six PhD students, or even in private conversation in his office. He loved his job. He loved his track and he really loved those who had more than two strikes against him. He saw the potential greatness in everyone and always looked beyond the outside and looked into that inner space where the spirit is at stake. He was a giant human being, a man he wanted to emulate in many ways. He taught me one of the greatest lessons of my 1961 life, to see the development of God in everyone and when it comes to outward appearances, to be a humanistic teacher who wouldn't even realize it. I am very grateful for the presence of this man in my life and for the way I see so much more clearly because of him. Rest in peace, my beloved teacher. It's 1971. For the past four years I have enjoyed working as a counselor at a fantastic high school, where I take on the role of interim principal from time to time. My salary is satisfactory and I can increase my income by running the driver's education program in the evenings and on weekends. All my PhD requirements are completed and I could easily stay in Detroit with an excellent career ahead of me. If I stay here, I could eventually run the counseling department, have an additional business that pays more than my full-time job, and have the added pleasure of being an adjunct professor at Wayne State University part-time. I have been teaching graduate courses at Wayne State once a week and I love the feeling of being Professor Dyer. Not long ago I was a freshman, wandering the campus trying to figure out the confusing registration procedures at a university with more than 45,000 students, and now I am awarded the title of professor, with all the prestige that that goes with it. Have. It accompanies such a high position, at least it seems high to me. I have been teaching at Wayne State part-time for the past four academic quarters and have a wonderful relationship with the head of the department. My evaluations are excellent and I have applied for a full-time position, but there are no openings at this time. However, I am being considered for a teaching position at a large university in Wisconsin. A gentleman named Bob Doyle also just phoned me to say, you have been offered a full-time teaching position as an assistant professor at St. John's University. Are you willing to move to New York City? I know for a fact that I want to teach at the university level, which means that I am faced with an opportunity and an important decision in life. Accepting this offer from Dr. Doyle, who is the head of the Educational Counseling Department at St. John's, represents a great struggle for me. Detroit is the only place I have ever known, other than the four years I spent traveling the world in the Navy. This is the only place I've ever called home. I am married with a four-year-old daughter, and my two brothers and my mother also live here. My wife is not enthusiastic about separating from her own family and moving to a distant city. She works as a dental assistant, earns a lot of money, and she too has only known Detroit as her home for years of her life. I know that I am being called to a new stage in my life that I have been working on since I decided on this academic path but there is a part of me that wants to stay where I am and work in an environment that is so familiar to me. I struggle with this dilemma every day. I am considering moving to a place where I don't know anyone, for a considerably lower salary than I am making now, to pursue a dream that everyone else feels is a foolish choice. I'm in a dilemma day and night, and I only have a few more days to decide or the offer won't be there. The job market is very tight right now. There are very few university openings for professorships anywhere in the country. No one is hiring, and here I have two offers on my lap after just one interview with these two top schools. I feel blessed, but I live with internal chaos every day. I am a disaster for my indecision and doubt. The easiest thing to do would be to say to 200 myself, forget about changing locations, 
it's too stressful and besides, you have everything your way in Detroit. So why spoil it by uprooting yourself and your family to pursue a dream that is simply too difficult to implement? The second dilemma I face has to do with which of the two chairs I should take, if indeed I am brave enough to finally conclude that I am going to evict my family and do this which is causing me so much stress. I am much more familiar with the Midwest and Wisconsin is much closer to home than distant New York. I present this dilemma to my high school principal, and she adds further anxiety to the situation by offering me a substantial salary increase if I consider staying in my current position. Now I have to decide whether I'm going to take a university professorship and which city I'm going to go to, or should I just take this hefty pay raise and forget about all this other nonsense, and finally sit down once. And for everyone the time is drawing near. I have a decision to make tomorrow. I walk into a semi-private cubicle in the university library that I use almost daily during my graduate years. I can access a quiet place within myself and meditate for more than an hour. When I suddenly return to normal consciousness, an inner voice prompts me to cross the street and speak to Dr. Mildred Peters. She was with me throughout the process of my PhD studies, she rearranged the PhD program curriculum for me four years ago, and she was like a mother and a guide to me. I'm going to see Millie and explain what's going on. She listens to me in her beautiful and moving way and asks me two questions that solve all my dilemmas on the spot, can you live with yourself, Wayne, if you don't face the one who poses the biggest problem, challenge? It's what you've always done. This is your calling, why are you at war with your higher self? I realize that the only reason I am in a dilemma is because I have allowed fear to occupy my inner world. In my heart I have always known and affirmed that I am a teacher. I love being a teacher. From the moment I went to my first interview with Bob Doyle at the American Personnel and Guidance Association, APGA, National Convention in the spring, I knew this was my destiny. I knew that I would be offered the chair even before my interview and, if there was any doubt, it disappeared after our first meeting. This was a done deal, but in my mind I had begun to feel disastrous about the possible consequences of leaving behind what was so familiar to me. I wrote an essay on something I called fear of the unknown, and now I'm living that fear instead of relying on the feeling of love that I experience when I envision myself as a college professor in the Big Apple. When Millie reminds me that I love the idea of challenge, I realize that this is precisely what New York represents to me. I hear the words of the popular song inside of me, if I can do it there, I will do it anywhere. It's a feeling of ecstasy, New York is the greatest challenge you could ever undertake. It's the Big Apple and I'm going to make it. I call my wife from Millie's phone and ask if she's willing to do this with me. She is reluctant, but agrees, knowing that it is something I must do. Two months later we are living in New York. I am in the largest city in the country teaching master's students in the educational guidance and counseling department during the summer session. I am delighted to have my own office, a full class schedule, and my own parking space. Leaving behind the only life I have ever known has been one of the challenges of my life. I have stepped into the unknown and am excited to have finally mustered the courage to leave the familiar behind. I remember my grandfather working in the same factory, living on the same street, for a lifetime. He could feel a deep feeling inside him that he was dissatisfied. I remember working as a resource teacher in Detroit and having a conversation with a friend who told me that he only had more years to work at the school and that he would receive his gold watch and his retirement benefits. I remember the uneasy feeling I had when I thought about doing the same thing for years just so I could comfortably retire. I am very happy that I have made this gigantic change in my life. Everything is so strange to me, the traffic, the customs, the accents, the rush, the rush, the rush of it all, but I'm at peace and I know I can get here. Looking back on those days when I felt so much internal tension from not being able to make the decision to leave the familiar and head out into the unknown, I can clearly see that there was something very powerful working within me that just couldn't be ignored. I came here with music to play, 
and the thought of reaching the end of my life and dying with that music still reverberating within me was more than I could bear. I trust these inner feelings and believe that they involve a kind of divine guidance, which in this case sent me to Dr. Peters. Millie knew exactly what to say to me at that moment, just as she is here guiding me as I write these words. I feel her presence almost every day, smiling at me even though she left this material world many years ago. She knew that I had a great dharma to live, in fact, she often told me that I had greatness within me and that I was destined to be a great voice for the transformation of our world. She is truly an angel now, someone I talk to when I have big decisions to make, and I know that she was an earthly angel to me throughout my years as a PhD student in 1961. That there are guardian angels that appear in our lives at crucial moments. From this point of view it is obvious to me, although it was not at the time, that Dr. Mildred Peters was sent to me by heavenly forces who knew that I would need a guiding light to make the big decisions in my life. I remember so many times when I thought about giving up my noble ideas and Millie would just show up and guide me in the right direction that my destiny demanded. On that day in 1971, I was in such inner turmoil about where to go and how to make it all happen. This woman, who I swear had the ability to look into the future, removed all my reservations with her piercing gaze and straightened me up. The result of that decision to date includes published books, public television specials, more than a thousand public lectures and hundreds and hundreds of recorded programs, which have helped millions of people improve their lives. I can see it all from here, as I have a vision of Millie smiling at me right now, that I was fortunate to have not only an extremely competent professional advisor, but one who would be with me for the rest of my days. Something that I know today that I was not aware of years ago is the learning from A Course in Miracles. ACIM teaches us to make decisions by asking ourselves, am I doing this out of fear or out of love? When we are afraid, there is no place for love, and when we are in love, there is no place for fear. When I removed the fear from my inner world, I felt a deep sense of peace. In other words, I was able to get out of love. Without fear, I was able to view New York City as a great adventure rather than something to fear. Fear is a mental exercise that is a habitual response lodged in the subconscious from early childhood that arises when we anticipate the unknown. From my current perspective, I know that love is what remains when I let go of fear. I have applied this wisdom from ACIM in making important decisions throughout my life. When a tug of war comes up involving indecision and doubt, I remind myself that anxiety is an emotional response and therefore must come from love or fear, and since love is not stressful, it must be an emotional response. Scared that is playing. Then I just go to an inner loving place, and the indecision is resolved. I find that if I keep quiet and meditate on the subject, loving guidance appears, and for me that loving guidance often takes the form of someone who has been a heavenly presence for me in my life. It's obvious from a distance where he needed to go to New York. If I had gone to Wisconsin or stayed in Detroit, my life, and possibly yours as well, would have looked different than it does today. It was conquering fear that allowed me to follow my dream when those mental obstacles arose. I live by the old adage that I really understand today, fear knocked on the door, love responded, and there was no one there. As one of my greatest teachers, Ralph Waldo Emerson, once observed, they can beat those they think they can and he who does not overcome a fear every day has not learned the lesson of life. That day, I learned one of life's great lessons. I am a full-time professor teaching graduate students at St. John's University. This is my second year and I still love being in this academic world. I am free to teach my courses as I choose. I primarily teach school teachers who are interested in becoming school counselors, I also supervise five or six PhD students as their advisor and direct their research towards their PhD theses. I also have a private counseling practice. However, I spend much of my time writing articles for professional magazines. My head of department, Dr. Bob Doyle, has told me, to receive a promotion and ultimately in tenure, 
you must demonstrate your academic competence by publishing in professional magazines and textbooks. It's 1973, and I'm part of a system known as Publish or Perish. If I don't have publishing credits, I will lose my job and professional jobs are very rare. I'm writing the kind of writing that I loathed as a freshman in college writing in APA style to please a graduate teaching assistant in English. I want to write for the masses, I want to publish my own books on living a self-fulfilling life, and I have a million ideas running through my mind as to what a popular and best-selling book would make. In particular, I am drawn to writing a manual that invites people who see themselves as normal to create a new vision for themselves. I want to encourage readers to discover their potential to live at extraordinary levels of consciousness. Dr. Maslow wrote about this potential in Toward a Psychology of Being, published about a decade ago, a book that's always in my briefcase. Still, I diligently submit articles to many magazines and compile an impressive professional writing resume. I am applying for a promotion to associate professor after completing my first academic year. I am rejected for moving forward, but the committee encourages me because it considers that such requests continue in the same vein. I am frustrated with this type of activity in my life. I love my teaching responsibilities and am popular with students. I put a lot of love and effort into my teaching activity and I love being in front of a classroom. I practice the vow I made a decade ago when I attended so many monotonous lectures. I do everything I can to bring my classroom to life. I use humor and anecdotes, and demonstrate the kind of counseling that I would like my graduate students to practice. I bring in recordings of prominent therapists and generally make my classroom an exciting place to be. My class size is roughly students, but it is not unusual for as many as people to attend, as my class attracts many guests invited by my graduate students. I start recording my lectures. In the back of my mind I know that the material I teach and the methods I use will appeal to a general audience, as well as school teachers who wish to become helping professionals in the field of counseling. I want to have a record of these popular lectures for my personal use when I am ready to write for periodicals that are not boring, hopefully in the near future. I am completing my second academic year, and this time the promotion committee decides that I am worthy of the title of associate professor. I am now co-authoring a book with my colleague in Detroit, Dr. John Vrind. The book is written by the two of us and a host of other professionals and is titled Effective Group Counseling. I am now a published author, and this publication credit allows me to be called an Associate Professor of Counseling Psychology. The following year I wrote another textbook with John, published by AGPA Press. The American Guidance and Personnel Association is the professional association for academics and professionals in this field, a prestigious organization within the academic community. This book is titled Counseling Techniques That Work and will be welcomed because it is a required textbook in graduate school classes across the country. I am busy writing a third textbook that I agreed to co-author with John Vrind. I furiously write every spare moment I have and send him the original manuscript chapter by chapter for editing, but I can't get him to reply. John worries more and more about his drinking. When I call him on the phone to discuss the manuscript, he is often incoherent and speaks the kind of drunken conversation that I remember so vividly from the days I lived with my stepfather many years ago. I write the entire book, titled Group Counseling for Personal Mastery, but I can't get the man I've agreed to co-author with to cooperate on what I consider a sensible schedule. I decide that I no longer want to be in the position of depending on someone else to complete my writing. I am a lonely act and will no longer associate with anyone. I abandon the idea of publishing this book right now and begin to focus all my mental energy on writing my own book. Not for the academic community, but for the general public. I have read Dale Carnegie, Napoleon Hill, and Norman Vincent Peale and feel that I can offer a book that goes beyond their inspiration and advice. I love and admire all these men and what they have offered, I see them as pioneers in a fascinating club that I intend to join. I have written three textbooks, the last one still unpublished, but I know it will be one day. About the articles I have written have appeared in professional magazines, 
and I co-produced a series of cassette tapes titled Counseling for Personal Mastery. I feel that this stage of my journey is complete and my vision is changing. The academic world, while stimulating and rewarding, is becoming increasingly insufficient. I love the classroom and the students, but the politics of college life leaves me cold. Committee meetings, office politics, job pressures, seemingly trivial administrative demands, and a mountain of paperwork and notices in my inbox are draining my creative juices. I'm done with writing that has a limited audience and is being done for status and promotion rather than personal fulfillment. I feel stifled in many areas of life and I realize that I need to temporarily remove myself from this environment. I know this is a fabulous job that many would give almost anything to have, but I feel called to a new chapter in my life. I know the signs and I also know that I cannot ignore them without paying a high price. I remember reading a question that now touches my conscience, have you lived years or have you lived a year? I am in the midst of a change that I cannot and will not ignore. I don't want to do the same thing over and over again, compiling a repeating resume. I need to expand. I need to make the decisions. I especially need to be free from the stale and insipid requirements that are imposed on me as a prerequisite for the privilege of working as a university professor. Looking back on my years as a college professor, I now know how important it is to avoid the trap of evaluating success and happiness based on external measures. I had everything going for me in my early to mid years. I had a job where I was almost certainly granted tenure, which means a guaranteed job for life, in a profession where such security is a rare commodity. I had excellent evaluations from all my students and my supervisors at the university. The dean frequently reminded me how much I was valued and appreciated for the recognition I brought to the university. I had amassed an enviable editorial resume, with future textbook contracts on my desk awaiting my signature. It had the coziest work arrangement one could ask for. I only had to be on campus two days a week, had a great relationship with my colleagues, and a thriving therapy practice. Sure, this was a great job, but something burned inside of me, demanding my full-time attention. My outer world looked great, but my inner world, where I earn my whole life, felt incomplete and restless. I was reminded of the eponymous character of Leo Tolstoy in his famous story The Death of Ivan Ilyich. On his deathbed, Ivan Ilyich looks his wife in the eye, the woman he despised because she had made many of the arrangements in his life without consulting him or what he was feeling. And ask, what if my whole life has been wrong? That scene gave me chills. I couldn't imagine living my life writing for academia, co-authoring with a man whose heart wasn't in it, and teaching courses in the same classrooms and attending the same college curriculum meetings throughout life. My life really would have been bad, as Ivan Ilyich feared on his deathbed. I didn't know it then, but that was my higher self, trying to get my attention in an effort to make me live without fear. Wayne State University offers a graduate program in counseling psychology for eligible military personnel and their dependents in Germany. Instead of students coming to college, this ongoing program brings college closer to students. They ask me if I would consider teaching in this program abroad for two academic terms, and I say yes. It is the spring of 1974 and I am on leave from St. John's University in the divided city of Berlin. This is my first time in Europe and I am enjoying the freedom I feel from all the unsettling requirements associated with my university position in New York. I am teaching a full academic load in Berlin, and I love this job and this adventure in a big way. Germany has always fascinated me. My mother's two brothers were in World War II, my uncle Stuart, with whom one lived during my eighth year, along with his four children, had been a Nazi prisoner of war for two years. My uncle Bill, my inspiration to go to college and become a teacher, had served in the Pacific on a Navy destroyer. I have heard the horror stories of the Holocaust and seen the death camp movies, and it has always seemed incomprehensible to me that such evil could have taken place, particularly during my own lifetime. Perhaps in ancient times, but not while I was a child in an orphanage, 
it seems possible that camps were erected for the purpose of exterminating an entire population of people, just because of religious and cultural differences. I struggle with how this country of civilized people allowed such evil to run rampant among them. Wherever I go, I talk to Germans and ask them the same question, it was only a few years ago, how could this happen? No one will talk about it. There is a collective shame evident in all the men and women who lived it. I decide to learn more about this. I am incredulous and obsessed with how such unprincipled behavior could infect an entire population. What were they thinking? Why couldn't they end this madness before it reached such epic proportions? This is proof of the groupthink mentality that I so abhor and have been struggling with on a small personal scale, and how monstrous it can get. I buy William Shire's History of Nazi Germany, entitled The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which was first published in 1961. I read the entire book in a few days and am even more distraught than before. It seems that the course of human history has made blind obedience to the rules the greatest virtue of the German mind. I notice it everywhere. It seems that everyone does what they are told, no one questions the supposed authority. If there is a rule, you obey it without hesitation. I see this automatic submission everywhere. Nobody in Germany seems to question anything. My teaching schedule allows me to travel, so my wife and I spend weekends visiting places within a short train ride from our location. We go to Bavaria, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Austria, France, Holland, and Switzerland. I find the differences between East and West Germany stark, and I can't get the images of the Holocaust out of my head. The trampling of all evidence of individuality, when sufficiently suppressed, provokes the madness of ethnic cleansing and makes genocide an accepted fact. I am beyond obsessed. I have to see this for myself. I make the decision to take the train to Munich and visit Dachau. Upon arrival, I tell the taxi driver that my wife and I wish to go to the former death camp that has been preserved as a reminder of what happened just a few years ago so that the world will never forget. The taxi driver, a man of more or less, refuses to take us to the camp. Obviously, he participated in those horrors in some way during his time, and his shame is so great that he chooses to miss a ticket rather than visit this place. Another taxi takes us to Dachau, the first open concentration camp in Germany. Built for political prisoners, it later became a crematorium and mass murder facility for the evil visions of the Nazi party. Instead of thinking for themselves, the German people did what they were told to do on such a grand scale that it took millions of them to carry out the sinister orders of a madman and his loyal henchmen. As we walk through the Dachau grounds, I am overwhelmed with sadness and despair. I feel the pain of the hatred that took place right here, yes, here, in the ovens and gas chambers, human beings were slaughtered day after day, for many years, all within sight of a prosperous city a few kilometers away. Away. This is the end result of brainwashing people to vilify others who think, worship, or act differently than the majority. I feel like the air is getting harder and harder to breathe. I feel like I'm going to throw up. Fear and despair are still here in these old barracks, showers, and ovens, even on the sidewalk I walk on. I feel like I'm here for a reason. Internal disruption is more than a normal reaction to a horror show like this. I know that I have changed forever. I was conceived on the day this war started, the 1st of September, when Hitler invaded Poland. I was born nine months later, on May 10th. I feel like somehow I was destined here, and I can't get this idea out of my mind. I was called to this God-forgotten place that is now a Holocaust Memorial Museum, and it is leaving a lasting impression on me. A week later, I catch a train to Amsterdam and visit the house where Anne Frank hid in the secret annex, and I wrote her famous diary that became a worldwide phenomenon when the madness of World War II came to an end. I go up the stairs and again I feel the pain that still emanates from the railing, the floor, the whole building, as if this shameful energy had not dispersed. It is still here in the house that is now a museum in memory of the Otto and Edith Frank family, 
as well as the countless victims who were massacred during the same years that I was a child growing up safe in a foster home. Across the ocean I don't just look at the photos and read the memories, I connect with the fear of those who lived here. Once again the air is thick, I can't breathe, I have to go outside to get some fresh air. Somehow I am connected to all of this. It happened while I was alive. I do not understand my passionate desire to know all this. It is much more than a curiosity. I am in this environment and I am forced to visit other horrendous places where atrocities were committed with the voluntary help of an entire population that had been brainwashed by a convincing speaker spitting evil and hatred and convinced a large number of people of that it was his duty. Behaving in this malevolent manner, even though it violated his own original nature. They voluntarily allow themselves to violate their own inner sense of love for their fellow men. How could this have happened? It is unimaginable that this has happened in my life. I am shocked. I feel a call to speak, to write in a way that can never happen again. I am leaving Germany to do a teaching assignment in Karamersal, which is located in northwestern Turkey in Izmit Bay in the Sea of Marmara. I cannot get rid of the images that I have seen and I am deeply shocked by my experience of living in a Germany that just less than years ago was at war with the world. During the long bus ride from Istanbul to Karamersal, I feel like I am transported back to biblical times. I see slaughtered animals in the central markets of the villages, all kinds of wagons carrying goods, and locals driving old American cars or on bicycles. It is very far from Germany. I teach at an Air Force base for a 10-week term and I am excited about the idea of the university being taken to our military overseas. The students are grateful and I am proud to be a member of the faculty here in this secluded location. My 10 weeks go by fast. My wife and I are scheduled to leave Turkey and return to the United States in July, when I will return to teach at St. John's University as a newly promoted associate professor. I'm not sure if I will continue to work full-time, but I agreed to stay at the university for the next fall semester starting in September. Living in a Muslim country has been enlightening in many ways. I love the people here. I love being close to nature and swimming every day in the Sea of Marmara. Living in Berlin, then Glyphada, Greece, for a short time, and then Turkey has stretched its mind. However, I am eager to return home. My wife and I arrived at the Istanbul airport in circumstances that were new to us. There are tanks, military soldiers armed with rifles and weapons of many descriptions on the way to the airport and inside the airport itself. It is July of 1974, and there is talk of war and closing the airport, which is crowded with people trying to leave the country. When I check in for our flight, I am informed that there will be no commercial flights in or out of Istanbul for the foreseeable future. I have been told that we could be trapped here for an indefinite period of time. People panic, the airport is congested with frustrated, angry and scared people. The war talk is ubiquitous. Turkey is preparing to invade northern Cyprus and Greece is preparing for a military response. I walk through the airport with a different mental vision than everyone else, who seems to be in various stages of fear and panic. I see myself flying out of here this morning. It is an intention that is glued with super glue in my imagination, this image will not leave me. I see some Americans in a line getting ready to board a military transport plane headed for Ramstein Air Base in Germany. I also notice a Turkish man who seems to be somewhat in charge of boarding procedures. In this hectic environment, he reaches out to people and asks them questions. Everyone he approaches shakes their heads and leaves. I walk up to this man and he asks me where I'm going. I explain that I am scheduled to fly to London, but my flight has been cancelled. I tell him that I have a military ticket, with a high-ranking GS, general service, rating, as I was a professor at an air base in Karamersal. He says my ticket is no longer good, but if I want to leave Turkey, he can arrange it on this flight to Germany and I can work it out from there. There are only two seats left in this military transport, for dollar, in cash, it will take my wife and me on this flight and out of Turkey, which is about to break out into war. 
I see this Turkish man as an angel sent to me to fulfill my intention to return home today. I give him all the money I have, which is more or less what I have earned from my time as a teacher at Karamersal. I'm a few dollars short, but he takes it and my wife and I boarded the last flight out of Istanbul. She is staring at me open-mouthed, moments before she panics from being trapped endlessly in a war-torn country, and now we fly to Germany on a US military flight. Arranged to address somehow. Bribe a local Turk amid the chaos. We landed in Ramstein, took a commercial flight from Frankfurt, and returned to the United States in July 1974, the same day that the Turkish military invasion of Cyprus is launched in response to a Greek military junta. Coup in Cyprus I sing the praises of the power that exists to make miracles happen when one holds firmly to an intention. The time I spent teaching abroad provided me with life experiences that were instrumental in everything I was to create for the next four decades. I spent much of my previous life, from my earliest memories, rebelling against authority figures and institutions that directed me to think and be like everyone else. It seems I was born with this kind of recalcitrant reaction to the groupthink mentality. Living in Germany allowed me to see firsthand, on an experimental level, how dangerous such thinking can be and how it can lead to the ultimate human degradation of genocide. Every day I ask the tough questions of anyone who lived through those dreadful years of World War II. He needed to hear from the ex-soldiers, the housewives, the ones who were children, he had to hear it from them. Did you know? What do you think about it? Have you ever considered disobeying hateful orders? The responses were almost always the same, we didn't realize, we were too scared to object, that's the way things were, we did what we were told. I knew in my heart that practically everyone had to cooperate in some way, because the horrible actions were so widespread and involved millions of people. When I left Germany I knew that I had changed forever. I had to be in this place right now for my conscience to be impressed. I would have to write and talk about the importance of self-reliance and the self, but not the human self, a higher self. I knew that what Thoreau had instilled in me in high school about the need for civil disobedience would now have to seep into all my future writing. These vile acts occurred through wrong zones of mental representation that had to be changed. I could write about this with much more passion than has ever been a part of my writing and my speech before. Now I look back and I can see the perfection in all of this. I incarnated the day that horrible war started. I was obsessed with knowing the truth of what the Nazis were able to accomplish while I was a child living in an orphanage. I had made my inner vow to teach myself rather than trust the group. All these influences were part of the Dharma that was my destiny. I left Germany determined, although I did not know when or how, to teach people to trust their own original nature, which is made up of love, kindness, gentleness and, above all, service to others. In both Amsterdam and Dachau, I experienced firsthand that energy is eternal. In those resurrected places, open to the public so that we will never forget it, I felt some of the pain, sadness and fear felt by those who were being so mistreated. I have never doubted this. From this point of view, I can clearly see that I was breathing the actual pheromones of fear while in Amsterdam, Dachau and other similar places. I have seen how animals that are taken to slaughterhouses where other animals have died out of fear react in the same way, as they feel that energy and emit fear pheromones themselves. Everything is energy. I stopped eating meat from slaughtered animals years ago, because when I ate that meat, I was also consuming fear. I choose to do whatever I can personally to be surrounded and encapsulated by love rather than fear. My future writing was to focus on overcoming fear and awareness of the permanent nature of energy and how it impacts us all. I was going to lecture and write about the idea that we are all connected in spirit, that is the nature of our universe. I was so deeply influenced by my visits and conversations in Germany. Walking through these vile places, I could feel a connection with these unfortunate souls within me and in my heart. I felt possessed by something ethereal while traveling through Europe in 1974. I know that I was sent there to awaken my soul and inspire me to teach people how to overcome their wrong thinking patterns. 
As I relieve my experience in Turkey as the war broke out over the Cypriot issue, I remember how important that day was to me. I had an image in my mind of escaping the country that particular morning, it was so real that I acted like it was already my reality. It was not a wish, it was an intention. And because I had used my imagination in such a way as to exclude each and every thought that it was not working, I discovered the power of intention experimentally, long before I could write about it many years later. I must have told that story hundreds of times about how powerful an image can be in your mind, especially when you act like the image is already a reality. Rather than looking for reasons to verify why this was an impossible situation at Istanbul airport, I acted on the basis of an inside image. Once again I had exposed myself to the idea that would become a motto for me in my writing and in my life, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. My departure from Turkey that day in July 1974 was already an idea whose moment had come to my mind, and the power came from my willingness to act solely on that idea. This has been a central theme in all of my writing, and obviously I had to experience it firsthand for it to imprint so vividly on my consciousness. It's August 1974, and I'm in New York teaching a summer class at St. John's University. It is a shortened semester, with classes meeting twice a week to make it equivalent to a normal semester. I speak with my colleague, Dr. Shirley Griggs, who is the director of a federal grant designed to determine whether Southern colleges and universities comply with the Civil Rights Act of 1961. She tells me that I could earn some extra money if I went to the University of Mississippi for women in Columbus, Mississippi, spend two days attending classes, interviewing students and teachers, and write a report at the end of the trip. I just got back from Europe, where it cost me dollar, to bribe my way home from Turkey, and I'm glad I got the chance to earn some extra money so I accept. Four years ago, I heard from a cousin on my father's side named Dorothy Phillips, who said, Wayne, I heard that you've spent a lot of energy trying to get to know your father. I'm just calling to tell you that he died in 1961 in New Orleans and his body was sent to Biloxi, Mississippi, for burial. That's all I know. Although my father had died and I stopped looking for him, my dreams of meeting him and the anger I feel in those dreams still persist. Now I have the opportunity to go to Mississippi on business, and I am excited about the prospect of going to his grave and even checking the death certificate to see if he is listed as a surviving child. I have never seen this man, of course, nor do I know if he ever acknowledged that he had three children, I being the youngest. I accept the assignment Shirley offered me and am looking forward to visiting my father's grave and perhaps closing this topic a bit, which has puzzled me since I was a child. The summer session ends on Wednesday in August. I fly to Columbus, Mississippi, on Thursday and do all my required visits and interviews that night and the next morning. When I'm done, I go to the only car rental place on campus and rent a 1974 Dodge Coronet. I'm going to drive a few miles to Biloxi, spend a day or two there, return the car to the New Orleans airport, and fly home Sunday night. I notice that the Dodge smells like a new car and I see that it has never been rented before. Odometer reads, Miles, new car delivered today at this college location. As I get behind the wheel, I reach for the seat belt and discover that it is missing. I get out of the car, pull the entire seat off the bench and see the belt taped to the floor of the car, the buckle wrapped in plastic, and a rubber band around it. I tear off the tape and the plastic and find a business card tucked inside the buckle. It says, Candle Light Inn, Biloxi, Mississippi, with a series of arrows leading to the inn. For a moment I think it's strange that this is in a new car and I'm actually heading to Biloxi. Then I put the card in my shirt pocket and start my journey. I get to the outskirts of Biloxi at p.m. on Friday in August and I go into the first gas station I see. I look in the phone book on a chain in the phone booth and call the three cemeteries listed in the yellow pages. After a busy signal for the first number and there is no answer for the second number, the third list is answered by an elderly southern gentleman ringing. I'm wondering if a Melvin Lyle Dyer, who died 10 years ago in 1961, 
could be buried in the cemetery. The man walks away from the phone for a full 10 minutes and, just as I'm about to hang up, he says, yes, your father is buried here. My heart beats through my chest. I feel like I'm finally going to have my visit with my father, even though it's in less than ideal circumstances. I ask the gentleman for directions and he informs me that this place is not an actual cemetery, but a place where the homeless are frequently buried, on the grounds of the candlelight inn. Dazed, I pull the card out of my shirt pocket, I am three blocks away and there is a map engraved on the card. Shivering, I drive to the little hut, where the gentleman shows me my father's death certificate. It has been kept in a battered cardboard Coca-Cola box for ten years. The certificate is stained and moldy, and I note with some satisfaction that my name and the names of my two brothers are listed as their surviving children. I knew he had a son named Wayne. I wonder who put it there and what did it tell someone about me and my brothers. The old man directs me to a grassy knoll above a driveway with a chain running through it. He says I can stay there as long as I want and asks me to put the chain back on when I get out. I park the car and walk to the headstone on the ground that says, Melvin Lyle Dyer, 1961. That's it. This is how we find ourselves. I stand there with tears rolling down my face. I'm still full of rage, thinking, I should pee in this grave and leave. But I do not do it. I've been looking for this man ever since I learned he had a father. For the first seven or eight years of my life, I didn't even know what the concept of father meant. So many questions go through my mind now, and I am overwhelmed by the excitement I feel standing next to this metal plate on the ground. For the next two and a half hours I chatted with my father. I cry loudly, oblivious to my surroundings. And I speak out loud, demanding answers from the grave. As the hours go by, I begin to feel a deep sense of relief and become very quiet. The tranquility is overwhelming. I'm pretty sure my father is there with me. I no longer speak with a tombstone, but somehow I am in the presence of something that I cannot explain. Finally, I wipe away my tears and say goodbye. As I walk to the rental car and have the chain in hand to block the driveway, an indescribable force overtakes me and I rush back to the grave site, as if urging me back. I talk to my father again, only this time I say something very different, somehow I feel like they sent me here today and that you had something to do with it. I do not know what your role is, not even if you have it, but I am sure that the time has come to abandon this anger and hatred that I have been carrying so painfully. I want you to know that from this moment, right now, all of that is gone. I forgive you. I don't know what motivated you to lead your life the way you did. I'm sure you must have felt many moments of sadness knowing that you had three children that you would never see. Whatever was going on inside of you, I want you to know that I can no longer have hateful thoughts about you. When I think of you now, it will be with compassion and love. I am letting go of all this mess that is inside of me. I know in my heart that you were simply doing what you knew how to do given the conditions of your life at the time. Although I do not remember ever seeing you, and although it was my greatest dream to one day meet you face to face and listen to your side, I will not let those thoughts stop me from ever feeling the love that I have. I have for you. I stand on this lonely grave in southern Mississippi, and say what I feel now, I send you love. I send you love, from this moment, I send you love. In this full-blooded moment, I feel forgiveness for the man who was my biological father, as well as for the child who had been and who wanted to know and love him. I feel a kind of peace and cleanliness that is completely new to me. I walk back to my car, put the chain on the driveway and feel a new sense of lightness. The elderly southern gentleman had given me the name of the man who delivered my father's body to this homeless cemetery. I look for him and discover that he was my father's best friend. He works as a projectionist in a Biloxi cinema. On Saturday in August I go there. The Ten Commandments are playing in the matinee. I climb the back stairs and knock on the projection booth door. I spend the afternoon with this man who tells me about the man who was my father. I learn very little, 
except that she had mentioned her three children on occasion, but it was very rare. I hear again about his alcoholism and wandering nature. I don't even care to know more details. I leave the theater and drive to the New Orleans airport. I am a changed man. I just participated in a miracle. I don't hate my father anymore. I know I was sent here to do this forgiveness thing, but I'm not sure why. I just know that something very mysterious is at work here. Something bigger than me is moving the pieces and conspired to land me here. I get home to New York on Sunday in September. I have more than two weeks before I go back to college for the fall semester. I put together all my recordings of my lectures from the last three years, along with the notes I kept during my time in Europe earlier this year. I make a flight reservation for tomorrow, Labor Day, to fly to FT. Lauderdale, Florida. I'm going to a sunny, warm place on the ocean to write my book, What Has Been Dominating My Inner World Needs to Escape and Be Born. At FT. Lauderdale Airport I rent a car for two weeks and drive to the Spindrift Motel, across the street from the Atlantic Ocean. I hide in my room, listen to the tapes, and take lots of notes. I decide that I am done with all this mental and physical preparation, I'm ready to write and start a writing binge. I stay in that motel room writing every night until the sun comes up. In September, I fly back to New York to begin the fall semester. I wrote a full manuscript using the same formula that has worked so well for me in my private therapy practice. Twelve chapters describe a common sense, rational approach designed to help anyone reach the top of Maslow's pyramid, self-actualization. First, identify the thought that is causing any kind of disturbance. Second, label the behaviors the customer is displaying. Third, establish the psychological reward system to maintain these behaviors. Fourth, focus on the alternatives by devising specific strategies to eliminate those ways of being counterproductive. No sophisticated psychological system, just old common sense with specific techniques for change. This has worked wonders in my counseling practice and I am sure my book will be well received. After spending a few hours in a spirit of forgiveness for something that immobilized me for my entire life, it seems that what I have agonized for years has vanished in just two weeks. The writing seems to be effortless guided and I have completed a handwritten manuscript. No title. No editor. Just an inner knowing that those moments at my father's grave have infused me with a spirit that I have never experienced before. Today, if you ask me what is the most significant experience of my life, I respond with the events of August 1974, being at my father's grave in Biloxi, Mississippi, forgiving and loving him, and cleansing my soul of the toxicity that living with internal rage had brought him. I am in awe of the synchronicities that came together to lead me to that grave. I don't have a clever intellectual explanation for the presence of that business card in that new rental car. I cannot give a rational explanation as to why a cousin I had never met called me four years before, why Dr. Shirley Griggs offered me that temporary assignment, or why I was called back to the cemetery plot and ordered to send love where internal violence had previously resided. I follow Rumi's poignant advice. I am puzzled by all this. However, I know that something far more powerful than a series of mere coincidences was at stake. From a clearer perspective looking back at everything, I know that God's fingerprints are all over the scene. Now I realize that I was a mess in those days. I was working but I was unsatisfied. My writing was stunted and, for the first time, emotionally unrewarding. He had bad eating and drinking habits, was overweight, and was in an unsatisfying marriage. He was an angry man in many ways and had frequent nightmares about my father. I would wake up in a cold sweat having met him at a bar in the nightmare, and I was always in a fist fight with him, lashing out in anger and demanding responses from a ghost that kept disappearing from my sight in my sleeping vision. I knew I had more important things to accomplish, yet I felt trapped by the circumstances of my life and unable to free myself from these self-imposed traps. After my return from Biloxi, my life took on a whole new flavor. My writing at the Spindrift Motel was pure joy. 
he wrote all night, often frustrated in the morning when he saw sheet after sheet of paper on the floor, my daydream about writing had been so hypnotic that I forgot to number the pages. Within weeks of returning to New York, I began an exercise regimen that continues to this day. I got into top physical shape and started a running streak of 8 miles a day that lasted 29 years, with the exception of one day. I changed my eating habits and adopted a completely new attitude. The book I wrote days after dispelling the anguish from my soul finally became the number one selling book of the decade, and has now been published in 47 languages around the world, with total sales below 1 million copies all over the world. It's called Your Erroneous Zones, and it talks about silly mistakes in our thinking and how to live a life free of emotional turmoil by changing our habitual thinking habits. This was a book that he was destined to write. A life of divinely inspired experiences prepared me for the task, yet I was being strangled by a self-sabotaging inner rage that had to be excavated. I was directed to Biloxi to understand firsthand the incredible power of forgiveness. This idea is at the center of spiritual teaching and yet it is one of the most ignored principles. Jesus reminds us in Luke 6, 27, But I say to those who listen to me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. And in Luke, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. These are just two of hundreds of such biblical warnings. There is great power in truly living this way. When I was able to forgive and send love where hate once ruled, everything in my life changed. The right words were there, the right people began to appear, circumstances magically appeared, all the scarcity dissolved, my health returned, my energy was rekindled, and my life was flooded with abundance, all due to a profound moment of forgiveness that was orchestrated by forces beyond my human capacity to explain. It was as if the universal divine mind, God, or the Tao, as it were, saw that I was trapped in a shifting sand that was destroying me, and merged the events necessary to give me a giant branch to grab onto, and remove me once and for all from the deadly well that extinguished my vital forces. From this point of view I can see that God is love, and forgiveness is a tool that is available to lead us back to a life made by God. I had always known that I had to write my way about the subjects that were precious to me. However, I could not free myself from so many ties that held me back. He had a life that would have been the envy of most people, but inside he was filled with discontent. As I was in the midst of the events of that summer of 1974, I felt something awaken within me. He couldn't see the mystical hand of divine intervention in action, this was only available to me as clearer vision years after I was able to see from a distance what was being taken to do me. In fact, many years later, I helped write and produce a film version of the essence of that Biloxi experience, titled My Greatest Teacher. I gave him this ironic title because I believe today that it was my father, this man I have never met, who taught me the great lesson that St. Augustine, forgiveness is the remission of sins. Because this is why what was lost, and was found, is saved from being lost again. After Biloxi I have never lost myself again. I have written entire chapters on the power of forgiveness and have told the story of my coming to meet my father to audiences around the world. I have counseled thousands of people in person, in the media, and on my own radio show, and I created the movie I just referred to. Once they found me and I saw how he offered me a change of meaning in my life, away from pain towards self-realization and God-realization, I was never lost again. Perhaps my favorite quote on forgiveness is from Mark Twain, Forgiveness is the fragrance thrown by the violet, on the heel that has crushed it. In fact, we send love in response to hatred and become spiritual alchemists. I didn't forgive my father just for his sake, I did it for myself and for him too. This I can see now with a much clearer vision today. At the end of the fall semester of 1974, I am completing the teaching of two courses at St. John's University on counseling techniques that work and diagnostic skills. I have recorded all of these lectures over the past three years and used much of the material from the first draft of my self-help book written a few months ago. 
That manuscript is in my office while I consider what I should do to get it published for the mass market. I am a stranger and publishers have been unwilling to take chances with me, despite the fact that I have written three textbooks and a bevy of articles that have been published in professional journals. I have done my best to make my evening classes informative and entertaining. I think back to my days as an undergraduate student who was so perplexed by the inability of the vast majority of teachers to bring material to life, to keep audiences entertained and on the edge of their seats. I love teaching and being in front of an audience, I especially enjoy making my classroom fun by injecting humor as often as possible. I am approached by five students from my Tuesday and Thursday evening lectures, encouraging me to make this material available to a much broader and less academically oriented audience. Dr. Dyer, could you consider offering a series of publicly available lectures similar to the ones you are teaching here at the university? These students are completing their master's program and often bring their friends and family to attend my lectures. They all live on the north shore of Long Island and they tell me they can guarantee a good turnout if I consider their request. It turns out that one of these students, Linda, works in Port Washington at the Educational Assistance Center, EAC, as an administrator and tells me that the building is never used after 6 p.m. on Monday. It will make the EAC available at no cost if I am willing to teach a course open to the public. I agree and create a course title for this four-week night school offer, Living a Self-Fulfilling Life. Linda plants a short story in the Port Washington News inviting the public to four lectures on four consecutive Monday nights beginning in February 1957. I'm going to give a public lecture for the first time. The total cost of the course is $1.20. This is my first stipend for public speaking. I arrive on Monday night at 7 o'clock for the first presentation to see that the students are sitting in the classroom. I end up with 500 in extra cash, which is a lot of cash during a somewhat depressed economy. I give all four lectures on topics such as overcoming guilt and worry, goodbye anger, and releasing the past. These are all chapter titles in my fully written, but still unpublished manuscript, which is in my office at the university. At the end of the fourth presentation, the students ask me to extend classes for four more weeks, they love these Monday night lectures and they don't want them to end. They also tell me that many of their friends are interested in joining. So, on the first Monday in March, I arrived to teach my next class and found that the room was packed. Sixty people crowd the classroom, all with dollar bills in hand. My Monday night lecture series is a huge success in North Long Island communities. In a year I have to leave the EAC due to space limitations, and I decide to rent the auditorium at Schreiber High School on Campus Drive in Port Washington. The place is packed every Monday night for the next year and a half, and when my book is published the following March, there will be people present. Now I earn more money from my lecture series than I do as a full-time professor at the university. My Monday night conferences in Port Washington are a great community event, attended by people from all over the New York metropolitan area. It is not long before I receive a letter in the mail from Mr. Arthur Pine, who is a literary agent in New York City, telling me that his wife, Harriet, is a close friend of someone who has been attending my lectures. Harriet's friend praises the content and presentation style of the teacher offering these classes to the community, and has suggested that Artie contact me to see if I would like to write a book using the format of these lectures for the general population. I pick up the phone and call Artie, who has a home in Port Washington. I tell him that I have a complete manuscript that I have been looking at for over six months, wondering what I need to do to get in touch with an editor. Artie listens to me describe the book and how I want to keep it in common sense language for the general public. He loves the idea and invites me to meet him at his Manhattan office the following week. I take the subway into town with my completed manuscript in hand and spend a lovely afternoon telling Artie all my ideas. He says he cannot promise me anything as I am an unknown product, and this would really be the first book as my previous books were written for a different market. Artie is skeptical, but he's captivated by my enthusiasm and loves the rave reviews he's heard from his wife's friends who attend Monday night public lectures in his hometown of Port Washington. 
He says he'll call me if he can get me an appointment with a publisher in New York. I leave knowing that I will soon have my own book. I know. Now I see Linda and her four friends approaching me to deliver a series of paid lectures to the community, they were angels sent into my life on a divinely appointed mission. In that moment, I just saw a fun new adventure, from a distance with clearer vision, I see how this experience launched me in a whole new direction. This was my first step in the direction of greater self-reliance in my life. I soon learned that I could stay in the teaching profession, which I loved very much, and not have what I considered restrictions, such as responding to administrators or the low pay that came with the teaching profession. I was able to teach on any subject of my choosing on my own terms, and found that this could also be a lucrative way to earn a living. For decades, I have encouraged everyone to believe that it is possible to earn a living with what you love. If you stay on purpose and commit to following your bliss, the one universal mind will cooperate with you to bring this to fruition. The right people will appear, obstacles will be removed, the necessary circumstances will materialize, and there will be guidance. As the ancient Buddhist proverb reminds us, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Also, when the teacher is ready, the students will appear. The key here is the word ready. If you had decided almost years ago that you couldn't do such a thing, it probably wouldn't work, that people wouldn't show up, it would be too much trouble, or the amount of money you would earn would be too small. It just wouldn't have been ready. Those five students and the availability of the EAC were teachers who sent me. It was my willingness to see the opportunity and seize it that prompted me to say yes, I'll try. If I hadn't said yes to this suggestion, my whole life would have played out in a whole new way. I could have remained a university professor for the next 30 years, because I would not have seen firsthand that I could still teach and do what I love, and make a living from it. I would not have met the man who would become my literary agent, guiding me into the publishing world. What I now know from this point of view is that teachers are omnipresent in every moment of our lives. These teachers don't always present themselves as people, sometimes they arrive as what appears to be a coincidental coalescence of events, or an unexpected letter in a mailbox, or a television interview. I have learned over the years not to look for teachers, but to keep myself in a state of readiness and in a state of gratitude for it all. I mentioned earlier the thorough quote stating that if you follow your dreams, you will meet unexpected success at ordinary times. I interpret this to mean that success will haunt you if you stay aligned with the highest vision you have for yourself. This alignment process is key. Stay connected to your creative source and you will gain the power of that source, because you and God are one. Taking advantage of the opening of that door in the EAC back in 1974, I opened a door to a great ballroom of unlimited potentialities that otherwise would not have been seen. I remember Monday nights when I was teaching my own course and it reminds me of the classes I offered to my fellow sailors in Guam when I was years old. The sheer joy I felt when I followed my own inner calling and aligned myself with God, kept me from having to let my life be guided by what others thought was best for me. I have often quoted the enigmatic writer Virginia Woolf whenever one of my eight children seems to be questioning which direction to take in their lives, organize the pieces that come your way. What great advice! Take the pieces that are presented to you and arrange them in such a way that you live without fear, and the one universal divine mind will take care of all the details for you. That wonderful hand of fate that knew what had aimed at me in this incarnation was directing things for me back in 1974. He sent me to Europe to help define my mission and safely got me out of Turkey so that I could see the power my intentions had to accomplish anything. He sent me to Biloxi to rid myself of those inner impediments to my own greatness, and brought into my life an awareness of my own potential for independence, as well as the people who would guide and direct me. In 1974 I was looking at two doors to pass through, one that ensured my stagnation and another that opened me to perspectives beyond even my own wildest imaginations. And the fall of 1975 was to offer me one more chance to fix the pieces that were coming at me fast and furious. I just finished my fourth year of teaching at ST. 
Johns University in the spring of 1975. I have also signed an agreement for R.D. Pine to represent me in exchange for receiving 15% of what I earn as a published writer. He has used a connection he has with Ty Crowell Publisher, and I have the opportunity to present my completed manuscript to a senior editor there and see if they are interested in my book. As R.D. says, go there and sell him the idea of having your book published. I arrive for my designated appointment in the heart of Manhattan and a secretary tells me to wait in the outer office. An hour passes and they finally escort me to the office of Mr. Paul Farges. He apologizes profusely for keeping me waiting and begins the interview by asking me about my manuscript and what my plans for publication are. However, something is not right. I have had a private therapy practice on Long Island for over four years, doing one-on-one -on -one counseling five days a week in my home office, seeing up to 30 clients a week. As a result, I have become an expert in feeling when a person is deeply concerned, and I am feeling it now in this interview. Paul exudes anxiety and stress, it seems like he's been up all night and he's trying to hide his true feelings and finish this interview, even though Artie had arranged it several weeks ago. I immediately switch to a therapy mode and ask her if she would like to tell me what is going on as maybe I can help. Paul talks about a personal problem he's dealing with, and we spend the next three hours talking about it. When we're done, he once again apologizes as we shake hands and leave. I am leaving with my manuscript under my arm, the topic never came up after the first moments of our introduction. I go home on the subway. When Artie calls, eager to know how the meeting at Tai went. Crowell went, I tell you briefly what happened. He is furious in a friendly way and annoyed with what he sees as my naivete. You can't believe I missed this once in a lifetime opportunity. Artie had negotiated this meeting through a connection at the company and he didn't think he could get me another date. This was my golden opportunity and I had not taken advantage of it properly. However, at 10 the next morning, Artie calls from his Manhattan office, beside himself with excitement. Paul Farges just told Artie, I don't care what's in that D.R. Dyers, I want to list him as my author. He offers an advance that is almost equal to my entire annual salary as a professor at the university. I am very happy. I have a book contract with Funk and Vanyals, a subsidiary of Ty. Crowell, and I doubled my income too. Unbeknownst to me at the time, I was presented with one of the great opportunities that had come my way. I had the option of letting ego take over and having that first meeting with a New York editor. My ego would have ignored the obvious tension Paul was in and proceeded full blast with his goals. I would have tried to sell this publisher all the reasons why I should consider publishing my book, which would have been ego's choice. The ego is about winning and attracting as much attention as possible to oneself. Over the years, I have learned that the ego's internal mantra is always a variation of, what do I get? Take care of me, I am the most important person in the world. With this type of continuous self-talk, the ego dominates most interactions, with unsatisfactory results. I can see from this point of view and with clearer vision that we are continually being given opportunities to tame this aspect of ourselves. The other option I had in Paul's office that day in 1975 was a wonderful opportunity to tame my ego by putting it on the back burner. The choice presented to me that day was to ignore the impulses of my ego and listen to the inner mantra of my higher self. This mantra asks how can I serve? Instead of focusing on what's in it for me. This was an important lesson for me, not just that day, but for all my future writing and teaching. Our original nature is love, kindness, gentleness, and service to others. This is how God looks and acts, he never asks for anything, he always serves by providing fresh air, water, food, flora, and fauna. All delivered free of charge. When we ignore our ego and listen to our higher self, we align ourselves with our source of being, God, and consequently we also acquire the power of our source. When we come from an attitude of how can I serve? As he was unconsciously doing in Paul's office, the universal source seems to recognize itself in that energy, 
and asks again, how can I be of service to you? This is what was happening to me, my simple act of reaching out to another human being in need brought a whole new world of limitless abundance into my life without my knowing it. Out of that publishing deal came a number of blockbuster best-selling books, and my life headed down a dramatically different path from the one it had followed. Taming the ego's incessant demands for attention and selfishness has been a huge theme in my writing, my speech, and especially in my own personal life. I feel that a divine hand was dealt to me during those days in 1975. A fateful meeting and there I was, an unknown 35-year-old professor, entered an office with an invisible force that whispered, choose, listen to your ego asking, what do I get? Or the voice of your higher self asking, how can I serve? This was truly one of the great lessons I had to learn, and I am so grateful that my higher self, which was barely heard before, was able to stifle the usually victorious push from my ego. I can clearly see that taming this heavy swagger has been a lifelong challenge, and that day in Paul's office was an opportunity to begin that journey. I will always be grateful for all the participants who joined me in starting that odyssey. During the fall semester of 1957, my plate is full. I have a multitude of assignments on various committees at St. John's University, a full teaching load, several doctoral students to advise, and a full-time counseling internship. Monday nights have become an event, with hundreds of people attending the class I teach in Port Washington on living a self-fulfilling life. And your erroneous zones is scheduled for release in a few months, so I'm in the early stages of editing the book. I love working with Paul Fargus, he is very skilled and offers me a great deal of guidance in the editing phases of the first book that I have written alone. My private therapy practice has grown so much that I am no longer accepting new clients. On my days outside of college, I often have therapy appointments starting at 7.30 m until after 9 p.m. with jobs to grade, dissertations to supervise, committees to sit on, and lots of students to advise, I feel successful, but crushed. Before my evening classes, my days at the university are beyond chaotic. My office is full of students who need to see me now with a legion of concerns, and my secretary, Mary, continually calls me to speak to someone on the phone. In a couple of hours I am scheduled to be in front of a classroom full of students, along with many uninvited guests who want to participate in my lectures. I hear Mary ask several of my colleagues who are also on office hours, has anyone seen Dr. Dyer? There must be a hundred people wanting to see it, and I've looked everywhere. In the midst of this pandemonium, when the tentacles of chaos seem to come towards me from all directions threatening to tear me apart, I escape. Down the back stairs of Marillac Hall, I step out and take a deep breath. I walk down Utopia Parkway for a few moments and enter the park, where I go to a secluded spot behind a group of trees and sit on a huge rock. Five minutes away, my office is full of people, all of whom want a part of me. I smile to myself at the enigma I am living, as I close my eyes and listen to the sounds of nature. I feel the sun on my face and enjoy the healing energy it seems to bring to my anxious stomach. I listen to the sounds of the birds, the crickets, the dogs in the park, and the wind blowing the branches and leaves above me. I slowly open my eyes, appreciating the brilliant colors that dance through the trees as the magnificence of the fall transformation unfolds before me all done effortlessly. I spent just a few minutes in this place that I cherish, enjoying a brief escape from the chaotic energy of my office, and I am ready to return. Refreshed, I walk back to college feeling like a new person. The heaviness is gone, I feel like absolutely nothing could affect me. I know I am returning to confusion, but it no longer seems turbulent to me. I climb the back stairs, enter the third floor through a rarely used door, and enter the outer space of the office, feeling totally at peace. The students who expected to see me look different than they did when, inadvertently, I left 20 minutes ago. I welcome each of them to my office and kindly assist them in resolving their concerns about grades, jobs, and other college requirements that appear to be affecting their desire to complete their degrees. 
my colleagues who need my attention no longer feel intrusive, now I can calmly handle all phone calls. The next two hours go by quickly, and I dispense with a number of details in a relatively stress-free way. I think of my little area in the park as my place of serenity, so it is a habit to visit there almost every day amid the chaos that characterizes my office hours. I treasure my time in this quiet enclave and the tranquility that I access there, happy and envious of the creatures that do not seem to have to be in their assigned places. In particular, I envy the birds that fly above everything, flying with the wind, oblivious to everything that is chaotic in the land below. But I realize that I have discovered that I also have a place of freedom within me. I can soar above it all and look at the tumult with clearer vision, simply by accessing my own imaginations of an eagle in flight. Now when I look back at the meaning of my place of serenity, I see the important role that this little place of escape in the park provided for me in 1975. This was before my true immersion in the wonderful world of meditation, but I feel like I was guided in some mysterious way to that place near St. John's to introduce me to the idea of silence as an antidote to stress. Almost four decades have passed since I sat on the rock in the park, but I can see it perfectly as I sit here writing today. I can see, smell, hear and feel that place of serenity that I retired to so many years ago. Meditation would become an extremely important activity in my life, I was meant to get deeply involved in this ancient art of centering. The Eastern teachers showed me how to teach others to practice japa, an ancient form of meditation that uses the mantra of God's name to reach exalted states of inner consciousness. I was going to be exposed to the magic of being a practitioner of transcendental meditation, and some of the world-renowned authorities would instruct me in this practice on how to quiet the mind. I was also destined to create my own version of meditation and to write a book that offered specific guidance on how to make meditation a daily practice in life. All of this was ahead of me, way ahead of me. However, I now clearly see the work of a divine intelligence that was aware of my destiny, which was obviously obscured for me at the time. Divine intelligence was at work on the days when I was pushed to leave my office and walk to the park. I look back at the unnerving energy that drove me to go there on days of emotional storm as a powerful experience that directs the course of my life. My place of serenity, where I drank from the enchanting beauty that was offered to me, seemed at that moment a great way to put anxiety aside and vent a bit. But from a distance I see it as a signal for me on that particular day to turn 180 degrees and walk away from a life full of unnecessary pressures. I have often quoted the French philosopher, scientist, and mathematician Blaise Pascal, who said, all man's problems stem from not being able to sit quietly in a room alone. Although I had considered his words thoughtfully many times, I didn't really understand until I experienced my problems dissolving as I quietly sat in my own place of serenity alone. I was given the opportunity to know the truth of these feelings from first-hand experience, and I remain eternally grateful to any divine hand that propelled me to that sacred place, where I often retired. They were giving me my introductory lessons on how to achieve inner peace in circumstances that drive others to madness and learning how to become a teacher of this wisdom for generations of new meditators and yoga practitioners. One of the great truths that I have been blessed to receive and teach came several decades after my stays at the place of serenity. It has become a trademark of mine and is printed on all of my notepads. It simply says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. When I got involved in so many activities and tried to find clarity amid the confusion that defined my life, my escapes brought this truth home to me in a big way. After spending a short time in nature, free from human distractions and being in a quiet indoor space, I was able to go back to that cluttered office and change the way I viewed things. And sure enough, the things I looked at changed. My students were young people in need, not people who were causing me stress. My colleagues were friendly co-workers, not the source of more things to do. The phone calls were no longer interruptions, but simply part of the work he had offered me to do. The whole place seemed to be an exciting undertaking with a bustling energy, rather than a mind-boggling energy drain. Today when I read that observation about changing the way you look at things, 
I often come back to those peaceful retreats in the park adjacent to the university. This was my inauguration to become a master of the powerful idea that a few quiet moments in nature can bring about a sea change in the most unpleasant circumstances. And sure enough, I was about to embark on a new career of teaching others how to live from a place of peace and change the way they see things. I finished my fall semester of responsibilities at St. John's University and have been working almost full-time editing and rewriting your erroneous zones. Paul Farges, my editor at Ty Crowell Publishing House in New York, just told me, your book will be published in March and we were able to publish it in a national publication. Congratulations. My book is becoming a guide to getting through a lifetime of emotional red tape. I have written it not because of my advanced educational training, but more despite it. I am sure what really works to help people achieve permanent change because I have worked with many people of all ages and a wide variety of backgrounds and cultural influences. In the last four years in my private practice, I have helped hundreds of clients learn how to manage their lives in healthier and more productive ways. They have come to me seeking to overcome emotional problems and have succeeded most of the time with a common sense approach. I think I can be more helpful to your erroneous zones readers if I can avoid the more psychological route that is often the basis for training my PhD students. I want to keep this book as simple and realistic as possible. I have a lot of faith in everyone's innate greatness. I hear Buckminster Fuller give a lecture where he makes the statement, everybody is born a genius, but the process of living defies them, and I can't get this idea out of my mind. I want people to trust their own magnificence. My experience doing therapy with clients and my exposure to Dr. Maslow has convinced me that everyone is a genius. In every counseling session, I think I am sitting in front of a genius who has unfortunately allowed himself to deganitalize. My book is about implementing these ideas without all the excuses that theoretical psychological approaches provide. I talk about my clients' problems, as they see them, very briefly. Most of my focus is on helping them think differently about themselves and their lives. I call this book Your Erroneous Zones because it tries to teach people to transcend errors in their thinking. Many people don't think they have options, they feel that their problems have been imposed on them by external factors over which they have no control. I see this as a bug. I repeatedly offer my clients tools that will make it easier for them to discover that they are the sum total of all the choices they make. They resist at first, wanting to blame, and I point out that it is a choice. I tell you that doing it is not just insane, it is an error of thought, that is your wrong zone. Change your way of thinking, take responsibility for everything in your life and conquer your wrong way of thinking. I practice a kind of smoothed rational emotional therapy, and I see colossal changes on the part of my clients in a relatively short number of sessions. Abraham Maslow and Albert Ellis have been great teachers, his work impacts me in my private practice, in my writing, and in my personal life. I insist on keeping my message direct and simple throughout the editing process of my original manuscript that was written a year ago. It is common sense rather than pedantic psychological theory, that has been most helpful in helping people overcome errors in their thinking that have caused emotional upheaval and unsatisfied lives. I resist my editor's efforts to professionalize my manuscript in an APA writing style, or to use endless references to established research. Fast forward to March 1976. I receive a hardcover copy of your erroneous zones in hand at my office in St. John's University. I am excited beyond my ability to describe this feeling. My heart races with excitement as I contemplate what has been accomplished, the visit to my father's grave in Mississippi. The hundreds of lectures and counseling sessions that I have recorded. The impact of Dr. Moslow and Dr. Ellis on my life. I am determined to make a big impact with the messages contained in the pages of my book. I remember all the hours I spent writing, starting when I was much younger and up to this moment sitting alone in my office holding a book that feels like the greatest treasure I could ever imagine. I take it with me to my classes, but I don't tell anyone. This is too precious, too rewarding for me to share yet. 
I remember Paul Fargus's words about having my book serialized in a national publication. Sure enough, the first of six installments of your erroneous zone soon appears in the National Enquirer, a magazine that specializes in celebrity gossip and is sold in grocery stores across the country. I have been told that this weekly newspaper reaches more than 3 million readers, in all the articles I have written for professional journals, I have reached a small fraction of that number. I think this is a large audience of readers who will benefit much more than professional magazine readers. I start to get a lot of emails from people all over the country, asking for advice and also telling me that my book is helping them with the problems they have in their families and love relationships. This national attention is very new territory for me, and I begin to answer the letters. My phone at college is also busier than ever with calls as a result of the popularity of your erroneous zones. One of these calls is from a ST. John's administrator who chided me for tarnishing the university's reputation by appearing in such a disreputable publication. I have been told that as a rising star, with published textbooks and magazine articles, I should not allow the serialization to continue. Advancement in my career could be compromised, as could any consideration for acquiring my position, a word I come to despise. At the age of, the idea of staying in the same place for the rest of my life, doing the same thing, is an extremely unpleasant thought. Not only do I refuse to stop the serialization of your erroneous zones, but I look forward to every new installment of my book, which is being read by millions of people. I strongly believe that many of these readers will discover ways to positively alter their lives by learning to overcome their self-defeating and erroneous thoughts. I choose to ignore critical comments and pay no heed to empty political threats from top management. My colleagues make good-natured jokes about serialization on this gossip rag, but I don't care. I am glad to know that I am making a difference for some people in need, and that a book I wrote is being read by a much larger audience than the small number of people who read academic academic journals. When I look back at the time when I was in the process of putting together the final package for my first solo book, I remember how strong the pressure was to produce a book that would withstand any hint of academic criticism. Your erroneous zones is full of suggestions for the reader to handle those same kinds of things for themselves. Being independent of the good opinion of others and being free from the need for approval is precisely what I was teaching, this was one of the most common types of neurotic disorders that I had been helping clients overcome for years, and now I, I was the recipient of such efforts by others to secure approval for my book. My editor wanted this book to have a more academic look, with case studies and annotated references. I remember remembering Mr. Joaquim Rise and his insistence that I write in a dry, unreadable, and uninteresting style in a freshman class at college, and how I resisted those efforts then, even at the cost of receiving an unsatisfactory final grade. I was adamant that I was not going to allow outside forces and standards written by academic types to dictate to me anymore. Paul Farge supported me on this. I think in large part because he had seen firsthand that the methods he was writing about were effective in helping him personally. This internal call to resist the efforts of others to dictate how I should be as a person and particularly as a writer has played an important role in my development as a speaker and author. Every time I thought about giving in and switching from the common sense style of your erroneous zones to a more professionally acceptable format, I heard a voice inside me say, you know what works, you want to help people change for the better, not look good in front of a collection of strange scholars. Stay the course, keep it simple, speak directly to the reader. It works in your counseling office, it will work here. From a distance with clearer vision, I see this as divine guidance, as an invisible intelligence that kept me on the path that I knew was right for me. It's about being myself and recognizing that no one can do that for me. I was listening to this lesson out loud because I needed to experience it directly in order to teach it. He had read most of the self-help literature that existed in 1975, and he didn't want to write another Dale Carnegie or Norman Vincent Peale book. I wanted to create my own genre, using a method that had been effective for so many clients who came to me for professional advice. I knew in my soul that when people stop thinking wrong and start taking full responsibility for everything in their lives, 
real permanent change is possible. I was living proof of it, and this experience of standing my ground and not settling and writing like everyone else allowed me to have the book I wanted to write. It had my name on it, and it was going to reflect what I believed in no matter what. I look back at the little furor that was created in college over the fact that my book was being serialized in a supermarket tabloid and now I can see how important it was for me to refuse once again to be swayed by my own firm stance on this issue. I had stated at the age of while I was in the Navy that I am a teacher. I did not put any restrictions on this statement. In my mind, I was a teacher, and the more people I could reach with my self-empowerment message, the more effective a teacher would be. For me, the logic was simple at the time, write for an academic audience and professional recognition, and you'll reach a few hundred people. Write for the widest possible audience in a tabloid and reach millions of people, all of whom will benefit the most from my teaching. This was a no-brainer. My mission was to reach as many people as possible, so I was in heaven with the serialization of my book. He was not looking for prestige. I wanted to teach and I wanted people to buy my book, because I knew deep down in my heart that my time in academia was getting shorter and shorter. I felt this was a stroke of luck that I was offered by a universal source that I knew had much bigger plans for me than I could imagine at the time. I felt that your erroneous zones was a way to reach everyone, and I wanted everyone in this world to receive the message that Buckminster Fuller expressed in these words. Never forget that you are one of a kind. Never forget that if you had no need to be on this earth in all your uniqueness, you would not be here in the first place. And never forget, no matter how overwhelming life's challenges and problems seem to be, that one person can make a difference in the world. In fact, it is always thanks to one person that all the major changes in the world take place. So be that one person. I wanted to teach others to embrace this awareness of being that one person. However, more than that, I felt a deep longing within me to really be that person, and I knew inside that I couldn't be that self-actualized person if I was afraid of what others might think of me. It is April 1976 and I am renting a house on Kime Avenue in West Babylon, New York. I am continuing my busy private practice, along with my professional teaching duties at ST. John's. I am also percent determined that I will carry the message of your wrong zones to the world. I have purchased copies, which account for about a third of all first printing, directly from the publisher. A few blocks from my house, I noticed the identification letters of a radio station in the building, WBAB. I have no idea what kind of format the station broadcasts, so I stop by on a Friday afternoon and give the receptionist a copy of your erroneous zones. I tell him that I just published this book, I live a couple of blocks away, and if you are ever interested in interviewing a local author, I would be happy to be a guest at your station. The next day I received a call from the station manager, who had seen my book with my phone number on the receptionist's desk. They invite me to be on the air that very day, as a guest they had scheduled had suddenly cancelled. I accept immediately. That Saturday morning I spent a lovely hour being interviewed by a local disc jockey. It is my first appearance in any medium and I am hooked. We get a few phone calls and I speak spontaneously about my common sense approach to creating a happy life. The phones light up, all incoming lines are full, and all callers want to know where they can buy the book. I give the address of a local bookstore in Huntington, which I drive to as soon as the radio show ends. I ask the manager to take 10 books on consignment, as my publisher has not yet shipped the book to me. The manager agrees, and now I am a writer as well as a distributor. In three days, this store sold all 10 books. Notice to my editor to make sure Long Island stores are fully stocked as I will now be at WBAB regularly. I discovered my own marketing scheme. I can voluntarily visit small radio stations, do interviews, and generate interest in my book. My editor is not as excited about marketing and promoting your erroneous zones as I am, but I am bursting with enthusiasm. After my interview with WBAB, I can see myself doing the exact same thing, not just here on Long Island, but across the country as well. 
the possibilities seem limitless to me. I feel like they are pushing me in a new direction. I will have to free myself from many of the obligations I have to clients in my growing practice and, in particular, from my responsibilities as an associate professor at the university. On Monday in April I arrive at Schreiber High School in Port Washington to give my weekly lecture. The audience was informed that my book will be available for sale after the talk, and my wife and I downloaded 500 copies of our car. The place is packed, more than 1,200 people have turned up, and we sell all 500 copies almost immediately. I am beyond amazed. Something very exciting is happening, I know I am onto something phenomenal. The words I am a teacher flash on my inner screen. I can do this on my own. I can take full responsibility for all aspects of this company. I can become my own bookstore if necessary. I can market myself if the marketing division is not on board. I can distribute my own book. Most importantly, I can generate enthusiasm in potential buyers, not by selling my book, but by loving what I am saying and selling that love. If they like what I am saying, and if they like me, the person speaking, they will automatically want to buy what I have written. Someone who regularly attends Monday night conferences in Port Washington recommended me as a potential guest to the hosts of an all-night call-in radio show on WMCA. Candy Jones, the famous World War II model married to radio personality Long John Nebel, calls me on the phone and asks, would you be willing to come to the radio station and stay for the entire night broadcast? Of course I say yes. I arrive at 11.30 at night, and Candy, Long John, and I get into a very energetic discussion. We receive phone calls and I begin to give advice over the air to all humanity in the New York metropolitan area. Truck drivers, insomniacs, lonely widows, unhinged night freaks, phones go crazy. Before I go home at 6 in the morning, they ask me to come back the following week. Both Long John Nebel and Candy Jones give your erroneous zones a tremendous amount of hype and are doing direct commercials telling all of their listeners to go out and buy this important book, and to demand that their local bookstores stock it. I return the following week to co-host the show with Long John, since Candy is busy. Long John has been diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer and is obviously in a lot of pain, sitting on a specially designed pillow to alleviate some of the discomfort. It leaves me alone on the microphone, along with the person who answers and screens the calls. I am delighted to be at one of the largest stations in the largest city in the US, with five hours of time to take calls and tell people about my recently published book. When I leave the phones have been ringing all night and I was told that my appearances on WMCA are getting exceptionally high ratings. I become a regular on the Long John and Candy Jones radio show, and every time I appear, my books are sold out in every metropolitan bookstore in New York. They ask me to appear on a wide variety of radio stations as a guest. Appearances are always spontaneous and unplanned. However, despite the inner glow of excitement I feel at being able to reach so many people and see my book sales increase, I also feel like it is being pushed in one more direction. Staying up all night and talking on the radio is one thing, but then having to see clients all day or show up at the university refreshed and ready to meet students, attend committee meetings, and give a big bang. Number of graduate classes is not a recipe for a long and healthy life. It is now May, and your erroneous zones has been available for two months. I have not been able to transfer my enthusiasm for the book to the powers that be in Ty Crowell, although Paul supports me enormously in all my efforts to obtain the recognition that he and I feel he deserves. I have my sights set on doing a national tour, even though it has been made clear to me that the publisher does not have the funds for such an undertaking. Your Erroneous Zones has been designated as a list book. That designation means it's slated to be on the spring list of new releases, and if it sells the first print of roughly 6,000 books, it will be deemed a success, and that will be the end of the story as far as the publisher is concerned. He's busy. I have a very different view, which means that I am designated as a highly motivated and excitable first-time author, 
naive and inexperienced in the ways of the great New York publications. I know what I am forced to do and I cannot have another vision. I inform all of my clients in my private therapy practice that I will be closing my practice at the end of the month as I cannot continue at the pace that I have been maintaining. My clients are disappointed, however, they knew when they started with me that my practice was not about buying a friend. I believe in short-term counseling with an emphasis on finding practical solutions to self-sabotaging thinking and behavior. My attitude is, come to my counseling sessions and leave with new skills. We are not going to spend endless hours reviewing early childhood trauma. This is not my way. It can be very valuable to dedicate yourself to psychoanalysis in the long term, but not with me. In May I close my practice and I am free from the need to be in a specific place several days a week. I can breathe easier, but I still have more ties to cut before I can do what I feel calls me with relentless exuberance. Opportunities to fulfill one's dharma are omnipresent when there is an internal image of one's intention firmly planted in the imagination. I look back at my actions in 1976 when your erroneous zones had just been published, and I can clearly see how the universe was aligning me with the people and circumstances I needed to allow me to continue in the direction I was heading. Although he had no idea what fate would be like. I have learned to practice this kind of awareness even in routine activities like finding a parking space. Parking spots show up more often when my intention inside is to find a spot to park, rather than there are never any parking spots around here right now. The inner vision that says yes to life and is open to all possibilities prompts you to look around you with a more intense vision, to anticipate that things are going to turn out and to jump on the slightest omen that indicates that you are being guided. It's about alignment, which I've written about extensively in the years since your erroneous zones was first published. I didn't know it at the time, but by holding firm to an inner image, I was aligning myself with the one divine mind, of which I am a fragment, and allowing this great Tao to offer experiences in the physical world. That coincided with my own divine destiny. Once I started paying more attention, I could see the magical synchronicities manifesting. At the time I attributed it to good luck or a strange coincidence. Now I can see more clearly and I know it better. I must have passed that WBAB sign a thousand times before looking at it with new, more awake eyes. The teacher was always there, but I needed my new lineup to see him now as a golden opportunity. I was guided to knock on that door, and there was an invisible connection between me, the receptionist, the station manager, the guest who cancelled, the people involved in needing to cancel that guest, the disc jockey, and so on. To infinity. The same is true for everyone involved in taking me to the WMCA station and everything else that is going on in my life up to this point. The key to seeing more clearly is alignment. Maintaining a burning desire with an image that is like an inner flame that is impervious to any distraction, I began to look out at each circumstance as an omen. It wasn't luck that pushed me then, it was my willingness to hold onto an inner vision until it became an intention, and then humbly follow my instincts and say yes to every break that came along. By being active and courageous, he was allowing doors to open that would have remained closed or, worse, unnoticed. Now I realize that I don't want to ignore even the slightest internal passing thought regarding an idea that I am pursuing. Thoughts are communications from the divine mind from which all things originate, including our thoughts. I see that the burning desire I was experiencing within me was not at all about becoming rich or famous or even selling a lot of books. It was an inner knowing that this was my calling. I had to answer that call or else I would have died inside, wondering why I was feeling so dissatisfied. When I said yes to this call, I knew what to do. I knew I had to close my practice and break free. He knew he could be effective in the media because he had all those opportunities to get on the air. Every time I said yes to another interview, or stayed up all night, another door seemed to magically open with new perspectives to explore. In the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu talks about the importance of thinking small, not big. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. If I had been thinking big back then, 
I would have walked over that little WBAB radio station two blocks from my house. However, a simple knock on a station door with perhaps 10 watts of transmitting power led to much more. What I see clearly is that one small step leads to the second step. A force in the universe that directs everything and everyone was urging me to take small steps. Great things started with just one step. I've always loved the movie Coal Miner's Daughter, the story of Loretta Lynn, the country singer from Butcher Hollow, Kentucky, who has become a legend. He went from radio station to radio station tirelessly hawking his recordings in the hope that one of them would be heard on the air. And I love the well-known quote from my friend Joe Girard, which I have lived alone. The elevator to success is not working. You'll have to use the stairs, one step at a time. I am grateful that I had the inner knowing to be willing to take that first step. I just finished the spring semester at St. John's University and am thinking about what to do during the summer of 1976 and beyond. I have attended college or taught college courses every summer since 1962. I have been offered a full list of classes to teach starting next week, and I must make a decision in the next few days. I'm driving west on the Long Island Expressway, Lie, heading to the university to deliver some final grades for my graduate students who have been on an internship that I supervised last semester. I have been making regular appearances on a variety of New York area radio stations, and my book sales have declined, but are still fairly steady. Suddenly emotion overwhelms me. I remember the uneasiness I experienced just five years ago as I struggled with the decision to leave Detroit and come to the Big Apple. I see the calm face of Dr. Peters as I remember the advice she gave me at the time. Here I am again, having to decide between two options, one that offers security and protection, and the other, the unknown. I wrote a chapter in your erroneous zones titled Exploring the Unknown that includes Robert Frost's poem The Road Not Taken. Last night on the radio with Long John Nebel, I quoted the last lines of Frost's poem. Two roads diverged in a forest, and I, took the one less traveled, and that made a difference. Suddenly, without warning, clarity takes hold of me in a way that I haven't experienced since I spoke to Millie Peters in 1970 in Detroit. I am overwhelmed by the lucidity I feel. There is no conflict. I stop at the lie's shoulder with tears running down my face. I have a clear feeling that a loving guiding spirit has enveloped me. This is what Dr. Maslow called a peak experience, a term that describes a state of ecstasy that is especially joyous and has an ineffable mystical slash spiritual essence. These are the moments, according to Maslow, lasting from seconds to minutes during which we feel the highest levels of happiness, harmony, and possibility. He once called these supernatural episodes of enhanced consciousness. I'm in this supernatural state right now, right here on the Long Island Freeway. I have been instructed to take the road less traveled, and I know what I am going to do, no, what I absolutely must do. I don't call my wife or my daughter, I do not seek advice. I have seen the light on this matter and I don't need to obsess over it another day, not even an hour longer. I see with a capital S. It's already a done deal. I make my way back to the freeway, park in my parking space next to Marillac Hall, go to the second floor, and tell the dean's secretary that I would like to speak with Dean Sarah Faisenmeyer. I assure you it will not take more than a few moments. I enthusiastically tell the dean that I am resigning from the university as of the end of this semester, which is in three days. He asks me to maybe take the summer off and clear up this matter. Please reconsider, he says. You have the potential for a great future here. You are a rising star and being associated with the university will be extremely advantageous to you. I agree that this is a risky move at a very uncertain time and I will lose the benefits that come with a professorship, medical retirement, IRA contributions, and job security. I listen carefully, but I have already looked into my future and I see it now as if it were already a present fact. I tell the dean that I know the risks and have weighed them carefully, and I'm going to say goodbye. I am alive with emotion. I walk out of the dean's office and up the only flight of stairs to my office. 
I call my wife and daughter, and they are both full of rapturous glee for me. I tell my department head, Dr. Bob Doyle, and he's surprised, but he's also supportive. He tells me how crazy it is to give up so much security for a dream that might not work. It reminds me of the possible financial consequences, no guaranteed income and no benefits, especially since I have a family to consider. I cannot be dissuaded. I think of that supernatural peak experience of pure euphoria that washed over me just an hour ago, as I sat in my car as thousands of people passed me on the way home or to work. I am no longer a traveler, I'm finally alone. Everything I do from now on will be on my terms. My colleagues congratulate me and my secretary cries, telling me how much she has enjoyed working for me these last five years. I clear my desk, submit my final grades, down the three flights of stairs, and head to my place of serenity a few blocks away. I go into a deep state of meditative silence. I do not request anything. No help, no guidance, nothing. I spent the last 30 minutes of my teaching career at St. John's University sitting on top of a rock, listening to the birds and the wind whispering through the branches. I am in a state of amazement. I am thankful for whatever came over me a couple hours ago and gave me such luminous grace and clarity. I am for the first time in my life, at the age of 36, self-employed, and I am flying across the seat of my pants, puzzled by the possibilities. The quantum moment I experienced on the Long Island Expressway, and subsequent actions that began almost instantly, remain vivid to this day. I have written about these quantum moments as the type of peak experiences that have the potential to shift consciousness to a higher state, where conscious contact with our higher selves is made and we are instantly propelled in a new direction. These sudden epiphanies and revelations have been the subject of much of my writing because I have come to see them as visits from a higher realm. I previously wrote about my experience at my father's grave as one of these quantum moments, or what Dr. Maslow called almost supernatural moments of perception that are often life-transforming. There are four characteristics of these quantum moments that I have described in my movie and book titled The Shift. First, they are always amazing. The moment of understanding in my car on the way to work seemed to come out of nowhere. Second, they are vivid. Even today, so many years later, I know exactly what I was wearing that day, and I can tell you the interior color of my Oldsmobile Cutlass. I can still see the construction signs on the highway, the passing cars, and I can smell the fumes from the endless stream of vehicles. Third, quantum moments are always benevolent. I can remember how completely blissful I felt when that angelic cloud hovered over me. I got goosebumps, or what my daughter calls the tingling. Fourth, they are durable. I need to say more, almost 40 years later, I remember this event as if it happened an hour ago. Something indefinable appeared to me that June day of 1976 and helped me make an uncomfortable change in my life. It has happened on several occasions when I was on the edge of which direction to take in my life. I trust in these moments of maximum experience and I not only trust them, but I invite them into my life. The more I trust my life purpose, the more I have been able to access this kind of vivid and emotionally charged energy. Clearly, Moments like the one I experienced the day I quit college are components of a more self-fulfilling life. As people begin to align with their original intention and live a purposeful life, they invite their highest guidance. I have come to know that the only way to access the help of the Ascended Masters is to become like them so that they can recognize themselves. There is no use praying for guidance and help if we live an ego-centered life. At that point in my life, all I wanted to do was share the magic that I was feeling touching the lives of so many people through radio call shows and the mail I received from all over the country for the serialization of my book. In a national newspaper. He was not driven by ego, yet he had no idea that he might be receiving some kind of inexplicable spiritual advice from the heavens. I was aligning myself with the one divine mind that is responsible for all of creation because it was focused on serving rather than receiving. I can see that I was beginning to live from the new consciousness by becoming more like those who live to serve in divine love. 
they see themselves in that energy and they can and will guide us down a more God-fulfilled path. From this perspective of looking back, I feel like I've been in some kind of ascended teacher training program. I had to go through a long period of time in the clutches of my own false self, that is, my ego, but when I was able to dismantle the ego's hold on me, I could feel the difference within me. I forgot myself and concentrated on reaching out and serving just because it felt good to do so, regardless of the material benefit that might come to me. Giving up a secure teaching position and taking the path not only less traveled but never traveled by me was inaugurated by a spiritual visit that I still cannot fully explain. At the time, he didn't know that Your Erroneous Zones was the first of the books he would write for the next 38 years, or that it was destined to impact the lives of millions of people across the planet. I am sure that the One Divine Mind, the Great Tao, God, or whatever label we put on it, was fully aware of the Dharma for which I had signed up and agreed to carry it out, and must have known it. I couldn't do it from the comfort and safety of a chair at a major New York University. In the sixth chapter of Your Erroneous Zones I said that only the insecure fight for safety, and I opened that chapter with this quote from Albert Einstein, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the true source of all art and science. I was about to embark on a journey to teach these ideas to those who were striving for ever-elusive safety. I am sure that the ascended hosts that watched over and guided my path they were aware of this great insecurity and knew that it was imperative that I take the path of following my speech rather than simply speaking it. I'm on the phone with the vice president at my publisher, Ty Crowell, to ask him how well my book is selling. After checking it out, he says, when your book runs out of its original first printing, we'll move on to the summer list. You should consider this a success for a novice author. I feel like your erroneous zones will basically die on the vine before it is given a chance to mature, and I will become a gigantic nuisance to all the powers that be at my publisher's headquarters. I talk to the advertising people and they tell me that there is no budget allocation for the promotion of my book. I talk to marketing people and they tell me there is no marketing plan for my book. I make calls to the people responsible for distributing my book to bookstores and no one returns my calls. Everything feels like it's paralyzed. I am in the midst of a kind of stagnation that is very new to me. Everything is too big too many departments not communicating and then blaming each other for inefficiency. I am eager to make something happen that is in line with my vision for myself and for this book. However, I seem to run into obstacles with everyone I meet. I decide to take matters into my own hands. I imagine if they run out on the first print while the book is still on the spring listing, they will be forced to make a second print. With a phone call, I become a bookstore, Wayne Dyer Books, West Babylon, New York. I call as a bookstore owner and order that all remaining copies of the first print be shipped to my shop, my garage. Two days later, I call the same vice president and ask him to check the status of my book. He's exasperated with me, as I've been a nagging pain for him at least twice a week since Your Erroneous Zones was published three months ago in March. The vice president goes through his records to give me the available inventory report, hoping it will be the same as it was when we last spoke a few days ago. He comes back and tells me that the book must be gaining momentum because all the print has been sold without a return. I ask him what he's going to do about it and he hits the button to order another print. However, this time it is considerably smaller, perhaps 2,500 books. Now I have more than 4,000 books in my garage, a week later, I buy all the remaining second print as well. My editor is forced to come back for a third edition and now they are starting to figure it out. In the meantime, I continue to do radio shows and sell my books at my Monday night lectures in Port Washington. I start visiting as many bookstores as I can in the New York metropolitan area. I take copies of your erroneous zones and ask you to put the title on consignment. Then whenever I appear on a local radio show, I mention the names of the stores that are stocking my book. I do commercials for the book every time I take a call on a radio show and tell the audience that they hear exactly where the books are sold, which makes the people at the bookstore very happy.
after a new visit to the different stores that have agreed to sell my book, I no longer have to play the role of distributor and money collector, as they are now buying your erroneous zones through the normal channels. I have become my own bookstore, I have my own marketing plan in place, and I also take care of distribution and delivery. Paul Fargus, who is also caught up in the huge publishing bureaucracy in New York, is aware of what I am doing and tells me about writing a follow-up book. This seems premature to me, I am only in the beginning stages of my efforts to share the message of your wrong zones with the world. I tell Paul that I will write a second book next year. I am now preparing my own advertising plan as I spoke to Ty Crowell's head of advertising and she is also a bit upset at my continued annoyances. They perceive me as a new author who clearly does not understand how the New York publication works, as well as someone who does not really know their place. I ask how to make this book available to the whole country. They told me that there is only one way to reach everyone in the country through the media, and that is to make appearances on nationally syndicated shows like The Tonight Show, The Phil Donahue Show, The Today Show, etc. I am assigned a young woman named Donna Gould who works in the advertising department. Donna loves the book and loves working with me, but she is also paralyzed by the fact that no money has been allocated for advertising for your erroneous zones. I cannot travel because there is no travel allowance. And no one on these national shows is the least bit interested in putting an unknown psychologist on their show, especially with the first book. Donna is young and energetic, but she has no power to override the system she works in. I am writing a long and passionate letter to the advertising director informing her that I know of a second way to reach everyone in America through the media, and that is to go to them directly, myself. I don't want any financing, I will pay my own expenses. I'm going to tour this country on my own. I will go to the smaller markets with my books in tow, and I will distribute, market and deliver just as I have been doing successfully in the tri-state area for the past few months. My editor has never met an author like me. They try to discourage me, but that inner flame is truly a burning desire, it tells me to forget all the resistance I encounter and to listen and follow the internal calls that will not be silenced. I must do this on my own. I'm sick of fighting and complaining about bureaucratic traps, I'm going to do this my way and I know they will guide me to the end. I am full of enthusiasm. Donna Gould agrees to work with me from home, she is an angel. He tells me that if I show up in a medium-sized city like Columbus, Ohio, he will make the calls to see what newspapers and radio and television shows he can reserve. I will pay as much as I can for her services, but she essentially does it because she believes in me and the message I have to offer. It is the middle of June 1976. My daughter, Tracy, is eight years old, I am talking about embarking on a wonderful adventure to visit cities across the country, north, south, east and west. She is a game. My wife is a game. It's not long before the car is full and loaded with books for distribution, and my wife and I are taking Tracy and her friend Robin on a cross-country adventure. I will visit as many places as possible that are willing to host me as a media guest, and Donna will arrange interviews whenever possible. My plan is to do several radio shows and to announce on the air that my book is available at specific bookstores that I have searched ahead of time. After the show I head to these stores. It is often my wife who has called to ask about buying the book that this fascinating author on the radio is discussing. They have already received several requests and are ready to accept the books on consignment when you arrive at the bookstore with a dozen books. My days are filled with driving, checking into hotels, and going from station to station after finding their location on a well-used map. It is normal for me to stay in one city for several days and do interviews in one day, I often stay up all night making radio calls late into the night. Donna is incredibly efficient. The more interviews I do, the more word begins to spread that I can do compelling interviews. I have become a media therapist and there is no shortage of radio stations that are willing to have me as a guest on their talk shows. We head to the other side of the country, and I do a lot of interviews in every city we stop at. The publisher is starting to notice the book, 
as requests for all of my interviews across the country are starting to get pretty regularly. Your erroneous zones goes into a fourth impression, and Donna finally manages to get permission to work with me from her office at Ty Crowell for the day. The advertising department has received some money for my book. And then I got that fateful call from Howard Papush on The Tonight Show. In September, my agent, Artie Pine, and my editor, Paul Fargis, tell me that your erroneous zones will make its first appearance on the New York Times bestseller list the following Sunday. For me, this is equivalent to being an actor and receiving an Oscar. From this vantage point of looking back at my frustration with my editor in New York, I can now see the great blessing they gave me in the form of indifference. I was given the wonderful opportunity to take my life into my own hands, and as a result, I would have absolutely no one to blame when things didn't turn out my way. I had been practicing this lesson all my life, but here it was presented to me in a very big way. When I was told that my book was essentially headed for oblivion if I allowed other people to take over this whole operation, I had a choice. You might say, okay, I guess this is the way the great New York publisher operates. I'm just a little cog in a big wheel, and I'll take what they decide is how things are going to be. He'd experienced a modicum of success, and he could give thanks and let it all fade away. My second option was to refuse to let anyone's opinion get in the way of what I had put in my imagination and to take full responsibility for every aspect of this journey I was undertaking. In the letter I wrote to the advertising director I included a very special quote that I have always loved, when Alexander the Great visited the greatest spiritual teacher of his time, Diogenes, and asked him if he could do something for the famous teacher, Diogenes replied, just get away from my light. I wasn't asking Ty Crowell to pay for any of my expenses, or even to help me arrange interviews. All he wanted was to be sure that they wouldn't become a hindrance by being recalcitrant and delaying book production and deliveries because he was flying out of the flight pattern they had presented for their authors. He had an inner conviction about what he intended to do. I knew that I could not stand by and allow all my dreams to be erased because others, who had more experience, felt that they knew better, they knew the way. I asked you to please step out of my light and let me be guided by my own vision. I also used another of my all-time favorite observations, from the German scholar Friedrich Nietzsche, in my letter, you get away with it. I have my way. As for the correct way, the correct way and the only way, it does not exist, there is no the way to do anything. What I see clearly today regarding the interactions I had with my publisher on how your erroneous zones would be marketed, distributed, and publicized is that I was offered a top-notch opportunity to start my new writing career by trusting myself first. And above all, I was being presented with a great learning experience. At the time I was a little frustrated that I wasn't getting the cooperation I wanted, but not for a moment did I even consider abandoning the inner vision of this is my way that was burning brightly in my imagination. Rather than make a big deal out of all of this, or even blame the system for not being my ally, I went straight to the image I had planted in my mind and decided to make all of this a light-hearted and fun undertaking. I was having the best time of my life in the New York area bringing all of this to life, and I didn't see any reason why it wouldn't work in every corner of the country, and the world too, if I kept my vision. And followed my inner impressions. I didn't have all the answers on how fieldwork should be done for a book to be a huge success, but I did know what I had learned from my immersion in Abraham Maslow's self-actualization research and after coaching. With hundreds of clients, it was imperative for me to remain independent from the good and bad opinions of others. As my friend Maya Angelou once observed, a bird doesn't sing because it has an answer, it sings because it has a song. What is clear to me today is that I must ignore the opinions and advice of others when they interfere with my own inner knowledge. It is enough for me to know that I have a song and, by God, I intend to sing it. My world has changed dramatically since I made the decision to go it alone as a freelance writer. It's 1977, and I've spent the past year working full-time to promote your wrong zones. About every three weeks I fly to the West Coast to be on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson, which has created a national audience for my book. 
My friend Howard Papush loves my common sense approach and the stories I tell, and continues to reserve me in author's place at the end of the minute show. I generally show up on Monday nights, with guest hosts as diverse as Bill Cosby, Bob Newhart, Vincent Price, Joan Rivers, Don Rickles, and other celebrities. Audience reactions and viewership ratings always increase when I walk in, and I feel blessed to have the opportunity for these regular appearances. With this national exposure, now I'm being called on TV shows that just a few months ago weren't interested in a school teacher named Wayne Dyer. I have recently been on The Phil Donahue Show, Today Show, The Merv Griffin Show, The Mike Douglas Show, and Good Morning America, among others. I've been traveling the country on a book tour funded by my publisher and guests starring on locally produced shows in cities across the United States and Canada. I've always liked being in front of an audience and delivering entertaining as well as engaging and educational talks, so I'm delighted to have lots of talks as well. I get paid fees beyond my wildest dreams, for a two-hour speech, I earn the equivalent of three-month salary as a university professor. My agent, Artie Pine, is booking my speeches now, and more requests are coming in than I can handle. I travel throughout North America speaking to large audiences at churches, universities, corporate meetings, and public seminars. As the demand for my services grows, Artie continues to increase my conference fee. I find it hard to believe that people are willing to pay thousands of dollars to hear me say what I had been saying with almost no pay just a few months earlier. Your erroneous zones has been running for months. Every week my editor runs a display ad in the New York Times that shows how many copies of the book are in print. Since that first print of roughly, it has shot through four more prints to its current print total of your erroneous zones has become a phenomenon. It has become an international bestseller translated into several different languages to meet demand in Europe, South America, Asia, and Australia. In a joint conference call with Artie Pine and Paul Fargis, I was told that there are two pieces of news that will blow my mind. The first is that your erroneous zones will appear on the New York Times bestseller list on Mother's Day, May 8, 1979, as the number one best-selling book in the country. The second is equally exciting, your erroneous zones has been put up for auction with all pocket publishers. The tender is well over a million dollars and Avon Books will introduce this book as its number one flagship book for the fall of this year. I was just informed that I am the author of the number one best-selling book in the country, and I also just became a millionaire as a bonus. I am over the moon of joy. I leave the phone in my rented house on Long Island, put my head in my hands and tears run down my face. I have done nothing but follow my own vision and confidently move in the direction of my own dream, and strive to live the life I have envisioned. It's what I read on the wall of the Thoreau Lyceum in Concord, Massachusetts, when I visited and lay in bed where Henry David Thoreau slept in the 20th century. And this great teacher of mine, who guided me through so many obstacles when I was back in high school, was quite right. I have come across totally unexpected success at ordinary times. I am overwhelmed with emotion. I call my mother in Detroit to break the news. He receives my news with the same kind of ecstatic shock that I feel. It reminds me of the poem called Wayne that he wrote to me in 1970 when I got my Ph.D. She recites it verbatim. A mother can only guide. So step aside, I knew it. I couldn't say, this is the way. That you should go. Because I couldn't foresee. What paths could attract you. To unimaginable heights. That I may never know. Yet always in my heart. I realized. That you would touch a star. I'm not surprised. She is crying with joy as she jokingly reminds me that my book is a huge success because she was the one who typed the manuscript before she gave it to the publisher. This beautiful woman, who sacrificed so much to bring her broken family back together after being abandoned by my biological father, who worked every day of his life without complaint, is the mother of a millionaire author, who has written the most popular book from the United States. Before hanging up he says, my son the doctor. Honestly, I'm not surprised, Wayne. You were always looking at the stars. 
I love you very much. I hang up the phone and say a deep prayer of thanks for this enormous blessing that has come into my life. I am humbled by the fact that I come from such meager beginnings, and I pray that you will help me not to be affected in any selfish way by all this external generosity. I promise to make sure my two brothers and our mother never have to pay a mortgage. Fast forward to summer, and your erroneous zones is at the top of the bestseller list in Australia, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Norway. I agree to visit these countries to do an advertising tour. I am in Australia, and the paperback edition of my book is very well stored in all the bookstores that I visit. I'm doing an interview on a radio station when we are interrupted by an announcement that Elvis Presley has just been found dead, presumably from a drug overdose. It is August 1977. I say a silent prayer for the legend and his family, as the station immediately begins an Elvis memorial. During my tour, Elvis music is everywhere, at every station. In practically all subsequent interviews, I am asked to comment on his death. I am talking about the wrong zone of addiction and I am asked to read the final chapter of your wrong zones, which is entitled Portrait of a Person Who Has Eliminated All the Wrong Zones. During this time, I begin to think about writing a second book on how to break out of self-sabotaging victim habits that can ultimately destroy a person. I spent two weeks touring all the major cities in Australia doing endless interviews for newspapers, magazines, radio, and television. It's a grueling schedule, non-stop until hours a day, from Perth to Adelaide, Brisbane, Melbourne, and Sydney. When I leave the country Your Erroneous Zones is the number one best-selling book, and I have a series of invitations to return for conferences in the future. What strikes me the most today, reliving those glorious moments of reaching such exalted status in the publishing world, is the greatest fear I had within me. He was referring to my ability to handle financial uncertainty at the beginning of my decision to drop out of college and go out on my own. I loved the feeling of freedom that fed my soul so much, however, my head was filled with dread over financial concerns. I grew up in an era of severe poverty. My parents weathered the Great Depression and money was always a big concern. I was weaned into a scarcity mentality and placed in foster care in large part because there simply wasn't enough money to meet the most basic needs. My mother, who had three children when she was 24, worked first as a saleswoman at a 5 and 10 and then as a secretary. My father, who was jailed for stealing on more than one occasion, abandoned his parental responsibilities and disappeared. I grew up working since I was nine years old. Money was a big problem everywhere he lived. The lack of money and the fear of monetary shortage, and the memories of being hungry and not having enough food to eat, were impressed in my subconscious mind with enough emphasis. Consequently, going out on my own with a family to support at the age of, with no guaranteed income, was a monumental thing for me. I loved the idea of being my own boss, but dreaded the idea of not being able to provide for my family and myself. What feels so much clearer to me now when I look back at this risky move is the importance of feeling the fear, acknowledging it rather than pretending it wasn't there, and then doing what my heart and soul were telling me I had to do. It was my willingness to align my body and its actions with my higher self, who could no longer bear to live a lie. As I traveled the country, and then the world, doing what I knew to be my divine purpose, everything started to fall into place. When that Artie and Paul conference call announced my new tax status as a millionaire with unlimited earning capacity, I realized a very important truth. Patanjali explained it in detail a few years ago. This great spiritual master offered me the kind of advice that he spoke to me back in 1970. He said, when you are inspired by a great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their ties, your mind transcends limitations, your consciousness expands in all directions and you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Then he added, the dormant forces, powers, and talents come to life and you discover that you are a much greater person than you ever dreamed of being. I love this passage, especially the part about latent forces. These are forces that we often think are dead and unapproachable, 
but he said they come alive to help us when we are inspired by a great purpose and act on it. I realized that I had many worries and fears about the money that I had grown up with and lived with all my life, and that they dominated much of my thinking. What Patanjali offered was true for me in a big way. As I followed my dream, I remained in spirit, that is, inspired, I made more money in the first year after leaving my job than I had in the previous 35 years of my life. Somehow I see it so clearly now, when we purposely hold on and steadfastly refuse to be discouraged, accepting our fears and doing it anyway, those seemingly dormant forces come to life and show us that we are greater people than we ever dreamed of being. We discover that we are one with our source of being, and as Jesus so perfectly expressed it, with God all things are possible. Being with God means living one's purpose and always coming from a place of love. I see so clearly now that my determination to follow my own innermost calling and to do so from an inner mantra of how can I serve, instead of what's in it for me, is what allayed my concern about the financial catastrophe. During all those years of talking to people in the media, the idea of getting rich was the furthest thing from my mind. My book that appeared on the New York Times bestseller list was a total surprise to me. The money that started showing up was really unexpected. Abraham Maslow's psychology of self-actualization had taught me to stay away from the outcome. I said it often, that people who realize themselves do what they do because they are following their heart, the call of their soul, not because of what it may turn out to be. My journey was to follow what I felt so deep inside of me. All the generosity that showed up was a mind-blowing but pleasant surprise for me. This is what I have clear today, follow your heart, stay aligned with your source of being, love, and let the universe take care of the details. I have accepted an invitation to do a book publicity tour in Holland, where something unheard of has happened. Willeke Alberti, a well-known singer and actress in the Netherlands, apparently appeared on a national television show informing everyone who saw her that she read a book that completely changed her life. That book is Your Erroneous Zones, titled in Dutch as Neat Morgan Mar New, which means not tomorrow, but now. Willeke has passionately pleaded with viewers to read and apply the simple, common-sense advice offered in what has been a life-changing book for her. The next day, the demand for Neat Morgan Mar New is beyond anything the Dutch publisher has ever seen. I fly to Amsterdam, where I speak with this fascinating woman who takes it upon herself to become an overnight sensation in Holland and Belgium. Bookstores can't keep up with the demand for my book. I appear on talk shows, late-night entertainment shows, and a national game show, and I do interviews with a lot of magazines and newspapers. Willeke tells me that Neat Morgan Mar News words touched her deeply and that she would be happy to endorse anything she might produce in the future. I made a friend in a country I've never visited before, with a celebrity who speaks a language I don't understand, who is willing to be an ambassador for the kind of teaching I'm promoting in a book published around the world. Ocean in America This book is sold by the hundreds of thousands in a country that has a total population of 14 million people. I return to the United States and meet with Artie Pine and Paul Farges at Ty Crowell to discuss ideas for my next book. Ever since I was pulled from my radio interview in Sydney last summer, I have been thinking about Elvis's untimely death. I want to write about something that seems to impact everyone I talk to in one way or another. I have seen in my therapy practice that although people can change their self-defeating thought patterns and correct their wrong habitual thoughts, they still feel victimized by so many external factors that they seem insoluble. I present to Paul an outline that details new and even surprisingly unconventional methods for getting rid of the pressures and manipulations that are continually directed at almost everyone. I want to teach people how to stop feeling victims in all their interactions in life, to operate from strength rather than weakness when dealing with family members, authority figures, and the demons that live within that continually drive them away from their own well-being. B. It seems to me that Elvis was dominated by an entourage of manipulators who mainly had their own interests at heart. How did your life get out of control? Why couldn't it resist the machinations of its handlers? Who was there to steer him away from self-sabotaging behaviors? 
I want to write a book that uses the same common sense approach that captivated so many people around the world at your erroneous zones. I want to teach people how to avoid the trap of the victim who took Elvis's life and consistently acts like a progressive cancer in the lives of countless men and women. I call this proposed book Pulling Your Own Strings. I get a good advance from my publisher which is limited due to some legal terms in the original contract that I signed with them. My agent, Artie Pine, is unsuccessfully trying to get the publisher to offer a substantial financial advance that goes beyond what is required in the contract, due to the enormous and unexpected success of your erroneous zones. Artie is adamant and wants to pressure the editor. I take a very different position and insist that he step back and just honor what we originally agreed to when we were delighted to have a book contract just 18 months ago. I am more than happy. I don't need more money, I now own a beautiful home in F.T. Lauderdale, Florida, where I reside full-time. I am excited to write a second book and to know that it will be published. I insist that Artie drop his demand that my publisher break our original agreement. I don't want conflict anywhere, no hard feelings. It's not about money and I don't want it to become a problem, now or ever. When I start writing my new book, I remember reading the Declaration of Independence aloud in a civics class I was teaching at Pershing High School in Detroit. This group of high school seniors studied the Declaration of Independence one line at a time and then discussed what it was said and how it applied to them in 1961, almost 200 years later. One line in particular attracted most of the discussion. All experience has shown that humanity is more willing to suffer, while the evils are bearable, than to straighten out by abolishing the forms to which it is accustomed. Before I write the first word of pulling your own strings, I decide that this will be the quote shown at the beginning of the book, as it reveals the topic I want to address. I write daily for three months, always focused on helping the reader straighten out by choosing not to be a victim of anyone or any system, under any circumstances. When the hardcover edition of Pulling Your Own Strings comes out, I'm just as excited as two years ago when I held up your erroneous zones and pampered it like a newborn child. Once again, I am committed to taking this message to the world, but this time I don't have to fight anyone at the publisher. Donna Gould has been assigned to me as a full-time publicist. I choose to go on a book tour around the country, only this time I don't have to drive or worry about hotel reservations and stay on a very tight budget. My airfare and hotels are managed by me. Everything I want is given to me without hesitation. Pulling your own strings immediately rises to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. I keep making frequent appearances on The Tonight Show, and now I've been invited to record the daytime talk show hosted by Dinah Shore, Dinah. I am greeted in Los Angeles by the kindest, sweetest, and most generous person I have ever met in all my encounters with people from the entertainment world. Dinah asks me to make a regular weekly appearance with her on her nationally distributed television show, suggesting that I present common victimization situations and that actors actresses act out various methods of dealing with such widespread scenarios. I fly once a month and we record four shows on each visit to play weekly. In the process, I establish a friendship with a woman who personifies self-actualization, and that is M.S. Dinah Shore. I see Dinah every week showing extraordinary kindness to everyone in the studio. The lady who empties the bins has the same dignity as the stars and well-known politicians who come to the studio. I am so impressed by this multifaceted superstar that she embraces everyone with love and kindness in her heart. I'm honored to be on your show as a regular guest, and I'm even more honored to see and learn from someone who seems to have tamed his ego. She is my friend and a great teacher. I am very grateful. One of the great discoveries of my life came from my experience in the Netherlands with Willeke Alberti, perhaps the best-known entertainment celebrity in that beautiful country. In the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu offers a paradoxical truism when he says that the great Tao, God, does nothing and leaves nothing undone. As I contemplate this ironic statement, I can see, but not explain, the wisdom inherent in Lao Tzu's words. I could look all day and night for a millennium, and my senses couldn't experience God doing anything. 
I cannot see, hear, smell, taste or touch God, but something is in action, leaving nothing undone, and that is when I align myself with the great Tao and live my Dharma in that covenant. There is nothing I can do with all the people in Europe, Asia, South America and anywhere else on the planet, who I would love to hear my self-empowerment message. But it is being done. I have no idea who first put a copy of Neat Morgan Marnu into the hands of Willicky Alberti, and what inspired her to speak so passionately about it on national television. I didn't do anything, and it was obviously supposed to happen, so nothing was left undone. Clearly, there is an invisible force in the universe that takes care of everything. Without exceptions. This force is in me and it is in everything and everyone else alive, it connects us all. When I remain in harmony with this force, which is really pure unconditional love, it leaves nothing undone by doing nothing. The Beatles were right when they said let it be. Since that first initial visit to the Netherlands, the beautiful Willeke Alberti has done the same over and over again, as my books have been published in Dutch. She is a soul mate, she walks the same path that I walk, and it is mysteriously delightful to hold her hand as we traverse this path together, though geographically and linguistically divided as we are. Clearly, this force within all of us works to help each of us if we remain true to our calling. Willicky is an example of thousands of allies who are committed to the same purpose of transforming our planet into a place of divine love. I am only a messenger in this process. I do not own the words that I write, I only allow them to come through me, and the great Tao takes care of all the details. Looking back with clearer understanding, I can see how the evolution of pulling your own strings was a must for me. From my earliest memories I can recall the frustration and even deep resentment at the silly rules imposed on me by people who told me I had to do things their way, which generally meant that I had to be a victim. In my therapy practice, I saw evidence of this in virtually everyone I came across. My desire to write and talk about these kinds of everyday victim traps came from an inner awareness that it doesn't have to be this way. One can summon the courage to confront those who try to replace one's knowing what is right, with their will, their policies, or their regulations. Now I can see that it often came from a place of ego within me when it came to dealing with authority figures. And to be perfectly honest, I let my own ego play a dominant role in my life sometimes in 1970, when the spotlight of stardom began to shine on me with two national bestsellers, a luminous career as television personality, and being recognized everywhere he went. My association with the egoless Dinah sure helped me, I quickly saw the real truth that I was no better than anyone else. With Dinah as a role model, I easily made the decision to be humble and kind in all my dealings with people, and to discard any arrogant attitude that might be forming. Here I was each week with a monumental superstar, a woman who had a resume of stardom that lasted forever. Not only did he have many hit TV shows, he was a movie star and popular recording artist, with more than albums under his belt and a long list of hits dating back to the year I was born. Dinah Shore was also an honorary member of the LPGA Hall of Fame and a beloved philanthropist, with too many awards to list here. Looking back today, I can see what a profound role she was for me. He spoke highly of everyone and never allowed his celebrity status to inflate his ego. Here I was, a newcomer to all this prominence, and I was beginning to adopt an attitude based on ego and that was not worthy of a person whose mission is to serve others. This new stardom and recognition had to be an irrelevant byproduct of my own mission. I can vividly remember seeing this magnificent superstar of a lady treating everyone with love and respect. I am very grateful for the presence of Dinah in my life. Every week when I was a guest on his television show for almost two years, I was reminded to keep my humility, think of others first, and always come from a place of love. Throughout the years since Dinah's death in 1990, I have remembered her loving face and sensational smile, as well as her own radical sense of humility, and it reminds me that I must emulate those qualities that she lived with so much. Authenticity. Thank you, sweet Dinah. It was a blessing meeting you. I know he belonged to a legion of men in love with you from a distance. 
the last two lines of John Keats' famous poem Ode to a Greek Urn always remind me of you. Beauty is the truth, the truth is beauty, that's all. You know it on earth, and everything you need to know. Thank you, Dinah, for providing a role model for me to keep humble in the face of the many ego temptations that accompany fame. Your inner beauty is my truth. It's May 1978, and I'm taking a train to New York City to have dinner with Artie Pine. For the past year, I have been speaking at different venues across the country, including businesses, universities, public seminaries, and unity and science of mind churches. Artie has greatly increased my speaking fees, but the audience for my talks continues to grow. I pride myself on speaking straight from my heart for hours without the benefit of a podium or notes at all. I'm a somewhat frustrated comedian, and I use much of my speaking time to keep the audience laughing as much as possible. This is a natural place for me. I love living my own personal affirmation that I have been using for 18 years, I am a teacher. Four months ago I recited this old joke to Artie, a student asks his singing teacher, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? Your teacher's immediate response is, practice, practice, practice. I told my agent how exciting I thought it would be to speak at Carnegie Hall, to be alone on that huge stage where so many legends have performed, and to speak to a sold-out audience. I said this was a dream of mine, but I knew it was really just a fantasy. To my surprise, Artie told me that he had a friend who is responsible for recruiting talent at Carnegie Hall, if I really wanted to do this, I would wonder about the details and cost of renting such a prestigious place for one night. I once said to myself, if I can get here, I can do it anywhere. Of course I want to. So Artie called his friend and arrangements were made. I will have to pay the rental fee if the ticket sales are insufficient to cover the costs. This is the Big Apple. And this is the largest theater in the city. Now we are sitting in Artie's favorite restaurant, the Russian Tea Room. I am about to cross out an item on what I will later call my wish list. I have rented Carnegie Hall for tonight, two days before my birthday. I tell my agent that I no longer want him to put a notice on my conference contracts that says, Dr. Dyer's talks cannot be recorded. I explain that this violates my own sense of why I do this work and travel the world speaking. I want as many people as possible to listen to these talks. It's not about making money, it's about getting the word out to as wide an audience as possible. I want people to record these messages, play my tapes, and send their recordings everywhere. Artie objects, feeling that it will cost me some sales of the recorded shows, after all, he is my agent and he feels it is his job to protect me financially. But agree to remove this provision from my contract with Carnegie Hall and from all future conference engagements. We finished dinner and walked the few blocks to Carnegie Hall. I look at the marquee and see my name in the lights of this wonderful building that has housed so many giants of the entertainment industry. I walk through the cavernous backstage to my dressing room and am in awe. I'm drowning and wondering if the enormity of this occasion will leave me speechless when those curtains open and I look out on the audience. I do a silent meditation of gratitude for 20 minutes and go out to contemplate the scene before me. The main hall has enormously high ceilings and there are balconies around this most prestigious concert venue in the USA. 2,804 people on five levels. I can't see an empty seat in the house, but the moment I start to speak, I lose all my nerves. I speak for two and a half hours without a break, and am honored by a long-standing ovation. There was no announcement that my lecture could not be recorded. Earlier this year, I wrote these words, I have two main goals that I intend to achieve before the end of this year. I've completed my fantasy of speaking at Carnegie Hall, which was one of two goals, and as the old joke goes, I got there with practice, practice, and practice. The second element of this year is running a full marathon. Why? Partly due to an experience I had a few years ago while teaching a summer course at Wayne State University. A group of graduate students stood in front of the class as part of an assignment, simulating a college classroom. 
the student who assumed the role of teacher had his belt lowered below his stomach, depicting an overweight teacher with a bulging belly. I couldn't understand why the whole class was stifling laughter and looking at me shyly. Suddenly I had a shocking awareness that this student was amiably imitating me. I realized for the first time that I was overweight. How had this happened to me? I laughed with the whole class and when I returned home I realized that this was one of the most important moments of my life. I made the decision on the spot that I was going to get in shape. I went out with a pair of tennis shoes on my feet and tried to run around the block. I walked a few feet and I was panting and couldn't catch my breath. My chest ached, my legs ached, and I slowly returned home. The next night I did the same, and this time I was able to run yards before collapsing from exhaustion. He was determined to be able to run a mile in four days. On the third day I passed the half mile and found that I was not as fatigued or out of breath as before. By the end of the fourth day I was able to jog slowly for a full mile. I was on my way. I found out how empowering it was to make this kind of progress, I was hooked. I now have a running regimen that I unswervingly adhere to. Within two months of my first day of long distance running, I managed to climb up to eight miles a day. I have been running obsessively every day since the first shock to see myself portrayed as an out of shape teacher with a girth around his waist. I did the same thing I did to get to Carnegie Hall, practice, practice, practice. For almost two years I have been running eight miles a day, not even considering taking a day off. No matter where in the world I've been, I found the time and place to run. I really love this alone time. I clear my head and feel the joy of having the wind on my face. I am one with nature when I run, and I am amazed at what my body is now capable of doing. My weight has dropped to a few pounds, I have very little body fat, and I feel better than I have in years, since I was on the track team in high school more than 20 years ago. I've set my intention, trained by running up to miles at a time, and completing more or less hours of training per week. It is now October 22nd and I am signed up to run in the Lake City Marathon in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It is a crisp October morning and I am at the starting line to run the 16 miles. It is an intention in my imagination and there is absolutely nothing that can prevent me from completing this mission. Running every day has become my life, and this marathon will be the greatest achievement. I'm not worried about my time, my speed, or how I compare to the other 2,000 runners here today. I am totally confident that I will complete this race and achieve the second goal that I set for myself in January. As I run, I hear people talking about the invisible wall that runners hit, somewhere around the mile mark. I keep going because I don't want my inner image of myself happily and proudly crossing the finish line to be tainted by your comments. I finish the entire 26.2 meal course in just over three and a half hours. I am overjoyed and give a silent thank you to that student who unknowingly woke me up when he described me as an overweight teacher. Looking back, I see how important those two items on my wish list were in the unfolding of my life's work that was to follow. When I set out to run a full marathon without stopping or walking, I had never run more than eight miles in my life. However, a marathon seemed to me the pinnacle of the achievements of the race. I remembered Maslow's words, self-actualizers must be what they can be. He was talking about the burning inner desire to maximize one's potential as defined by oneself. It had allowed me to lose shape during my 30 seconds. I had given up strenuous exercise when I began teaching and directing my private therapy practice. However, I didn't see myself the way other people saw me. The young man who was imitating me in my own class was one of the best teachers I came across. To this day I can see him frolicking around the room posing as his teacher as a man with a fat belly. That was a quantum moment in my life. Rather than view that scene as criticism and feel offended, I see that all the participants, and especially the pissed off copycat, were angels sent to guide me. They most likely saved my life. At the time I was heading in a dangerous direction, overeating fatty food, drinking beer, being sedentary, enduring a crumbling marriage, 
and employing a type A lifestyle because I was being pushed in so many different directions professionally and personally. That young man posing as me helped set me on the path to self-improvement in many ways. I started a 25-year period where I ran a minimum of 8 miles every day and also ran an additional 6 marathons. Also, I started changing my eating habits and my weight dropped by about 30 pounds, and I stayed in the general neighborhood of what I weighed when I was in high school and has stayed close to there to this day. I also see so clearly today the power inherent in the idea of an intention that I was able to harness, not a wish or a hope, but the intention to manifest a new concept of myself. When I decided to run a marathon, I already saw myself triumphant crossing the finish line. As a result, I acted on the idea as if it were a complete fact. This prompted me to go out every day and challenge myself to live up to the idea that I had in my imagination, as for me it was already a fait accompli. The power within me that is inherent in an intention was brought about by mysterious teachers disguised as annoying copycats, something I now see as a valuable lesson in that 1978 experience. In fact, I am convinced that some of our greatest and most influential teachers appear in our lives disguised as people we resent or even despise. After all these years and the endless miles that I have run, I am thankful for the divine mind that sent that student to impersonate me and take my picture that day. My performance at Carnegie Hall was another great teaching moment. I had to overcome any internal doubts about my ability to reach my own level of greatness in the world of professional public speaking. My intention to speak on the main stage of the country made me realize how powerful an idea that is planted in the imagination with intention can be. Today I know that everything that ever manifests in physical reality begins with a thought, and that a thought tied to intention is a virtual guarantee that it will happen. This was a personal challenge for me, I wanted to know if I could do it. The conversation I had with Artie at dinner just before my Carnegie Hall appearance, regarding permission for the audience to record me, was also a major turning point in my life. I really wanted to live up to Maslow's definition of a self-actualizing person as someone who is detached from the outcome. I didn't want money to be the reason for how I conducted my life. My purpose was never to make money, it was always about teaching and reaching people to a new level. I cringed on the inside every time they told the audience that they couldn't record my presentation. That an audience member's recording could interfere with some projected sales of my audio show seemed completely irrelevant to me. Making the statement that night put me back in alignment with my soul. I want everyone to hear my message, not just those who can pay. In the same way, when Artie told me that copies of my books were being pirated in foreign countries and that I did not receive royalties, I refused to look for these stolen editions. I want people in China, South America, Eastern Europe, and anywhere else where poverty is not controlled to be able to read what I have written. They may be inspired by an author who once lived in the same kind of crippling scarcity, but was able to transcend it. Those two intentions that I picked up on New Year's Day 1978 were the pillars of a lifetime of writing dedicated to the incredible power of intention that is everyone's birthright if they choose to change the way they see things. As Lao Tzu taught me many years later, if you correct your mind, the rest of your life will be fixed. I corrected my mind and began to see myself as capable of accomplishing whatever I put my attention on, and learned that sometimes our deepest teachers appear to us in unexpected disguises. I was invited to participate in a week-long conference in Vienna, Austria, sponsored and produced by the Young President's Organization. YPO members are individuals who meet certain age requirements and are responsible for the entire operation of a qualified corporation or division, and are involved with organizations around the world. I accept the invitation and two days after my appearance at Carnegie Hall, my wife and I flew to Vienna. YPO has assembled a distinguished group of presenters for this conference and I am flattered to be one of them. This is an unpaid speech, offering a wonderful week in and around Vienna, with the opportunity to be a faculty member with an impressive group of well-known personalities, including the current Vice President of the United States, Walter Mondale. Upon arrival, I find out that I will be on a panel that addresses some of the YPO members. When I hear who will be performing with me, 
I am temporarily speechless. I will sit next to Dr. Viktor Frankl and consider myself a colleague. Perhaps of all the people living today, he is the one I admire the most. I remember my days as a doctoral student, in which I took courses in logotherapy, a type of therapy that Dr. Frankl created from his experiences as a Holocaust survivor in various Nazi death camps, including Auschwitz and Dachau. Four years ago when I visited Dachau, I had seen this hero of mine in my mind during my day in the concentration camp. I read Dr. Frankl's classic book, Man's Search for Meaning, both as a master's and a doctoral student, and made it mandatory to read it in all graduate courses I taught at ST. John's University. I remember how he wrote that even in the most absurd, painful, and dehumanizing situation, life has potential meaning. And he had told the world that everything can be taken from a man, except one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances, to choose one's own path. Here I am, invited to be a presenter at this prestigious conference due to the success of a couple of insignificant self-help books, and I must share the stage with a man who was imprisoned in a series of Nazi death camps, survived to tell his story, and then I wrote a classic text, which I studied and used when I taught at St. John's. I feel so humbled, so inadequate, so incredibly blessed to meet this great man, much less to be considered a quasi-colleague and co-host of a group of young presidents here in Vienna, the hometown of this lion-hearted reign of Rhodes. I feel like there must be a reason for this unexpected opportunity to be on the same panel with Viktor Frankl. When I pick up my copy of Your Erroneous Zones, I notice that the first words of this book were inspired by my reading of Man's Search for Meaning, the essence of greatness is the ability to choose personal fulfillment in circumstances where others choose to be craziness. Tomorrow afternoon I am scheduled to appear on stage with Dr. Frankel, whom I have quoted hundreds of times in my lectures. I visited the horrible death camps where the Nazis imprisoned him as a slave worker, reminding me that in the midst of these terrible circumstances this neurologist and psychiatrist, subjected to the lowest inhumanity of man towards man, was able to find beauty and meaning. I have written essays on the central idea of his logotherapy, which, as he wrote, occurred in part while the guards yelled at him and beat their rifle butts at him, a thought paralyzed me, for the first time in my life I saw the truth as it is sung by so many poets, proclaimed as the ultimate wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth, that love is the ultimate and highest goal to which man can aspire. I met with Dr. Frankel just before going on stage to speak with this distinguished group of corporate presidents. He is warm, very funny, and speaks with a strong Austrian accent. I tell him how much I admire his writing and that I had been using man's search for meaning as required reading for my graduate students. I also tell him that my two best-selling books today were inspired by him and my teachers, Dr. Fritz Redl and Dr. Abraham Maslow. I am delighted to learn that you know Dr. Redl personally and that he was associated with Dr. Maslow prior to his death eight years ago. I am beyond excited that you are aware of the German edition of your erroneous zones, entitled Der Wunderpunkt, and have read it. Responding to my comments on how to survive such gruesome treatment in the various death camps where he was imprisoned for nearly three years, and then in his fascinating speech to the engrossed crowd of attendees, Viktor Frankl says, when we can no longer change in a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. He relates that he was given a glass of dirty water with a floating fish head for protein as his only food for the day, and that his captors found beauty in this repulsive offering. He emphasizes that he reminded himself to choose to change himself. He speaks eloquently of the deaths of many of his fellow inmates, not only because of the horrible hygienic conditions, but also because of surrendering themselves and losing a sense of purpose or meaning. When I speak to the audience, I obviously feel out of place next to this teacher who is sitting at the same conference table and has lived and demonstrated his mastery of what I have written so amateurishly in comparison. When the session ends, I spend an hour or so talking to this extraordinary man. I am so impressed by his great sense of humor and love that it seems to emanate from him, even when he talks about the hideous treatment he received from his captors. 
I know that his wife died in a concentration camp in Bergen-Belsen and his mother was murdered in the gas chambers of Auschwitz. He also lost all members of his immediate family except his sister Stella, who escaped being in a camp because she had immigrated to Australia. He gives me some advice to apply in my own life and in all my future writing. He speaks clearly, saying that suffering is part of the human condition from which no one escapes during his life, and that it can be more desperate for some than for others. Yet he says, looking directly at me, you must teach people to find the meaning of their suffering, and by doing so they will be able to turn their personal tragedies into personal triumphs. This, he explains, is the essence of logotherapy. If your customers or your readers can't find the meaning, they will eventually perish. I leave Vienna a changed man. I will write and speak from the perspective that Dr. Frankel offered me here at this conference, and I promise to live a life much more focused on meaning. I am inspired by my contact with this great man and by another copy of Man's Search for Meaning at the conference to reread on the plane home. I open the book to see, those of us who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts consoling others, giving away their last piece of bread. And then I read these words, a quote from Nietzsche that I keep by heart as I contemplate writing my next book and giving my next talk, he who has a reason to live can bear almost any how. I am committed to teaching and living from a place of meaning. How to live will play a secondary role, while why to live will be much more dominant in my work. The first time I came across Viktor Frankl's work was in a filmed interview that spoke to my soul. I listened with my ears, but I listened with my heart. As Dr. Frankl spoke about the importance of meaning in everyone's life, I felt like I was hearing a higher version of myself because his words echoed something deep within me. I always wanted to go beyond what seemed to me to be the little concerns and rules created by our culture, trying to fit in and be like everyone else. While watching this interview, Dr. Frankel spoke of concentration camp inmates who gave up their lives and died, unable to find any life-sustaining beauty in the most horrible circumstances. Which means, he said, was everything. He urged listeners to find their own way to experience and trust an ultimate meaning that one may or may not call God. He pointed out that in the concentration camps, those who clung to a vision of the future were the ones who, throughout this ordeal, seemed to have the best chance of survival. Whether the vision was an important task before them or a return to their loved ones, they were more likely to survive their suffering. The moment I saw Dr. Frankel I felt a kind of alignment with him that I had never felt towards any literary person. Today, I have no doubt that there was some kind of connection between us. It was no accident that some 13 years after my first devouring the search for the meaning of man, I placed myself on the same panel with this man with whom I felt such a spiritual kinship. When I first read the accounts of Dr. Frankel's mistreatment at Auschwitz, Dachau and the Riesienstadt in Bohemia, suffering overwhelmed the words I was reading, and I knew that one day I would visit those horrible places. In some mysterious way, I felt that I would find this man speaking so persuasively about the innate ability humans have to transcend evil and discover meaning, when madness screams from every angle. That I was destined to meet this man in person, something invisible and indescribable connected us. That meeting of that day in Vienna in May of 1978 instituted a change in my writing and in my life. At the time, I was moving away from traditional psychology as the basis for my own teaching and exploration. I loved the common sense approach that permeated my first two books, and appreciated Dr. Frankel's praise for my writing succinctly and in language anyone would understand. But the essence of meaning in a larger sense, the exploration of an ultimate meaning in relation to our connection to a higher power, was stirring in me. When I met Viktor Frankl, something inside me recognized him as if we had met before and we knew each other. However it was that they placed me on that panel with one of my heroes, I can see from this perspective that the force that united us for one afternoon made my life change and my writing began to emphasize concepts such as spirituality, higher consciousness, divine love and, what is more significant, meaning. Now I can clearly see that I was beginning to explore the world beyond the ego. It is the spring of 1980, a new decade. 
Both your erroneous zones and pulling your own strings have been hugely successful. Both books have been on the New York Times bestseller list for nearly four years. When Ty Crowell accepted my original manuscript in 1975, they did so with little expectation of how well it would sell. After the phenomenal success of your erroneous zones, my agent, Artie Pine, was disappointed when the publisher refused to renegotiate the original contract. I insisted that we deliver on our commitment smoothly, and now the two-book contract with Ty Crowell has been completed. Artie has turned to Simon and Schuster, a benchmark in New York publications. He just called him to say, I made a deal with a new publisher and they offer him a preview that is in line with what I think he deserves. When he tells me that he has entered into a two-book deal with a guaranteed advance of $1.5 million, I am thrilled. I can't even imagine being in such a fortuitous place financially. I am more than blessed. Every day that I neither travel nor advertise for pulling your own strings, I write the book that I have imagined since I was in Vienna with Viktor Frankl. This new book for Simon and Schuster will be titled The Sky is the Limit and it will explain the details of reaching the state that Abraham Maslow called self-actualization, which I discovered 12 years ago. I still feel such a special kinship with this man who passed away on the same day that I received my doctorate in June 1970. Dr. Maslow often said that the state of self-actualization is achieved by a very small number of people because most are stuck pursuing and meeting the lowest needs. Physiological, security, love and belonging, and esteem. He visualized those lower needs as the base of a pyramid that he called the hierarchy of needs. The apex of this pyramid described it as an exalted realm where only a few explored its sense of purpose and meaning. I differ dramatically from Dr. Maslow on this point. I feel that self-realization is a birthright of every person. I see it as our original nature, damaged by the enculturation of genius that Buckminster Fuller described to me a few years ago. My meeting with Dr. Frankel reinforced this concept and I know that I am not alone in this belief. The idea is quite evident in John 14, 12, where Jesus proclaims that those who believe will do even greater things than he has done. I am writing The Sky's the Limit in a style similar to my two previous books, with the aim of identifying the salient characteristics of what Maslow called exemplary people. I have identified these personality traits and am writing from the point of view that we can, as Viktor Frankl so brilliantly put it, change ourselves and make new decisions in the face of circumstances that cannot be altered, this includes our past and all of our personal history. I'm moving away from how to writing and into the world of meaning, offering readers a way to access Frankl's purpose and the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and self-actualization. My new editor at Simon & Schuster is Michael Korda, who has worked on several best-selling books and has even written some himself. Michael flies to Florida and we spend a day walking the beach and discussing promotional plans for The Sky's the Limit. Then I proudly hand over this manuscript that has dominated my life for the past few months. Michael and I talk frequently and he tells me the book is fine. It just needed a little extra adaptation, so he hired an outside editor to edit the manuscript. This is a new experience for me, in the past, I've made my own edit based on feedback with suggestions. However, I am confident in the process of this new publisher, who have invested heavily in this book with a dollar million guarantee against future royalties. Months go by and I don't hear anything. I feel like I'm back in the same boat I was with John Vrind a decade ago, waiting for someone else to do their job so my book is finished. After six months I call Michael Corda and insist that his outside editor send me what he has completed. Several weeks later, I finally received a package in the mail with the first half of my manuscript rewritten by this outside editor. I am in shock. I do not recognize the book that I delivered. This person has taken the liberty of deciding that my writing style is not up to scratch. He has taken my ideas and has simply written his own version, and has basically put my original writing aside. His writing is not bad, it's just not me. I don't recognize myself in any of your rewrites. I have delivered two of the best-selling books of 1970 in my own common sense and realistic style, 
and now I am faced with the same kind of dilemma that I faced when I was a freshman in college, and was told to write using a more literary and cultured style that corresponds to the trademark of Simon and Schuster. I tell Michael that this is unacceptable, regardless of how much money I have been offered. He assures me that everything will be resolved amicably. I wait another two months, and there is still no news of this ghost editor, or rather, of a rewriter. I call Michael Corda and give him my ultimatum, I want my original manuscript back. I will review what has been rewritten and do all the final editing myself. The complete package arrives and nothing has been done since I last saw my carved manuscript two months ago. I go through the entire book, drop some of the corrections, and rewrite, although I'm not happy with the way it reads. I take the second half of the book, which the unknown publisher hasn't even gotten to after having it for eight months, and I complete the editing process myself and deliver it. I am not entirely satisfied with the final version that will be printed. But I allow it anyway because of the pressure of having it published before the end of the year. I am not at all happy with myself for allowing myself to be cajoled into accepting an edited version of what I considered masterful writing. The backstage editor hired to fix my manuscript did a good job. However, he has included examples from his own life experience and inserted them as if I had written them. Now I have a book that is excellent, but I don't support it percent because it feels like someone else wrote in the first four chapters, but it's all attributed to me. I love this book and I half resent it. The second half and the appendix are recognizable to me because they are essentially intact, but the first half has a different flavor that repels me a bit. I devoted body, mind, and spirit to the writing of this book and delivered over 700 pages that I sweated through for almost a year. I needed to cut it out, but this is the first time since freshman English university that I have an outsider telling me to write in a more acceptable literary style. I decide here, right now, that I will never allow this kind of rewriting to happen again, not for money, not for prestige, not to please anyone else. The lesson for me in managing the sky's the limit editing is summed up in a single sentence, be wary of those who claim to know more. I wasn't interested in winning any literary writing contests, nor did I care to follow someone else's writing style. I wanted to write in simple, direct language to produce a book that would help readers reach their full potential for self-actualization. By allowing other voices to dictate what my book would look like as a finished product, I now know for a fact that it had a polluting effect on the energy associated with the sky's the limit. When I held the finished product in my hand, it felt very different from my previously published books. All the interviews I did for this book did not have the same electrifying attention that I gave to my previous writing. That when part of the authenticity of what he was creating was clouded by the unwanted and unnecessary entrance of strange ghosts, it impacted everything on the book. My enthusiasm for promoting it waned a bit, albeit on a subconscious level. When I opened the book to any of the overly edited pages, I had a sense of disgust hovering over me like an invisible black cloud. I was telling myself, I didn't write it this way and yet it has my name attached to it. The dedication of this book reads, in memory of Abraham H. Maslow, the original pioneer in the study of man's potential for greatness. This was to be my tribute to my mentor, as well as the inspiration to my heart. Somehow I felt that I had disappointed both Dr. Maslow and Dr. Frankel by giving in to the pressures applied to me due to the large sum of money paid to me. The idea that I would capitulate because I was being paid very well gave me something in bad taste. That this was an important lesson for me. In the 35 books that have been published since 1980, I have never allowed anyone else's contribution to trump my own. However, I did find a woman who became my personal editor as a result of my experience with The Sky's The Limit. If I had not had this experience of feeling discredited, I would not have had the desire to find, train, and work in harmony with my friend and editor, Joanna Pyle, for these past 33 years. Today she is like the other half of me when it comes to writing. She knows how I think and how to do the professional work of editing every manuscript I create. 
From that unpleasant experience I was able to attract to me a literary soulmate who takes my scribbles and makes me look like a refined writer without the need to intervene whatever she prefers. This was a great lesson for me. Be wary, very wary, of those who would come into my life and decide for me what my life's work should be like. Now I look back and realize that the energy around this book was tainted in some mysterious way by the fact that I did not stay with my I am presence and insist on what I knew to be true in my heart. It has been many years since The Sky's The Limit was published, and it is the only book of mine that has not been able to recoup the advance on royalties that was paid at the time of publication. It is 10 o'clock in the morning of October 15, 1982. I am in the small town of Marathon, Greece, along with 5,000 people from all over the world, to run the annual classic Athens Marathon. The race was supposed to start at 7 this morning, but due to some inconvenience we started at 10. This means that we will run through Athens, about 26 miles from Marathon, during the hottest part of the day. Even so, I'm sure that starting the race this will be my best moment. This is my fifth marathon since my inaugural race four years ago. As the race progresses, a large part of the course is going uphill and it gets hotter by the minute. At the 23 mile mark, I am at a point of physical exhaustion that I have never experienced before. I am shaking and vomiting green bile. Runners are ditching around me, being picked up and taken to first aid stations by ambulances. Due to our late arrival in Athens, we have to go through the lane markers between the car lines. The fumes are the worst I have encountered. Race officials try to get me into an ambulance, however, I cannot understand the idea that I flew to Greece to achieve something that I dreamed of and that I am not going to finish. As I lay on the side of the road, completely exhausted from the heat of the day, something came over me that I can only describe as a miracle. An invisible being has appeared and comes to me in my dreams and occasionally when I am awake and need guidance. All I can say about her is that her eyes are beaming and they seem to smile at me when she talks. This supernatural metaphysical visitor speaks to me directly now while I am lying on the street. She tells me that I am strong and that I will finish this race, and that she will guide me to the end. I no longer focus on what is wrong and what bothers me, I forget about the traffic the heat, the time lost while I vomit on the ground, the fumes. My inner companion, this incredible woman who is more than a figment of my imagination, is there holding my hands and using her bright blue eyes to convince me that I am so much more than just a tired body. I am a spirit, and this spirit can do anything because it is not restricted by time, space, and physical form. I have five miles to go, but now I can see myself crossing the finish line. I no longer have leg cramps nor do my stomach ache from dehydration. My energy is replenished and suddenly I feel very strong. This is a miracle. I enter the old Olympic Stadium and do one last lap to complete it. Miles. I raise my hands and jokingly shout, we conquer. Legend tells us that these were the words spoken by the ancient runner Pheidippides as he ran from the plains of Marathon to announce the Greek victory over the Persians, after which he supposedly fell dead from exhaustion. At that moment, with intense excitement, I realize that I must write about the inner feminine partner that seems to me responsible for my victory. Upon my return to the United States I meet Artie Pine and tell him, I have a vision of a very wise woman who comes to me while I sleep. I want to write a story about her and what she constantly tells me. Artie is wildly skeptical about things like ghostly visitors and implores me instead to think about writing a book that builds on my past themes, speaking success, and appearances. In TV, I explain to my wife that I am drawn to writing about a woman who lives in my imagination and that I have named her a kiss in honor of our daughter Sky, who was born just over a year ago. By reversing the letters of our daughter's name and inserting the letter I for the higher self, the name a kiss appeared. I inform Michael Corda, my editor at Simon and Schuster, that I am going to write a parable along the same lines as Jonathan Livingston Seagull's fable, which was written and published 12 years ago. I will use my inner guide, Ikis, as the protagonist of the story. You will reside on a fictional planet that has a real life base only. 
This means that there can be no wrong thinking because people on this planet are restricted in their thinking by what it is, rather than what they would like it to be. My agent, my publisher, and almost everyone else advise me to abandon this idea of writing fiction and stick with what I have been successful so far, writing self-help books rooted in my psychological and therapeutic training. But I'm hooked on the idea of writing a fictional story and calling it A Kiss Gifts. I imagine that A Kiss will visit our world, where wrong zone thinking is rampant, and will give us the secrets to living a self-fulfilling life from his worldview based only on reality. From my experience running the Greek marathon, I can't help but think that Akis is not just a figment of my imagination, she is a spirit guide who can really speak to me and guide me in times of trouble. I trust this invisible guide and feel her presence more and more as I look forward to writing a fable based on her teachings. I was on the ground in Athens. I saw people being carried off en masse. I was about to be one of those deserters since my body had lost all its strength. I remember the moment when the energy of a kiss enveloped me and allowed me to instantly transcend the limitations of my devitalized and drained body. I ran the last five miles of that race with the help of someone or something that I couldn't explain, but was nonetheless very real to me. I am going to write this fable and trust a kiss to guide me in this new endeavor. I am scheduled to speak in Honolulu for a national convention next month and I plan to spend time writing this fictional account on Waikiki Beach. I gather my writing supplies and head to Hawaii with the firm belief that when I return home I will have completed the first draft. For the next two weeks in Honolulu, every day I head to a favorite spot, dip my back in the sand, pull out my notebook and pen, and write. The story unfolds almost effortlessly. Every day I write it feels like someone else is moving my pen across the page, and I just let it come. I don't have an outline, I have no idea how this story will play out, I just write and write. I fill many pads of paper sitting on the beach, watching the seagulls, the children, and just allowing. After two weeks I pack up and fly to the island of Maui. My wife joins me here for the last two weeks of my stay as a writer, bringing our daughter Sky, who is now months old. I find a shady spot on the beach and, using the same backing, continue with my daily writing. In Gifts from a Kiss Part 3, the main character leaves his strange but wonderful world and comes to Earth to share his gifts with us on how to truly live from a self-actualizing perspective. The story flows effortlessly and I hand over the manuscript to Simon and Schuster. While they are not enthusiastic about the idea of me doing a fiction book, my editor is very supportive. Fast forward to the book's release in late 1983. I am eager to tell the world about the messages contained in Gifts from a Kiss, and I am involved in a campaign to have this book stocked in all the bookstores I can in the United States and Canada. I buy books by the thousands and ship them on my own. Telling the world about a kiss and her gifts becomes my full-time job. I love taking this whole project back into my own hands, like I did with your erroneous zone seven years ago. I'm not worried about book sales or a spot on a bestseller list. I am having the best time of my life spreading something about something that I love. A kiss speaks to me in my imagination all the time. I feel her feminine energy all around me, silently but firmly moving toward a more spiritual approach to this life on earth. I don't talk much about a kiss as a true guiding spirit in my life, but she is very real to me. After purchasing tens of thousands of copies of gifts from a kiss and distributing them to people all over the world, I know that I will get on with my writing. I see the book as an important movie in the future and I appreciate the presence of a kiss in my life. I have written and published my only fictional story and I feel blessed beyond my ability to describe it. While writing the final chapter of gifts from a kiss, our daughter Samar is conceived in Maui. I have no doubt that a kiss is real. She is moving me more and more into a spiritual realm and is infusing me with her right brain yin energy. My experience of lying on the ground in Athens while running the marathon in 1980 was another quantum moment, a major turning point in my life. This was the first time I saw and felt the presence of a supernatural energy, and I allowed myself to go beyond my physical self and be guided. 
it was as if I was no longer constrained by the limitations of my tired body. A kiss seemed to be taking over at this time of crisis. I say crisis because the thought of coming home knowing that I had not achieved my goal of running this marathon was more than I could bear. He was living what Maslow described as a person who should be what he can be. Quitting was not an option, but my body was completely enervated. That there is much more to this whole idea of being human than can be measured by our physical achievements. I know there is a reservoir of inner strength that can be tapped into at crucial moments, and even more amazingly, there is divine guidance available to us if we are willing to believe in it and allow it to work with us. Today I know that everything in the universe is connected to everything else by invisible spiritual threads, so to speak. I know that I have a spirit guide available to me, and that it is always there if I choose to invoke it. A kiss is a personification of this divine guidance. She has appeared to me numerous times in the years since I first gave my incorporeal spiritual friend a name. I have come to rely on the availability of angelic help and guidance. I remember the amazement I felt when I ran into that old Olympic stadium. An hour earlier I was so ill that I was being urged to get into an ambulance, which nearly two-thirds of the runners had done due to the intense heat, uphill racing, and vehicle fumes that characterized this race. However, I had a second wind and I felt stronger at the end than at any other point in the race. Writing gifts from a kiss was a magical experience for me, one of my first experiences with automatic writing. Every day as I sat on the beach in Honolulu and Maui, I felt the presence of this yin energy that I call a kiss. I felt relaxed, at peace, and sure that everything I needed to say in this parable would be there. It is what I now call channeled writing, I was the instrument, and the words just appeared mystically on the pad of paper. My hand moved effortlessly and very fast. I can remember that my hand felt tight because the ideas and words came so fast. Every day, after writing for several hours, I would comment to my wife that something akin to real magic was happening with me on the beach every day. Today I can clearly see that this was my introduction to the idea that all writing is actually channeled from the world of the invisible. As Jesus said, it is the spirit that gives life, and the words on a page that appear out of nowhere are the result of the dance of creation. Now I know that God writes all books, that the words that appear on the page are not the property of anyone. I know for sure that the creative process is something that I get from a higher realm, and that a kiss symbolized for me a way to align myself with this energy that I call God, and when I can do it, I have the same. All things are possible abilities as the Creator does. When I was sending copies of gifts from a kiss to thousands of people across the country, I included a letter that said, a kiss is turning into a movie. I didn't say someday, I said it like it was a fait accompli. This was my first foray into the idea of living from the end and embracing the feeling of wish fulfilled, and posing something in terms of the present moment as if it were already a done deal. Today, in fact, there is a script for gifts from a kiss, and a director is even assigned. The idea of turning this book into a movie, which at the time was just an idea, is now becoming a physical reality. A kiss appeared first in my dreams, and then in my quiet moments of meditation, and finally as a guiding force in my life at a time when I needed to experience firsthand the extraordinary powers that can manifest when I feel most hopeless and hopeless, yes I am willing to give up and allow a miracle. This is what happened during my experience in Greece in 1980. Since that day I knew that there is much more to my humanity than what I detect through my senses and slash or scientifically verifiable data. A kiss appeared for me when I banished all doubt and allowed divine help to lead me to the finish line. In the summer of 1985, my life is increasingly filled with sharing the responsibilities of raising children of various ages. I am years old and I am the father of three little girls, as well as three older children. My wife, Mark Elline, and I have had three babies in the last four years, my daughter Tracy is now, and we have two tweens to raise. This is a huge responsibility that, on the one hand, I consider to meet the lower level needs of my children in Maslow's hierarchy, that is, to feed, clothe, and provide them with a safe place to grow. But on the other hand, 
I am also here to help you achieve your highest needs in that little compartment at the top of Maslow's pyramid called self-actualization. I have been surveying the public at numerous conference engagements over the past year asking, what do you really want for your children? The idea of writing a book on parenting behaviors specifically geared toward raising limitless children to become self-actualized adults has become an intriguing topic. Parenting is where this transformation could take place. It seems to me that many parents are pushing their children in the opposite direction to the top of Maslow's pyramid. Many children are taught to live by the demands of their ego, to earn at all costs, to accumulate and possess as many things as possible, to define their lives on the basis of how they compare to others, to earn so much money as possible, and put a monetary value on everything they do. The results of this type of pressure on children are manifested in personality disorders, obesity, physical diseases, anxiety and stress and emotional instability. My agent, Artie Pine, just signed a contract for two future books with another prestigious New York publisher, William Morrow and Company. As I discuss this new contract with my wife and Artie, I say to them, I feel compelled to write a long book on raising children to become self-actualizing people. I further explore this idea by describing how I have found that what parents say they want for their children often does not match how they actually raise their children. I have thousands of responses to my queries in a huge archive that is organized into 10 categories on what parents say they want for their children. From this file, I decide to create a proposed book outline. When Artie and I introduce it to my new editor, they are excited and give me the go-ahead. This time I avoid the need for a big advance for my book. I don't want money involved as I write, I do not wish to repeat my experience at Simon and Schuster. I am totally in the writing of this new book. I decide to title it using the same question I asked thousands of attendees at my conferences over the past year, what do you really want for your children? I am fascinated with the answers I have in my file. Nobody says, I want my kids to be rich, to be better than everyone else, to earn in everything they do, to get a good job, to get the best grades, to go to the right schools, to look good in their sons. Companions. However, it seems that this is how they are raising their children. I write for hours and hours every day, and I am aware of everything I say and do as a parent. Marcy and I have long conversations about what we really want for our six children, and we often modify our own parenting interventions to more clearly reflect what we want for our children. We are determined to put into practice the idea of raising children who feel determined and live at their highest level of happiness. I watch my son and daughters as they go about their daily routines, and I'm amazed at the miraculous way they interact with each other, with us, and with their world. I want my children to enjoy life, to value themselves, to take risks, to become self-reliant, to be free from stress and anxiety, to have a peaceful life, to celebrate their present moments, to experience a life of wellness, to be creative and above all to meet your highest needs and have a sense of purpose. These qualities would make them self-actualizing people, and these will be the individual chapter titles of this huge writing enterprise that has completely taken over my life. I write and observe, my children and my wife are wonderful teachers. They fill my heart with joy and my manuscript with ideas on how to raise children to live at the top of the pyramid. The manuscript grows day by day. I can't seem to stop typing, and am once again experiencing, in stunned amazement, automatic typing. A kiss is with me every day of this fabulous trip. On a daily basis I tell my wife what I am writing and how fascinated I am by the way this information reaches me. I have an angelic co-pilot who is directing this entire project from a heavenly distance. My writing has never been easier. I have long contemplated what it would be like for children to grow up in an environment where their total well-being was exclusively emphasized and the demands of the ego were completely set aside. This book is dedicated to the idea I learned from Buckminster Fuller, that we are all geniuses, it is life that derails us. My goal in writing What Do You Really Want For Your Children? is to explain how parents can create a living environment that does not degenerate children. 
I remember how Dr. Maslow emphasized that self-actualization is a state of consciousness that is only available to a select few people who could be called geniuses. These are the people he studied, Albert Einstein, Jesus of Nazareth, Lao Tzu, and contemporary leaders in other fields as well. I am, with apologies to Dr. Maslow, taking the position that this most exalted state at the top of the hierarchy of needs is not only available to emotionally advanced souls who won the lottery when they were conceived. This peak of the pyramid is our natural birthright. Children who are encouraged to self-actualize and see it modeled will know that no one is superior to anyone and that these higher realms are there for all of us. It is a place where people are independent, comfortable being alone, focused on reality, and deeply accept themselves, others, and the world. As parents, what we really want for our children is for them to live a happy and fulfilling life, and this is what I am totally immersed in every day. I have been writing day and night for almost a year. The words come fast and furious, flowing freely like water from a tap that continues to flow due to a broken pipe. I cannot cover the leak, I have never seen so much intensity in my writing. It comes in the middle of the night, it comes in the afternoon and also at night. I've written more, pages. I know I will have to cut this manuscript significantly, but I will leave it to my new editor, Joanna, who now works with me full time. Writing about raising children to become limitless, self-actualizing adults was the natural progression for me in 1985. I was in the midst of a portentous change in my life and consequently it was reflected in my writing and my speech. He was in the early stages of a spiritual awakening. Much of this had to do with my new marriage and the continued presence of more and more children coming into our family, by 1989, we had five new babies who were all born in 1980. It was no accident that I was directed to write about parenting, as more and more responsibilities seemed to fall into my lap. I have been a teacher at many different levels, from elementary school to graduate school, and I have always known that the best way to truly learn and understand something is by teaching it. And the same thing happened with parenting. The essential lesson I wanted to convey in writing this volume for parents was self-reliance. I have said it thousands of times, parents are not to bow down, they have to make the lean unnecessary. This is the message I have always tried to convey to my clients in counseling sessions. Learn to trust yourself. Take full responsibility for everything that comes into your life, and as Dr. Viktor Frankl has taught, you can always choose how to react to whatever life has to offer. As my family grew, these young divine beings were my teachers. Yes, in fact, when the student is ready, the teachers will appear. There was also the mystical aspect that I called a kiss directing the course of my life, as a man and as a teacher and professional writer. Here's another interesting story. One of my first clients in St. John's University, in my early years as a teacher in 1970, was a woman named Susie Kaufman, the mother of a boy named Ron who was diagnosed with childhood autism. She was also the sister-in-law of my first advised PhD student, Stephen Kaufman. During the course of many of our counseling sessions together, Susie related that her young son was completely unreachable. She and her husband, Barry Neil Kaufman, spared no effort or expense to have Ron examined by autism experts around the world. The answer was always the same, it is incurable. It is unattainable. We don't know why and there is nothing that can be done. So Susie and Barry came up with their own program to treat their young son. They hired students and trained them in a method they created, essentially to surround Ron with unconditional love in a safe and contained environment. Four hours a day, days a week, four months, Ron was the recipient of continuous loving responses. Susie described to me Ron's symptoms of rocking back and forth and being distant, almost as if he were in a waking coma. But after months of his own program to communicate with his son, one day Ron's eyes flickered and Barry said, I looked at my son with new eyes. In 1970, Barry went on to write a book titled Sunrise, which detailed the entire process they went through and how they were finally able to see Ron return to them and leave behind his incurable diagnosis. 
the book became a television movie starring James Ferentino several years later. Now fast forward to 1985, as I write about parenting. Our daughter Serena had been born in May and within a year she had started exhibiting some of the same symptoms that Ron had. I immediately remembered my sessions with Susie and all the things that she and her husband did about 15 years before. I arranged a family reunion with Marcy and all of our children, and detailed precisely how we were going to deal with Serena, all based on what she had learned 15 years ago. We surround her with love, Marcy literally held our baby close to her heart almost 24 hours a day. Her parents and siblings told Serena over and over again that she was loved, that she had nothing to fear, and that if she wanted to rock back and forth, then she would be the world rock champion as far as we're all concerned. No judgment, no anger, just love. It worked for the Kaufmans in the early 1970s, and it worked for our Serena in a relatively short period of time. Again, there are no accidents anywhere. Susie, coming into my office for counseling sessions, would benefit an unborn child some 15 years in the future, and she taught me exactly what to do as a parent without even knowing it. When I finished writing, what do you really want for your children? I began to include many references to higher needs, spiritual awakening, and God. These topics had not appeared in any of my four previous books. The birth of my children, my marriage to a spiritually awakened woman, and my own development as a teacher by examining these spiritual principles on a daily basis led me in a new direction. I was moving into the mystical, the mysterious, the realm of higher and higher consciousness. Today it is clear to me that I was receptive to the influence of the Ascended Masters who invited me to go beyond what I had been exploring and writing. Seeing my baby doing what I had been described years ago, and knowing exactly what to do and then implementing it successfully, gave me tingles. I knew that I was being led by a force much greater than myself. I knew that I was about to embark on a completely new adventure that had almost nothing to do with what I had written and spoken up to that point. All the factors were coming together, the birth of so many new babies in my life, the felt presence of a spiritual guide whom I called a kiss, a wife who modeled spiritual awareness in her motherhood practices, and most significantly, an inner call that made me speak of God, miracles, and spiritual awakening. I deliberately left them out of my previous writings, but now they were calling me, in a way that I couldn't ignore. I didn't have it, had me. On October 9, 1980, my wife gave birth to our seventh child, a boy we have named Sans J. Dyer. I've been traveling a lot these past two years doing a paperback and hardcover tour for my parenting book, What Do You Really Want for Your Kids? I feel like my life is taking a whole new purpose and direction, although I can't define precisely what that is. I receive many requests to speak at church services across the country, and I have been giving many speeches in multi-denominational, humanistically oriented churches over the past few years. It seems that the messages in my books resonate with these church memberships, and congregations are eager to attend my seminars and talks at their Sunday morning services. In a unity or religious science church a sermon is as likely to be on the writing of Ralph Waldo Emerson, Abraham Lincoln, Buddha, or Lao Tzu as it is on the direct teachings of Jesus Christ. These Christian churches emphasize spirituality and a God-fulfilled life, rather than more traditional religious dogma, and people of all religious beliefs are always welcome. I am excited to be considered a spiritual master. This is new to me as I have practically avoided any specific religion. I see myself as a global person with no interest in excluding anyone. I am honored to give sermon-like talks in church services and to be associated with the likes of Emerson, Thoreau, Leo Buscaglia, Neville, and other transcendental teachers. The more I speak at these spiritual gatherings, the more I want to write about personal and spiritual transformation. I feel like I'm being taken in a new direction, and I'm not the one pulling. Something much bigger than a little me seems to be taking charge of my life. I have now published five books, all of which have been very successful, and Artie Pine has some ideas on how to capitalize on this commercial success by writing two books that he is sure will be very lucrative for me and my publisher. 
suggest that I write a self-help book on using my common sense principles to be more effective at making money, and then a follow-up book that tells people how to have a great sex life using the limitless ideas about sex that I have written previously. Thanks to Dr. Ruth Westheimer's radio and television appearances, a new era of freer and more frank conversation about sex has been ushered in. Both my agent and my publisher believe that we would have runaway bestsellers if I wrote books about money and sex, and everyone concerned would reap a financial bonanza. As Artie tells me, your publisher is willing to make a two-book deal that will make you a fortune. I have given you the idea for these books. Just say the word and I'll finish this deal for you. I listen carefully to Artie's proposal and immediately tell him that there is no way I am interested or willing to undertake such a proposal. I explain that the talks I have been giving in spiritual gatherings over the past year have fascinated me with the idea that people are capable of achieving some kind of God realization if they change their way of thinking. What I want to write is a book called You'll See It When You Believe It, to contrast with the more common phrase, I'll only believe it when I see it. I reiterate to my agent that our beliefs as a people determine what we finally see. I am excited by this idea of writing a spiritual guide to achieve my own personal transformation. These ideas have been germinating within me during this period in which I became prominent as a spiritual teacher, without consciously doing anything to achieve it. Artie's annoyance is palpable on the phone. He asks me what I'm talking about when I say you'll see it when you believe it. I am trying to tell you that it is about entering the world of the spirit. And it is whatever people put their attention on in their imagination, which will become observable in the physical realm due to the power of the mind to create whatever it believes in. I explain that I have seven one-word concepts that the average person does not easily understand. A God-realized state is accessible with a clear explanation of these concepts and how they operate in life. I'll make each word slash concept a chapter, with examples to turn them from fuzzy concepts into something the reader can immediately put to use. I read the seven words to him, transformation, thought, unity, abundance, detachment, synchronicity and forgiveness. Then I read a statement from President John Quincy Adams that I have been carrying with me for the past year and that I have been using in most of my talks, especially in spiritually based church presentations. John Quincy Adams is fine, but the house he currently lives in is deteriorating. It staggers on its foundations. Time and the seasons have almost destroyed it. Its roof is quite worn. Its walls are badly destroyed and tremble with every wind. I think John Quincy Adams will have to quit soon. But he's doing pretty well himself, pretty well. Artie is out of his mind, frustrated with me, and responds with his wonderful New York literary agent style, what the hell are you talking about, Wayne? I have no idea what you want to write. Let's accept the deal I have arranged for you. I would be a fool if he rejected it, it is more money than he has ever dreamed of in his life. I say sorry, but I can't let money, status, or anyone else tell me what to write and talk about. I'm not Dr. Ruth and I don't want to pretend that I'm interested in telling people how to make money. I tell Artie that I will write my next book on the concept that believing is seeing, and not the other way around. William Morrow agrees to be the editor of my next book, but they don't offer a royalty advance. Both Artie and my editor tell me over and over again that the general public is not really interested in reading books related to spirituality and higher consciousness. They tell me that I am wasting my time and effort, and there is no possibility that a book with such a confusing title and amorphous concepts can be as successful as my previous books. I am fearless. I know what I want to write about and I feel the presence of something divine whispering to me that I have made the right decision. I look back and see clearly that something was influencing me to make a major change in my writing and my speech, and also in my life. I had written five best-selling books, all from a psychological perspective on how to live a fuller and more self-sufficient life, yet it was very easy for me to turn down an exceptionally lucrative offer to continue writing popular books in the country. Help the genre that would attract a large audience. I was turning down several million dollars of guaranteed income for something that would not have been particularly difficult for me to achieve. 
Given the circumstances he faced in 1987, turning down such a windfall was not something he would have predicted. He had a large family of seven children to support, including a newborn baby. Four of my children were under the age of six, and I had older children who were attending private schools or going to college. However, remembering my decision to decline that exceptional offer, I can still feel how easy it was for me. I did not hesitate for a moment or ask to speak to anyone. My no thanks came from a deep knowledge within me that I could not go in the direction that these ego temptations offered me. I am intrigued when I compare the index in my previous books to the index in You'll See It When You Believe It, which was written between November 1987 and June 1989. In this last book, God has 10 appointments, the spiritual one has 12, and the higher consciousness has. Examining the five books I had previously written and my three textbooks reveals a grand total for one of those citations across all of your indexes. That one quote is for spiritual needs and refers to Maslow's definition of self-actualization in my parenting book. I went from a single reference to God, spiritual, and higher consciousness in all my previous books to just this book. What was it that turned me away from writing psychologically oriented books to a book rooted in spirituality, higher consciousness, and most dramatically, God? This was not part of any plan I had when I started writing for the general reading public. At this crucial moment in my life, there was something that influenced me to stop thinking about making more money, or gaining more fame, or massaging my ego, and instead letting myself grow. I had avoided using higher consciousness or spiritual terms in my previous writings because I thought they hit too hard on religion and supernatural forces. He wanted to use the language of common sense and the idea that an individual did not need such unverifiable divine intervention to lead to a self-fulfilling life. By 1987 he was involved in spiritual teachings. I was reading and quoting the Bhagavad Gita and the Tao Te Ching, as well as the New Testament. I was communicating with spiritual ministers across the country and regularly lecturing large audiences in non-denominational churches on Sunday mornings. Whereas before I did not use the words God, spiritual, or higher consciousness in my writing, I was now deeply absorbed in metaphysical rather than purely physical teachings. Obviously, I had gone as far as I was supposed to go with my previous focus on rational emotional therapy and self-actualization principles. It had a rooted foundation in the material world of the corporeal, now he was being called to look much more closely at the invisible world of spirit. I immersed myself in the study of quantum physics, the great philosophers, and Eastern and Western spiritual wisdom. I was drawn to attend lectures and listen to recordings on the themes of unity, transformation, synchronicity, and detachment, all of which became the focus of You'll See It When You Believe It. Everything seemed to move very, very fast when I started this shift writing about higher consciousness and spirituality. God was no longer a religious concept for me and I felt closer and closer to God every day. I felt like my days as a psychologist were essentially over and I was excited to be considered a teacher of spiritual principles. I began to turn down requests to speak from businesses and schools, and began speaking almost full-time at churches throughout the United States and Canada. My public talk focused on achieving God-realization and being able to create miracles in everyday life. Concepts that I once rejected and criticized were now a big part of my writing and speaking, and I knew that something was directing this new course in my life. I put a tremendous amount of effort into creating You'll See It When You Believe It, which was the first of many books that I was privileged to create in the field of spiritual nonfiction literature. I wanted to create a book that would give specific suggestions on how to harness the invisible part of ourselves and how to apply the same principles that govern the universe to the functioning of an individual life. My personal editor worked very closely with me, and I was also fortunate to have a world-famous editor who had only worked on fiction books previously working on the final edit. Her name was Jean Bernkopf, and she was an angel sent to me to put the finishing touches on this, my inaugural book in this new field of research. I did two national book tours and hundreds of public lectures, mostly in what were called New Age churches at the time, across the country. 
The audience was so receptive that it is now clear that there was something that moved me to speak and write about spiritual awakening. You will see it when you think it contains a message about life that the general public, both in the US and around the world, wanted to explore. My learning in the world of self-help and psychologically oriented writing and speaking was complete. I had been pushed into a new teaching direction of how to harness something beyond the body slash mind and truly create heaven on earth. Both Artie Pine and my editor were wrong. You'll see it when you believe it, it demonstrated beyond a doubt that there was an audience for books about God and a heightened awareness in a non-religious format. The book debuted on the New York Times bestseller list and was well received around the world. I didn't know it at the time, but with the advantage of being able to look back, I see that I was living the title of that book. I saw it all come true because I first believed it. Nothing could deter me from my vision, not even an extraordinary financial gain. It is so clear to me now that the hand of God and a host of ascended masters were gently but persistently pushing me toward being a master of spiritual truth. Miracles were about to unfold in my life to help me stay aligned with this new direction. It's February of 1989, the 10th anniversary of the day Mark Ellen and I met. We both remember that first meeting on Valentine's Day with love and humor. Someone had pasted a red Valentine heart sticker on my shirt, and the first words I said to my future wife were in response to her question about what was on my shirt, I have a heart for you. I have accepted a speaking tour of Australia that includes John and Greg Rice, Kathy Lee Crosby and my dear friend and colleague Og Mandino in the lineup. My wife and my two youngest children, Serena, three and a half years old, and Sands, months old, have accompanied me on this journey. We are currently staying at the Hilton Hotel in Brisbane. I am scheduled to appear on stage in front of thousands of people tomorrow, when I will be the keynote address at a large seminar open to the public throughout the day. A noise wakes me up. The red numbers on the digital clock next to the bed read, AM, and I see that my wife is up and in the process of rearranging the furniture and sleeping arrangements in our room. It's the middle of the night. What the hell are you doing? Are you awake or do you walk asleep? I ask Mark Ellen. Apparently she's sleepwalking because she doesn't answer. Serena is asleep next to me, and Sans, who is still a nursing baby, is in the same bed as her mother. Marcy, in a walking coma, picks Serena up and puts her in bed with our baby and climbs in next to me. She starts to make headway and is completely determined to make love to me. The expression on his face is unlike any I have ever seen, and I am in a semi-conscious state of surprise slash delight. My wife has been breastfeeding or pregnant for the past eight years and as a result has completely stopped her menstrual cycle. They also removed an ovary, making conception seem impossible. Despite all this, our youngest daughter, Sage, is conceived. What woke up my wife at that precise moment? What caused this behavior of a woman who is always in control? What force is operating here? Who is in charge here? A few months later, I'm in Phoenix on a book tour for you'll see it when you believe it. I am scheduled to appear on KTAR radio station with Pat McMahon, I have visited his show on several occasions during book tours over the past decade, and he has become a good friend. Turns out the guest on the show before me is another of my heroes. Mother Teresa is in Phoenix to support the opening of a newly built homeless shelter, where she had slept the night before. Pat McMahon is an Irish Catholic, a spiritual man, and he's beside himself with excitement anticipating interviewing this holy woman. He repeatedly asks her if there is anything he can do for her, tell the listeners about your ashram in Calcutta. Can I help you raise money for your mission? Anything. Mother Teresa. I would like to do something for you, since you do so much for so many people. There is one thing you can do for me, he finally says in his broken English. Tomorrow morning, get up at four in the morning and hit the streets of Phoenix. Find someone who thinks he is alone and convince him that he is not. I am deeply moved by your words. They confirm everything I have written in my book about unity and awareness that we are always connected to our source of being, 
regardless of what our senses tell us or what external circumstances seem to indicate. I am aware that the energy of the entire studio has changed. People seem to be in less hurry, the atmosphere is one of benevolence, whereas before this beautiful, tiny woman walked in, it was fast-paced and kinetic. I feel like a warm shower is running into me, which I often call the tingling. And I'm not the only one who feels that way, Pat tells me it was like a wave of unconditional love washed over him as she sat across from him in the studio. I cannot see or touch the loving energy that everyone seemed to feel. But it is evident to me that this devoted woman, who has dedicated her life to serving others and living in Christ consciousness, has managed, with her little self, to dramatically impact the environment around her, and also everyone in it. I feel very blessed to be able to share this experience. It reinforces that there is much more to what we perceive as our reality than what we experience with our senses. This is not something that can be explained, nor is it something that I believe because I am seeing it. This is the experience I refer to in the title of the book that I am proud to have written through myself. You will see it when you think it says it all. What happened on Valentine's Day in 1980 was as momentous an occasion as any I have ever experienced. The odds of my wife getting pregnant seemed incredibly high. That Marcy was awakened from a deep sleep and directed in her semi-conscious state to participate in that instant in the dance of creation was beyond my reason. This was the only time in our more than years together that she behaved in this way. For me, this was a confirmation that something much bigger and beyond the material world was at stake. Sajakis Dyer was born in November of 1989, and he obviously played some kind of invisible role in reaching this physical plane of existence with me as his father and Marcy as his mother. Something beyond our explanation happened that morning. My youngest daughter is one of the most determined young women I have ever met, ever. That determination must have been working overtime that early morning in Brisbane. He had to touch his mother's shoulder and somehow wake her from a deep sleep. He had to order her to move the furniture and rearrange her future siblings to activate the conditions necessary for her to enter this world from her position in the infinite realm. This was the only time available for Sage to fulfill his own dharma. At any other time, his openness would fade and someone different would appear or, more likely, no one at all. On Mother's Day that year, I wrote a verse to my wife titled Brisbane, commemorating the incredible events that occurred that morning. Brisbane where God was revealed to us. Only the two of us know the magic and wonder of that presence. Against all odds. Our connection with eternity is further strengthened, strengthened. However, the paradox always persists. We are in control slash not in control, condemned to make decisions. All I'm sure of is our forever embedded love. The first two lines say it all. This was the moment when God's presence was truly revealed to Marcy and me. I can clearly see today that I was involved in a divine intervention as I watched my wife move around the room in a sleepwalking state, led by a force that I had never witnessed up close and personal before. This was a turning point for me. My future writing would emanate from this first-hand knowledge of the sacred that I witnessed at the conception and subsequent birth of our daughter Sage. From that moment I knew that there really are no accidents in this world. We think we are in control, but as Lao Tzu once observed, we are not doing anything, we are just finishing. And Jesus also said, it is the spirit that gives life. The spirit was working in that Brisbane hotel room back in 1989. Every time I look closely at Sage, I think of the invisible spirit that was speeding up the process of getting here, as I said, against all odds, and then I remember with God, all things are possible. When I look at his tireless perseverance and unwavering determination, I remember how that must have been at stake in a gigantic way as he manipulated events to ensure his incarnation. I have always thanked God for the beautiful spirit that is my daughter. But I am even more grateful to be able to participate in something that I can only call real magic, which would be the title of the next book that I would write in three years. Now I had left the world of psychology behind in my writing permanently. 
that a person who reaches a level of God realization can impact everyone he meets simply by his presence in the same room. It has been said that when Jesus entered a village, only his presence and nothing else would raise the consciousness of everyone in the village. This was the same phenomenon that I observed in May of 1989 when Mother Teresa entered that study and everyone seemed to feel the impact of her holy presence. This is not psychology, it is advanced spirituality and divine love in action. I decided right then and there that this was something I would aspire to for the rest of my life. By observing how this woman affected the world around her, I was given a role model for how I would like to impact others as well. It reminded me of the way the loving presence of Dinah Shore seemed to uplift everyone around her. With Mother Teresa, there was also an element of spiritual impact. The presence of this holy woman seemed to make everyone around her want to be more like Christ, be less critical, overlook and forgive any flaws, literally feel closer to God due to the pheromones of love that she emitted with her alone. Presence Years later, on the morning of September 1997, I was about to address a large gathering of people in Sydney when a note was handed to me informing me that Mother Teresa had passed away the night before. I told the audience about my experience in Phoenix with this future saint, and commented that it was very much like her to sneak away unnoticed at a time when the world's attention was focused on Princess Diana's funeral in England. Mother Teresa lived her life beyond the ego. He did not want to be given any credit or attention, it was about serving others, especially the underprivileged. He once commented that every day he saw Jesus Christ in all his harrowing disguises. That's how she lived. And that's how he died, at a time when all the fanfare and attention was elsewhere. The divine and holy presence of this woman invigorated and enhanced not only the energy of the immediate environment, but also all those who were in her presence. I remember thinking that it could become this way if I could live and be just a fraction of the goodness and godliness that Mother Teresa represented. She was definitely a miracle worker, and she inspired me a lot to become more like her. I knew that I would have to undergo a radical transformation in my lifestyle, in particular to tame my ego and focus my life's work more on the realm beyond the physical. I can clearly see that my brief encounter with Mother Teresa, just as I was about to launch a national book tour for You'll See It When You Believe It, pushed me to look into the world of the miraculous and examine the possibilities of the real. Magic The kind of magic I saw take place when this woman walked into a study and made everything and everyone feel aligned with God. I am on a new mission in my life in the fall of. I have been reading a lot about spiritual masters, ancient and contemporary, who are capable of performing what are called miracles of all descriptions, astonishing feats such as raising the dead, instant healing from paralyzing deformities, acts of alchemy, communication telepathy, astonishing manifestations, and synchronicities. I firmly believe that if one person can perform this kind of magic, everyone can. This is what I want to explore. Henry Miller said, Don't look for miracles. You are the miracle. I cannot get this idea out of my mind. I am going to write about the notion of teaching people how to maximize their own highest potential to achieve what has been called miracles. I too am about to participate in my own impressive feat and experience a radical transformation. I watch world-famous illusionist David Copperfield perform amazing magic acts in Las Vegas. As I sit there enjoying the show, the idea occurs to me that I have been immersed in something that does not involve smoke, mirrors and hoaxes to fool the audience. There is real magic and I have been on the fringes of this phenomenon for the past few years. I go back to my hotel room and stay up all night writing an outline for a book on creating miracles in everyday life. I'm going to call it real magic, and I can't wait to start. One of my spiritual mentors is Nisargdutta Maharaj from India, who passed away a decade ago. As I prepare to write my new book in Florida, I am drawn to read and reread this advice he gave to a devotee, if you want to reach your full potential and fulfill the dharma for which you incarnated, you will. I need to live a life of sobriety. Little by little I realize that the phrase speaks to me about myself and that I must make a decision. I have been running a minimum of 8 miles every day for almost years. 
Running several hours a day is just as normal for me as brushing my teeth before going to bed. Now sitting at my desk, I try to remember a day when I didn't have a few beers at night after running. I mentally go back 10 years and I know that it is even more than a decade. It hits me hard that almost years have passed in which I have consumed alcohol every day, with no exceptions. It is a habit and my life revolves around this habit. I allow a recent scene to play itself out in my imagination. Last week I had my wife and our six children pack and leave a restaurant because her liquor license had been temporarily suspended. My need for a couple of beers became the reason to make seven other people uncomfortable. I am ashamed that I have allowed this habit to become such a dominant force in my life, and that it has become something of a daily obsession for years. I hear Nisargadatta's words ringing loudly in my ears. If I want to reach my full potential and fulfill my life mission, I need to live a life of sobriety. I tell myself, I'm sober. I never get drunk. I always stop after two or three beers. I really don't have a problem. But I know I'm kidding myself. That's over, consecutive days of putting alcohol in my body. Hokkyo Sho once said in his Sanskrit text, after the third glass, the wine drinks the man. I wonder what he would say about 5,000 consecutive days of three beers. I think a lot. In fact, the beer is drinking me. I make a decision on the spot. I make an agreement with God, my higher self, that I will not have a beer tonight. I will practice the total sobriety that Nisargdutta recommended to one of his devotees in Bombay back in 1970, which also happened when I started this daily habit of drinking beer. Maybe he was talking to me. I never met Nisargdutta, but I studied her work I am that in depth. Whenever he read the transcripts of his dialogues with his students and devotees, it always seemed as if he was speaking to me. This is another one of those quantum moments, in fact, I can watch it with me now as I repeat my rude behavior at the restaurant, where I behaved in such a rude and inconsiderate manner to my wife and children. I ask for guidance and support in my new endeavor. I don't tell anyone what I'm doing. Tonight passes and I'm amazed at how easy it is. I feel the hand of a guiding spirit working here. I'm not doing this just because I don't want to disappoint myself, my family, or anyone else. I no longer wish to disappoint God, my higher self, the individualized expression of God, which is pure love. I come from perfect health and wellness, and I intend to stay aligned with this and keep alcohol out of my body, because alcohol destroys brain cells and is therefore destructive to my well-being. I have a senior partner in this company and I feel confident, blessed, and truly inspired to change this habit, one day at a time, and I love every minute of it. I write furiously and my new editor, Harper Collins, is delighted with the manuscript. Every day I realize that deep within all of us there is a unified field of limitless possibilities. I wonder, who am I to undertake a task like speaking of miracles? Then I stop with the doubt, I just listen and let myself be directed as the spirit seems to be calling me. My opening remarks at Real Magic are an observation from St. Francisco de Assis, a saint whom I have met superficially and considered one of the greatest examples of miracles, I have been all impious, if God can work through me, he can work through anyone. These words reflect both the humility and the confidence I feel about this venerable subject of royal magic. Jumping into the fall of, I have completed a full year without alcohol. I know in my heart that this decision, prompted by my long-deceased Guru Nisargdutta Maharaj, set me on this new path. I thank God, Saint Francis, and Nisargdutta for the beautiful book with the rainbow on the cover titled Real Magic, which I hold in my hand. I'm blessed. More than two decades have passed since I heard Nisargdutta Maharaj speak those words about the need for total sobriety to fulfill a man's destiny. Today I can say that those words that I heard were some of the most momentous I have ever encountered. I have never been tempted to go back on my commitment to sobriety since that extraordinary quantum moment. When I look at my decision to break a year-long habit of daily beer consumption, 
I realize that I no longer want to upset or disappoint my higher self, which is in total alignment with the source of all being. That breaking habits of self-sabotage is not difficult when I dedicate myself to my higher, God-realized self. He knew then that he had promises to keep and miles to go before bed, as Robert Frost wrote so succinctly in his famous poem Passing Through the Woods on a Snowy Night. However, I also knew that if my daily drinking habit continued, it would not allow me to keep the promises I made when I came to the spirit world. It was the promise I made to my creator, to that infinite intelligence of well-being from which I originated and to which I would eventually return, that I fully intended to keep. Once the decision was made, with the help of contemplating what my future would look like, and my brain in particular, when I was no longer destroying brain cells with my drinking, real magic began to appear in my life. I received a phone call from Michael Jackson inviting my entire family of 10 to spend five days with him at his Neverland Ranch in California. For three hours alone with Michael on top of a mountain, all he wanted to know about me was, does real magic really exist? And how can we access it? I met and associated with Deepak Chopra, and we continue to lecture around the world, including in England, Greece, and Australia, and at the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids of Cairo, Egypt. We were both open to the idea of being able not only to become miracle workers ourselves, but to teach others how to tap into their own unique and unlimited potential for greatness. That all these experiences of real magic came from the singular quantum moment in which a great enlightened spirit spoke to me and set the wheels in motion for me to make a great decision that would impact me for the rest of my life. Giving up my daily beer drinking habit seemed impossible one day and an easy directive to follow from my most respected teacher the next. Now I look back at the shame I felt for being so inconsiderate of my family, in the name of an ego-based longing for a substance that was destroying my ability to reach a more evolved and enlightened state, and I can see that a lot of divine force was at work. I know very well the Buddhist homily that says that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. The teachers were there all the time. He had read and reread Nisargdata countless times before. However, on that day, due to the alignment of my own self-repudiation, coupled with my desire to write about the miracles of my contact with Mother Teresa, the words of my long-dead guru, and my intention to be a better person, me, the student, was ready. I maintained that disposition by systematically abolishing so many unhealthy and decidedly unspiritual habits that I had acquired, and replacing them with a reverence for serving others and for trying to live a God-fulfilled life as a teacher. He is no longer a teacher of psychological principles for a self-realized life, but a teacher who was and is being guided by a multitude of ascended masters to try to teach others how to find the sacred in themselves and in everyone they meet. My decision to quit alcohol was one of the most momentous things I have ever done in my life, and it all happened because I was told that I could no longer destroy some brain cells every day and hope to fulfill the dharma that I had signed. 4. I look back at the events of that day and all the shame and disappointment I was feeling, as one of the greatest gifts ever given to me. In fact, I was able to glimpse the future and see myself as a sober spiritual master or a man addicted to a self-limiting, brain-destroying habit. Implementing my new vision was, and still is, essentially effortless. It's the spring of 1994, and I've been touring the country promoting the hardcover and paperback editions of Real Magic. My editor is asking for a follow-up book, and I remember a very special day almost 10 years ago when Ken Keyes, Jr., and his wife, Penny, came to visit us. Her car pulled up in front of our house in Boca Raton, Florida, and I saw a young woman pick up the man in the passenger seat and drive him to our house. Then I had one of the most memorable nights of my life. He had been a fan of Ken Keyes, Jr., for over a decade. I read and reread his classic book published in 1970, Handbook to Higher Consciousness, without realizing that he was a quadriplegic. It turns out that Ken had been paralyzed for almost years of his life, due to the fact that he contracted polio shortly after his discharge from the military at the conclusion of World War II. He had only mentioned it in a very early book, in which he wrote, 
my reality is that I am too busy and involved in the activities of my life to have time to worry about being shy in the wheelchair department. Today I see my supposed disability as another gift that my life has offered me. Over the years I read and lectured on his recently published book, The Hundredth Monkey, which I distributed to my audience for several months. The book details how a higher consciousness can be implemented to prevent nuclear war, focuses on the idea that all humans are connected on a spiritual level, and each thought that we have individually impacts all other individuals due to this interconnectedness. Ken and Penny were as excited to meet me as I was to have them in my home. My books had been on the bestseller lists for almost a decade, and my numerous appearances on national television had brought me great recognition. Ken's book had been very important to me and many others on a spiritual path, however, it had not yet reached the type of large audience that I believed it warranted. As Ken, Penny, Mark Elling, and I sat around the kitchen table, he often returned to speak of the area of heightened awareness. He said, I encourage you to explore the world of higher consciousness. You have a great voice and the whole planet will listen to you if you write about it. We spent a lot of time talking about the possibilities of transforming our world through the implementation of spiritual principles. This area of writing was relatively new to me as I had recently been removed from an exclusively psychological perspective. After Penny and Ken left, I took some notes on what we discussed. I detailed four keys to greater awareness that emerged from our intense and inspiring conversation that night. I made a mental note to incorporate these four keys into my lectures, and maybe one day write about them. They were, banish the doubt, cultivate the testimony, close the internal dialogue and free the higher self from the ego. I spent the next decade making these ideas the centerpiece of my presentations. I think back to that gloriously exhilarating night I spent with Ken Keyes, Jr., and his wife, Penny, about ten years ago as I consider what my follow-up book will be. I have been talking about the ability that we all possess to create real magic in our lives, and now I am preoccupied with the idea of writing about the sacredness that is the very essence of all. We are all sacred, pieces of God, and it's not so much about creating miracles for me anymore, it is about recognizing God within us. Living beyond the ego, which is actually the false self. We all come from God, therefore we must be sacred, a part of what we come from. Unfortunately, many people invert the letters in sacred and live in fear. I write an outline and submit it to my editors at HarperCollins. They are very excited about this book that I call Your Holy Self. It has been three years since I was in write mode. I am happiest when I can sit at my desk and write without interruption. My family now lives in a beautiful new home that my wife and I designed and built in Boca Raton, Florida. We have five daughters and one son living with us, forever. So, I wake up every morning around 3 and go to my local office where I can be in a quiet environment without interruptions. The words seem to come out effortlessly as I fill in page after page. I learned that my friend and spiritual master Ken Keyes now has kidney failure, and I keep his photo, as well as the manual for higher consciousness, in view as I allow your sacred self to come through me. I write a chapter on each of the four keys to greater awareness that Ken and I discussed in depth a decade ago in my kitchen. I am almost obsessed with discovering ways that we can overcome that great obstacle, which is our ego, to know our sacred self. I write extensively on the details of moving from an ego-based identity with its focus on competition, fear, and outward appearances, to a higher consciousness such as peace, truth, love, and purity. Every chapter on transcending our ego seems to flow from my pen to the pages I write every morning while Marcy and all of our children are fast asleep a few miles away. I conclude your sacred self with an essay titled Towards a World Without Ego which is inspired by that glorious day I spent with Ken Keyes, Jr., and our discussion of the hundredth monkey phenomenon. This was his vision, which motivated him to encourage me to become a spokesperson for higher consciousness. I thank Ken, who passed away on December 20th of kidney failure, and close with a quote from another of my spiritual teachers, Nisargdutta Maharaj, my position is clear, produce to distribute, feed before eating, give before taking, 
think of others before thinking of yourself. Only a selfless society based on sharing can be stable and happy. This is the only practical solution. If you don't want it, fight. I say a silent prayer of thanksgiving for the presence of these two enlightened souls in my life. I remember very well the day Ken and Penny came to my house and I know it was a divine appointment. The energy of that night together at our home stayed with me for a decade, inspiring me to write your sacred self. It was during that night together that I came face to face with a man who was living what he had written in his manual for higher consciousness a dozen years earlier. But more of what we talked about that night, which would become the impetus for a great in-depth book on discovering one's holiness, was what I noticed in these two poignant people. Ken Keyes, Jr., was trapped in a body that was dysfunctional in many ways. Her paralysis turned into quadriplegia and was severe enough that she was unable to roll over in bed, and she needed body care aids for more than four decades. However, what he revealed the most to me that night was that this man, who had written a classic book on higher consciousness, did so without paying any attention to his physical body. Not only did he know that we are all spirit beings having a human experience, he was living it, because his body was essentially inoperable. Today I can clearly see the importance of the inner world in contrast to the outer world. The interior is invisible, shapeless, and does not care about the data that is revealed to us through the senses. It is in this inner meditative realm that I tap into a great deal of my own creative energy. I write and speak often about the presence of the I am within each of us, and how to live a spiritually directed life while ignoring the illusion of our bodily being. What is real is what never changes is a statement I have made thousands of times. That I who am the ghost of the machine is real, the machine itself is constantly changing and is therefore not real. But I have not had to test this principle. Ken Keyes, Jr., lived and taught from the only place where he was complete, and that is his inner I am presence. He never complained, he simply walked in and offered a manual on how to achieve spiritual fulfillment regardless of our circumstances in the physical world. He had to see Ken and Penny up close and personal. The image of this woman picking up the man she married and doing it from a place of pure unconditional love is permanently etched in my memory. And the image of this man sitting there with unusable hands and legs dangling helplessly, and talking to me about the importance of my writing about what I was living, burns brightly on my own inner screen. Benjamin Franklin once observed, while we may not be able to control everything that happens to us, we can control what happens within us. No one personified the truth of this better than my friend and colleague Ken Keyes, Jr. His presence in my life inspired me not only to write a book about one's sacred self, but to work even harder to tame my own ego. I remember talking to my friend Elizabeth Kubler-Ross about Ken and his impact on my writing. She told me something that later appeared in her book Death, The Final Stage of Growth. The most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These people have an appreciation, sensitivity, and understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and deep loving concern. Beautiful people don't just happen. She was describing Ken with these words. I can clearly see that divine surprise date that day with Ken Keys was to impact me and my writing in a very big way. I love you, Ken. Thanks for the inspiration. You really are one of those beautiful people Elizabeth talked about. The day after Christmas, I read an article in the newspaper about K. Obara, a woman who has been a 24-7 caregiver of her daughter, Edwarda, for the past few years. Edwarda went into a diabetic coma on January 3, 1970, when she was years old. His last words were, Promise me you won't leave me, will you mommy? K. Obara, holding her daughter's hand, said, Of course not. I would never leave you, baby, I promise and a promise is a promise. Kay's promise to her teenage daughter has involved a kind of self-sacrifice that few people are called upon to perform. Edwarda needs to be fed every two hours, 24 hours a day. In addition, your blood must be checked and tested every four hours, 
and you must receive an insulin injection six times a day. Kay has not slept in a bed for the last quarter century as she has cared for her daughter around the clock. The newspaper story captures my soul and I am forced to gather the rest of the family to listen to it. I tell them, I want each of you to go to the kitchen and listen to the story that I am going to read to you. I want us, as a family, to do something for this woman and her daughter. My family is crying to hear about the Obara family ordeal and the sacrifices this holy woman who lives only 40 to 50 miles from our home in South Florida is making. K. Obara, who has sacrificed all her personal concerns in the name of service to her daughter, is a living example of God realization. It's a lot like what I remember feeling when I encountered the amazing energy that Mother Teresa projected six years ago at the Phoenix radio station. I am writing a short letter to Kay telling her that she is my hero and sending her a copy of Real Magic, as this book explores the idea of being able to create miracles in everyday life. I put my letter and my book in a package with a donation and a card signed by my children and my wife, and sent everything to Kay in Miami, along with a silent prayer for her and her daughter who is now 41 years old. In January I go to the west coast of Florida. I plan to write a new book on demonstrations and will be traveling home on the weekends. I keep Kay and her daughter in my prayers, but my focus is on my writing. I am absorbed in this idea of manifestation and I feel that I am somehow channeling information along with spiritual principles in order to attract everything we desire into our lives. After a long day of writing and researching, I turn on the television to watch the evening news. Deborah Norville, who has interviewed me several times in recent years, announces that her Inside Edition will feature a story about a woman who has been caring for her daughter in a coma for 26 years or more. When the show starts, there's Kay Obara reading to Edward Ah from Real Magic, who had sent her less than two weeks ago. I look in amazement when I hear Kay read the first words of Chapter 1 to her daughter, this is a book about miracles. I am in awe of the synchronicity at work here. I'm watching TV, something I rarely do, a show I've never seen, and there's Kay reading to her daughter a book I sent her because I was deeply moved by this woman's unconditional love. To top it off, the title of the chapter I'm writing in my new book, Manifest Your Destiny, is called Connecting to the Divine Source with Unconditional Love. I make the decision to contact Kay when I return home from my time as a writer. When I return to Boca Raton, I see a thank you letter from K. Obara on top of my mountain of mail. I immediately call her and make arrangements to visit my wife the next day. When Mark Elling and I arrive at K.'s modest home, we are greeted by a woman full of life, fully committed to serving her comatose daughter and devoid of self-pity. Both Marcy and I felt as if we were in a sacred space when we entered Edwarda's room. I hold Edwarda's hand and somehow feel like she can hear me speaking to her. After an hour I say out loud that we are about to leave, and a small tear appears and she seems agitated and restless. When I tell her we'll be back, Edward almost instantly seems calmer, like she knows we're in the room with her. I feel such a strong connection to these two women. I know Edward is connecting with me in some way that I can't explain. I have been writing about sacred spaces, real magic, and now the spiritual principles involved in manifestation. I know it is no accident that I am here in this sacred space where unconditional love has been ubiquitous for the last quarter of a century. I am in the habit of visiting Obara's house whenever I can, and I learn of the enormous financial burden this family has been subjected to, the extraordinary expenses involved in Kay keeping her promise to Edward on never to leave her. I keep wondering what I can do to help these beautiful people who live from a place of higher consciousness, while simply writing about it. I know that my wife and I were sent to help these people. There are no accidents in this universe and this is certainly no exception. After several weeks, my son Sands, who is nine years old, runs out of his bedroom one morning after showering. In a somewhat hysterical way, she announces, Mom, Dad, I just saw Edward in the shower. She was awake and smiling at me. Honestly, it was her and I ran out as fast as I could. Sans is hysterical. He, along with all of our children, 
has been to Edwarda's house and has watched Marcy and me interact with her in her comatose state. When I tell Kay what my little one has seen, she says that she can feel when Edwarda leaves her body. Edwarda has also appeared as more than an apparition with other people around the world. I am skeptical, but I remember that Jesus said that all things are possible for those who believe, which leaves nothing out. I remind myself that when I walk into Edwarda's bedroom and talk to her, I always feel a sense of calm and a slight scent of roses. I make a decision that I want to help ease the financial burden that hangs over Kay at all times, and I want to tell her incredible story to the world. I feel like it will help others reach their hearts and spread compassion and love in their own lives wherever and whenever possible. I will put my writing on hold and tell the story of Edwarda and her mother's devotion to her, and donate the proceeds and royalties to Kay. This will be the first time in my life that I can turn all my writing energy into something that will benefit another human being without bringing me any financial reward. He has given me a gift from a woman who has been in a coma for over 26 years. I'm blessed. My wife and I are alone with Edwarda in her room several times a week as I prepare to write this incredible story for publication. Although Edwarda is in a coma, we always feel a higher presence in the room. I never leave visitation without feeling that she is fully aware of my presence. Also, the more I learn about what Edwarda was like before the onset of her coma years earlier, the more I think she is an extremely spiritual person. She was kind to everyone, never judging her, and only had loving things to say even to those who were often on the opposite side of her value system. Her sister describes her as a daughter of peace, and she radiated that peace outward to everyone she met. When I ask her mother what the use of Edwarda's life as she lies motionless and speechless, Kay responds, she truly gives meaning to all of our lives. She may think I'm crazy, but I think she's doing the Lord's work. I do many hours of interviews with Kay and her holy doctor, who has worked tirelessly and without pay. I gather all the medical records, my recordings of our interviews, and I dedicate every working moment to writing the almost incredible story of a mother's unconditional love and what it can teach us. Hey House will publish A Promise is a Promise. I ask Mark Elling to include a chapter on a mother's point of view, as she herself is a devoted mother of seven children. The presence of Kay and Edward Obara in my life was another of the great gifts given to me. When I look back at everything that happened to facilitate this new relationship, I can see that there were so many synchronous events that occurred to bring me this gift. This was the work of a higher power that coordinated the entire company. He had been writing books that focused on spirituality, the creation of miracles, and the connection to the sacred that is inherent in all beings. However, it is one thing to write books on higher consciousness and spirituality, it is another thing to live it, day after day. Edward and Kay were instrumental in my journey from being able to write about spirituality and God realization to being able to practice and live those teachings. Kay Obara's selfless demonstration of unconditional loving service to her daughter for over a quarter of a century, avoiding any and all personal concerns and sacrificing even the simplest of pleasures, such as sleeping in a bed or shopping for anything. Thing for her, is demonstrative. Of the realization of God in action. It was time that he began to live what until now he had only spoken lip service when writing and speaking. These are some of Marcellini's words in A Promise is a Promise. When Wayne found out about her financial situation, he said to me quite naturally, I'm going to write a book about Kay and Edward. All proceeds will go to Kay. What do you think of that? I looked into the blue eyes of this dear and kind man and saw his determination. I have personally watched him evolve over the years into that spiritual master that we all love, and I saw it as his greatest act. On duty thus far I would not only write this book, I would promote it around the world and get nothing out of it. I see clearly that Edward and Kay were in my life's path to offer me the opportunity to live as God lives, aligning myself with the pure energy of giving without asking for anything in return. This is how God works. Thus lived and worked the great ascended masters. Just asking, how can I serve? Instead of, what do I get out of this? 
I spent some of the most satisfying months of my life writing a promise is a promise. The coincidences that occurred are certainly of a higher order. Starting with me reading the news about this unconditional love, her life close to where I lived, watching Kay reading real magic to her daughter on national television, going to her house, and so many other alleged coincidences were part of the promise. Of a great source of love called God, who invites me to live from a place of service to others. I thank Kay and Edward Obara every day for that precious gift. Before Kay died, she told me that I was an angel sent by God to help her overcome the pain that defined her life. I told her many times that it was the other way around, that she and Edward Ah were angels sent into my life to teach me firsthand the meaning of the words of one of my favorite poets, Rabindranath Tagore. I slept and dreamed that life was joy. I wake up and see that the life was service. I acted and lo and behold, the service was joy. It's January 1997, and I just put the finishing touches on Manifest Your Destiny. This idea of manifestation has intrigued me since I began to write and speak from a spiritual perspective more than eight years ago. It comes from my fascination with the works of Jesus, who was reported to have the ability to turn five loaves and two fish into a feast that fed people by looking up at the sky and commanding the food to appear. I have heard of ascended masters alive today who are able to manifest the sacred ash called booty and other material objects from their thoughts without the benefit of smoke and mirrors. Deep within me I know that we are all divine because we come from the divine. And I also know that when we fully align ourselves with our original nature, we are one with the creative source of the universe, and therefore we gain the same powers as the creator. The ability to instantly manifest from our thoughts is rare because very few humans have succeeded in ignoring the demands and temptations of the false self that is the ego. I have been writing about specific principles so that I can reduce the time lag between having a thought and that thought manifesting as a physical reality. These principles have come directly to me in the last two years thanks to my daily japa meditation practice, which I do twice a day as a result of this letter from Sri Guruji. Dear Wayne. The purpose of this meditation is to end the suffering of human beings by manifesting their wishes. Before developing and offering the technique, I prayed with Shiva and Nandi. I would never allow it to be misused, that's why I chose you. This spiritual master from India selected me to learn the ancient Japa technique of meditation for the manifestation that was originally conceived by the father of meditation, Patanjali, more than years ago. The word Japa literally translates as saying God's name repeatedly. I am captivated by this technique, which has just appeared in my mailbox with a recording and instructions on how to practice it. The package came from a distinguished Indian spiritual master who goes by various names, including Guruji, Dattatreya Shiva Baba, and Dr. Pillai. He is a mystical scholar who has taught Indian studies at the University of Pittsburgh, when he is not traveling the world teaching while doing this japa mediation. Two years ago, when Sri Guruji's letter and instructions arrived at my home, I began a serious practice to prepare myself to teach japa at my speaking events around the world. I contacted my publisher and arranged for the creation of a CD called Manifestation Meditations, demonstrating this ancient japa technique. People from all over the world were captivated by the royal magic inherent in this practice. By repeating the sound of God's name as an internal mantra and paying attention to what one wants to attract to life, these divine sounds act as a vehicle to bring it into physical manifestation. As Guruji reminded me in his letter and in the subsequent discussions we had in person, the beginning of everything is God, so to start something, we need the sound of God's name. In the book of John, the first lines say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I look at the manuscript I have written, which includes a chapter on meditating with the sound of creation, and I am amazed that I can use this Japa technique to create a complete book with nine specifically outlined principles in the correct order. I had no outline, no idea what the second, third, or ninth principle would be when I wrote the first. I totally relied on the power of the divine name that I used as an internal mantra while writing Manifest Your Destiny. And I have been able to manifest nine spiritual principles and write an entire chapter on each one with almost no effort. 
I read the Patanjali Sutras and applied this ancient wisdom in all areas of my life. Meditation is now a regular part of my daily life and I spend time mastering the Japa technique. I use it in a wide variety of ways and I find little miracles that appear when I use these divine sounds. I can eliminate fatigue and any symptoms of illness by doing Japa regularly, and by continually chanting the name of God, I find that I can participate directly in the act of creating and manifesting. My gratitude is enormous that Sri Guruji has placed his faith in me, knowing that he would never allow this ancient technique of manifestation using sound that is in the name of God to be misused or sullied in any way. I'm not sure why he chose me to be the Japa teacher, but it feels like it was somehow orchestrated by God himself. I treat this as a sacred assignment. My head is swimming in blissful ecstasy, and I have the feeling that I am bridging the gap between the world of the physical and the divine, from which all physical particles come. I look at my entire Manifest Your Destiny manuscript and wonder how these nine principles could have been so gracefully conveyed. I take out my pen and write my dedication, Sri Guruji, thank you for the inspiration to explore the world of manifestation. Namaste. This is indeed the call of the Spirit on my life. Not only do I feel aligned with this great teacher who has chosen me for such a resplendent assignment, but I also feel aligned with Patanjali and, yes, with the creative source of all, the one divine mind, with God. And the word was God, I say over and over several times a day. Besides being a teacher, I am now also a confirmed meditator. Something indefinable was at stake when Sri Guruji, now known as Dattatreya Shiva Baba, was motivated to write to me and send me audio tapes and instructions for me to learn Japa and become a master of this practice. Guruji's spontaneous decision inspired me to learn and ultimately teach the Japa meditations through my CD titled Meditations for Manifestation. It also prompted me to channel and write a book on the manifestation two years later, and then to write my own book on meditation entitled Getting in the Gap, some eight years after receiving Guruji's letter. This beautiful spiritual man from India was one of the most influential people who crossed my path. Before Guruji I dabbled in meditative practices, but had never considered it a discipline. Once I started the art of Japa meditation and saw the amazing results that were appearing, I decided to make meditation a part of my daily life, both in the morning and at night. As I was writing Manifest Your Destiny, I would repeat the ah sound and focus my attention on receiving guidance for each of the nine principles in this book. After long sessions of repeating this sound and visualizing myself receiving what I needed, I saw my pen move effortlessly through the pages, as if in the hand of an invisible force. In my lectures I explained the theory and the story behind this provocative meditation practice and then asked the audience to sing the sound of God, ah um, while giving their individual attention to what they would like to manifest in their lives. The results were amazing. I included many of those results in the body of my book Getting in the Gap. It is quite clear to me that this sublime being was sent to me so that I could continue to the next stage of my own personal dharma. A meditation practice was vital for me, however, I was not even close to adopting one until Guruji decided to become the recipient of this spiritual awareness. Somehow I knew that I would take this Japa practice seriously and incorporate it into my lectures and media appearances. It turns out that Guruji had prayed to two of his holiest saints, Shiva and Nandi, asking for guidance on who should be the person in the West to present this method of meditation from a year ago to a global audience. I am honored to have been chosen for such a venerable company. Two years after I started teaching Japa, I met this spiritual man face to face. They invited me to a house in Los Angeles after a lecture I gave at a large seminar and they told me that Guruji would like to meet me. I waited in a private room for a few minutes, and then this great guru came into the room, all dressed in white, and sat across from me. Neither of them said a word for close to an hour. We are both speechless, but the love between us is what she has come to describe as Grace Light on her website. Grace Light is the light of God. It is invisible to human eyes but visible to sages, prophets, messiahs, angels, and other higher beings. Grace Light has incredible intelligence and energy to know and do everything. 
it is the omnipotent power of God. Once it airs, grace light will do its job miraculously. It will transform the body, mind, and soul. I felt this light of grace that Guruji describes as we sat in silence at our first meeting. After a long period of silence, a tear came out of my eye and slid down my cheek. We hugged and thanked each other. Very few words were said, but I felt like we had communicated through what I quoted above. I left that house in Los Angeles and realized that all of this had somehow been arranged in advance by a heavenly force that I would always be grateful for. Something within this man knew that he had instructions to contact me and set me off on an inward path. Japa has been a godsend to me and to the millions of people who have adopted this practice as a result of having spoken and written about it publicly. What Lao Tzu meant by, you are not doing anything, you are just finishing. I didn't know it at the time, but I was about to make a change in the work that I was sent here to do, and the practice of Japa and my meeting with Guruji were absolutely essential for me, as this new course in my life it was about to unfold. I was expecting a much wider audience. Obviously, I needed to have a procedure in hand that would give me instant inner peace and a true knowledge that all things are possible. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Guruji, for being willing to bring me this phenomenal teaching and trusting that I will never, ever abuse it in any way. It is the spring of 1998, and I have spent most of the past year writing a book of essays based on the wisdom of 60 of the most profoundly influential teachers who have graced my life. I call this compendium Wisdom of the Ages, and I can imagine future English and philosophy teachers using it as a way to bring these thought-provoking ideas into the lives of young people. Being a teacher first and foremost, I fondly recall one particular high school class that I taught in 1961. I have always felt very strongly that poetry, philosophy, and spiritual literature do not have to be dry, they must come to life, especially for young and inquisitive minds. My students in that class learned to apply ancient wisdom to their contemporary lives by studying some of our greatest teachers. Nearly 40 years later, I continue to teach the wisdom found in great essays. As I consider writing my essays on these teachings, I ask myself, what do our ancient scholars, whom we consider to be the wisest and most spiritually advanced, have to tell us today? Included in this compendium of essays that will give readers the opportunity to receive guidance from our great academic ancestors and to recognize their own potential for greatness are Jesus, Buddha, William Blake, Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, Mahatma Gandhi, Rabindranath Tagore, Paramahansa Yogananda, and Mother Teresa. These ancestors of ours were not just pedantic types, who wrote for professional recognition, they wrote from a place of passion with the desire to lift the human spirit to a higher place beyond the petty concerns of the ego. It has been a rewarding year, like being back in college studying the great masters who lived before us, without worrying about writing a final paper or taking an exam to pass a grade on a transcript. I also envision bringing these ancient words of wisdom to a much wider audience and impacting the consciousness of our country and our world as a result. One day a letter came in my mail from Nikki Vettel, who is introducing herself as the executive producer of several PBS engagement specials. She writes, I wonder if you might be interested in creating a show for PBS based on two of your most recent books. I'd love to work with you on creating such a show, and I'd love to produce it too. I am fascinated by your letter and the follow-up telephone inquiry regarding my interest in creating a program to be broadcast nationally as a fundraiser for the public broadcasting service. Just a few days before, I received a letter from fellow author Leo Buscaglia encouraging me to bring my message of spirituality and higher consciousness to television audiences. The result of my communication with Nikki is that we organized the recording of two special programs, one based on my recent book Manifest Your Destiny, and a second program about this new book, Wisdom of the Ages. It seems to me that there is a call to achieve this, the unsolicited letters from Leo and Nikki, and my subsequent conversation with Nikki, along with my desire to impact more and more people in a spiritually enlightening way. I know that only one in ten people buy books, but practically everyone watches television at home. 
I am excited about the prospect of bringing these messages of increased awareness to a whole new audience. As we approach the production deadline, Nikki nervously asks if she could talk to me about something. Turns out you're worried we won't have enough money to collect the specials before the deadline we've been given, and you wonder if you'd be willing to do what's called a bridging loan, where you put the money in now and you will be reimbursed later. I believe in my ability to make this program a success for PBS and everyone involved, and I agree to help provide the financial guarantee myself if necessary. The project is on. We recorded my first public television engagement show at the Boca Raton Resort and Club, where an audience gathers for the recording. I shot the first show, How to Get What You Really 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 Want, Take an Hour Break, and then Record Improve Your Life Using the Wisdom of the Ages. My 16-year-old daughter, Sky, sings a beautiful a cappella version of the classic spiritual song Amazing Grace for the second show. Several weeks after completing the taping of both shows, and as they prepare to broadcast, I receive a notification that my colleague, Dr. Leo Buscaglia, passed away on June 12. He was a pioneer and guide on how to give compelling, entertaining and provocative television lectures. I promise myself that I will do everything I can to live up to the faith that Leo had in me when he encouraged me not only to support his favorite cause, public broadcasting, but to reach a much wider audience through from the television. I remember the commitment I made more than 20 years ago to my first general public book, Your Erroneous Zones. I am in the same place. I decide that I will visit every PBS station in the country that accepts me. I will become a spokesperson, not only for my own work, but also for the cause of public television. I love PBS programming, all of my kids grew up on Sesame Street, PBS's fabulous kids show. I love the fact that there is no violence on PBS daily broadcasts, and that they are commercial free, it feels like a perfect match. I am prepared to get back on the road and bring these lectures to America's attention. I see the potential for transformation here, and I am grateful for the opportunity for my messages of spirituality to be carried into the living rooms of people in every state of the Union. That Nikki Vettel consultation in early 1998 was a major turning point in my personal and professional life. It launched me into a whole new way of reaching large numbers of people. During my first meeting with Nikki, I was reminded of my fascination with Bishop Fulton Sheen as a child. As all my friends who owned television sets were watching the Milton Burley show comedy, I sat paralyzed listening intently to Bishop Sheen speak directly to me about the power of my own mind to create the kind of life I want for myself. I loved their Tuesday night show, it was a well-constructed, entertaining and informative lecture that attracted the attention of viewers in their homes when television was in its infancy. He was confident that he could do the same and make it work for everyone concerned, and that he would also have heavenly help. I remembered Milton Burley's comment when he found out that the popular Bishop had won an Emmy Award, while Burley had been overlooked by his popular comedy show. Burley joked, it has better writers, Matteo, Marcos, Lucas, and Juan. Perhaps I could also include these same writers in my presentations. I embarked on this new adventure with the same fervor and commitment that inspired me to embark on the route 22 years earlier, when Your Erroneous Zones was published. With the completion of the first two shows, I started making personal fundraising appearances on local PBS stations on a regular basis. It was pretty clear to Nikki and me that when I was able to go to a local studio and speak to the public during engagement breaks, the dollars raised to support public broadcasting increased dramatically. I had visions of doing precisely what I did in the early years with the publication of every book I wrote. I would take full responsibility for all aspects of the success of these programs. The number one priority for PBS executives was fundraising. If the show made money through viewers who called and contributed, the show would air over and over again. My number one goal was to educate people around the world. A larger audience meant more inspired people to support PBS financially. Both PBS and I were able to achieve our highest callings and goals. Within a few weeks of launching the first two programs, I recovered the costs associated with creating the program. 
Within a year we were in contract talks with PBS to do two more shows, which were scheduled to shoot in Concord, Massachusetts, the home of two of my most sacred and beloved spiritual mentors, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Nikki Vettel, my friend Reed Tracy, who is the CEO of my new publisher, Hay House, and now it was a team. During each engagement period, I was on the road going from station to station, often on my own, just like in the days a quarter of a century earlier when traveling across the country because it was the only way to get there. Everyone at that time. There is a flame of intense desire when it comes to fulfilling the desires that burn within me. No one else can do it for me, and I can't find acceptable excuses for participating in a project that fails. Many of the executives in New York and Washington told me that the type of programming associated with my presentations did not predict financial success. I had been told and shown the statistics on the large number of programs that failed miserably. They would be produced and then aired, and with a few notable exceptions, such as Leo Buscaglia, affectionately known as Dr. Love, they were shelved after one or two broadcasts. I used to watch Leo on TV on promise breaks and wanted to jump across the screen at my house and hug this man. His enthusiasm, which in the original Greek translates as the God within, was his secret. I knew that I could also communicate my ideas with passion and enthusiasm. He knew people would watch and support his local PBS station if he could bring this material to life within them, to tap into the viewer's God within, so to speak. I devised a plan to end the financial hardships of contributing and arranged with Reed at Hay House to provide a wonderful array of thank you gifts for a dollar one a day contributor for public broadcasting in the United States. Now that I look back at my transition from writer slash speaker to public broadcast television personality, I can see more clearly than ever that it is that burning inner desire that was carrying me through this transformation. I had nothing at all on my list of things that they weren't willing to do to turn my future dream into a present fact. For the next 10 years, I made personal fundraising appearances on virtually every PBS station in the country. A visit meant spending four hours on television while the shows aired and then introducing PBS's mission and offering a profusion of thank you gifts, comprised of books and audio and video recordings associated with the show. I was tireless in my energy and was reaching millions of people who would not have otherwise been exposed to these higher consciousness ideas. And with each new book, Reed, Nikki, and I would get together to design a new show, with a new set of thank you gifts, and I'd go out to make more appearances on local stations, many of which I had visited 10 or 12 times previously. As I look back on the 10 PBS specials that bear my name and my evolving message, I am proud to say that I have been privileged to be often referred to as Mr. PBS. The amount of money raised for public broadcasting in America is not measured in thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of dollars, but in hundreds of millions of dollars. I feel like I was called to this job, and I was preparing for do it when I was that kid sitting in front of our little black and white television staring at Bishop Fulton J. The brilliance of life is worth living. My fascination back then created something inside of me that enthusiastically murmured, I could do this. I know I could. Those inner impulses are the work of angelic forces that have always been there, inviting me to seek broader and more far-reaching perspectives. Leo Buscaglia was one of the angels, as was Nicky Vettel. His decision to write to me and encourage me to put together a test show, and his tireless energy in producing these 10 PBS specials, was also directed by invisible heavenly energy. When I read Nikki's first letter about the possibility of appearing on my own PBS show, I thought, I knew this was coming, I knew this was my destiny. Both my wife and my agent heard me say at the time that this was something I was aware of from my youth, when television as an entertainment medium was in its infancy. Now I can see so clearly that my inner assertion at 19 that I am a teacher meant much more than a classroom in a school. He had a message of self-empowerment and spiritual descent to take to the world. Bishop Fulton Sheen, Leo Buscaglia, Nikki Vettel, and Reed Tracy were all angelic instigators who joined me in making this vision that I had from the first time I watched television come true. 
clearer now than they might have been then are the two mental lists that I carried with me. In a list is everything I am willing to do to turn my future dream into a present fact. In the second list is everything that I am not willing to do, that list is always blank. When the first two shows were brought to me, Nikki asked me if I would be willing to fly to Fresno, California, which involved three round-trip flights, and basically pay my own expenses to be in the studio for the first show. Due to my two mental lists, I wholeheartedly agreed. That visit became the first of more than 2,000 visits to stations that carried the message that is so close to my heart to the homes of America. We all have a destiny, a dharma to fulfill, and there are endless opportunities, people, and circumstances that surface throughout our lives to illuminate our path. Incidents and people create little sparks that make us recognize, this is for me, this is important, that's why I'm here. Those sparks are signals to pay attention and to be in awe and to know that those little sparks are being ignited by the same divine source that is responsible for all of creation. I have always been eager to say yes to life with the belief that when I trust myself, I am trusting the very wisdom that created me. That inner spark is God speaking to me, and I just refuse to ignore it. I know that if I feel it and it ignites something in me, then the ignition process is the invisible, the source, the very essence of all creation, and I trust it to the fullest. This is what launched my career in public broadcasting, not a fluke or inexplicable coincidence. I said yes to those thoughts that burned inside of me and refused to let them fade until they were fulfilled. In October, I agreed to take a small group of people to the city of Assisi in Italy. This is the birthplace of Saint Francis, a man who has become a vital force in my life over the past few years. I have been working on a new book, There is a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem, based on the famous St. Francis Prayer, and I have returned to Assisi to put the finishing touches on the manuscript. I'm drawn to this place and I want to write a little bit here because I feel like San Francisco is directing not only my writing, but all aspects of my life. The words and ideas for this new book have been so accessible, and I have felt a kind of extremely peaceful divine energy since I decided that this was going to be my next writing project. At dawn I go for long walks alone in the countryside, away from all the tourists who also seek to be close to this man of God who lived here about 800 years ago and left so many lasting impressions. I have read about the miracles that were attributed to the man born Francesco di Pietro di Bernardone, and I wish to be in nature and meditate on the energy of this well-preserved divine city. I feel this energy with me, as it seems to have been for the past year as I wrote every day. When I was considering accepting the offer to be a guide and lecturer accompanying a small group of people on a tour of Assisi, I made the decision when I heard myself say to my wife, let's go back to Assisi and do a meditation together in the chapel of the Porcincola that we visited six years ago. Marcy and I visited the city for the first time in 1990 with three of our children, and since then we had both discussed our desire to return and do a meditation together in the little chapel called Porzi Ancola, a sacred place. Welcome space for those seeking tranquility, body, and spirit. It is now located inside the Basilica of Santa Maria de Los Angeles, surrounded by modern architecture, with beautiful frescoes on all the walls and domes. The chapel commemorates the amazing life of this little man who touched the lives of so many people, it was here that Francesco clearly understood his vocation and with divine inspiration founded the Franciscan order. This is where he lived and died. In the hallway of our home that leads to our children's bedrooms hangs a beautifully framed image of the Saint Francis prayer that a woman gave me at one of my public lectures. She designed and created this portrait, and as she handed it to me, she told me that the message of this prayer would be very important to me. At least once a day for the last decade I have read it. Long ago I was completely memorized. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is pain, sorry. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light and where there is sadness, happiness. O Divine Master, grant me that I do not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood, how to understand, 
to be loved as to love. For it is by giving that we receive. It is by forgiving that we are forgiven. And it is by dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Every time I recite or read it, I say to myself, this is not a prayer, it is a technology. It is about being an alchemist and turning hatred into love, doubt into faith, despair into hope, and sadness into joy. In the last few months it has really come alive for me, because each of the last seven chapters of the book that I am completing is titled by the first seven lines of this sentence. I feel like St. Francis has been by my side encouraging me to write in modern language what I was teaching in the th and th centuries. Marcy and I entered the Porzi Ancola and sat across the hall, able to hold hands as we meditated. Something very strange is happening. We both feel it. A cloud of tingle surrounds us. I can barely breathe, the feeling is so overwhelming. I get goosebumps as if energy runs through my entire body. As we left this holy place, we both looked at each other without even being able to speak. We are both moved on a soul level. The next day we visited San Damiano to see the house where St. Clara lived and preached as a devout Franciscan, living her vow of chastity and poverty. I am climbing the spiral staircase to the third level when a young man named John Gray Bill II, who has leg braces due to muscular dystrophy, informs me that he is unable to continue climbing. The ladder is too narrow and you cannot extend your leg far enough to either side to take the next step up. He is a member of our tour group and he asks me what to do since he cannot walk and cannot retreat. I tell him to put his arms around my neck, I will carry him on my back. I just forget that I have been told that my quarter century of running and playing every day has deteriorated me so much that I will soon be a candidate for a knee replacement. I don't think about my knee, bone on bone, or that I forgot to put on the little brace that I use for support. I take three or four steps up with John on my back, cradling his arms around my shoulders, and suddenly I feel my knee getting weaker and weaker. I am about to collapse with the weight of John and his braces on my body. I panic. There is a single long line of people behind me. I start to go down with John on top of me, and suddenly I see an apparition of Francesco. He looks at me directly and says nothing. He holds out both hands and moves them upward, motioning for me to get up. I straighten up and I'm suddenly exploding with a lot of energy. I start walking with John on my back, then trot up the circular stone staircase. I start running incessantly. My knee feels like it's never been stronger. I make it to the top, where my wife and most of the rest of the tour group wait to visit St. Claire, the founder of the Poor Claire Sisters. With a surprised expression on her face, Marcy asks, what happened? I tell him that I just experienced a genuine miracle. I saw San Francisco and he motioned for me to go up. She says, but everyone else is out of breath, and you're running with John on your back and you forgot to put your knee brace on this morning. I tell him I can't explain it. I am fully energized, my leg feels healed. I ask everyone around me to forgive me. I walk to the edge of the balcony on the third level of this old building, I clasp my hands and look out to see if I can again contemplate the appearance of St. Francis. Just a few weeks ago I was pulled off a tennis court because my right knee had broken and I was told that I would probably need a knee replacement. Now he feels stronger than ever. As I say a silent prayer of gratitude, a woman named Patricia Egan takes a photo of me leaning over the balcony thanking St. Francis. I take my wife's hand and effortlessly walk down the spiral staircase after saying a prayer in the humble abode of St. Claire here in San Damiano. We take a long walk in the country and for the first time in years I walk without any pain in my knee. Joy has overwhelmed me and I am very honored for this second visit to Assisi. I have been reading and contemplating the St. Francis prayer for almost a decade. Now it has come into my life and has shown itself to me for a few seconds. Later, sitting in my hotel room, I put the finishing touches on there's a spiritual solution to every problem. I know that the spirit of this man from Assisi, who lived almost years ago right here in this beautiful town in Italy, 
is guiding and directing my life in a way that defies description. I feel so deeply loved, so blessed to have participated in this miraculous experience. Since I made the switch to focus on teaching spirituality and higher consciousness, Francesco di Pietro di Bernardun, also known as Saint Francis of Assisi, has been a major force in my life. This holy man has had a unique place in my heart for some time. I think it started when I hung the gift of the beautiful framed print of the Saint Francis prayer on the wall of our home. As the days and years passed after hanging it there, I must have recited the prayer thousands of times. I think Francesco played a kind of divine role by placing that framed prayer in my hands in the early 1980s. I have seen all the movies that have been made about San Francisco and I have a small library of books written about it. In a past life regression a few years ago, I found myself living as, or with, St. Francis. When I came out of that hypnotic state, I had such a clear vision of how to handle an ongoing crisis in my life that everything was resolved within minutes of my return to the present moment. I find all of this very fascinating as I remember Francesco's influence on my life. I was not raised in a Catholic tradition, but somehow I am incredibly drawn to this man's life story and his deep devotion to his belief, along with his spiritual connection to Jesus, which brought stigmata to him in recent years of their life. Something was putting great pressure on me to go to Assisi and experience it firsthand. It was an inner knowing that this man and the story of his life were somehow mystically linked to mine. I have always been touched by San Francisco's ability to communicate peacefully and lovingly with animals, especially the birds that fearlessly flocked near him. I loved his compassion for everyone, including those he personally feared, such as the lepers with whom he became friends. That Francesco lived up to what Patanjali offered in his Yoga Sutras a thousand years or more before the saint's birth. When you are firm, said Patanjali, which means that you never, ever slip, in your abstention from thoughts of harm directed at others, all living creatures will cease to feel enmity in your presence. Francesco was of such purity that even wild animals were tamed for his steadfastness. He was pure Christ consciousness, and everything I read about him made me want to be like him in every way I could summon. Looking back at the moment my knee healed at the castle of San Damiano, I can see much more clearly how and why this happened. For a long period of time I let my ego explain it, telling myself that this happened to me because I was a well-known spiritual master who loved Francesco and this healing was a gift to me. Now I know better. The ascended masters come to us with guidance and help, not by our prayers for their intervention or our prominence, they come to us when they can recognize themselves in us. That moment happened when I put my ego aside, spontaneously offering help to a frail and needy man, without thinking of any problems this might present to me. I acted like an ascended master like St. Francis would. He recognized himself, a being of unconditional love, in me at that moment, and manifested himself. In their presence they forgave my knee injury. As his prayer says, where there is wrong, forgive. I learned a great lesson from that day in San Damiano, miracles happen when we think and act as God does. Now I see clearly that this means serving without hesitation, ignoring the ego's demands, and asking for nothing in return. The following year, the newly released There is a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem was made available to the public with the photo of Patricia Egan, after that miraculous moment, on the cover. With tears in my eyes for all the wisdom it contained to live a spiritually enlightened life, I held up the book that I had partially written in Assisi, based on the enlightening teachings of the man who grew up there and became a living saint before his death in. I decided to do a massive book promotion tour to share Francesco's teachings and help raise awareness of our troubled world. I flew to San Diego to begin the eight-week tour that was scheduled to begin in September. The PBS program based on the teachings of the St. Francis, who had recorded in Concord, Massachusetts, would air simultaneously with my national tour. After a full day of scheduled interviews in the San Diego media, I woke up to a phone call from my daughter Tracy, who told me to turn on the television. 
Our country was under attack and the World Trade Center buildings in New York were on fire and in danger of collapse. It was 6, 15 in the morning. A copy of USA Today from September 11, 2001 was on the carpet inside my hotel room door. In the midst of the chaos shown on television, I opened the newspaper and there was an ad for my newly published book that covered 80% of the page. In bold, the title announced there is a spiritual solution to every problem. I thought of the irony of a nearly full-page ad in a national newspaper appearing on this day when we seemed to be rooted in a very big problem that affected everyone, not just in our country, but our entire planet. I look back knowing that the ad that appeared that day, proclaiming that there is a spiritual solution to every problem, was no accident. There are no accidents or coincidences, we have to work together to find a spiritual solution to the hatred that encourages such petty and evil actions. The inhumanity of man towards man will only be resolved when we take up the mantle of life and the teaching of S. Francis of Assisi. That those inexplicable feelings of connection with this man were and are the expressions of a divine source that seeks to be known in our world now. I breathe in and breathe out gratitude for my healed knee every day when I do yoga, swim in the ocean, or go for long walks. I smile when Francesco's face crosses my inner screen, and I imagine him there spreading his arms and beckoning me to get up. And that what happened to me individually is being offered through me to the world. It is the spring of 2003. I am 62 years old and I am going through my first episode of prolonged deep sadness. I sleep for long periods of time, I can't seem to motivate myself to do much of anything, and I have lost at least pounds. I don't feel like eating and I have to force myself to get out and continue my daily running practice. People close to me often ask me if I have some kind of illness that I don't want to talk about. I know I am in a state of depression. Two years ago I suffered a mild heart attack. An angiogram revealed that I had a 99% blockage in an artery leading to the heart and that it may have been a part of my physical anatomy since I was born. My heart is strong and the damage is minimal. A stent was inserted into the blocked artery and I got back to my normal exercise and work routine fairly quickly. Today I have a healthy heart according to all the medical tests, however, in fact, otherwise, it is badly broken. My wife and I separated almost two years ago. She is involved in a relationship with a man she loves very much, and I am essentially in a state of shock. I never imagined that at the age of 62 I would be experiencing the emotional effects of a separation. I have walked this path before and I thought that everything was in the past at this stage of my life. Mark Elline and I have seven beautiful children, and we both love them very much. There is no fault to assign here. I take full responsibility for my role in breaking up this marriage. It's just that I can't seem to get out of this funk. Medical friends urge me to take antidepressants. When my GP prescribes one of these medications for me, I tear it apart after reading the possible side effects of this type of pill therapy. Several of my children are concerned about my health and try to help me in their conversations. They have often fondly suggested, you seem so depressed, maybe you should try writing to give yourself some peace of mind. I am deeply grateful for your concern and, at the same time, Marcy and I are doing everything we can to keep the children out of the separation anxiety that we both feel. About a year ago I came across some words while reading Carlos Castaneda's book The Power of Silence that struck a chord within me. I had the statement copied and laminated on a card so I could take it with me. The moment I read these words I knew the direction my writing would take, however, this separation and semi-rupture from our family has prevented me from even thinking about taking on a project as gigantic as planning and writing an entire book. Today I take the laminated card out of my shirt pocket and read Castaneda's words softly to myself, in the universe there is an immeasurable and indescribable force that sorcerers call intention, and absolutely everything that exists in the entire cosmos is linked to the intention through a connection. Link I am captivated by this idea that intention is not something we do, but an energy that we are connected to. I put the card in my front pocket, feeling the impact of these words. 
we are all connected to an invisible and indescribable field called intention, all I have to do to heal myself is cleanse myself of the numbness I feel, and my connection to this great source called intention will be whole again. I begin to see that I have been wallowing in my ego, and I am filled with deep sadness that I have withdrawn to an ordinary level of consciousness. I temporarily lost my connection with God, with the field that Castaneda calls intention. I have an epiphany on the spot. I am going to follow the advice of my children and start doing what I love the most, that is, writing. I will clear my own connection link with intention and write a book that will help millions of people do the same. I had thought of intention as something I do, an attitude of determination and indomitable will. But suddenly I recognize that that is the definition of the ego, the need to take credit for making big changes in one's life. Now I think of intention as a field, to which I am always connected, albeit with a seriously corroded link. I call Reed Tracy from Hay House and tell him that I am going to write a book on the power of intention, based on the ideas that are on a laminated card that I carry with me constantly. I spend most of the next year writing every day, in the process, I come out of the sadness that has engulfed me for the past two years. I find that my dejected state of my new separated marital status is changing the look of my writing. I have more compassion for myself as a result of actively doing what makes me feel determined, which is writing. This compassion is reflected in what I write, and my writing flows in a way that is completely new to me. I have a small frame on my desk that I look at every day when I start writing. Says. Hello. This is God. Would handle me. All of your. Today's problems. I will not need. Your help, you also have. A miraculous day. I feel like the presence of God, the field of intention, so to speak, is writing here. I realize that the pain of my separation from my wife is making me a more tender and empathetic writer. I find that my public lectures are a bit softer, more laced with kindness and love instead of being witty and maybe even a little harsh. My broken heart is healing, my relationship with Marcy and her new love has improved significantly. Fast forward to the following spring. Three years have passed since the impact of the separation and my most recent book, The Power of Intention, is about to be published. I have contacted Nikki Vettel and she will be the executive producer of my new PBS special that will be filmed at Emerson College in Boston. When I hold The Power of Intention in my hand, I have a paradoxical awareness that it was my own deep pain that allowed me to write from a new place of compassion and empathy. I consider that I really needed to go to the lowest point of my life to advance to the next stage of my own divine mission. There are no accidents here, I realize. I needed this jolt to understand and write this highly spiritual book on how to learn to co-create your own life. Intent is not something I have done, not even in writing this book. It is a joint effort with the creative source of everything, which the great sorcerers call intention. I know that intention is not something I do because of a rigid determination to achieve it, this is what happens when I clean the corrosive elements of the connection linked to the field of intention. That's when the intention begins to take effect. As I hold this book in my hands, I know that God writes all the books, builds all the bridges, and delivers all the speeches. I can become a corrosion-free link to the source of all, the field to which all things are destined. The moment my wife and I parted company, after more than 20 years of union and in the process of raising seven children together, I thought my world had come to an end. Despite all my training and life experience, and my many books on self-empowerment, the emotional impact of our separation left me feeling anything but empowered. And yet, when I look at the significance of this event from a distance, I can clearly see that this dramatic episode led me upward to become a more compassionate and spiritually aware person. Virtually every spiritual advance we make in our life is preceded by some kind of downfall. That fall of living in the midst of melancholy forced me to find a way to climb and get higher. I look back on our separation, which still continues today, even though we have never filed for a final divorce, as a gift. A gift for which I express my gratitude every day. Marcy and I are closer now than ever. 
All of our children feel the love that we both have for each and every one of them. We spend time together as a family frequently, and there is nothing but respect and love for each other. The book I wrote while feeling so downhearted about our separation was by far the best received book I had written since Your Erroneous Zones was published 28 years earlier. I have received more emails and more people have told me how much the power of intention influenced and changed their lives for the better than in any of the 41 books I have written since 1971. People tell me, there is something about the way you described the intention that really spoke to me. It really changed my life. I wrote this book from a place of almost radical humility, and compassion seeped from virtually every page. My own downfall forced me to come up and write from a place much more God-fulfilled, a place where I could have genuine empathy for all who wanted their connection to the divine source of all to be cleansed of all corrosion that them keeps alive. At Ordinary Levels of Consciousness The PBS program I recorded as a special engagement for the power of intention was the most successful fundraising program for PBS I have ever done. The ideas from this conference, which were taken from my book, seemed to resonate with audiences across the country. The show aired thousands of times, often during prime time. It is clear that the desolation and depression I was going through while writing impacted millions of people in a positive way. If I hadn't had the opportunity to break through this gloom and write my way out of it, this book could never have emerged. I have come to understand that I should always strive to be in a state of gratitude, not only for the subtleties that appear, but also for the things that seem so devastating. A difficult lesson, but one that I apply regularly now, since I saw the enormous spiritual advances I was able to redo what I thought at the time was the end of my happiness. The day I decided that I was going to write a book based on a small quote from Carlos Castaneda's teachings, which I had been carrying in my pocket for over a year, I received a letter from my spiritual master and guru, Sri Guruji. The man who was responsible for teaching me Japa meditation a decade earlier learned of my separation and subsequent discouragement, and sent me a letter with a phrase, which is taped to the wall of my sacred space to write to this day. It says, Dear Wayne, the sun is shining behind the clouds. This was the spark that made me stop participating in my pity party and move on with my own dharma. Clouds represent each and every supposed problem that is ubiquitous in all of our lives. The sun behind the clouds is God, the field of intention, the divine mind. All I needed to do was clear those clouds, and they're glowing brightly, I could now clearly see my source of being. And the words of my friend, the late Elizabeth Kubler Ross, ring true to me as I write today. If I protected the canyons from wind storms, I would never see the beauty of the carvings. The saddest and most difficult time of my life finally allowed me to write a powerful book and produce a spectacularly shocking PBS special, which touched the lives of millions of people. That storm in my life was responsible for many spiritual breakthroughs that were forged, and it directed my life in a new direction on many fronts that extend far beyond my public persona. When I look back, I am in a deep state of gratitude for all the storms in my life, especially for that Category 5 hurricane that appeared to keep me on the path of teaching and living divine love and higher consciousness. I just finished lecturing in New York City to several thousand people at an Omega Institute seminar on April 3, 2005. I'm standing outside the hotel ballroom surrounded by people looking for autographs and photo opportunities. I look up and my eyes catch an incredibly amazing African woman in the back of the circle of people around me. I'm immediately captivated by the fact that it seems to radiate such spiritual energy, it's almost angelic. As the crowd begins to thin, I walk up to this woman and ask her, where are you from? In very broken English, she replies, I'm from Rwanda. The night before in my hotel room I had seen the movie Hotel Rwanda. I ask her if she is familiar with what happened in that African nation in 1990. Her friend who is helping her with the language responds, Yes, Dr. Dyer. She was there. She was locked in a bathroom for 90 days with seven other women, and the story of how she survived the Holocaust is one of the most inspiring stories of courage and faith that anyone has ever heard. Always. 
I asked the Rwandan woman to write her name and exchange email addresses with my daughter Sky, who is next to me. I want to know more about this fascinating person whose radiant almost heavenly energy captured me from the first moment I saw her. A week goes by and I ask Sky to email her asking her to call me in Maui, where I am putting the finishing touches on a new book called Inspiration. I still don't know the name of this flashy woman, but something inside me has taken over and replaced all logic. I have an instant knowledge that we are going to work together on the same mission. I feel a great need to call Reed Tracy and say, I just met an extraordinary woman who has an amazing story to tell. I want you to publish her unwritten book and I will include it in my next PBS special to present it to the world. Reed tells me that he would be happy to publish his story and that he will find someone to work with, as English is his third idiom. I finally got an email from Sky telling me that she has located the lady from Rwanda. I pick up the phone and Immaculi Ilabajiza and I talk for the next few hours. And he tells me the most amazing survival story I've ever heard. It is estimated that more than a million men, women, and children were slaughtered with machetes in this small country that is roughly the size of the state of Maryland. The Hutu and Tutsi tribes had lived together in the once peaceful country, but a conflict broke out when the Rwandan president was assassinated and the Hutus declared a final solution for the Tutsis. Immaculate hid in a cramped bathroom with seven other women for 90 consecutive days. During that dark nightmare of incessant murder, his weight dropped to 65 pounds, and his parents and two of his brothers were mercilessly murdered. However, he managed to stay alive. In the first moment we met, I knew in an absolute flash of perception that I was in the presence of a unique and divine woman. Our long conversations have given me a whole new perspective on the power of faith, and I know that Immaculate has a message for all of humanity. His story has to be told, and something deep within me drives me to make this happen. I ask you to put the title of the book untold, and I say that I would consider it an honor to write the foreword to your book when it is complete. I promise to do everything I can to bring the story of this heroic woman to the world. I reach out to Nikki Vettel and let her know that I want to introduce Immaculate to the American public on my PBS Inspiration Show, which will be taped in November in San Francisco. I ask Immaculate to keep her agenda clear for the next two to three years because I want her to speak at each of my public lectures. The more details I hear of Immaculate's ordeal in the Holocaust of 1994 Rwanda, the more I begin to believe that I am speaking to a person who has reached an extraordinary level of higher and enlightened consciousness. When she is chatting at a dinner table, everyone present is drawn to her almost magnetically. There is more than charisma here. Immaculate not only talks about unconditional love, but radiates it to everyone, including the Hutus who were responsible for the horrific murders of her entire family in Rwanda. She lives at a heightened level of spiritual awareness, and I am blessed to be able to do whatever I can to bring this extraordinary woman and her story to the world. It is now October 1st and I will be filming a new PBS show in 40 days. Immaculate works on her book every day and is very nervous about speaking on television for the first time due to her linguistic considerations. I have immersed myself in the incredible challenges he went through in his determination to survive, when only a handful of Tutsis survived the hundred-day bloodbath that left so many corpses scattered across the countryside of that once bucolic country in Central Africa. Immaculate is a devout Catholic. Although she was inches from being hacked to death, she used her faith in Jesus to stay alive, in fact, he says that he truly discovered God in the midst of a demonstration of man's abominable inhumanity toward man. I'm inspired to challenge myself in a lesser way, just to get a little appreciation for the struggle Immaculate experienced. Jesus, whom both Immaculate and I love unconditionally, spent days in the desert at the beginning of his public ministry. This was a time of testing and preparation for him. Today I will take my first Bikram Yoga class, 90 minutes of intense yoga practice in a room that is 100 degree desert heat. It pales in importance to what Jesus and Immaculate experienced, but I am 65 years old and I choose to test and prepare as well. I promise to do 40 consecutive days of this practice. The word yoga means union. That is, 
union with God, our creative source of being. The word inspiration means in spirit. A way to experience union with our spiritual source and stay in spirit. It all seems to make perfect sense to me. When I take Immaculate to Bikram Yoga class, she jokingly tells me that it was harder than living in the little bathroom with seven other women. However, on November 10th I complete my 40 consecutive hot yoga classes, and I am a committed yogi. I will practice this ancient spiritual custom for the rest of my life. My 40 consecutive days leave me feeling like I can accomplish anything. On my three-hour television show for PBS, I take Immaculate on stage. Although his language is a bit of a barrier, he completely mesmerizes the audience and receives a standing ovation. Everyone who sees her has the same reaction I had the first time my eyes met hers just seven months ago. I am so proud that she shares the stage and the spotlight with me. I can write about inspiration all day, but this woman with her unconditionally loving and forgiving face is a living example of what it means to live in the spirit. Fast forward to Monday March 6, 2006. PBS's new engagement special, Inspiration, Your Ultimate Calling, has been shown in prime time in virtually every city in the United States that has a public television station. The show is scheduled to air several thousand times this month alone. Immaculate is a great success throughout the country, her story of faith and survival leaves no one indifferent. Now I'm on the phone with her as she looks at her computer screen to see that the two best-selling books in the country are Inspiration and Left to Tell. The following week, Immaculate Ilabajiza is one of the New York Times best-selling authors. I am beyond euphoric. I am honored to have had this divine being in my life and to have been taught the unfathomable power of divine faith and love in person. Immaculate traveled with me to all conference engagements for over two and a half years, and wherever we went, the public fell in love with her. Looking back at the impact it has had on me, I immediately see images of both Mother Teresa and Viktor Frankl. It has the same impact on the audience that Mother Teresa had, somehow the room becomes softer when Immaculate speaks. It has the same quality of being able to make everyone feel more at peace, almost as if it radiates outwards a kind of angelic mist that envelopes everyone who comes into contact with it. Viktor Frankl was also a Holocaust survivor, and his determination to survive the Nazi death camps was fueled by his obsessive desire to tell the story to the world. It was in honor of Dr. Frankl that I asked Immaculate to title her book Left to Tell. The mere fact that a Tutsi woman was able to survive that day with machetes against each and every member of her tribe was a miracle in itself. He really felt that it was his duty to tell all the details of his ordeal. Immaculate's presence in my life at that time was another one of those events orchestrated by a divine power. There was an indefinable spiritual connection that existed between us from the moment our gazes met. Divine intervention was working so that Immaculate was in that hotel that day and was curious enough to stay and see a book signing by an author she had never heard of. Never before and since then had he been so possessed to act on an inner feeling. I had to locate her. I had to help her publish. I had to put it on my TV show. I had to make him travel with me so that the world could see a true miracle, a saint in my eyes. What is it that Immaculate was directed into my life for me to see, up close and in person, a living and breathing example of what we can all accomplish when we step into and surrender to a divine source? She became one with God during her confinement in that bathroom. She knew that God was with her, as she actually saw a cross of light that prevented her and her companions from certain death, and angels of love and compassion seemed to appear out of nowhere the more she intensified her communion with him. In the bathroom, Immaculate became aware of the murders that were taking place in her country against her fellow Tutsis because she could hear radio transmissions outside her bathroom window. Yet in the midst of this gruesome outrage, he was able to forgive his tormentors and even send love to them. Immaculate brought a whole new sense of the possibilities for miracles to occur when a person is 100% aligned with their source of being. My almost obsessive desire to find her, help her spread her story, write the foreword to her book, have her on the PBS special, and carry her with me for more than two years of talks, had to come from a divine source. 
she is also fully responsible for motivating me to undertake the yoga practice, which I desperately needed and still do regularly as a component of my own spiritual practice. Left to Tell is one of the best-selling books Hay House has published, and Immaculate's message of hope, unconditional love, forgiveness, and pure faith continues to impact millions of people around the world. Hanging on my wall is this short note. Dear Wayne. You are the most beautiful being in the world. I love you with all my heart. I can only pray that God returns a thousand times the blessings and joy you give him. If you only knew how blessed I feel to meet you. I had to write this in case I don't get serious enough to express these feelings. I treasure this note, and all I can say is that I could have written it myself and directed it to the beautiful soul who stayed behind to tell. Right now Acha, Immaculate. It is May 11, 2005, the day after my 65th birthday. This is the traditional age when I am supposed to retire and spend my days sitting in idyllic surroundings listening to the birds and gazing at my belly button. Now my work is supposed to be complete. However, I can't even ponder the concept of retirement. Withdraw to what? Withdraw from what? I feel a strong inner urge to make a significant change in my life that I have never felt before. When I look around at the mountain of things that I have accumulated, I strangely feel that all these things really belong to me. It's a feeling of emptiness and I feel trapped by it. If I choose to move, how am I going to get all these things from here to where I want to go? I sit in the blue leather chair where I have spent countless hours meditating over the years and ask for guidance. I have a calling to do something great, something that will challenge me more than it has ever challenged me before. I continually think of Immaculate, who attributes her survival to her faith her conscious contact with God and how she endured physical and emotional hardships beyond anyone could imagine. I know that I am not being called to suffer, as was the fate of Immaculate, but I feel an overwhelming feeling that now is the time to make a big change in my life. I have stayed in and out of Florida for the past four years and am still separated from my wife. I'm not happy or healthy being this close, and I know it's time for me to start writing again. Sitting in my blue chair meditating, I notice a familiar figure repeatedly moving across my inner screen that triggers thoughts of having reread the Tao Te Ching, short verses that offer a spiritual awakening to those who study and live according to its teachings. The 200-year spiritual text was given to me by my friend Stuart Wilde more than a decade ago. But I realize that the Tao has been coming up a lot for me lately. I just finished reading A Million Little Pieces by James Frey, and the Tao Te Ching is everywhere. While in Las Vegas to give a talk, I met friends at the Tao restaurant, where all the decor, and even the menu, is a Taoist theme. I also remember Stuart telling me how much wisdom is in that little book and how he encouraged me to study it in depth, frequently telling me that this was the wisest book ever written. Now I see an Asian looking old man informing me that I am being called to begin living according to the teachings of the Tao Te Ching, and that this will return some of my lost health and happiness. I come out of my deep meditation and I am certain of what I must do. I remember how my wild and crazy mentor and friend Stuart once told me that he had given up everything he had just by closing the door and walking away from it. For years I thought about the paradox inherent in such a scene. Leaving everything seems so definitive and, furthermore, there is a great attachment to a lifetime of accumulated things. On the other hand, there is so much freedom in having nothing to stop you, moving forward unimpeded, being as free as those birds that I'm supposed to hear now that I'm of retirement age. I feel like they are directing me to make this move to get rid of everything. I pick up the phone and call my personal assistant, Maya, who has worked for and with me for over a quarter of a century. I tell him to drive to my garden apartment, which has served as my office and writing space for almost three decades. As he walks down the sidewalk, I hand him the key and say, I want you to get rid of everything I have, and then I want you to put this place up for sale. Maya is in shock. She tells me there must be 20,000 books there. What should I do with all the furniture? My clothes? My shoes? My memories framed on the walls? The pictures? 
the mountain of old tax records and personal documents. I say to him, here is the key, I am done here. I will tell my children that they have the first choice in everything there. The rest you have to undo. Give everything away. She tries to make me see reason, but I'm adamant. I let go of all my attachments and head to my writing space on Maui. They call me to do something about the Tao Te Ching. I'm not sure what, but I know they are telling me to let go and leave God. I get away from everything. Maya is in charge of all my things, and I feel an incredible sense of relief and wonder. I remember how I felt when Stuart told me that he had left everything behind, there was an emotion in the pit of my stomach and here I am doing the exact same thing. At different times during the transition I think of things that I could really wish for. I don't even have a copy of my doctoral thesis. Oh well, I've never seen him in 35 years. What about my favorite pants and shoes and all the cool shirts? Maya has gifted them to a group of people living under an overpass in a homeless enclave. I remember what I have taught in many of my books and lectures, we come from nowhere to now, here with nothing. We go now, here, nowhere, with nothing. There is nowhere now here, it's all the same. It's just a matter of spacing. On Maui I read and study the Tao Te Ching every day. It is a book full of paradoxes. Do less. Get more. Think small and achieve great things. The Tao does nothing and leaves nothing undone. We are all doing nothing, rather, we are ending. God is everywhere. God is here now. I know that in some mysterious way Lao Tzu, the author of the Tao, has called me to bring the messages of the Tao Te Ching to a 21st century audience. I speak with Reed at Hay House and inform him that I am going to write individual essays on how to apply the wisdom of each of the verses of the Tao Te Ching. But before I can write these essays, I must dedicate myself to each of the lines. I explain my plan to read and he gives me the go-ahead. I will read the first verse of the Tao Te Ching, the first day. Then I will meditate on it, turn it over in my mind for four days, and consult with Lao Tzu. I have several portraits of him in my writing space, in one he is dressed in a simple robe, in another he is standing with a cane, and in a third he is astride an ox. But the most revealing image I have of him is the one I see when I close my eyes in meditation. After contemplating and reflecting on the meaning of verse 1, I will wake up on the fifth day and write an essay on how to apply the wisdom of that verse. I intend to do this four and a half day ritual for each of the verses, dedicating the entire year 2006 to this project. This is what I feel called to do. All the omens that have come to me about Lao Tzu and the Tao are directing me to this exciting task. Not only will I write about the Tao Te Ching, I will also become a Taoist and ask Lao Tzu in my meditations what I should say in each of the verses. I'll call the book Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. I am on a Taoist mission. I gave up everything I wanted to do this Herculean task at the age when everyone tells me I should slow down and have fun. I am really overjoyed with the anticipation. I know that the great wisdom of Lao Tzu is not out of date in the least, simply because it was written years ago. The word Tao is the Chinese version of the word God, the invisible and nameless energy that is responsible for all life. I receive a book from a person who knows that I am undertaking this project, called Jesus and Lao Tzu, The Parallel Sayings, edited by Martin Aronson. On one side of the page are the words of Jesus, who walked the earth long after Lao Tzu, and on the other side of the page are the words of Lao Tzu, expressing the same ideas using slightly different words. This is ancient truth, divine wisdom, and now I am about to start an exciting new chapter in my life. I am not just a teacher, but a student and teacher of ancient wisdom, with an invisible one-year-old mentor as my guide. I reach out to Nikki Vettel, inform her of my new project, and ask her to consult with PBS executives. I can imagine doing a pledge program that brings the teachings of the Tao Te Ching to America's living rooms during prime time. This is a call that could impact millions of people and initiate a transformative shift in our collective consciousness. 
Nikki makes arrangements with the decorator from the movie Memoirs of a Geisha, and they allow us to use this magnificent set for my new special. The show, titled Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life, becomes an instant hit. The great Lao Tzu teachings in the Tao Te Ching are broadcast in prime time in the homes of millions of people wherever PBS is broadcast, which are all major and minor markets in the United States. And the book containing the verses and essays goes on to top the New York Times bestseller list. I can recall with crystal clarity the quantum moment when I emerged from that deep meditation in my blue leather chair in my office the day after my birthday. Something that I had been thinking about in a vague and actionless way became my absolute reality. The fear of making such a drastic change and letting go of so many attachments to so many things disappeared at a time that Zen Buddhists often refer to as Satori, a word that means instantly seeing one's true nature. All doubt was eliminated and replaced by a certainty about what the next steps in my life would be. When I handed my other key to my apartment and all of its contents, I spoke from an inner knowing, almost as if they were directing me to overcome all my resistances and do what is associated with the recovery movement, letting go and letting God. It was so clear that what he had to do was release the strong pull of the ego and allow spirit, or the invisible Tao, to do what it knows how to do perfectly. That my year of immersion in the Tao Te Ching was something that I absolutely had to experience firsthand, before I could continue with the work that I was destined to do. That year of living the Tao and then writing an action-oriented interpretive essay on how to apply this infinite wisdom was without a doubt the most critical and substantial year of my entire life. Now I look back much more clearly with the benefit of 20-20 hindsight, and I can see that many Tao-centered omens were directed my way by the one universal mind. Over and over again, when a reference to the Tao appeared in a book, on television, in a movie, in a restaurant or during a phone conversation, I would stop and have a momentary inner aha, I know that the Tao appears again and again. Above, I wonder what this means. I was reading the book The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, and he referred again and again to what he called omens, which are clues from our invisible source of being to pay attention. Instead of thinking of it as an ongoing coincidence, he said listen and let yourself be guided and, most importantly, banish fear. When Stuart Wilde told me about the moment he was instructed to leave his home in London and leave everything behind, that story made an indelible impression on me. I knew the day would come when I too would have to undertake such a momentous journey. That image of leaving everything behind and moving forward with absolute confidence never left me. Somehow the combination of reaching the age of 65, symbolizing the end of a passage through the material world, and the continued presence of omens related to the Tao, along with that powerful meditation, merged to print on my inner screen a knowledge that I had to act. Living the Tao Te Ching for a year was like having a complete body, mind, and spirit makeover. The word Tao is the hidden force that gives existence to the 10,000 things, the closest synonym that exists for God. Lao Tzu teaches that we become aware of love or the Tao nature through the loss of emphasis on the physical conditions of our life. Time after time I read, interpreted, and applied what Lao Tzu was teaching. It is about letting go of our attachments to this physical plane. As I read and then wrote, I found myself giving away more and more of my stuff. It was no surprise to me that I was originally inspired to come to Maui and immerse myself in the Tao Te Ching out of an almost uncontrollable desire to release my attachments to all that I had accumulated in the previous two or three decades. It was that quantum moment in my life that started a project that was to bring the wisdom of the Tao to countless millions of people around the world. I experienced a kind of automatic writing when I went to write the short essays on how to do the Tao now. In the years since Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life was first published, I have received letters from many Taoist scholars around the world, particularly in China, telling me how well these essays align with their vision. Of what the Tao Te Ching is. Is teaching. That it was my own destiny not only to write a book on the wisdom of the Tao as it applies to our contemporary world, but also to make the shift towards a more Tao-centered way of being. I found myself behaving in much less selfish ways, actually practicing a kind of selfless humility inspired by the words of Lao Tzu. 
I lived smoother and with a kind of detached satisfaction that was not a character trait associated with me in pre-Tao times. I found myself listening more and speaking less, and noticed the inherent wisdom of nature much more. I began to see that all my attachments to objects, status, my culture and even those close to me prevented me from being free on the great path of the Tao. I felt freer and people noticed it everywhere I went. That my sudden quantum satora moment on May 11, 2005, was going to have a far-reaching effect, and that it did not happen to me personally, as my ego would like to believe. As the teacher of Tao says in verse 57, if you want to be a great leader, you must learn to follow Tao. Stop trying to control. Let go of fixed plans and concepts, and the world will rule itself. As I let go of myself more and more, I realized the truth of this passage. I'm sure this Satora moment the day after my birthday, when I was urged to drop everything and come to Maui to study, live, and write about the great wisdom of the Tao, was orchestrated by a divine intelligence that I listen to and trust of. A way that I once didn't understand I can see very clearly that the last line of the verse was working in that quantum moment, being is born of not being. The television program that entered so many homes and the book that interprets the great Tao Te Ching that was read by so many people are now beings born of non-being. It was not being that touched my soul that day in May 2005 and allowed a completely new self and a completely new teaching to be born. I see more and more clearly, and I am more and more amazed. PBS is airing my television special during its Spring Pledge campaign, which means that millions of people in the US and Canada are assimilating Lao Tzu's wisdom from the 2,500-year-old Tao Te Ching. I'm not ready to start the rigorous undertaking of writing a new book or creating another television special in the foreseeable future, as writing Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life was a formidable task. I literally lived through each of those verses of the Tao while writing the 81 essays interpreting the words of my former mentor Lao Tzu, before taking on the task of condensing them into a format for a television audience. I am tired but stimulated by all that this great project has brought to my life. Reed Tracy, the executive director of Hay House, asks me, would you be interested in making a dramatic film based on the work you have produced and do you think you can play a leading role in the film without any acting experience? I tell him that I am interested, the idea of making a film is something that has long resided in the recesses of my imagination. And I have some acting experience, playing Julius Caesar in a play at Marquette Elementary School when I was 13. Reed has been communicating with a brilliant young man named Michael Gorgian, who has been both a professional actor and a film director, in fact, he recently directed Kirk Douglas in a movie. Michael has read a script written by Kristen Lazarian in which there are three intertwined stories of a businessman with great achievements, a mother of two seeking her own expression in the world, and a director trying to make a name for himself. In the movie, these three meet at Asilomar, a retirement center in Northern California, where Wayne Dyer is doing a series of interviews about an upcoming book. I'm going to play myself in this drama, which shouldn't be too much of a stretch, as I've been doing just that for 68 years. My only reluctance to take on such a project is due to the fact that I have seen a considerable number of films based on spiritually oriented books and have always been disappointed. They have seemed a bit amateurish, in part because the author is trying to take on the role of a professional actor. Oftentimes, the script seems weak, the acting unpolished, and the entire movie a shame. I express to both Reed and Michael that I don't want them to associate me with a clunky looking end product. I will only undertake this project if everything and everyone associated with it is of the highest professional caliber. I insist that all actors and technicians are top notch talents. If I am going to be in a film based on the spiritual principles of higher consciousness that I have been writing and speaking about for the past decades, then the final project must reflect a competition that matches the lofty ideals of higher consciousness and realization of God. I make it clear from the start that I am willing to do whatever is asked of me to create a film that will stand the test of time and potentially have a huge impact on all who see it. 
This means that it should be of such a high quality that it sets a standard for future filmmakers who choose to create a dramatic presentation of writing based on spirituality. The people who finance and run this project agree. I love the script and, after extensive discussions with the filmmaking team, I am convinced that the film will be a finished product that I can promote with pride and enthusiasm. I am honored to have so many highly qualified and competent people to work with on this project as I head to California to learn about filmmaking, acting, and film editing. I am in my 60 seconds, about to once again take the road less traveled and immerse myself in a new vocational endeavor that may be a means of reaching people who are not readers. I recently read that approximately 95% of the American population buys 95% of all books, and virtually 90% of the adult population never buys a book. On the contrary, almost 100% of the population go to the cinema or watch it at home. These alarming statistics to me suggest that my time writing and producing books on self-development and spirituality means that I have not been able to reach nearly every hundred adults in America. The idea of positively impacting a large percentage of the population that has not been affected by my life's work is an exciting prospect for me. It is my wish that 10 million people see this movie, called The Shift. This number represents approximately 3-14% of the population of the United States and Canada. I remember number 31,416 of my days struggling with algebra and geometry, is called Pi, Pi. I remember hearing that when that percentage of a population is exposed to a new or radical idea, it represents something in physics called a phase transition, and it triggers a message to the remaining members of that population to start shifting and aligning with those that are in that newly aligned critical mass. In quantum physics experiments, when a certain number of electrons within an atom align in a specific way and critical mass is reached, the other intact electrons automatically begin to align with those in the experimental group. I love this idea, to get a large number of people in a population to change their consciousness to a more God-realized place, and regardless of other external forces, such as political problems, economic situation, unemployment figures, educational practices, weather patterns, wars, conflicts, and so on, the entire population will eventually be brought into a more spiritual alignment. When enough of us begin to choose a higher consciousness, we will reach that critical mass. I have always felt that big radical changes will not occur because of the efforts of political leaders to make changes to the system, but because enough individuals within the system choose to change their own consciousness. This is what will impact the entire collective consciousness, regardless of what anyone may try to impose on the majority. I love this idea of change. The main focus of this film will be the shift from ego, with its associated emphasis on ambition and acquisitions, to meaning, where the main inner desire is to serve others and create a world where God-realization is a universal reality in place of a desperate ideal of a few highly evolved spiritual dreamers. Portia de Rossi will play one of the main characters in the film. A few months ago, Portia and her fiancé, Ellen DeGeneres, asked me to officiate at their wedding, which is scheduled for August, right in the middle of our filming schedule. I happily agree, excited to be the one to declare them a legally married couple. I arrive in Asilomar to spend the next few weeks deeply absorbed in this fascinating new world of filmmaking. I meet with the entire production team, including Portia and the rest of the actors. Everyone associated with the making of this film is in full agreement with the goals that Michael Gorgian and I clearly and emphatically stated in our initial meeting. I'm a bit intimidated by the prospect of being in a movie with these seasoned actors and the directing team. I keep reminding myself that I'm just playing myself, but I'm still acting. It's the day before filming begins, and Michael manages to give me my only acting lesson. We spent two hours together walking through an imaginary scene. At the end of the session, I am confident that I can make this happen to a higher level. However, when filming begins, I am exasperated by the endless reruns of takes that are required for a variety of reasons. The shadows were too dark, the sound man caught the chirp of a bird overhead, the director wants to shoot safely again, and so on. This is very different from anything I have done before. 
when I speak to live audiences, I just walk on stage and improvise for the next few hours, speaking from my heart and telling stories that punctuate a point that I want to make. If I cough, I cough, and move on. If I stumble a bit, I regroup and move on. If there is a bug in the microphone, or a disturbance of any kind, it is corrected and we move on. Not so here on the set of this movie. Although it is tedious, it is also exhilarating and I am captivated by the amount of time, energy, experience, and love that goes into the filmmaking process. On the third day of filming I make my own change, a quantum moment for me. For the past two days I had been trying to memorize my lines and look natural, but it all seemed very elaborate and artificial. I had been doing what the actors in the movie directed and encouraged me to do, but I didn't feel the same way as when I'm on stage or in a television interview being myself. Then Michael says to me, Wayne, forget about the script, forget about the lines that you are memorizing, just talk to the other people in the scenes as if you were talking to them in a similar situation in real life. Everything you say will be exactly what we want for the finished product. I let go, and as I have been doing for so many years, I let God. I surrender it to a higher aspect of myself, to the God within who knows exactly how to be, and I navigate through the rest of the footage. In August, midway through filming, Portia completed all of her scenes. I fly to Los Angeles for my first wedding ceremony and write a heartfelt letter to Ellen and Portia that I will read to you. On August 50th, with the paparazzi flying in helicopters, the immediate family gathers in the couple's basement with all windows covered to deter any wandering photographer from breaking into this very private wedding party. I officially brought these two incredibly special people together as a legally married couple. The next morning I fly back to Asilomar and resume a daily program of 12 to 14 hours of filming. At the beginning of September we have a final meeting with all the filming already completed. My work is done for now and the big job of editing and putting everything into a finished product begins for the director and his editing team. I am so thankful for all the dedicated people who have worked so long to get this done. I am very excited about this film that addresses the message of transcending the call of the ego and urges viewers, through a series of intertwined dramatic stories, to find their own purpose. A few months later, I have the opportunity to review the many editions of the film. It is now a finished product titled From Ambition to Meaning, and a country tour is planned to present the film to audiences in New York City, Chicago, and Los Angeles. I travel to these three movie premieres with executive producer, Reed Tracy, the director, Michael Goergian, and a special soulmate companion, Tiffany Saya. We all ride a rented bus when I have an epiphany about our movie title. I say I love the movie and am moved by the audience's reactions and standing ovations. What bothers me is the title, if I were repeating it, I would change the title because it sounds too much like a documentary or a live lecture. I'd title it The Shift, which is a recurring theme throughout the film. Reed says it will be expensive to do so, but is willing to incur additional expenses to give it this new title, which everyone agrees is more indicative of the film's content. It is now March 2009 and I have added a new nickname to my resume, Movie Star. Is this a miracle or what? When I look back at all the events that had to coalesce to become the driving force behind this movie project, I can clearly see that there was a kind of divine hand working to transform it from an idea into a physical reality. Ever since I was a child, I knew that the crazy ideas that were circulating in my mind were destined for a growing audience. Whether speaking or writing, there has always been an inner awareness that I must share this with as many people as possible. This entire project seemed to receive a silent blessing from a heavenly force that was watching over us all. Asilomar Conference Grounds and State Beach are located on 107 acres of ecologically diverse beachfront land on the Monterey Peninsula in Pacific Grove, California. The members of the film crew gathered at this incredibly beautiful haven by the sea, which is what the word Asilomar means in Spanish. Large numbers of visitors attend many diverse functions throughout the year here, and this is particularly true in the summer months when we converge on the terrain with large trucks, lighting, sound equipment, and the wide range of technicians and support staff. 
that are required to make a film of this caliber. Every day, in every way, everything seemed to fit together for us. At the time of our shoot, there was a large conference of spiritually inclined people associated with unity and religious science churches across America. Some of the attendees saw me and asked if I could give a keynote address, as their keynote speaker was forced to cancel his scheduled lecture. When I was introduced to the audience, they were pleasantly surprised that I was able to offer them a free lecture, with Ellen DeGeneres and Portia de Rossi sitting front row as celebrity guests of honor. When we needed extras for many of the scenes in the film, those who had been at that conference at the beginning of filming were delighted to accommodate them. When we needed a layer of clouds, it magically appeared. When we needed the clouds to disperse, they seemed to obey some invisible CEO and adapt to our needs. These kinds of many miracles were constantly observed and commented on by everyone associated with the making of the shift. That the making of this film was a divinely ordained appointment. He had been lecturing on the quantum notions of critical mass, phase transition, and the hundredth monkey effect for decades. Now everything was happening on a different scale. From a distance I can see the truth in the idea that when I follow my emotion, I align myself with who I am as an infinite being. The emotion or feeling of inner bliss that arises when I contemplate what I really know I must do is God-realization. When I remain in that state of following my bliss, Everything I undertake will not only be effortless, but even more significant, the universe will fully support me as well. The idea of creating a full-length dramatic film that could help people move from the selfish demands of the ego to a more spiritually meaningful life sparked my enthusiasm in a huge way. Also, the idea of reaching out to all those people who never read books and creating a critical mass where this change could happen globally was an exciting idea that I have no words to describe. When I follow my enthusiasm with integrity, I know that I really am on the path that I am supposed to follow in this life. Making this movie at the age of 68 was not just a start up to buy time or attract fans. Because it triggered that feeling of excitement, it was a message to me from my divine source of being, saying, you must do this. Your higher self is demanding it. It cannot be ignored. Now I see clearly that my enthusiasm is the signal, it is me. Once I had this idea firmly planted in my imagination and felt the thrill, I knew that the universal divine mind from which it was originally intended would fully support me. I found that when I follow my enthusiasm, it is like turning the entire project over to God and watching the endless stream of synchronous miracles unfold seamlessly. The whole thing of making this movie flowed effortlessly because everything was surrendered to a matching higher power within me and everyone involved. We were listening to our higher selves, who are identifiable because our emotion is triggered and acted upon. When I look back at the way the shift has been accepted and revised, I see more and more clearly how the universe supports the ideas presented in the film. It has been broadcast many times on national television and received many rave reviews. It has found a life of its own and continues to make its mark on audiences around the world as it has been translated into dozens of foreign languages. My original enthusiasm imagined that 10 million people were watching the shift and beginning a transition phase to a more spiritually awake planet, that this is underway and that I am truly being fully supported in this vision. I remember the day Ellen and Portia asked me if I would be willing to be the person to marry them. As they sincerely pleaded with me, I was reminded of many of the stories I have related here in this book, the images of Rhoda, my Jewish classmate in elementary school, Ray Dudley, my best friend in the Navy, being punished for the color of his skin, Guamino civilians who were denied privileges due to their ethnic origin, and so many, many more that I have not delineated in the pages of this book. So often have I been called upon to advocate for causes, long before they are accepted by the masses. I responded to Ellen and Portia enthusiastically that I would be honored to serve in this capacity in their next marriage. I was thrilled and honored beyond measure to perform the wedding ceremony for these two beautiful people, who chose to tell the world that they were in love and wanted to be treated with the same respect and rights as two other people, regardless of their sex. Orientation I have never been able to understand the unequal treatment of any of God's children. 
I know for a fact that I am here to learn and teach a fundamental truth that has been part of my own life experience since I first appeared here on planet Earth in 1940. We must all work to be firm in our refraining from hurtful thoughts directed toward ourselves and everyone else, and simply refuse to have any judgment, criticism, or condemnation of any person or part of God's creation. That this is part of the shift that is inherent to the film. It is no coincidence that Portia, who starred in this film, along with many other magnificent and stellar actors, joined this film set to help our entire world shift towards a more divinely loving consciousness. He did this by publicly standing up and marrying the woman he loved, who happens to be one of the least critical and least critical world-renowned celebrities that I have been privileged to call my friend. This is what the movie is about. This is what Ellen and Portia are all about. Helping make this change on our planet is what has really defined my life. This was one of the great honors of the quantum moment for me, and it couldn't have come at a more auspicious time, right in the middle of the making of a movie to be called The Shift. After several months of filming, I returned to my writing space on Maui in the fall of 2008. I'm working on a topic for a new book on eliminating the propensity to make excuses, and I've compiled a list of the most commonly used excuses that I think keep people from living at their highest level of self-actualization. I have heard these excuses my entire life, and have even used them frequently when I have temporarily taken the path of guilt rather than self-responsibility. I am also reading a very stimulating self-published book entitled The Biology of Belief by Dr. Bruce Lipton, a leading cell biologist. I observe with interest that he writes, I came to the conclusion that we are not victims of our genes, but masters of our destiny, the primacy of DNA in the control of life is not a scientific truth. I am listening to an interview on CNN and I hear the interviewee explain why he behaved the way he did. Quite naturally, he says, I couldn't help but act the way I did, after all, it's in my DNA and everyone knows that no one can change their genetic makeup. It's what we're born with. I know that I have expressed a similar sentiment myself in the mistaken belief that our genes are what make up our own humanity, and obviously cannot be changed by our mind or any amount of willpower. I grew up in the age of genetic determinism, and until now I had never considered that I could have been programmed to rely on one gigantic excuse when all the others fade away. After reading The Biology of Beliefs, I encourage Reed Tracy of Hay House to publish this extraordinary book. I tell him I want him to be a part of my next PBS special and present it to the public as one of the gifts offered in exchange for a donation to his local public broadcasting station, and he agrees. I am intrigued by the idea that our beliefs can literally change our genes, and Dr. Lipton offers a wealth of scientific evidence to support this revolutionary idea. If our entire genetic blueprint can be changed by altering the way we process life, then all the other petty excuses we employ can also be eradicated. What if we were brought up to truly believe in my often quoted maxim offered by Jesus, with God, all things are possible. And that excuses are never necessary. I've compiled a list of the most common excuses I've heard over the years as a therapist, speaker, media personality, and father of eight. Also, I have created an excuses begun paradigm consisting of seven questions that I have used with clients to help them see that all of these frequently used excuses are actually a way to avoid responsibility and shift to a blame mindset. I got the go-ahead from the powers that be at PBS to record a three-hour engagement show that presents this paradigm for use in everyday life. I know it works, I have seen people come out of a life of habitual patterns when they use this paradigm seriously, and I have put it to work in my own life to eradicate the patterns of excuses that I have used since I was a little boy. Getting rid of the typical excuses, as it will be difficult, it will be risky, I do not deserve it, I cannot afford it, I am not smart enough or I am too scared, which everyone uses to explain their inability to do things the way they ideally would like doing them can be a life-altering experience when using excuses begun. Paradigm regularly. It's the area of overcoming the big excuses that keep people stuck for life that I find most challenging. I feel deep within me that lifelong self-destructive habits can be eliminated, 
and I am excited by the idea of teaching others how this can be easily accomplished. Science is now informing the world that our most cherished beliefs, such as the supremacy of our genetic makeup and the existence of memes firmly rooted in the subconscious mind, are susceptible to change. I write about how to change counterproductive thinking habits and apply them to my own life as well. I remember the experiment of the formation of a blister on a woman's arm due to the strength of her belief, as well as how I was able to heal myself from a pilonidal cyst diagnosis using my mind. Now, in the biology of beliefs, I have read about how the power of the mind can be trained to overcome not only genetic predispositions, but also the mental memes and viruses that have been ingrained in our subconscious since childhood.